Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Chapter I Mishnah If joint owners agree to make a meza in a courtyard they should build the wall in the middle in districts where it is usual to build if the build is a kefisin or lebenim they must use such materials all according to the custom of the district if the bill is used each gives three handbreadths if it is used each gives two handbreadths and a half if kef are used each gives two handbreadths if lebenim are used each gives a handbreadth and a half. Therefore if the wall falls it is assumed that the place it occupied and the stones belong to both similarly with an orchard in a place where it is customary to fence off either can be compelled to do so but in a stretch of cornfields in a place where it is usual not to fence off the fields neither can be compelled if however one desires to make a fence he must withdraw a little and build on his own ground making a facing on the outer side consequently if the wall falls the place and it stones are assumed to belong to him if however they both concur they build the wall in the middle and make a facing on both sides consequently if the wall falls it is assumed that the place and the stones belong to both Gemara it was presumed in the Beth Hamid Rash that Meza means a wall as it has been taught if the Meza of a vineyard has been broken down the owner of an adjoining cornfield can require the owner of the vineyard to restore it if it is broken down again he can again Require him to restore it. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. If the owner of the vineyard neglects the matter and does not restore it, he causes his neighbor's produce to become forfeit and is responsible for his loss. This being so, the reason why either can be compelled to join in putting up the wall is because they both agreed, but if either did not agree, he cannot be compelled from this. We infer that overlooking is not regarded as a substantial damage, but may I not say that Mehza means division as in the verse and the congregations have Mehza's lit division. That being so, since they agreed to make a division, either can compel the other to build a wall from which we infer that overlooking is recognized as a substantial damage. If that is the case, why does the Mishnah say who agreed to make a division Mehza? It should say who agreed Lehazoth to divide. You say then that Mehza means a wall. Why then does the Mishnah say they must build the wall? It should say simply they. Must build it if the Mishnah had said it, I should have understood that a mere fence of sticks is sufficient. It tells us therefore that the partition must be a wall, they must build the wall in the middle. Surely this is self evident. It had to be stated in view of the case where one of the partners had to persuade the other to agree. You might think that in that case the second can say to the first when I consented to your request, I was willing to lose part of my airspace but not part of my ground space. Now we know that he cannot say so, but is then overlooking no substantial damage. Come and here similarly with an orchard, there is a special reason in the case of an orchard, as we find in a saying of our Abba for our Abba said in the name of Arhuna who said it in the name of Rabbit is forbidden to a man to stand about in his neighbor's field when the corn in it is in the ear, but the Mishnah says, and similarly this refers to the Gabil and the Gazith. Come and here at the wall of a Courtyard falls in he the joint owner can be compelled to help in rebuilding to a height of four cubits if it falls the case is different but what then was the point of the objection because it could be said that the statement was required only as an introduction to the next which runs above four cubits he is not compelled to help in rebuilding come and here every resident in a courtyard can be compelled to assist in building a gateway and a door to the courtyard this shows does it not that overlooking is a substantial damage injury inflicted by the public is in a different category is then overlooking by a private individual not an injury come and here this a courtyard need not be divided on the demand of one party unless it is large enough to allow four cubits to each which shows that if enough space will be left to each a division can be demanded must not that division be made by a wall no a mere fence of sticks is sufficient come and here a wall built facing Windows whether above below or opposite must be kept four cubits away and in explanation of this it was taught that if higher it must be four cubits higher so that one should not be able to peep over and look in and if lower four cubits lower so that one should not be able to stand on it and look in and four cubits away so as not to darken the windows damage caused by looking into a house is different come and here are nom and said in the name of Samuel if a man's roof adjoins his neighbor's courtyard he must make a parapet four cubits high there is a special reason there because the owner of the courtyard can say to the owner of the roof I have fixed times for using my courtyard but you have no fixed times for using your roof and I do not know when you may be going up there Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra so that I may keep out of your sight another version of the above discussion is as follows it was presumed in the Beth Hamid Rash that Mehza means division as in it. Verse and the congregation's Mehazoth was etc. Since then the partners agree to make a division they are compelled according to the mission to build a wall this would show that overlooking is a substantial damage may I not say however that Mehazoth means a wall as we have learned if the Mehazoth of a vineyard has been broken down the owner of an adjoining cornfield can require the owner of the vineyard to restore it if it is broken down again he can again require him to restore it if the owner of the vineyard neglects the matter and does not restore it he causes his neighbor's produce to become forfeit and is responsible for his loss this being so the reason why either can be compelled to assist in putting up the wall is because they both agreed but if either did not agree he cannot be compelled from which we infer that overlooking is not a substantial damage if that is so instead of they should build the wall the mission should say they should build it you say then that Mehza means division if so instead of who agreed to make a division the Mishnah should say who agreed to divide it is usual for men to say come let us make a division but if overlooking is a substantial damage why does it speak of the partners agreeing even if they do not agree either should be able to demand a division to this RC answered in the name of our Yohanan our Mishnah is speaking of a courtyard where there is no right of division and where therefore a division is made only. If both agree the Mishnah then tells us according to this that where there is no right of division they may still divide if they so agree we have learned this already in the following passage when does this rule apply when both of them do not consent to divide but if both consent even when it is smaller than this they divide if I had only that to go by I should say that where it is smaller than this they may divide with a mere fence of sticks therefore it tells us here that it must be a while but could not the mission then state this case and omit the other the other case was stated to introduce the succeeding clause scrolls of the scriptures must not be divided even if both joint owners agree how then have you explained the mission as applying to a courtyard in which there is no right of division if it is speaking of one in which there is no right of division even if both owners consent what does it matter either of them can retract rc answered in the name of our yohanan we assume that each made a formal contract with the other by means of a kanyan but even if they made such a contract what does it matter seeing that it relates only to a verbal agreement we assume that they contracted by a kanyan to take different sides are as she said and this becomes effective if for instance one traverses his own part and takes formal possession and the other does likewise in districts where it is usual to build etc you build notes untrimmed stones because squared stones as it is written all these were of costly stones according to the measure of hewn stones because of Kephasin are half bricks and Levenim whole bricks rather the son of Rabbah said to Arashi how do we know that Gabil means untrimmed stones and that the extra hand breadth is to allow for the projection of the rough edges may it not be that Gabil is half the thickness of his and this extra hand breadth is to allow for the mortar between the rows in the same way as we define Kephasin to be half bricks and Levenim whole bricks the extra hand breadth being for the mortar between the rows he replied granting your analogy between Gabil and Kephasin how do we know that Kephasin means half bricks from tradition similarly we know from tradition that Gabil means untrimmed stones according to another version Araha the son of Arawiya said to Arashi how do we know that Kephasin means half bricks and the extra hand breadth is for the mortar between the rows may it not be that Kephasin means untrimmed stones and the extra hand breadth is for the projection of the rough edges in the same way as we define Gabil to be untrimmed stones and is it to be polished stone the extra hand breadth being for the mortar between the rows he replied granting your analogy between Kephasin and Gabil how do we know that Gabil means untrimmed stones from tradition so we know this also from tradition Abbe said we learn from this that the space between the layers in a wall should be a hand breadth this however is the case only if it is filled with mortar but if with rubble more space is required some say this is the case only if it is filled with rubble but if mortar is used not so much is required the Mishnah seems to assume that where squared stones are used if for every four cubits of height there is a breadth of five hand breadths the wall will stand but otherwise not what then of the amatrix in which was thirty cubits high but only six hand breadths brought and yet it stood the one extra hand bre
Also have been specified we may conclude therefore that the plaster is included Noel may still say that the measurements given refer to the material without the plaster and the reason why that of the plaster is not specified is because it is less than a handbreadth but in the case of bricks does it not say that one gives a handbreadth and a half and the other likewise their half handbreadths are mentioned because the two halves can be combined to form a whole one come and urine. Objection to this the beams of which they speak should be wide enough to hold an area which is the half of a liban of three handbreadths there it is speaking of large bricks this is indicated also by the expression half a brick of three handbreadths which implies that there is a smaller variety hence it is proven Arhista said a synagogue should not be demolished before another has been built to take its place some say the reason is less the matter should be neglected others to prevent any. Interruption of religious worship. What practical difference does it make? Which reason we adopt? There is a difference if there is another synagogue. Mirmar and Marzitra pulled down and rebuilt a summer synagogue in winter and a winter synagogue in summer. Rubin asked Arashi, suppose money for a synagogue has been collected and is ready for use. Is there still a risky reply? They may be called upon to redeem captives and use it for that purpose. Rubin asked further, suppose the bricks are already piled up and the lathes trimmed and the beams ready. What are we to say? He replied, it can happen that money is suddenly required for the redemption of captives and they may sell the material for that purpose. If they could do that, he said they could do the same even if they had already built the synagogue. He answered, people do not sell their dwelling places. This rule about pulling down a synagogue only applies if no cracks have appeared in it, but if cracks have appeared, they may. Pull down first and build afterwards. A case in point is that of Arashi who observing cracks in the synagogue of Matha Mahaja had it pulled down. He then took his bed there and did not remove it until the very gutters of the new building had been completed. But how could Baba Bibuta have advised Herod to pull down the temple seeing that Arhista has laid down that a synagogue should not be demolished until a new one has been built to take its place. If you like I can say that cracks had appeared in it or if you like I can say that the rule does not apply to royalty since a king does not go back on his word. For so said Samuel if royalty says I will uproot mountains and will uproot them and not go back on its word. Herod was a slave of the Hasmonean house and had set his eyes on a certain maiden of that house. One day he heard a bath call say every slave that rebels now will succeed. So he rose and killed all the members of his master's household but spared that maiden when she saw that. He wanted to marry her. She went up onto a roof and cried out, Whoever comes and says, I am from the Hasmonean house is a slave since I alone am left of it, and I am throwing myself down from this roof. He preserved her body in honey for seven years. Some say that he had intercourse with her, others that he did not. According to those who say that he had intercourse with her, his reason for embalming her was to gratify his desires. According to those who say that he did not have intercourse with her, his reason was that people might say that he had married a king's daughter. Who are they? He said, Who teach from the midst of thy brethren, thou shalt set up a king over thee, stressing the word brethren. The rabbis, he therefore arose and killed all the rabbis, sparing, however, Baba Bibuta, that he might take counsel of him. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, he placed on his head a garland of hedgehog bristles and put out his eyes. One day he came and sat before him and said, Caesar, what this wicked slave Herod. Does what do you want me to do to him? Replied Baba Bibuta. He said, I want you to curse him. He replied with the verse, Even in thy thoughts thou shouldst not curse a king, said Herod to him. But this is no king, he replied, Even though he be only a rich man, it is written, and in thy bedchamber do not curse the rich, and be he no more than a prince, it is written, A prince among thy people thou shalt not curse, said Herod to him. This applies only to one who acts as one of thy people, but this man does not act as one of thy people. He said, I am afraid of him, but said Herod, There is no one who can go and tell him, since we two are quite alone. He replied, For a bird of the heaven shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Herod then said, I am Herod, had I known that the rabbis were so circumspect, I should not have killed them. Now tell me what amends I can make, he replied, As you have extinguished the light of the world, for so the rabbis are called, as it is written for the Commandment is a light and the Torah a lamp. Go now and attend to the light of the world, which is the temple of which it is written, and all the nations become enlightened by it. Some report that Baba Bibuta answered him thus as you have blinded the eye of the world, for so the rabbis are called as it is written, if it be done unwittingly by the eyes of the congregation, go now and attend to the eye of the world, which is the temple as it is written, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes. Herod replied, I am afraid of the government of Rome. He said, Send an envoy and let him take a year on the way and stay in Rome a year and take a year coming back, and in the meantime you can pull down the temple and rebuild it. He did so and received the following message from Rome. If you have not yet pulled it down, do not do so. If you have pulled it down, do not rebuild it. If you have pulled it down and already rebuilt it, you are one of those bad servants who do. First and ask permission afterwards though you struck with your sword your genealogy is here we know you are neither a Riga nor the son of a Riga but Herod the slave who has made himself a freedman what is the meaning of Riga it means royalty as it is written I am the stay rack and anointed king or if you like I can derive the meaning from this verse and they cried before him Abrek it used to be said he who has not seen the temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building of what did he build it rabbis said of yellow and white marble some say of blue yellow and white marble alternate rows of the stones projected so as to leave a place for cement he originally intended to cover it with gold but the rabbis advised him not to since it was more beautiful as it was looking like the waves of the sea how came Baba Bibuta to do this to give advice to Herod seeing that Rab Judah has said in the name of Rab or it may be our Joshua be Levi that Daniel was punished only because he gave Advice to Nebuchadnezzar as it is written, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and atone thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if there may be a lengthening of thy tranquility, etc. And again, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar, and again at the end of twelve months, etc. If you like, I can say that this does not apply to a slave of an Israelite such as Herod was, who was under obligation to keep the commandments of the Torah, or if you like, I can say that an exception had to be made in the case of the temple which could not have been built without the assistance of royalty. From whence do we learn that Daniel was punished? Shall I say from the verse and Esther called to Hadish, who as Rab has told us was the same as Daniel? This is a sufficient answer if we accept the view of those who say that he was called Hadish because he was cut down Hadish from his greatness, but on the view of those who say that he was called Hadish. Because all matters of state were decided Hadish according to his counsel what answer can we give that he was thrown into the den of lions all according to the custom of the district what further implication is conveyed by the word all that we include places where fences are made upon branches and branches of bay trees therefore if the wall falls the place and the stones belong to both surely this is self-evident it required to be stated in view of the case where the wall has fallen entirely into the property of one of them or where one of them has cleared all the stones into his own part you might think that in that case the onus probandi falls on the other as claimant now we know that this is not so similarly in an orchard in a place where it is customary to fence off the text itself seems here to contain a contradiction you first say similarly in an orchard in a place where it is customary to fence off either can be compelled from which I infer that in an ordinary Orchard he cannot be compelled to fence off now see the next clause but in a stretch of fields in a place where it is usual not to fence off neither can be compelled from which I infer that in an ordinary stretch he can be compelled now if you say that he cannot be compelled in an ordinary orchard do we require to be told that he cannot be compelled in an ordinary stretch of fields Abbe replied we must read the mission of a similarly with an ordinary orchard and also where it is customary to put fences in a stretch of fields he can be compelled said Rabba to him if that is the meaning what are we to make of the word but no said Rabba we must read the mission of a similarly with an ordinary orchard which is regarded as a place where it is customary to make a fence and he can be compelled but an ordinary stretch of cornfields is regarded as a place where it is not customary to make a fence and he is not compelled if however one desires to make a fence he must withdraw a little and Build on his own ground making a facing how does he make a facing Arhuna says he bends the edge over towards the other side why should he not make it on the inner side because then his neighbor may make another one on the other side and say that the wall belongs to both of them if he can do
First, may claim the whole wall as his own is the tana, then teaching us how to guard against rogues and is not the previous regulation also a precaution against rogues. Robber replied, This is right and proper. In the former clause, the tana first states the law and then teaches how it should be safeguarded. But in the latter clause, what law has he laid down that he should teach us how to safeguard it? Robin said, We are here dealing with a partition made of palm branches and the object of it. Mishnah is to exclude the view of Abay that for a fence made of palm branches there is no security save through a written deed. It therefore tells us that the making of a facing is sufficient. Mishnah, if a man has fields surrounding those of another on three sides and fences the first, second, and third, the other is not bound to share in the cost. Our Jose said, If he takes it upon himself to fence the fourth, the whole cost devolves upon him. Gamar Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the Halachah. Follows our Jose who said, If he takes it upon himself to fence the fourth, the whole cost devolves upon him, and it makes no difference whether it is the enclosure or the enclosed who does so. It has been stated, Arhuna said, The contribution to the cost of the whole must be proportionate to the actual cost of erecting the fence. Hi, Rab said, It must be proportionate to the cost of a cheap fence of sticks. We have learned if a man has fields surrounding those of another on three sides and fences it. First, second, and third sides, the other is not compelled to contribute to the cost, which would imply that if the other fences the fourth side, also he must contribute to the cost of the whole. Now, see the next clause. Our Jose says, If he takes it upon himself to fence the fourth, the cost of the whole devolves upon him. This accords very well with the opinion of Arhuna who said that he contributes to the cost of the whole in proportion to the outlay on the fence. There is a genuine difference of opinion between the first Tana and our Jose, the former holding that the contribution has to be proportionate to the cost of a cheap fence of sticks, but not to the actual outlay, and our Jose that it has in all cases to be proportional to the actual outlay. But if we accept the view of Hi Rab who said that it need only be proportionate to the cost of a cheap fence of sticks, what difference is there between the first Tana and our Jose if he is not to give him even the cost of a cheap fence? What? Else can he give if you like I can say that they differ as regards the hire of a watchman the first tana holding that he must pay the cost of a watchman but not of a cheap fence and our Jose holding that he must pay the cost of a cheap fence if you like again I can say that they differ as to the first second and third sides the first tana holding that he has to contribute only to the cost of fencing the fourth side but not the first second and third and our Jose holding that he has to contribute to the cost of the first second and third sides also if you like again I can say that they differ as to whether the fence in question must be built by the owner of the surrounding fields or of the enclosed field if the latter is to contribute to the cost of the whole the first tana holds that the reason why the owner of the enclosed field has to contribute is because they took the initiative in building the fourth fence and that is why the cost of the whole devolves on him but if it Owner of the surrounding fields took the initiative, the other has only to pay him his contribution to the fourth fence. Our Jose, on the other hand, holds that it makes no difference whether the owner of the enclosed or of the surrounding fields took the initiative in building the fourth fence. In either case, the former has to pay the latter his share of the whole. According to another version of this last clause, they differ as to whether the fourth fence has to be built by the owner of it. Enclosed or the surrounding fields in order to make the former liable for contributing to its cost. The first tana holds that even if the owner of the surrounding fields makes the fourth fence, the other has to contribute to the cost. Whereas our Jose holds that if the owner of the enclosed field takes it upon himself to build the fourth fence, then he has to contribute to the cost of the whole because he makes it clear that he approves of it. But if the owner of the surrounding fields builds it, the other does not pay him anything. Talmud, Mas Baba Batre, one Ranya had a field which was enclosed on all four sides by fields of rubbin. The latter fenced them and said to him, Pay me towards what I have spent for fencing. He refused to do so, then pay towards the cost of a cheap fence of sticks. He again refused and pay me the hire of a watchman. He still refused one day. Rubbin is Ranya gathering dates and he said to his Mediago and snatch a cluster of dates from him. He went to take them, but Ranya shouted at him. Whereupon Rubbin said, You show by this that you are glad of the fence. If it is only goats you are afraid of, does not your field need guarding? He replied, A goat can be driven off with a shout, but he said, Don't you require a man to shout at it? He appealed to Rubbin, who said to him, Go and accept his last offer, and if not, I will give judgment against you. According to Arhuna's interpretation of the ruling of Arhuse, Ranya bought a field adjoining a field of Rubbin. The latter thought he was entitled to eject him in virtue of his right of preemption said Arsaf for the son of Arya but Rubina you know the saying the high cost for Zuzim and for Ar for the Tanner Mishnah if the party wall of a courtyard falls in each of the neighbors can be compelled by the other to contribute to the cost of rebuilding it to a height of four cubits each of them I is always presumed to have given his share until the other brings a proof that he has not given for. Rebuilding higher than four cubits neither can be compelled to contribute if however the one who has not contributed builds another wall close to it even though he has not yet put a roofing over the space between the pro rate cost of the whole devolves upon him and he is presumed not to have given until he adduces proof that he has given Gamara Reshlakish has laid down if a lender stipulates a date for the repayment of a loan and the borrower pleads when the date of payment arrives. That he paid the debt before it fell due his word is not accepted let him only pay when it does fall due Abay and Rabbah however both concur in saying that it is not unusual for a man to pay a debt before it falls due sometimes he happens to have money and he says to himself I will go and pay him Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be so as to be quit of him we have learned each is presumed to have given his share until the other brings proof that he has not given how are we to understand this are we to suppose that he says to the claimant I paid when the payment was due then it is self evident that he is presumed to have given we must suppose then that he pleads I paid you before the payment was due this would show would it not that it is not unusual for a man to pay a debt before it is due here the case is different because with every layer of the wall that is finished some payment becomes due come and here this he is presumed not to have given until he is pro of that he has Given how are we to understand this are we to assume that he says to him I paid you when payment became due if so why should we not take his word we must suppose therefore that he says I paid you before payment became due which would show would it not that it is not unusual for a man to pay before the time the case here is different since he may say to himself how do I know that the rabbis will make me pay our papa and Arhuna the son of our Joshua followed in practice the ruling of Abay and Rabba whereas Mar son of Arashi followed Reshlakish the law is as stated by Reshlakish and the ruling applies even to orphans in spite of what has been laid down by a master that one who seeks to recover a debt from the property of orphans need not be paid unless he first takes an oath because the presumption is that a man does not pay a debt before it falls due the question was raised if the creditor claims payment sometime after the debt falls due and the debtor pleads I paid it before. It fell due how do we decide do we say that even where there is a presumption against him we plead on his behalf what motive has he to tell a lie Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra or is the rule that where there is such a presumption we do not advance this plea come and here each is presumed to have given his share until the other brings proof that he has not given how are we to understand this are we to suppose that the claim was made sometime after the payment fell due and the defendant pleads. I paid you when it fell due then this is self-evident we must suppose then that he pleads I paid you before the time of payment from which we would infer that even where there is a presumption against the defendant we plead on his behalf what motive has he to tell a lie the case here is different because with every layer that is finished some payment becomes due come and here for rebuilding higher than four cubits neither can be compelled to contribute if however he builds another wall. Close to it until he adduces proof that he has given. How are we to understand this? Are we to suppose that the claim is made sometime after and the defendant pleads, I paid you when the money fell due? If so, why should we not believe him? We must suppose, therefore, that he pleads, I paid you before the time of payment, and yet he has to contribute, which would show would it not that where there is a presumption against him, we do not plead on his behalf. What motive has he to tell a lie? Here the case is different because he can say to himself, How do I know that the rabbis will compel me to pay? Said Araha, the son of Rabbi to Arashi, come and hear this. If a man says to another, You owe me a mina, and the other says that is so, and if on the next day when the lender says, Give it to me, the borrower pleads, I have given it to you, he is quit. But if he
rest large beams upon it but if he has acquired the right to rest large beams that does give him the right to rest small beams are joseph however said that if he has acquired the right to rest small beams he also has the right to rest large beams according to another version arnaman said that if he has acquired the right for small beams he has the right for large beams and if he has acquired the right for large beams he has the right for small beams arnaman said if a man has a prescriptive right to let water drip from his roof into his neighbor's courtyard he also has the right to carry it off there by means of a gutter pipe but if he has acquired the prescriptive right to carry it off by means of a gutter pipe he has not also the right to let it drip from the roof are joseph however said that if he has acquired the right to carry it off by means of a gutter pipe he has also the right to let it drip from the roof according to another version arnaman said that if he has acquired the prescriptive right to carry it off by a gutter pipe he has the right to let it drip from the roof but he has not the right to let it drip from a cone-shaped roof of reeds whereas R. Joseph says that he has that right also in a case which came before him R. Joseph decided according to his own view Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Biabu if a man lets an apartment to another Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B in a large residence the latter is at liberty to use the projecting beams and the cavities in the walls up to a distance of four cubits from his room and also the thickness of the wall if this is a local custom but not the part of the wall facing the front garden Arnaman however speaking for himself said that he may use even the side facing the front garden but not the yard at the back of the house Rabbi however said that he may use the yard at the back also Rabbi said if a man is allowed by his neighbor to support the beam of his hut on his wall for 30 days this does not constitute prescriptive right but after 30 days it does constitute prescriptive right if the hut however is for religious purposes should no objection be raised within 7 days this does not constitute prescriptive right but if objection is raised only after 7 days it does if however he attaches it with clay and still the neighbor does not object he acquires prescriptive right immediately Abbe said if there are two houses on opposite sides of a public thoroughfare the owner of the one should make a parapet for half his roof and the other a parapet for half his roof in such a way that the parapets do not face one another though each should extend his parapet a little beyond the middle why does Abbe state this rule in connection with the public thoroughfare seeing that it could apply equally to private ground it was more necessary to state it in connection with the public thoroughfare for you might think that in this Case one might refuse to build saying to the other when all is said and done you have to guard your privacy against the public therefore we are told here that this is not so since the other can retort the public can only see me by day but not by night whereas you can see me both by day and night or again the public can see me when I am standing but not when I am sitting but you can see me whether I am standing or sitting the public can see me when they look directly at me but not otherwise. But you see me even without looking the master has just said that one should make a parapet for half his roof and the other should make a parapet for half his roof in such a way that the parapets do not face one another though each should extend his parapet a little beyond the middle surely this rule is obvious we require it for the case where one of the owners builds a parapet first without consulting the other you might think that in that case the other is entitled to say to him complete. The parapet and I will reimburse you were therefore told that he cannot insist upon this since the other can say to him why don't you want to build because it might weaken your wall I too don't want my wall to be weakened Arnaman said in the name of Samuel if a man's roof adjoins another man's courtyard he must make a parapet four cubits high but between one roof and another this is not necessary to this Arnaman added in his own name that a wall of four cubits is not required but a partition of ten handbreadths is required for what purpose is such a partition required if to prevent overlooking we require four cubits if for the purpose of convicting his neighbor of felonious entry a mere fence of sticks would suffice if to prevent kids and lambs from jumping over a partition too high for them to jump over at a headlong run would suffice the actual reason is that he may be able to convict his neighbor of felonious entry if there is only a fence of sticks the latter can Find an excuse, but if there is a partition of ten handbreadths, he can find no excuse. An objection was brought against this ruling of Arnaman from the following: If the other's courtyard is higher than his roof, there is no need for it. Does not this mean that there is no need for a partition at all? No, it means that there is no need for a wall of four cubits, but a partition of ten handbreadths is required. It has been stated if two courtyards adjoin and one is higher than the other, Arhuna says that the owner of the lower one has to build the party wall up from his level, and the owner of the higher one starts building from his level. Ola and Arhista, however, say that the owner of the higher one has to assist the owner of the lower in building from his level. It has been taught in agreement with Arhista if there are two adjoining courtyards of which one is higher than the other, the owner of the higher one must not say to the other, "I will start building the party wall from my level." But he must assist the other to build from his level if however his courtyard is higher than his neighbor's roof he has no liability two men were living in the same house one in the upper room and one in the lower the lower room began to sink into the ground so the owner of the lower room said to the one above let us rebuild the house the other replied I am quite comfortable Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra then let me take it down and rebuild it said the first he replied meanwhile I have nowhere to live said the first I will hire you a place I do not want to bother he replied but said the first I cannot live in my place to which he replied you can crawl on your belly to get in and crawl on your belly to get out said Arhamma he had a full right to stop him rebuilding this however is the case only if the beams of the upper room did not sink lower than ten handbreadths from the ground but if they came as low as this the owner of the lower room can say below ten handbreadths my property and is not subject to you further the one above was within his rights only if they had not made an agreement with one another but if they had made an agreement with one another then they must take down the house and rebuild it and if they did make an agreement with one another how low must the upper chamber sink before the one below can demand rebuilding the rabbi stated in the presence of rabbi in the name of marzitra the son of arnaman who said it in the name of arnaman till the lower room fails to answer the requirement laid down for that of which we have learned its height must be equal to half its length and half its breadth combined said rabbi to them have i not told you not to hang empty bottles on arnaman what arnaman said was it must be fit for human habitation and how much is this arhuna the son of our joshua said big enough for one to bring in a bundle of reeds of mahusa and turn around with them a certain man began to build a wall facing his Neighbor's windows the latter said to him you are shutting out my light said the first let me close up your windows here and I will make you others above the level of my wall he replied you will damage my wall by so doing let me then he said take down your wall as far as the place of the windows and then rebuild it fixing windows in the part above my wall he replied a wall of which the lower part is old and the upper part new will not be firm and he said let me take it all down and build it up from the ground and put windows in it he replied a single new wall in a house the rest of which is old would not be firm he then said let me take down the whole house and put windows in the new building he replied meanwhile I have no place wherein to live I will rent a place for you said the other I don't want to bother said the first said Arham on hearing of the case he had a perfect right to stop him is not this case the same as the other why then this repetition to tell us that the Owner of the house may exercise his veto even though he only uses it for storing straw and with two brothers divided a house which they inherited the one taking as part of his share of veranda open at one end and the other the front garden the one who obtained the garden went and built a wall in front of the opening of the veranda said the other you are taking away my light I am building on my own ground he replied said Arhamma he was quite within his rights in saying so Robin asked Arashi how does this case differ from what was taught if two brothers divide an inheritance one taking a vineyard and the other a cornfield adjacent the owner of the vineyard can claim four cubits in the cornfield since it was understood that on that condition they divided he replied there the reason is that they struck a balance with one another what then said Robin do we suppose here that they did not compensate one another are we dealing with idiots of whom one takes a veranda and the other the garden and yet no question of compensation is raised he replied granted that compensation was allowed for the bricks beams and planks no allowance was made for the airspace but cannot he say at first you let me have a veranda as my share now you are only letting me have a dark room Arshai my be as she said he let him have something which happened to be called so has it not been taught if a man says I sell you a Bethcore of ground even if it subsequently proved to be only a leaf that the sale is valid since he sold him only something designated a Bethcore provided always that the land in question is commonly called a Bethcore if a man says I sell
On the strength of the bond nor do we tear it up we neither enforce payment because a receipt is produced against it nor do we tear it up because it is possible that when the orphans grow up they will bring evidence invalidating the receipt said Araha the son of Rabbi what is the accepted ruling in such a case he replied in all the above mentioned cases the law follows our save only in the matter of the receipt the reason being that we do not presume the witnesses who have Signed the receipt to have been guilty of the falsehood of Marzitra the son of Armari however said that in this also the law follows Arhama since if the receipt were genuine the defendant ought to have produced it in the lifetime of the father and since he did not do so the inference is that it was forged Mishnah he a resident of a courtyard may be compelled by the rest to contribute to the building of a porter's lodge and a door for the courtyard Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel however says that not all courtyards require a porter's lodge he a resident of a city may be compelled to contribute to the building of a wall folding doors and a crossbar Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel says that not all towns require a wall how long must a man reside in a town to be counted as one of the townsmen twelve months if however he buys a house there he is at once reckoned as one of the townsmen Gamara to the building of a porter's lodge this would seem to show that a porter's lodge is an improvement. Yet how can this be seen that there was a certain pious man with whom Elijah used to converse until he made the porter's lodge after which he did not converse with him anymore there is no contradiction in the one case we suppose the lodge to be inside the courtyard in the other outside or if you like I can say that in both cases we suppose the lodge to be outside and still there is no difficulty because in the one case there is a door and in the other there is no door or again we may suppose that in both cases there is a door and still there is no difficulty because in the one case there is a latch and the other there is no latch or again I may say that in both cases there is a latch and still there is no difficulty because in the one case the latch is inside and in the other outside he may be compelled to contribute to the cost of a porter's lodge and a door it has been taught Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel says not all courtyards require a porter's lodge a courtyard which abuts. On the public thoroughfare requires a lodge but one which does not abut on the public thoroughfare does not require such a lodge the rabbis however hold that it does because sometimes in a crowd people force their way and he may be compelled to contribute to the building of a wall etc. It was taught Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel says that not all cities require a wall a town adjoining the frontier requires a wall but a town which does not adjoin the frontier does not require a wall and the rabbis. They hold that it does because it may happen to be attacked by a roving band our Eliezer inquired of our Yohanan is the impost for the wall levied as a poll tax or according to means he replied it is levied according to means and do you Eliezer my son fix this ruling firmly in your mind according to another version our Eliezer asked our Yohanan whether the impost was levied in proportion to the proximity of the resident's house to the wall or to his means he replied in proportion to the proximity of his house to the wall and do you Eliezer my son fix this ruling firmly in your mind our Judah the prince levied the impost for the wall on the rabbi said Rush Lakish the rabbis do not require the protection of a wall as it is written if I should count them they are more in number than the sand who are these that are counted shall I say the righteous and that they are more in number than the sand seeing that of the whole of Israel it is written that they shall be like the sand on the seashore. How can the righteous alone be more than the sand? What the verse means, however, is I shall count the deeds of the righteous, and they will be more in number than the sand. If and the sand, which is a lesser quantity, protects the land against the sea, how much more must the deeds of the righteous, which are a larger quantity, protect them? When Rish Lakish came before our Yohanan, the latter said to him, Why did you not derive the lesson from this verse? Lamb a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Where I am a wall refers to the Torah, and my breasts are like towers. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, to the students of the Torah. Rish Lakish, however, adopts the exposition of this verse given also by Rabbah, is that I am a wall refers to the community of Israel, and my breasts are like towers to synagogues and houses of study. Arnam and B. Arhis Dalavi, the poll tax on the rabbi said, Arnam and B. Isaac, to him, you have transgressed against the law, the prophets, and the holy writings against the law, where it Says although he loveth the peoples, all his saints are in thy hand, said Moses to the Holy One, blessed be he sovereign of the universe, even at the time when thou fundless other peoples, let all Israel saints be in thy hand. The verse proceeds, and they are cut at thy feet. Our Joseph learned these are the students of the Torah who cut their feet in going from town to town and country to country to learn the Torah. He shall receive of thy words, alluding to their discussing the utterances of God. You have transgressed against the prophets, where it says, Yea, though they study among the nations, now I shall gather them, and a few of them shall be free from the burden of king and princes. This verse Allah has told us is written partly in Aramaic and is to be expounded. Thus, if they all study, I will gather them even now, and if only a few of them study, they those few shall be free from the burden of king and princes. You have transgressed against the holy writings, as it is written, it shall. Not be lawful to impose upon them the priests and levites, etc. Minda Belo and Halak and Rab Judah has explained that Minda means the king's tax below the poll tax and Halash denotes a known our papa levied an impost for the digging of a new well on orphans. Also said Arshis hate the son of Aridi to our papa. Perhaps no water will be found there. He replied, I will collect the money from them. In any case, if water is found well and good, and if not, I will refund them the money. Rab Judah said, All must contribute to the building of doors in the town gates, even orphans. Not however, the rabbis, since they do not require protection, all must contribute to the digging of a well for a public fountain, including the rabbis. This, however, is only when there is no corby, but when the digging is done by corby, we do not expect the rabbis to participate. Rabbi once opened his storehouse of vittles in a year of scarcity, proclaiming, Let those enter who have studied the scripture or the Mishnah or the Gemara or the Halachah or the Yagada, there is no admission, however, for the ignorant Arjanathan Biamrom pushed his way in and said, Master, give me food. He said to him, My son, have you learned the scripture? He replied, No, have you learned the Mishnah? No, if so, he said, Then how can I give you food? He said to him, Feed me as a dog and a raven are fed. So he gave him some food. After he went away, Rabbi's conscience smote him and he said, Woe is me that I have given my bread to a man without learning R. Simeon, son of Rabbi, ventured to say to him, Perhaps it is Jonathan Biamrom, your pupil, who all his life has made it a principle not to derive material benefit from the honor paid to the Torah. Inquiries were made and it was found that it was so, whereupon Rabbi said, All may now enter Rabbi in first refusing admission to the unlearned was acting in accordance with his own dictum, for Rabbi said, It is the unlearned who bring misfortune on the world. A typical instance was that of the crown for which. The inhabitants of Tiberias were called upon to find the money. They came to Rabbi and said to him, Let the rabbis give their share with us. He refused, and we will run away. They said, You may. He replied, So half of them, the Amhiris, ran away. Half of the sum demanded was then remitted. The other half then came to Rabbi and asked him that the rabbis might share with them. He again refused, We will run away. They said, You may. He replied, So they all ran away, leaving only a certain fuller. The money was then demanded of him, and he ran away, and the demand for the crown was then dropped. Thereupon Rabbi said, I see that trouble comes on the world only on account of the unlearned. How long must he be in the town to be counted as one of the townsmen, etc.? Does not this conflict with the following if a caravan of asses or camels on its way from one place to another stays there overnight and goes astray with the population? The members of the caravan are condemned to be stoned, but their property is left. Untouched if however they have stayed there thirty days they are condemned to death by the sword and their property is also destroyed. Robert replied there is no contradiction the one period twelve months is required in order to make a man a full member of the town the other makes him only an inhabitant of the town as it was taught if a man vows that he will derive no benefit from the men of a certain town he must derive no benefit from anyone who has resided there twelve months but he may derive benefit from one who has resided there less than twelve months if he vows to derive no benefit from the inhabitants of the town he may derive none from anyone who has resided there thirty days but he may from one who has resided there less than thirty days but his twelve months residence required for all impost has it not been taught a man must reside in a town thirty days to become liable for contributing to the soup kitchen three months for the charity box six months for the clothing. Fund nine months for the burial fund and twelve months for contributing to the repair of the town walls RC replied in the
Redemption of captives is a religious duty of great importance. Rabbi asked Rabbi Bimari whence is derived the maxim of the rabbis that the redemption of captives is a religious duty of great importance. He replied from the verse, and it shall come to pass when they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? And thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for famine to the famine, and such as are for captivity to captivity. And commenting on this, are you said each punishment mentioned in this verse is more severe than the one before the sword is worse than death. This I can demonstrate either from scripture or if you prefer from observation. The proof from observation is that the sword deforms, but death does not deform. The proof from scripture is in the verse precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Famine again is harder than the sword. This again can be demonstrated either by Observation the proof being that the one causes prolonged suffering but the other not or if you prefer from the scripture from the verse they that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger captivity is harder than all because it includes the sufferings of all our rabbis taught the charity fund is collected by two persons jointly and distributed by three it is collected by two because any office conferring authority over the community must be filled by at least two persons it must be distributed by three on the analogy of money cases which are tried by Beth in of three food for the soup kitchen is collected by three and distributed by three since it is distributed as soon as it is collected food is distributed every day the charity fund every Friday the soup kitchen is for all comers the charity fund for the poor of the town only the townspeople however are at liberty to use the soup kitchen like the charity fund and vice versa and to apply them to whatever purposes they choose the townspeople are also at liberty to fix weights and measures prices and wages and to inflict penalties for the infringement of their rules the master said above any office conferring authority over the community must be filled by at least two persons whence is this rule derived our nom and said scripture says and they shall take the gold etc this shows that they were not to exercise authority over the community but that they were to be trusted the supports are Hannah for our Hannah reported with approval the fact that rabbi once appointed two brothers to supervise the charity fund what authority is involved in collecting for charity as was stated by our nom in the name of rabbi Biaboa, because the collectors can take a pledge for a charity contribution even on the eve of sabbath is that so is it not written i will punish all that oppress them even said our isaac b samuel b martha in the name of rabbi the collectors for charity there is no Contradiction the one rap speaks of a well-to-do man, the other of a man who is not well-to-do as for instance Rabbi compelled our Nathan BMI to contribute 400 zoos for charity it is written and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament this applies to a judge who gives a true verdict on true evidence and they that turn many to righteousness Zedakah as the stars forever and ever these are the collectors for charity Zedakah in the very day it was taught that are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament this applies to a judge who gives a true verdict on true evidence and to the collectors for charity and they that turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever this applies to the teachers of young children such as who for instance said Rab to such as our Samuel B. Shalat for Rab once found our Samuel B. Shalat in a garden whereupon he said to him have you deserted your post he replied I have not seen this garden for Thirteen years and even now my thoughts are with the children and what the scripture say of the rabbis Rabban answered they that love him shall be as the sun when he goeth forth in his night our rabbis taught the collectors of charity when collecting are not permitted to separate from one another though one may collect at the gate while the other collects at a shop in the same courtyard if one of them finds money in the street he should not put it into his purse but into the charity box and when he comes home he should take it out in the same way if one of them has lent a man amina and he pays him in the street he should not put the money into his own purse but into the charity box and take it out again when he comes home our rabbis taught if the collectors still have money but no poor to whom to distribute it they should change the small coins into larger ones with other persons but not from their own money if the stewards of the soup kitchen have food over and no poor to whom to distribute it they may sell it to others but not to themselves in counting out money collected for charity they should not count the coins two at a time but only one at a time Abbe said at first the master would not sit on the mats in the synagogue but when he heard that it had been taught that the townspeople can apply it to any purpose they choose he did sit on them Abbe also said at first the master used to keep two purses one for the poor from outside and one for the poor of the town when however he heard of what Samuel had said to Artahel of Abiyabdimi keep one purse only Talmud, Mas Baba Bathray and stipulate with the townspeople that it may be used for both he also kept only one purse and made the stipulation Arashi said I do not even need to stipulate since whoever comes to give me money for charity relies on my judgment and leaves it to me to give to whom I will there were two butchers who made an agreement with one another that if either killed on it Others day the skin of his beast should be torn up one of them actually did kill on the other's day and the other went and tore up the skin those who did so were summoned before Rabbi and he condemned them to make restitution Aryam Arbi Shalimi thereupon called Rabbi's attention to the Baritha which says that the townspeople may inflict penalties for breach of their regulations Rabbi did not deign to answer him said our Papa Rabbi was quite right not to answer him this regulation holds good only where there is no distinguished man in the town but where there is a distinguished man they certainly have not the power to make such stipulations our Rabbis taught the collectors for charity are not required to give an account of the monies entrusted to them for charity nor the treasurers of the sanctuary of the monies given for holy purposes there is no actual proof of this in the scriptures but there is a hint of it in the words they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they Delivered the money to give to them that did the work for they dealt faithfully our Eliezer said even if a man has in his house a steward on whom he can rely he should tie up and count out any money that he hands to him as it says they put in bags and told the money Aruna said applicants for food are examined but not applicants for clothes this rule can be based if you like on scripture or if you prefer on common sense it can be based if you like on common sense because the one who has no clothing is exposed to contempt but not the other or if you prefer on scripture on the verse is it not to examine Paras the hungry before giving him thy bread for so we may translate since the word Paras is written with a sin as much as to say examine and then give to him whereas later it is written when thou seest the naked that thou cover him that is to say immediately Rab Judah however said that applicants for clothes are to be examined but not applicants for food this rule can be Based if you like on common sense or if you prefer on scripture if you like on common sense because the one without food is actually suffering but not the other or if you prefer on scripture because it says is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry that is at once whereas later it is written when thou seest the naked that is to say when you shall have seen that he is deserving it has been taught in agreement with Rab Judah if a man says clothe me he is examined but if he says feed me he is not examined we have learned in another place the minimum to be given to a poor man who is on his way from one place to another is a loaf which costs a pundi and when four seahs of wheat are sold for a seller if he stays overnight he is given his requirements for the night what is meant by requirements for the night our papa said a bed and a pillow if he stays over sabbath he is given food for three meals eight and a tot if he is a beggar who goes from door to door we pay no attention to him eh? Certain man who used to beg from door to door came to our papa for money but he refused him said our Sabbath the son of our Yeba to our papa if you do not pay attention to him no one else will pay attention to him is he then to die of hunger but replied our papa has it not been taught if he is a beggar who goes from door to door we pay no attention to him he replied we do not listen to his request for a large gift but we do listen to his request for a small gift R.C. said a man should never neglect to give a third of a shekel for charity in a year as it says also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our lord R.C. further said charity is equivalent to all the other religious precepts combined as it says also we made ordinances it is not written in ordinance but ordinances are Eliezer said he who causes others to do good is greater than the doer as it says and the work of righteousness said, shall be. Peace and the effect of righteousness, quiet and confidence forever. If a man is deserving, then shalt thou not deal thy bread to the hungry. But if he is not deserving, then thou shalt bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. Rabbi said to the townsfolk of Mahuza, I beg of you, hasten to the assistance of one another so that you may be on good terms with the government. Our Eliezer further said, When the temple stood, a man used to b
Mother, the reason is this Arahad boy BMI asked Arshis hate once do we infer that a leper while he is counting his days for purification renders unclean a man who touches him he replied since he renders garments unclean he renders a man unclean but he said perhaps this only applies to clothes which he actually wears for similarly we have the case of the lifting of a carcase which makes the garments unclean but not the man he replied and once do we know that a creeping thing makes a man. Unclean is it not from the fact that it makes garments unclean he replied of the creeping thing it is distinctly written or whosoever touches any creeping thing whereby he may be made unclean how then he or she hate said do we know that human semen makes a man unclean do we not say that because it makes garments unclean therefore it makes a man unclean he replied the rule of semen is also distinctly stated since it is written in connection with it or a man who seed goeth from him. Where the superfluous phrase or a man brings under the rule one who touches the seed he Arahad boy made his objections in a mocking manner which deeply wounded Arshi's hate and soon after Arahad boy Abba lost his speech and forgot his learning his mother came and wept before him but in spite of all her cries he paid no attention to her at length she said behold these breasts from which you have sucked and at last he prayed for him and he was healed but what is the answer to the question that has been raised as it has been taught our Simeon he says washing of garments is mentioned in connection with the period of the lepers counting and washing of garments is also mentioned in connection with the period of his definite uncleanness just as in the latter case he renders any man he touches unclean so also in the former case our Eliezer said a man who gives charity in secret is greater than Moses our teacher for of Moses it is written for I was afraid because of the anger aid Wrath and of one who gives charity secretly it is written a gift in secret subdues anger in this here Eliezer differs from our Isaac for our Isaac said that it subdues anger but not wrath since the verse continues and the present in the bosom fierce wrath which we can interpret to mean though a present is placed in the bosom yet wrath is still fierce according to others our Isaac said a judge who takes a bribe brings fierce wrath upon the world as it says and a present etc our Isaac also said he who gives a small coin to a poor man obtains six blessings and he who addresses to him words of comfort obtains eleven blessings he who gives a small coin to a poor man obtains six blessings as it is written is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and bring the poor to thy house etc when thou seest the naked etc he who addresses to him comforting words obtains eleven blessings as it is written if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul he shall thy light rise in the darkness and thine obscurity be as the noonday and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and they shall build from thee the old waste places and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations etc. Our Isaac further said what is the meaning of the verse he that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life righteousness and honor because a man has followed after righteousness shall he find righteousness the purpose of the verse however is to teach us that if a man is anxious to give charity the Holy One blessed be he furnishes him money with which to give it our nom and be Isaac says the Holy One blessed be he sends him men who are fitting recipients of charity so that he may be rewarded for assisting them who then are unfit such as those mentioned in the exposition of Rabbah when he said what is the meaning of the verse let them be made to stumble before thee in the time of thine anger deal thou with them Jeremiah said to the Holy one blessed be he sovereign of the universe even at the time when they conquer their evil inclination and seek to do charity before they cause them to stumble through men who are not fitting recipients so that they should receive no reward for assisting them or Joshua be Levi said he who does charity habitually will have sons wise wealthy and versed in the Agata wise as it is written Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra he shall find life wealthy as it is written he shall find righteousness versed in the Agata as it is written and he shall find honor and it is written elsewhere the wise shall inherit honor it has been taught our mayor used to say the critic of Judaism may bring against you the argument if your God loves the poor why does he not support them if so answer him so that through them we may be saved from the punishment of Gehenna this question was actually put by Turnus Rufus to our Akiva if your God loves the poor why does he not support them you replied so that we may be Saved through them from the punishment of Gehinnom on the contrary said the other it is this which condemns you to Gehinnom I will illustrate by a parable suppose an earthly king was angry with his servant and put him in prison and ordered that he should be given no food or drink and a man went and gave him food and drink if the king heard would he not be angry with him and you are called servants as it is written for unto me the children of Israel our servants are Akiva answered him I will illustrate by another parable suppose an earthly king was angry with his son and put him in prison and ordered that no food or drink should be given to him and someone went and gave him food and drink if the king heard of it would he not send him a present and we are called sons as it is written sons are yet to the Lord your God he said to him you are called both sons and servants when you carry out the desires of the omnipresent you are called sons and when you do not carry out the desires of the omnipresent you are called servants at the present time you are not carrying out the desires of the omnipresent our Akiva replied the scripture says is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when dost thou bring the poor who are cast out to thy house now and it says at the same time is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry our Judah son of our Shalom preached as follows in the same way as a man's earnings are determined for him from new year so his losses are determined for him from new year if he finds merit in the sight of heaven then deal out thy bread to the poor but if not then he will bring the poor that are outcast to his house a case in point is that of the nephews of Rabban Yohan and Bezakai he saw in a dream that they were to lose 700 dinars in that year he accordingly forced them to give him money for charity until only 17 dinars were left of the 700 on the eve of the day of atonement the government sent and seized them or Yohan and Bezakai said to them do not fear that you will lose any more you had 17 dinars and these they have taken they said to him how did you know that this was going to happen he replied I saw it in a dream then why did you not tell us they asked because he said I wanted you to perform the religious precept of giving charity quite disinterestedly as our papa was climbing a ladder his foot slipped and he narrowly escaped falling had that happened. He said mine enemy had been punished like sabbath breakers and idolaters high be wrapped from 50 said to him perhaps a beggar appealed to you and you did not assist him for so it has been taught our Joshua B. Korha says whoever turns away his eyes from one who appeals for charity is considered as if he were serving idols it is written in one place beware that there be not a base thought in thine heart and in another place certain base fellows are gone out just as in the second case the sin is. That of idolatry so in the first case the sin is equivalent to that of idolatry it has been taught our Eliezer son of our Jose said all the charity and deeds of kindness which Israel perform in this world help to promote peace and good understanding between them and their father in heaven as it says thus saith the Lord enter not into the house of mourning neither go to lament neither bemoan them for I have taken away my peace from this people even loving kindness and tender mercies where loving kindness refers to acts of kindness and tender mercies to charity it has been taught our Judah says great is charity in that it brings the redemption nearer as it says thus saith the Lord keep ye judgment and do righteousness said for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed he also used to say ten strong things have been created in the world the rock is hard but the iron cleaves it the iron is hard but the fire softens it the fire is hard but the water quenches it the water is strong but the clouds bear it the clouds are strong but the wind scatters them the wind is strong but the body bears it the body is strong but fright crushes it fright is strong but wine vanishes it wine is strong but sleep works it off death is stronger than all and charity saves from death as it is written righteousness and delivereth from death our dust high son of our janet preached as follows observe that the ways of god are not like the ways of flesh and blood how does flesh and blood act if a man brings a present to a king it may be accepted or it may not be accepted and even if it is accepted it is still doubtful whether he will be admitted to the presence of the king or not not so god if a man gives but a farthing to a beggar he is deemed worthy to receive the divine presence as it is written i shall behold thy face in righteousness said i shall be satisfied when i wake with thy likeness our Eliezer used to give a coin to a poor man and straightway Say a prayer because he said it is written I in righteousness shall behold thy face what is the meaning of the words I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness Arnam and B. Isaac said this refers to the students of the Torah who banish sleep from their eyes in this world and
Without knowing from whom he receives this excludes the practice of Arava how is a man then to do he should put his money into the charity box the following was a distant objection to this what is a man to do in order that he may have male offspring our Eliezer says that he should give generously to the poor our Joshua says that he should make his wife glad to perform the marital office our Eliezer B. Jacob says a man should not put a farthing into the charity box unless it is under the supervision. Of a man like our Hanan of Beterion in saying that a man should put his money into the charity box, we mean when it is under the supervision of a man like our Hanan of Beterion. Our Abab said Moses addressed himself to the Holy One, blessed be he, saying, Sovereign of the universe, wherewith shall the horn of Israel be exalted? He replied, Through taking their ransom, our Abab also said, Solomon, the son of David, was asked, How far does the power of charity extend? He replied, Go and see what my father David has stated on the matter he hath dispersed, he hath given to the needy his righteousness endureth forever. Our Abba said, The answer might be given from here, he shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks, his bread is given him, his waters are sure. Why shall he dwell on high, and his place be with the munitions of the rocks, because his bread is given to the poor, to his waters are sure. Our Abab also said, Solomon was asked, Who has a place in the future world? He Answered he to whom are applied the words and before his elders shall be glory a similar remark was made by Joseph the son of our Joshua he had been ill and fell in a trance after he recovered his father said to him what vision did you have he replied I saw a world upside down the upper below and the lower above he said to him you saw a well regulated world he asked further in what condition did you see us students he replied as our esteem is here so it is there I also he continued heard them saying happy he who comes here in full possession of his learning I also heard them saying no creature can attain to the place in heaven assigned to the martyrs of the Roman government who are these shall I say our Akiba and his comrades had they no other merit but this obviously even without this they would have attained this rank what is meant therefore must be the martyrs of blood Rabban Yohan and Bizak I said to his disciples my sons what is the meaning of the verse righteousness Exaltate the nation, but the kindness of the peoples is sin. Our Eliezer answered and said, Righteousness, exaltate the nation. This refers to Israel, of whom it is written, Who is like thy people, Israel, one nation in the earth, but the kindness of the peoples is sin. All the charity and kindness done by the heathen is counted to them as sin, because they only do it to magnify themselves, as it says that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savor unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons, but is not an act of this kind charity in the full sense of the word, seeing that it has been taught. If a man says, I give the seller for charity in order that my sons may live and that I may be found worthy of the future world, he may all the same be a righteous man in the full sense of the word. There is no contradiction in the one case we speak of an Israelite in the other of a heathen. Our Joshua answered and said, Righteousness, exaltate the nation. This refers to Israel, of whom it is. Written who is like thy people Israel one nation on the earth the kindness of peoples is sin all the charity and kindness that the heathen do is counted sin to them because they only do it in order that their dominion may be prolonged as it says wherefore O king let my counsel be acceptable to thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor if there may be a lengthening of thy tranquility Rabban Gamaliel answered saying righteousness exalted a nation this refers to Israel of whom it is written who is like thy people Israel etc and the kindness of the peoples is sin all the charity and kindness that the heathen do is counted as sin to them because they only do it to display haughtiness and whoever displays haughtiness is cast into Gehinnom as it says the proud and haughty man scorner is his name he worketh in the wrath Hebrew of pride and wrath connotes Gehinnom as it is written the day of wrath is that day said Rabban Gamaliel we have Still to hear the opinion of the Modi, our Eliezer, the Modi, it says righteousness exaltate the nation. This refers to Israel of whom it is written who is like thy people Israel one nation in the earth. The kindness of the peoples is sin. All the charity and kindness of the heathen is counted to them as sin since they do it only to reproach us as it says the Lord hath brought it and done according as he spake because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed his voice. Therefore this thing is come upon you or Nehunia Bihakana answered saying righteousness exaltate the nation and there is kindness for Israel and a sin offering for the people said our Yohan and Bizakai to his disciples. The answer of our Nehunia Bihakana is superior to my answer and to yours because he assigns charity and kindness to Israel and sin to the heathen. This seems to show that he also gave an answer. What was it as it has been taught our Yohan and Bizakai said to them just as the sin offering makes atonement. For Israel, so charity makes atonement for the heathen. For Hormaz, the mother of King Shabur, sent four hundred denarim to Rmi, but he would not accept them. She then sent them to Rabbah, and he accepted them in order not to offend the government. When Rmi heard, he was indignant and said, "Does he not hold with the verse when the bows thereof are withered, they shall be broken off? The women shall come and set them on fire." Rabbah defended himself on the ground that he wished not to offend it. Government was not Rmi also anxious not to offend the government. He was angry because he ought to have distributed the money to the non-Jewish poor, but Rabbah did distribute it to the non-Jewish poor. The reason Rmi was indignant was Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, that he had not been fully informed. It has been taught the following incident is related of Benjamin the righteous, who was a supervisor of the charity fund. One day, a woman came to him in a year of scarcity and said to him, "Sir." Assist me, he replied, I swear there is not a penny in the charity fund. She said, Sir, if you do not assist me, a woman and her seven children will perish. He accordingly assisted her out of his own pocket. Some time afterwards, he became dangerously ill. The angels addressed the Holy One, blessed be he, saying, Sovereign of the universe, thou hast said that he who preserves one soul of Israel is considered as if he had preserved the whole world. Shall then Benjamin the righteous who has preserved the woman and her seven children die at so early an age? Straightway his sentence was torn up. It has been taught that twenty-two years were added to his life. Our rabbis taught it is related of King Manabez that he dissipated all his own hordes and the hordes of his fathers in years of scarcity. His brothers and his father's household came in a deputation to him and said to him, Your father saved money and added to the treasures of his fathers, and you are squandering them. He replied, My father stored up. Below and I am storing above as it says truth springeth out of the earth and righteousness looked down from heaven my father stored in a place which can be tampered with but I have stored in a place which cannot be tampered with as it says righteousness and judgment are the foundation of his throne my father stored something which produces no fruits but I have stored something which does produce fruits as it is written say of the righteous sodic that it shall be well with them for they shall eat of the fruit of their doings my father's gathered treasures of money but I have gathered treasures of souls as it is written the fruit of the righteous sodic is a tree of life and he that is wise winneth souls my father's gathered for others and I have gathered for myself as it says and for thee it shall be righteousness sadaka my father's gathered for this world but I have gathered for the future world as it says thy righteousness sadaka shall go before thee and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward if he acquires a residence in it. He is counted as one of the townsmen. The mission is not in agreement with Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel since it has been taught. Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel says if he acquires a piece of property, however small in it, he is reckoned as a townsman. But has it not been taught if he acquires in it a piece of ground on which a residence can be put up, but not smaller, he is reckoned as one of the townsmen. Two Tanaim have reported the dictum of Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel. Differently, mission a courtyard should not be divided unless there will be after the division at least four cubits for each of the parties. A field should not be divided unless there will be nine kabs space for each. Arjuna says unless there will be nine half kabs space for each. A vegetable garden should not be divided unless there will be half a cab for each. Our Akiba, however, says a quarter cab space. A holly drawing room, a dukkah, a garment, a bathhouse, an olive. Press and an irrigated plot of land should not be divided unless sufficient will be left for each party. The general principle is that if after the division each part will retain the designation applied to the whole, the division may be made, but if not, it should not be made. When is this the rule when one or other of the owners is not willing to divide? But if both agree, they can divide even if less than these quantities will be left. Sacred writings, however, may not be divided even if both agree. Gemara RC said in the name of our Yohan and the four cubits of the
Doing your abbey answered what it means is this he takes eight cubits in the length of the courtyard and four in the width of the courtyard. Amimar said a pit for holding date stones carries with it four cubits on every side. This is the case, however, only if he has no special door from which he goes to it. But if he has a special door for reaching it, Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabi, it carries with it only four cubits in front of his door. Arhuna said an exeter does not carry with it four cubits for. Why are the four cubits ordinarily allowed to provide space for the owner to unload his animals? If there is an exeter, he can go into it and unload. There are she's raised an objection to this from the following gates of exeters equally with gates of houses carry with them four cubits that was taught in reference to the exeter of a schoolhouse that the gate of the exeter of a schoolhouse carries with it four cubits is obvious, is it not? Since it is a proper room, we should say therefore that. It was taught in reference to a Roman exeter or rabbis taught a lodge in exeter and a balcony carry with them four cubits. If there are five rooms opening onto the balcony, they carry with them only four cubits between them. Or Yohanan inquired of Arjane whether a hankoop carried with it four cubits or not. He replied, Why are the four cubits ordinarily allowed to provide room for a man to unload his animal? Here the fowls can clamber up the wall to get out and clamber down the wall to get in. Rabba inquired of Arnaman if a room is half roofed over and half unroofed, has it four cubits or not? He replied, It has not four cubits. If the roofing is over the inner part, this goes without saying, since it is possible for him to go into the room and unload, but even if the roofing is over the outer part, it is still possible for him to go right through and unload under the open part. Arhuna inquired of Rmi if a man residing in one alleyway desires to open a door onto another alleyway can. The residents of this alleyway prevent him or not, he replied, they can prevent him. He then inquired, Are troops billeted per capita or on each one according to the number of his doors? He replied, Per capita, it has been taught to the same effect. The dung in the courtyard is divided according to doors belonging to each resident. Billeted troops per capita are not said if one of the residents of an alleyway desires to fence in the space facing his door, the others can prevent him on the ground. That he forces more people into their space, an objection was brought against this from the following. If five adjoining courtyards open on an alleyway, all the inner ones share with the outside one the use of the part facing it, but the outside one can use that part only. The remainder of the inner three share with the second, but the second has the use only of the part facing itself, and the outside one, thus the innermost one, has sole use of the part facing itself and shares with all the Others the use of the part facing them there is a difference on this point between Tanaim as it has been taught if one of the residents of an alleyway desires to open a door onto another alleyway the residents of that alleyway can prevent him if however he only desires to reopen their one which had been closed they cannot prevent him this is the opinion of Rabbi Arsimian B. Gamaliel says if there are five adjoining courtyards opening onto an alleyway they all share the use of it alike. How does courtyards come in here there is a lacuna in the text and it should run as follows they cannot prevent him and similarly if there are five courtyards opening onto an alleyway all share with the outside one but the outside one can use that part only etc this is the opinion of Rabbi Arsimian B. Gamaliel however says that if five courtyards open onto an alleyway they all share the use of it the master has stated if he desires to reopen a door which has been closed the residents of the other courtyard cannot prevent him. Rabbi said this rule was meant to apply only if he had not taken down the post of the closed door, but if he had done so, then the residents of the courtyard can prevent him reopening it. Abbe said to Rabbi, it has been taught in support of your opinion, Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra, a room that is shut up carries with it four cubits in the courtyard, but if the posts of the door have been taken down, it does not carry with it four cubits. If a room is shut up, it does not render unclean all the space around it, but if the posts have been taken down, it does render unclean all the space around it to a distance of four cubits. Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Aryohanan, if the people of a town desire to close alleyways which afford a through way to another town, the inhabitants of the other town can prevent them. Not only is this the case, if there is no other way, but even if there is another way, they can prevent them on the ground of the rule laid down. By Rab Judah in the name of Rab that a field path to which the public have established a right of way must not be damaged. Arain and said in the name of Samuel if the residents of alleyways which open out onto the public thoroughfare desire to set up doors at the entrance the public who use the thoroughfares can prevent them. It was thought that this right extended only to a distance of four cubits from the public thoroughfare in accordance with what Arzara said in the name of Arnaman that the four cubits in the alleyway joining the public thoroughfare are on the same footing as the public thoroughfare. This however is not the case for Arnaman's rule applies only to the matter of uncleanness but here in the case of the doors it does not apply because sometimes people from the street are pushed in by the crowd a good distance a field should not be divided unless there will be nine kbs space to each there is no difference between this authority and Arjuda who said nine half. Cabs each was speaking for his own district. What is the rule in Babylon? Our Joseph said there must be a day's plowing for each. What is meant by a day's plowing? If a day's plowing in seed time that is not a two full day's plowing in plow time, and if a day's plowing in plow time that is not a full day's plowing in seed time, if you like, I can say that a day's plowing in plow time is meant, and in seed time it takes a full day where one plows twice, or if you like, I can say that a day's plowing in seed time is meant, and in plow time two full days are needed where the ground is difficult. If a trench is divided, Arnaman said enough must be left for each party to provide a day's work in watering the field. If a vineyard, the father of Samuel said that three cabs space must be left to each, it has been taught to the same effect. If a man says to another, I sell you a portion in a vineyard, Simica said he must not sell him less than three cabs space, Jose. However, said that this is sheer imagination. What is the rule in Babylon? Rabbi Bikis has said three rows each with twelve vines enough for a man to hold round in one day. Are of Dimi from Haifa said since the day when the temple was destroyed, prophecy has been taken from the prophets and given to the wise. Is that a wise man not also a prophet? What he meant was this: although it has been taken from the prophets, it has not been taken from the wise. Amimar said a wise man is even superior to a prophet. Is it? Says and a prophet has a heart of wisdom who is compared with whom is not the smaller compared with the greater. Abe said the proof that prophecy has not been taken from the wise is that a great man makes a statement and the same is then reported in the name of another great man. Said Rabbi, what is there strange in this? Perhaps both were born under one star. No, said Rabbi, the proof is this that a great man makes a statement and then the same is reported. Talmud, Mas Baba Bath, Rabbi, in the name of. Our Akibabi Joseph said Arashi what is there strange in this perhaps in this matter he was born under the same star no said Arashi the proof is that a great man makes a statement and then it is found that the same rule was a halacha communicated to Moses at Mount Sinai but perhaps the wise man was no better than a blind man groping his way through a window and does he not give reasons for his opinions or Yohanan said since the temple was destroyed prophecy has been taken from prophets and given to fools and children how given to fools the case of Marson of Arashi will illustrate he was one day standing in the matter of Mahuza when he heard a certain lunatic exclaim the man who is to be elected head of the academy in Matha Mahaja signs his name Tabiamai he said to himself who among the rabbis signs his name Tabiamai I do this seems to show that my lucky time has come so he quickly went to Matha Mahaja when he arrived he found that the rabbis had voted to appoint Araha of Dipping. As their head when they heard of his arrival they sent a couple of rabbis to him to consult him he detained them with him and they sent another couple of rabbis he detained these also and so it went on until the number reached ten when ten were assembled he began to discourse and expound the oral law and the scriptures having waited so long because a public discourse on them should not be commenced if the audience is less than ten or aha applied to himself the saying if a man is in disfavour with heaven he does not readily come into favour and if a man is in favour he does not readily fall into disfavour how has prophecy been given to children a case in point is that of the daughter of Arhista she was sitting on her father's lap and in front of him were sitting Rabbah and Rami Bihama he said to her which of them would you like she replied both whereupon Rabbah said and let me be the second Arab Dimi from Haifa said before a man eats and drinks he has two hearts but after he Eats and drinks he has only one heart as it says a hollow nabob man is two hearted the word nabob occurring
Joseph strongly objected to this on the ground that sometimes one channel may continue running while the other dries up. The law follows our Joseph. If, however, there are two fields adjoining one channel, our Joseph says that in such a case we do compel a man not to act after the manner of Sodom. Abbe objected to this strongly on the ground that the one who has two fields in the middle can say, I want you to have more metayas. The law, however, follows our Joseph. The increase in the number of metayas is not a matter of consequence. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra. If there is a channel on one side and a river on the other, the field is to be divided diagonally, a hall, etc. If they are not large enough to leave sufficient space for both after division, what is the ruling? Rab Judah says one partner has the right to say to the other, You name a price for my share or let me name a price for your share. Our says he has not the right to say, You name a price or let me name a price. Said Rabbi Tuar. Naman on your view that one has not the right to say to the other you name a price or let me name a price how are a firstborn and another son to manage to whom their father has left a slave and an unclean animal he replied what I say is that they work for the one one day and the other two days an objection was brought against the opinion of Rab Judah from the following if one is half a slave and half free he works for his master one day and for himself one day alternately this is the opinion of Beth Hillel Beth Sham I say you have made matters right for his master but not for him to marry a bunt woman he is not permitted to marry a free woman he is not permitted shall he then remain unmarried and has not the world been created only for propagation as it is written he created it not a waste he formed it to be inhabited no what we do is to compel his master to consent to emancipate him and we give him a bond for half his value Beth Hillel hearing this retracted their opinion and adopted the ruling of Beth Shammai. This is not quite a case in point because while the slave can say I will name a price, he cannot at any time say to the master you name a price. Come and here if there are two brothers, one rich and one poor to whom their father leaves a bath and an olive press. If he made them for renting, then the brothers share the rental. But if he made them for his own use, then the rich brother can say to the poor one Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B take slaves and let them wash you down in the bath, take olives and make oil from them in the press. There too the poor brother can say to the other you name a price, but he cannot say I will name a price. Come and here anything which if divided will still retain the same name is to be divided and if not a money value has to be entered for IT. There is a difference on this point between Tanaim as it has been taught if a man says to his partner you take the prescribed minimum in the courtyard and I will take less his. Suggestion is adopted. Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel says that his suggestion is not adopted. What are the circumstances if we take the statement as it stands? What is the reason of Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel? Therefore, we must suppose that there is a lacuna and it should run thus. If one says you take the standard space and I will take less, his suggestion is adopted. If he says you name a price or I will name a price, his suggestion is also adopted. And in regard to this, Rabbin Simeon remarks that his suggestion is not adopted. This, however, is not so. The statement is to be taken as it stands. And as to your question, what reason can Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel have? It is because he can say to him, the one who offers to take less, if you want me to pay for the extra, I have no money. And if you want to make me a present, I prefer not, since it is written, he that hate gifts shall lie. Abbe said to our Joseph, this opinion of Rab Judah really comes from Samuel, as we have learned scrolls of the scripture. May not be divided even if both agree and on the Samuel remark this rule was only meant to apply if the whole is in one scroll but if it is in two scrolls they may divide now if you maintain that a man has no right to say you name a price or I will name a price why should the rule apply only to one scroll why not to two scrolls also our shall man explained that Samuel referred to the case where both consent to Mimar said the law is that a partner has the right to say you name a price or let me name a price said our Ashi to Mimar what do you make of the statement of our nominee replied I don't know of it meaning I don't hold with it how could he say the scene that Rabba Bihinna and Ardini Bihinna were left by their father two bond women one of whom knew how to bake and cook and the other to spin and weave and they came before Rabba and he said to them a partner has no right to say you name a price or let me name a price the case is different there because each of them wanted both the women so when one said you take one and I will take one this was not the same as you name a price or let me name a price but what of a copy of the scriptures in two scrolls where both are required and yet Samuel said the rule that they must not be divided applies only where there is one scroll but if there are two they may be divided this has been explained by our shall man to refer to the case where both consent our rabbis taught it is permissible to fasten the Torah of the prophets and the hagiographer together this is the opinion of our Meir our Judah however says that the Torah of the prophets and the hagiographer should each be in a separate scroll while the sages say that each book should be separate Rab Judah said it is related that Boethus B. Zonin had the eight prophets fastened together at the suggestion of our Eliezer B. Ezra. others however report that he had them each one separate Rabbi said on one occasion a copy of the Torah of the prophets and the hagiographer all bound up Together was brought before us and we declared them fit and proper between each book of the Torah there should be left a space of four lines and so between one prophet and the next in the twelve minor prophets however the space should only be three lines if however the scribe finishes one book at the bottom of a column he should commence the next at the top of the next our rabbis taught if a man desires to fasten the Torah of the prophets and the hagiographer together he may do so at the beginning he should leave an empty space sufficient for winding round the cylinder and at the end an empty space sufficient for winding round the whole circumference of the scroll if he finishes a section at the bottom of one column he commences the next at the top of the next Talmud, Mas Baba Bathre, and if he wants to divide he may do so what is the meaning of these last words what it means is because if he wants to divide he may do so a contradiction was pointed out between this Rule and the following at the beginning of the book and the end there must be sufficient empty space to roll round to roll round what if to roll round the cylinder this contradicts what was said about the circumference if to roll round the circumference this contradicts what was said about the cylinder our nom and B. Isaac answered the statement applies in both ways our Ashi however replied that the statement refers only to a scroll of the law as it has been taught other books are rolled up from the beginning to the end but the scroll of the law closes at its middle there being a cylinder at each end our Eliezer son of Arzadik said this is how the scribes in Jerusalem used to make their scrolls our rabbis taught a scroll of the law should be such that its length does not exceed its circumference nor its circumference its length rabbi was asked what should be the size of a scroll of the law he replied with thick parchment six hand breadths with thin parchment I do not know our Seventy scrolls of the law and hit the exact measurement with only one Arahab. Jacob wrote one on calf skin and hit it exactly. The rabbis looked at him enviously and he died. The rabbi said to Arham and Aram I wrote four hundred scrolls of the law. He said to them, Perhaps he copied out the verse Moses commanded us. Alorabah similarly said to our Zerah Arjani planted four hundred vineyards and he answered, Perhaps each consisted of two and two vines facing and one as a tail. An objection was brought against the statement regarding the size of a scroll from the following. The ark which Moses made was two cubits and a half in length, a cubit and a half in breadth, and a cubit and a half in height. The cubit being six hand breadths, the tablets were six hand breadths in length, six in breadth, and three in thickness. They were placed lengthwise in the ark. Now, how much of the length of the ark was taken up by the tablets? Twelve hand breadths, three therefore were left. Take away one hand breadth. They Half for each side of the ark, and there were left two handbreadths, and in these the scroll of the law was deposited. That a scroll was in the ark, we know because it says there was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there. Now in the words nothing and save we have a limitation following a limitation, and the purpose of a limitation following a limitation is to intimate the presence of something which is not mentioned in this case. The scroll of the law which was deposited in the ark, you have accounted for the length of the ark. Now account for its breadth. How much of the breadth of the ark do the tables take up? Six handbreadths. Three therefore are left. Take away one half for the thickness of each side, and two are left so as to allow the scroll to be put in and taken out without squeezing. This is the opinion of our Meir. Our Judah says that the cubit of the ark had only five handbreadths. The tables were six handbreadths in length, six in breadth, and three. In thickness and were deposited lengthwise in the ark. How much did they take up of the ark? Twelve handbreadths. There was thus left half a handbreadth. The finger's breadth for each side. You have accounted for the length of the ark.
In the middle the space between the two cylinders must have been over and above the two hand breadths. How did this get into the two hand breadths? The scroll read in the temple cord was rolled round one cylinder even so how could two hand breadths get into exactly two? Arashi replied the scroll was rolled together up to a certain point and placed in the ark and then the remainder was rolled up on top. If we accept our Judas theory where was the scroll placed before the coffer came alleged? Projected from the ark and on this the scroll was placed. What does Armadier make of the words at the side of the ark? This is to indicate that the scroll is to be placed at the side of the tables and not between them. But even so, it was in the ark only at the side. According to Armadier, where were the silver sticks placed outside? And whence does Armadier learn that the fragments of the first tables were deposited in the ark from the same source as Arhuna who said, What is the meaning of the verse? Which is called by the name, even the name of the Lord of hosts that sitteth upon the cherubim. The repetition of the word name teaches that the tables and the fragments of the tables were deposited in the ark. And what does Arjuna make of these words? He requires them for the lesson enunciated by Arjuna who said, In the name of Arsimian Bio, this teaches us that the name of four letters and all the subsidiary names of God were deposited in the ark. And does not Armadier also require the Verse for this lesson certainly he does whence then does he learn that the fragments of the first tables were deposited in the ark he learns it from the exposition reported also by our Joseph for our Joseph learned which thou breakest and thou shalt put them the juxtaposition of these words teaches us that both the tablets and the fragments of the tablets were deposited in the ark and what does our Judah make of this verse he requires it for the lesson enunciated by Resh Lakish who said which thou breakest God said to Moses thou hast done well to break our rabbis taught the order of the prophets is Joshua judges Samuel kings Jeremiah Ezekiel Isaiah and the twelve minor prophets let us examine this Hosea came first as it is written God spake first to Hosea but did God speak first to Hosea were there not many prophets between Moses and Hosea are Yohanan however has explained that what it means is that he was the first of the four prophets who prophesied at that period namely Hosea Isaiah Amos and Micah should not then Hosea come first since his prophecy is written along with those of Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi and Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi came at the end of the prophecy is reckoned with them but why should he not be written separately and placed first since his book is so small it might be lost if copied separately let us see again Isaiah was prior to Jeremiah and Ezekiel then why should not Isaiah be placed first because the book of Kings ends with a record of destruction and Jeremiah speaks throughout of destruction and Ezekiel commences with destruction and ends with consolation and Isaiah is full of consolation therefore we put destruction next to destruction and consolation next to consolation the order of the Hagiographer is Ruth the book of Psalms Job Prophets Ecclesiastes Song of Songs Lamentations Daniel and the scroll of Esther Ezra and Chronicles now on the view that Job lived in the days of Moses should not the book of Job come First we do not begin with the record of suffering but Ruth also is a record of suffering it is a suffering with a sequel of happiness as Arjohanan said why was her name called Ruth because there issued from her David who replenished the Holy One blessed be he with hymns and praises who wrote the scriptures Moses wrote his own book and the portion of Balaam and Job Joshua wrote the book which bears his name and the last eight verses of the Pentateuch Samuel wrote the book which bears his name and the book of Judges and Ruth David wrote the book of Psalms including in it the work of the elders namely Adam Belshized Abraham Moses Heman Yedath and Azaf Talmud Mos Baba Bathre and the three sons of Korah Jeremiah wrote the book which bears his name the book of Kings and Lamentations Hezekiah and his colleagues wrote Nemonic YMSHK Isaiah Proverbs the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes the men of the great assembly wrote Nemonic and DG Ezekiel the twelve minor prophets Daniel and it. Scroll of Esther Ezra wrote the book that bears his name and the genealogies of the book of Chronicles up to his own time. This confirms the opinion of Rab since Rab Judah has said in the name of Rab Ezra did not leave Babylon to go up to Eretz Israel until he had written his own genealogy who then finished it. The book of Chronicles Nehemiah the son of Hashalia the master has said Joshua wrote the book which bears his name and the last eight verses of the Pentateuch. The statement is in agreement with the authority who says that eight verses in the Torah were written by Joshua as it has been taught it is written so Moses the servant of the Lord died there. Now is it possible that Moses being dead could have written the words Moses died there? The truth is however that up to this point Moses wrote from this point Joshua wrote this is the opinion of our Judah or according to others of our Nehemiah said our Simeon to him can we imagine the scroll of the law being short of one word? And is it not written take this book of the law? No, what we must say is that up to this point the Holy One blessed be he dictated and Moses repeated and wrote and from this point God dictated and Moses wrote with tears as it says of another occasion and Barak answered them he pronounced all these words to me with his mouth and I wrote them with ink in the book which of these two authorities is followed in the rule laid down by our Joshua B. Abba which he said in the name of Argidal who said it. In the name of Rab the last eight verses of the Torah must be read in the synagogue service by one person alone it follows our Judah and not our Simeon I may even say however that it follows our Simeon who would say that since they differ from the rest of the Torah in one way they differ in another you say that Joshua wrote his book but is it not written and Joshua son of Nun the servant of the Lord died it was completed by Eliezer but it is also written in it and Eliezer the son of Aaron. Died Phineas finished it you say that Samuel wrote the book that bears his name but is it not written in it now Samuel was dead it was completed by Gad the seer and Nathan the prophet you say that David wrote the Psalms including work of the ten elders why is not Ethan the Ezraite also reckoned with Ethan the Ezraite is Abraham the proof is that it is written in the Psalms Ethan the Ezraite and it is written elsewhere who hath raised up righteousness from the east the passage above reckons both Moses and Heman but has not Rab said that Moses is Heman the proof being that the name Heman is found here in the Psalms and it is written elsewhere of Moses in all my house he is faithful there were two Hemans you say that Moses wrote his book in the section of Balaam and Job this supports the opinion of our Joshua B. Levi Bilama who said that Job was contemporary with Moses the proof is that it is written here in connection with Job oh, that my words were now evo. Written and it is written elsewhere in connection with Moses for wherein now Epho shall it be known but on that ground I might say that he was contemporary with Isaac in connection with whom it is written who now Epho is he that took venison or I might say that he was contemporary with Jacob in connection with whom it is written if so now Epho do this or with Joseph in connection with whom it is written where Epho they are pastoring this cannot be maintained the proof that Job was contemporary with Moses is that it is written in continuation of the above words of Job would that they were inscribed in the book and it is Moses who is called inscriber as it is written and he chose the first part for himself for there was a lawgiver's mihok eglit inscriber's portion reserved Rabbah said that Job was in the time of the spies the proof is that it is written here in connection with Job there was a man in the land of us Job was his name and it is written elsewhere in Connection with the spies, whether there be what easy there and where is the parallel in one place it is as in the other easy. What Moses said to Israel was the sea if that man is there whose years are as the years of a tree and who shelters his generation like a tree. A certain rabbi was sitting before our Samuel B. Namani and in the course of his expositions remarked, Job never was and never existed, but is only a typical figure. He replied to confute such as you. The text says there was a man in the land of us. Job was his name, but he retorted, If that is so, what of the verse the poor man had nothing save one poor lamb which he had bought and nourished up, etc. Is that anything but a parable? So this too is a parable. If so, said the other, why are his name and the name of his town mentioned? Are Yohanan and our Eliezer both stated that Job was among those who returned from the Babylonian exile and that his house of study was in Tiberias? An objection to this view was raised from the following. The span of Job's life was from the time that Israel entered Egypt till they left the Talmud, Mos Baba Bathra B. Say as long as from the time they entered Egypt till they left it. An objection was further raised from the following seven prophets prophesied to the heathen, namely Balaam and his father Job, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhites, Afar the Namathite, and Elihu the son of Barachel the Buzid. He replied, Granted, as you say that Job was one of these, was not Elihu the son of Barachel from Israel, seeing that the scripture mentions that he was from the family of 
Sopra fair damsel in the case of David the search was only in all the border of Israel in the case of Ahas whereas in all the land are Nathan says that Job was in the time of the kingdom of Sheba since it says the Sabaeans fell on them and took them away the sages say that he was in the time of the Chaldeans as it says the Chaldeans made three bands some say that Job lived in the time of Jacob and married Dinah the daughter of Jacob the proof is that it is written here in the book of Job thou speakest as one of the impious women Nebelet speak and it is written in another place in connection with Dinah because he had wrought folly Nebelet at Israel all these ten agree that Job was from Israel except those who say that he lived in the days of Jacob this must be so for if you suppose that they regarded him as a heathen the question would arise after the death of Moses how could the divine presence rest upon a heathen seeing that a master has said Moses Pray that the divine presence should not rest on heathens and God granted his request as it says that we be separated I and that people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth are Yohanan said the generation of Job was given up to lewdness the proof is that it says here in the book of Job behold all of you have seen Hazard of it why then are ye become altogether vain and it is written elsewhere return return O Shulim return return that we may look upon me as Eddie but may not the reference be to prophecy as in the words of vision Hazan of Isaiah son of Moses if so why does it say why are ye become altogether vain are Yohanan further said what is the import of the words and it came to pass in the days of the judging of the judges it was a generation which judged its judges if the judge said to a man take the splinter from between your teeth he would retort take the beam from between your eyes if the judge said your silver is dross he would retort your liquor is mixed with water our Samuel be Namani said in the name of our Jonathan whoever says that the Makath queen of Sheba was a woman is in error the word Makath here means the kingdom of Sheba now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them and the Lord said unto Satan whence comest thou and Satan answered etc he addressed the Holy One blessed be he the sovereign of the universe I have traversed the whole world and found none so faithful as thy servant Abraham for thou didst say to him arise walk through the land to the length and the breadth of it for to thee I will give it and even so when he was unable to find any place in which to bury Sarah until he bought one for four hundred shekels of silver he did not complain against thy ways then the Lord said to Satan hast thou considered my servant Job for there is none like him in the earth etc said are you had and greater praise is accorded to Job than to Abraham for of Abraham it is written for now I know that thou fearest God whereas of Job it is written that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil what is the meaning of eschewed evil our Abba B. Samuel said Job was liberal with his money ordinarily if a man owes half a prata to a workman he spends it in a shop but Job used to make a present of it to the workman and then Satan answered the Lord and said doth Job fear God for not hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house etc what is the meaning of the words thou hast blessed the work of his hands our Samuel B. R. Isaac said whoever took a prata from Job had luck with it what is implied by the words his cattle is increased in the land our Jose B. Hanan said the cattle of Job broke through the general rule normally wolves kill goats but in the cattle of Job the goats kill the wolves but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will renounce thee to thy face and the Lord said unto Satan behold all that he hath is in thy power only upon himself put not forth thine hand etc and it fell on a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house that there came a messenger unto Job and said the oxen were plowing etc what is meant by the words the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them are Yohanan said this indicates that the Holy One blessed be he gave to Job a taste of the Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra a future world while he was yet speaking there came also another and said the fire of God while he was yet speaking there came also another and said the Chaldeans made three bands and fell upon the camels and have taken them away while he was yet speaking there came also another and said thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house and behold there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men then. Job rose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and he said naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the Lord in all this job sinned not nor charged God with foolishness again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves and the Lord said unto Satan from whence comest thou and Satan answered the Lord and said from going to and fro in the earth etc he said sovereign of it universe I have traversed the whole earth and have not found one like thy servant Abraham for thou didst say to him arise walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it for to thee I will give it and when he wanted to bury Sarah he could not find a place in which to bury her and yet he did not complain against thy ways then the Lord said unto Satan hast thou considered my servant Job for there is none like him in the earth and he still holdeth fast his integrity although Thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause said Aryohan and were it not expressly stated in the scripture we would not dare to say it God is made to appear like a man who allows himself to be persuaded against his better judgment Atan taught Satan comes down to earth and seduces and ascends to heaven and awakens wrath permission is granted to him and he takes away the soul and Satan answered the Lord and said skin for skin all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will renounce thee to thy face and the Lord said unto Satan behold he is in thine hand only spare his life so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job etc. Our Isaac said Satan's torment was worse than that of Job he was like a servant who is told by his master break the cask but do not let any of the wine spill rush like said Satan the evil prompter and the angel of death are all one he is called Satan as it is written and Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord he is called the evil prompter we know this because it is written in another place every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it is written here in connection with Satan only upon himself put not forth thine hand the same is also the angel of death since it says only spare his life which shows that Job's life belonged to him early by said both Satan and Peninnah had a pious purpose in acting. As adversary Satan when he saw God inclined to favor Job said far be it that God should forget the love of Abraham of Peninnah it is written and her rival provoked her sore for to make her fret when our Ahabi Jacob gave this exposition in Papunia Satan came and kissed his feet and all this did not Job sin with his lips Rabbah said with his lips he did not sin but he did sin within his heart what did he say the earth is given into the hand of the wicked he covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If it be not so where and who is he Rabbah said Job sought to turn the dish upside down Abay said Job was referring only to the Satan the same difference of opinion is found between Tanaim the earth is given into the hand of the wicked our Eliezer said Job sought to turn the dish upside down our Joshua said to him Job was only referring to the Satan although thou knowest that I am not wicked and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand Rabbah said Job sought to exculpate the whole world he said sovereign of the universe thou hast created the ox with cloven hoofs and thou hast created the ass with whole hoofs thou hast created paradise and thou hast created Gehenim thou hast created righteous men and thou hast created wicked men and who can prevent thee his companions answered him yet thou doest away with fear and restrainest devotion before God if God created the evil inclination he also created the Torah as its antidote Rabbah expounded what is meant by the verse the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy the blessing of him that lost came upon me this shows that Job used to rob orphans of a field and improve it and then restore it to them and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy if ever there was a widow who could not find a husband he used to associate his name with her and then someone would soon come and marry her oh that my vexation were but wait and my calamity laid all the balances together. Rab said dust should be put in the mouth of Job because he makes himself the colleague of heaven would there were an umpire between us that he might lay his hand upon us both Rab said dust should be placed in the mouth of Job is there a servant who argues with his master I made a covenant with thine eyes how then should I look upon a maid Rab said dust should be placed in the mouth of Job he refrained from looking at other men's wives Abraham did not even look at his own as it is written behold. Now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon which shows that up to then he did not know as the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away so he that goeth down to Sheol shall
The word TEL channel here means a mold rabbi Bishila replied because it is written and he made a trench TEL as great as would contain two measures of seed or away for the lightning of the thunder many thunderclaps have I created in the clouds and for each clap a separate path so that two claps should not travel by the same path since if two claps traveled by the same path they would devastate the world I do not confuse one thunderclap with another and shall I confuse Eve with Oh yet knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve this wild goat is heartless towards her young when she crouches for Talmud, Moss Baba Bathra be delivery she goes up to the top of a mountain so that the young shall fall down and be killed and I prepare an eagle to catch it in his wings and set it before her and if he were one second too soon or too late it would be killed I do not confuse one moment with another and shall I confuse. Eve with Oyed or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve this hind has a narrow womb when she crouches for delivery I prepare a serpent which bites her at the opening of the womb and she is delivered of her offspring and were it one second too soon or too late she would die I do not confuse one moment with another and shall I confuse Eve with Oyed job speak without knowledge and his words are without wisdom Rabbah said this teaches that a man is not held responsible for what he says when in Distress now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil which was come upon him they came everyone from his own place Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zafar the Namathite and they made an appointment together to come to bemoan him and to comfort him what is the meaning of they made an appointment together Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbit teaches that they all entered the town together through one gate although as it has been taught each one lived three hundred parts hands away from the other how did they know of Job's trouble some say that they had crowns and some say that they had had certain trees the distortion or withering of which was assigned to them Rabbah said this bears out the popular saying either a friend like the friends of Job or death and it came to pass when men began to multiply Lorab on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them Yohan and says the word Lorab indicates that increase Rebu came into the world Resh. Lakish says it indicates that strife Mary became into the world said Rush Lakish to Aryohan and on your view that it means that increase came into the world why was not the number of Job's daughters doubled he replied though they were not doubled in number they were doubled in beauty as it says he also had seven sons and three daughters and he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Kezia and the name of the third Karen Hapach Jemima because she was like the day. Young Kezia because he emitted a fragrance like Kashi Kezia Karen Hapach because so it was explained in the academy of Arshila she had a complexion like the horn of a Kirsh this explanation was laughed at in the west where it was pointed out that a complexion like the horn of a Kirsh would be a blemish but what it should be said are his is like garden crocus of the best kind the word put means pigment as it is said though thou enlargest thine eyes with paint put the daughter. Was born to Arsimian the son of Rabbi, and he felt disappointed. His father said to him, Increase has come to the world. Barkapur said to him, Your father has given you an empty consolation. The world cannot do without either males or females. Yet happy is he whose children are males, and alas for him whose children are females. The world cannot do without either a spice seller or a tanner. Yet happy is he whose occupation is that of a spice seller, and alas for him whose occupation is that of a tanner. On this point, there is a difference between Tanaim. It is written, The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Beagol, what is meant by in all things, Armagir said in the fact that he had no daughter. Arjuna said in the fact that he had a daughter. Others say that Abraham had a daughter whose name was Beagol. Our Elizer the Modiat said that Abraham possessed the power of reading the stars for which he was much sought after by the potentates of East and West. Arsimian Biohi said Abraham had a Precious stone hung round his neck which brought immediate healing to any sick person who looked on it and when Abraham our father departed from this world the Holy One blessed be he suspended it from the orb of the sun Abbe said this bears out the popular saying as the day advances the illness lightens another explanation is that Esau did not break loose so long as he was alive another explanation is that Ishmael repented while he was still alive how do we know that Esau did not break loose while he was alive because it says and Esau came in from the field and he was faint it has been taught in connection with this that that was the day on which Abraham our father died and Jacob our father made a broth of lentils to comfort his father Isaac why was it of lentils in the west they say in the name of Rabbi Mari just as the lentil has no mouth so the mourner has no mouth for speech others say just as the lentil is round so mourning comes round to all the denizens of this world what difference does it make in practice which of the two explanations we adopt the difference arises on the question whether we should comfort with eggs or Yohanan said that wicked Esau committed five sins on that day he disanured a betrothed maiden he committed a murder he denied God he denied the resurrection of the dead and he spurned the birthright we know that he disanured a betrothed maiden because it is written here and Esau came in from the field and it is written in another place in connection with the betrothed maiden he found her in the field we know that he committed murder because it is written here that he was faint and it is written in another place woe is me now for my soul faint ate before the murderers we know that he denied God because it is written here what benefit is this to me and it is written in another place this is my God and I will make him an habitation we know that he denied the resurrection of the dead because he said behold I am on the way to die also that he spurned the birthright because it is written so Esau despised his birthright and whence do we know that Ishmael repented while Abraham was still alive from the discussion which took place between Rabbah and Arham Abibuza when they were once sitting before Rabbah while he was dozing said Rabbah to Arham Abibuza do your people really maintain that wherever the term giving up the ghost to God is used in connection with the death of any person it implies that that person died righteous that is so he replied but what then of the generation of the flood he asked we only make this inference he replied if both giving up the ghost and gathering in are mentioned but he rejoined what of Ishmael who is said both to have given up the ghost and been gathered in at this point Rabbah woke and heard them children he said this is what our Yohanan has said Ishmael repented in the lifetime of his father we know this because it says and Isaac and Ishmael his sons buried. Him, but perhaps the text arranges them in the order of their wisdom if that were so then why in the verse and Esau and Jacob his sons buried him are they not arranged in the order of their wisdom what we have to say is that the fact of the text placing Isaac first shows that Ishmael made way for him and from the fact that he made way for him we infer that he repented in Abraham's lifetime our rabbis taught there were three to whom the holy one blessed be he gave a foretaste Talmud, Mas Baba, Batra of the future world while they were still in this world to Abraham Isaac and Jacob Abraham we know because it is written of him the Lord blessed Abraham and all Isaac because it is written and I ate of all Jacob because it is written for I have all three there were over whom the evil inclination had no dominion to Abraham Isaac and Jacob as we know because it is written in connection with them in all of all also include also David of whom it is written my heart is Wounded within me and the other authority he understands him to be referring here to his distress our rabbis taught six there were over whom the angel of death had no dominion namely Abraham Isaac and Jacob Moses Aaron and Miriam Abraham Isaac and Jacob we know because it is written in connection with them in all of all, all Moses Aaron and Miriam because it is written in connection with them that they died by the mouth of the Lord but the words by the month of the Lord are not used in connection with the death of Miriam our Eliezer said Miriam also died by a kiss as we learn from the use of the word there in connection both with her death and with that of Moses and why is it not said of her that she died by the month of the Lord because such an expression would be disrespectful our rabbis taught there were seven over whom the worms had no dominion namely Abraham Isaac and Jacob Moses Aaron and Miriam and Benjamin son of Jacob Abraham Isaac and Jacob we know because it is written of them in all of all, all Moses Aaron and Miriam because it is written in connection with them by the mouth of the Lord Benjamin son of Jacob because it is written in connection with him and to Benjamin he said the beloved of the Lord he shall dwell thereon in safety some say that David also is included since it is written of him my flesh also shall dwell in the grave in safety the other however explains this to mean that he is praying for mercy our rabbis taught for died through the counsel of the serpent namely Benjamin son of Jacob Rome the father of Moses Jesse the father of David and Kilab the son of David we know this only from tradition in regard to all of them save Jesse the father of David in regard to whom it is stated distinctly in the scripture as it is written and Absalom set Amasa over the
has a practical bearing on cases of sale as it was taught if a man says to another I will sell you a pit and its walls the wall must be not less than three hand breadths. it has been stated if a man desires to dig a pit close up to the boundary between his field and his neighbor's abbey says he may do so and Rabbah says he may not do so now in a field where pits would naturally be dug both agree that he may not dig close up where they differ is in the case of a field where pits would not naturally be dug Abbe says he may dig because it is not naturally a field for digging pits and therefore his neighbor is not likely to want to dig one on the other side while Rabbah says he may not dig because his neighbor can say to him just as you have altered your mind and want to dig so I may alter my mind and want to dig others report this argument as follows in the case of a field where pits would not naturally be dug both Abbe and Rabbah agree that he may dig close up to the Boundary where they differ is in the case of a field where pits would naturally be dug. Abbe says that in such a field the owner may dig and would be allowed to dig even by the rabbis who lay down that a tree must not be planted within 25 cubits of a pit for the only rule is because at the time of planting the pit already exists but here when the man comes to dig the pit there is no pit on the other side. Rabbi on the other hand says that he may not dig and would not be allowed to dig. Even by our Jose who laid down that in all circumstances the one owner can plant within his property and the other dig within his for he only rules thus because at the time when the former plants there are as yet no roots which could damage the pit but in this case the owner of the other field can say to the man who wants to dig the pit every stroke with the spade which you make injures my ground we learned a man should not dig a pit close to the pit of his neighbor from this it appears that the reason why he must not dig is because there is another pit in existence but if there is not then he may dig now this would be in order if we accept the version of the argument reported above according to which Abbe and Rabbah agree that in a field where pits would not naturally be dug the owner may dig close up to the boundary we may then interpret the mission to speak of a field where pits would not naturally be dug if however we accept the version according to which Abbe and Rabbah differ in regard to a field where pits would not naturally be dug then while the mission is in order according to the ruling of Abbe it presents a difficulty does it not according to that of Rabbah Rabbah could reply to you it has already been reported in this connection that Abbe or it may be Rab Judah said that the word wall in the mission means the wall of his pit others report this discussion as follows the mission says that a man should not dig a pit close to the pit of his neighbor and it has been reported in this connection that Abbe or it may be Rab Judah said that wall here must be explained to mean the wall side of his neighbor's pit now all will be in order if we accept the version of Abbe and Rab's argument according to which in a field where pits would naturally be dug both agree that he should not dig close to the boundary for in this case we explain the mission also to refer to a field where pits would naturally be dug if however we take the version according to which Abbe and Rab differ in regard to a field where pits would naturally be dug while the mission is in order according to the ruling of Rab it presents a difficulty does it not according to that of Abbe Abbe might reply that the mission speaks of the case where both owners want to dig at the same time come and here if the soil at the boundary is a crumbling rock and the one owner wants to dig a pit on his side and the other owner on his side the one keeps three and breaths away from the boundary and plasters the sides of his pit and the other does likewise crumbling rock is different but how could the questioner have raised the question at all the questioner thought that the same law would apply to ordinary soil but that it was necessary to specify the rule about crumbling rock as otherwise I might think that since it is crumbling i.e. soft rock and even greater space was required for it now the very that tells us that it is not so come and here a man should keep all of refuse dung talmud, moss baba bathra salt lime and flint stones at least three hand breaths from his neighbor's wall or plaster them over the reason is that there is a wall but if there is no wall he may bring these things close up to the boundary no even if there is no wall he still may not bring them close up what then does the mention of the wall here tell us it tells us that these things are injurious to a wall seeds plow furrows and urine should be kept three and breaths from the wall the reason is that there is a wall but if there is no wall he may bring these things close up to the boundary no even if there is no wall he may not bring them close up what then does the mention of the wall here tell us it tells us that most things are bad for a wall come and your millstones should be kept at a distance of three hand breaths reckoning from the upper stone which means four from the lower stone the reason is that there is a wall and if there is no wall he may bring them close up no even if there is no wall he may not bring them close up what then does this tell us it tells us that the shaking caused by turning the millstones is bad for the wall come and your oven should be kept away three hand breaths reckoning from the foot of the base which means four from the top of the base the reason is that there is a wall but if there is no wall he may bring it close up no even if there is no wall he may not bring it close up what then does this tell us that the heat from the oven is bad for the wall come and here a man may not open a bakery or a dyer's workshop under another person's storehouse nor make a cashier there the reason is that there is a storehouse there but if there is no storehouse he may may he not a place where persons can live is different this is indicated by the berry that taught in connection with this mission if the cashier was there before the granary he is permitted to keep it come and here a man should not plant a tree nearer than four cubits to his neighbor's field now it has been taught in reference to this that the four cubits here mentioned are to allow space for the work of the vineyard the reason then is that there should be space for the work of the vineyard but were it not for this he would be allowed to plant close up would he not although the tree has roots which can injure the other's field we are dealing here with the case where there is a piece of hard rock between this is further indicated by the fact that the passage goes on if there is a fence between each one can plant close up to the fence on his own side if that is so what do you make of the next clause if the roots of his tree spread into his neighbor's field he may cut them out to a depth of three hand breadth so that they should not impede the plow now if there is hard rock between how can the roots get there what the passage means is this if there is no hard rock between and the roots spread into his neighbor's field then he may cut them out to a depth of three hand breadth so as not to impede the plow come and here a tree in one man's field must be kept 25 cubits from a pit in another man's field the reason is that there is a pit if there is no pit he may plant close up no even if there is no pit he may not plant close up and the statement teaches us that up to 25 cubits the roots are liable to spread and injure the pit if that is so what do you make of the next clause if the tree was there already he is not required to cut it down now if he may not plant close up how can you apply the statement as our papa said in another connection in the case of a purchase so here in the case of a purchase come and here water in which flax is steeped must be kept at a distance from vegetables and leeks from onions and mustard from a beehive the reason is that there are vegetables there otherwise he may bring them close up to the boundary no even if there are no vegetables he may not bring them close up and what the statement teaches us is that these things are bad for one another if that is so what of the next clause our jose declares it permissible in the case of mustard and it has been taught in reference to this that the reason is because the sower can say to his neighbor just as you can tell me to remove my mustard from your bees i can tell you to remove your bees from my mustard because they come and eat the stalks of my mustard plants Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi now if a man is not allowed to bring these things close up to the boundary in what conditions could such a remark be made our Papa answered in the case of a purchaser but if we are speaking of a purchaser what reason have the rabbis for prohibiting also why does our Jose permit only in the case of the mustard why not the water and the leeks also rub and reply the rabbis hold that it is incumbent on the one who inflicts the damage to remove himself we may infer from this that in the opinion of our Jose it is incumbent on the one who suffers the damage to remove himself and if that is so then he should permit flax water to be placed close to vegetables the truth is that our Jose also holds that it is incumbent on the one who inflicts the damage to remove himself and he argued with the rabbis as follows I grant you are right in the case of the flax water and the vegetables because the former harms the latter but not vice versa but the case is different with these and mustard because both are harmful to one another what have the rabbis to say to this that these do no harm to mustard the grains they cannot find and if they eat the leaves they grow again but does our Jose in fact hold that it is incumbent on the one who inflicts the damage to remove himself have we not learned our Jose says even if the pit was there before the tree the tree need not be cut down because the one owner digs in his property and the other plants in his the truth is that our Jose holds it to be incumbent on the one who suffers the damage to remove himself and here he was arguing with the rabbis on their own premises thus in my view the
Gloss to this effect to the Mishnah itself unless he removes the edge of the soaking pool three handbreadths from the wall and plaster the sides. The question was raised is the proper reading of the Mishnah and plaster or, or plaster obviously and plaster is the proper reading for if the Mishnah meant to say or then the first two clauses could have been run into one but possibly or is after all the right reading and the reason why the two clauses are not combined is because they are not in the same category. The damage in one case arising from moisture and in the other from steam come and here our Judah says if there is crumbling rock between the two properties each owner can dig a pit on his own side and each must keep away from the boundary three handbreadths and plaster his pit. The reason is is it not that the soil between is crumbling but otherwise there is no need to plaster. No this is the rule even if the soil is not crumbling he still has to plaster the case of crumbling soil. However, is specified because otherwise I might have thought that with crumbling soil a greater distance still was required. Now he teaches us that this is not so. Olive refuse dung, salt, lime, and flint stones should be kept, etc. We have learned in another place in what materials may food be kept warm for the Sabbath, and in what may it not be kept warm. It may not be kept warm in olive refuse, or in dung, or in salt, or in lime, or in sand. Whether moist or dry, why is it that your flint stones are included in the list and not sand, and their sand is included and not flint stones? Are Joseph answered because it is not usual to keep food warm in flint stones? Set away to him, and is it usual to keep food warm in woolen fleeces and strips of purple wool? And yet these are mentioned in a very which says food may be kept warm in woolen fleeces and strips of purple wool and fluff, but these things must not be carried on Sabbath. No said away. The truth is that his neighbor telleth. Concerning him, the Mishnah here mentions flintstones, and the same rule applies to sand, and there it mentions sand, and the same rule applies to flintstones. Said Rabbah to him, if his neighbor telleth concerning him, should not the Mishnah mention the whole list in one place and only one item in the other, allowing us to understand that the same rule applies to the rest? No, said Rabbah. The reason why flintstones are not mentioned in connection with Sabbath is because they are liable to crack the pot. And the reason why sand is not mentioned here is because while it makes hot things hotter, it makes cold things colder. But our Oshia included sand in his Beritha in the list of things that have to be kept away from the boundary. He was speaking of things which produce moisture. Then why should our Tana also not include it on the ground of its producing moisture? He has mentioned specifically a ditch, yet in spite of mentioning a ditch, he also mentions a fuller's pool. Both of these required to. Be specified for if he had mentioned only a ditch I should have said that this was because it was a fixture but I should not have included a fuller's pool which is not a fixture and if he had mentioned a fuller's pool I should have said that this was because its waters are stagnant but I should not have included a ditch which has running water hence both were necessary seeds and plow furrows are kept away etc. Cannot seeds be inferred from plow furrow seeds can be dropped without. Plowing cannot plow furrows be inferred from seeds plowing can be done for trees cannot both be inferred from water the tana is speaking of Eretz Yisrael of which it is written it drink water of the rain of heaven our mission would imply that seeds Talmud, Moss Baba Bathra be spread their roots how is it then that we have learned if a man bends over the bow of a vine and plants it in the earth if there are not three hand breadths of earth over it he must not sow seed on it and to this. The gloss was added in a very but he may sow all round it. Our Haga answered in the name of our Jose. The reason here in the case of the wall is because the seeds break up the soil and bring up loose earth and not because they spread and urine must be removed. Three hand breadths, etc. Rabbi Barhana said it is permissible for a man to make water on the side of another man's wall as it is written and I will cut off from Ahab one that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and him that is left at large in Israel. But did we not learn urine must be kept three hand breadths from the wall? This refers to slop water come and here a man should not make water on the side of another man's wall but should keep three hand breadths away. This is the rule for a wall of brick but if the wall is of stone he need keep away only so far as not to do any damage. How much is this a hand breadth? If the wall is of hard stone it is permitted does not this confuse the dictum of Rabbi Barhana? Does but Rabbi Barhana based himself on the scripture the meaning of the verse is this even a creature whose way is to piss against the wall I will not leave him and what is this a dog our Toby be kissing said in the name of Samuel a thin wafer does not narrow a window space why a thin one the same can be said even of a thick one the rabbi gave an extreme instance it goes without saying in the case of a thick cake that since it is fit for food the owner does not mentally ignore its existence and therefore it does not narrow the window space but with a thin one since it soon becomes uneatable I might think that he does ignore its existence therefore our Toby tells us that even a thin cake does not narrow the window space cannot this be derived from the fact that a wafer is a thing which is capable of becoming ritually unclean and the rule is that anything which is capable of becoming ritually unclean cannot form a partition to prevent the passage of uncleanness we assume the wafer. In this case to have been needed with fruit juice an objection to the rule as stated above was raised if a basket full of straw or a jar full of dry figs is placed in a window space then we decide as follows if when the basket and the jar are taken away the straw and the figs can stand by themselves then they form a partition but if not they do not now straw is fit for the food of animals we speak here of straw which has become moldy but it is fit for making clay we speak of straw which has thorns in it but it is fit for fuel we speak of damp straw even so it can be used on a big fire a big fire is something uncommon but figs are fit to eat Samuel replied we speak of figs which have bread worms so Rabbi Abba also explained we speak of figs which have bread worms how are we to picture this jar if its mouth faces outwards Talmud Moss Baba Bathra it forms itself a partition because an earthenware vessel does not communicate uncleanness from its outside we suppose Therefore that its mouth is turned inwards or if you like I can say that its mouth is turned outwards and here we are speaking of a jar of metal a further objection was raised against the rule from the following grass which has been plucked up and placed in the window or which has grown there of itself rags less than three by three hand breadths a limb or flesh hanging from an animal a bird nesting in the window a non-Jew sitting in the window or a child born at the eighth month which has been placed there salt in earthenware vessel or a scroll of the law all these narrow the window space on the other hand snow hail ice hoarfrost and water do not narrow the window space now grass is food for cattle we speak here of poisonous grass or which has grown there of itself will it not be removed as injurious to the wall Rabbi said we speak here of the wall of ruin our Papa said the rule applies even to the wall of an inhabited place where the grass springs up from more than three. Hand breadths distance from the window rags are useful for mending clothes we speak of thick rags these are useful for a blood letter we speak of sacking if the berry speaks of sacking it should say less than 4 by 4 not 3 by 3 it means rough like sacking a limb or flesh hanging from an animal will not the animal go away we suppose it to be tied but it can be killed for food we suppose it to be an unclean animal in that case it can be sold to a non-Jew we suppose it to be too scraggy in that case he can cut off the limb and throw it to the dogs as this would cause pain to a living creature he would not do so a bird nesting in the window will it not fly away we suppose it to be tied then he will kill it for food we suppose it to be unclean then he will sell it to a non-Jew we suppose it to be a colony then he will give it to a child it will scratch a colony does not scratch we mean as scraggy as a colony a non-Jew sitting in the window will he not get up and go we suppose him to be tied there then someone will come and untie him we suppose him to be leprous another leper will come and loosen him we suppose he is a prisoner of the government or a child born in the eighth month placed in the window will not its mother come and lift it up we assume it is on the sabbath when she may not lift him as it was taught a child born at eight months is on a par with a stone and may not be carried on sabbath but his mother may bend over him and give him suck for the sake of her health salt is useful we speak of bitter salt this is useful for preparing skins for tanning we suppose there are thorns in it but since it is injurious to the wall it will be taken away we suppose it to be resting on a piece of earthenware but this itself will form a partition talmud mas baba bathrabi we speak of a piece which has no size to speak of and may even be carried on sabbath as we have learned a piece of earthenware which must not be carried on Sabbath must be big enough to put between one window post and another an earthenware vessel is it not useful we suppose it to be dirty it is still useful for a blood letter to collect the
The foot of a base etc. A base and we learn from this that the base of an oven project normally one hand breadth. This has a practical bearing on questions of sale. Mission oven should not be fixed in a room unless there is above it an empty space of at least four cubits. If it is fixed in an upper chamber there must be under it paved flooring at least three hand breadth thick for a small stove. One hand breadth is enough if in spite of these precautions damage is caused the owner of the oven. Must pay for the damage. Arsimian, however, said that all these limitations were only laid down with the idea that if after observing them he still causes damage, he is not liable to pay. A man should not open a bakery or a dyer's workshop under his neighbor's storehouse nor a cow sheet. In point of fact, the rabbis permitted a bakery or dyer's workshop to be opened under one, but not a cow sheet. Gemara, there must be under it paved flooring at least three hand breadths, etc. But has it not been taught that there must be four hand breadths under an ordinary oven and three under a small oven? Said Abe, this refers to the ovens of bakers, for our large oven is like their small one. A man should not open a bakery, etc. A tanned taught if the cow sheet is there before the storehouse, it may be opened. Abe raised the following questions: If the owner of the upper room has cleared out and swept the room in preparation for a storehouse, but has not yet placed any produce there, what is the ruling if? He has opened out a number of windows there. What is the ruling if there is an exit under the storehouse? What is the ruling if he builds a room on the roof? What is the ruling? These questions must stand over. Are not the son of our Joshua asked if he stores their fix and pomegranates? What is the ruling? This question also must stand over. In point of fact, the rabbis permitted in the case of wine, etc. A tanned taught they declared it permissible in the case of wine because the smoke improves it. While they forbade a cow sheet because the smell spoils it, our Joseph said our wine is adversely affected even by the smoke of a lamp. Our sheets hate said crop corn is on the same footing as a cow sheet mission. If a man desires to open a shop in a courtyard, his neighbor may present him on the ground that he will not be able to sleep through the noise of people coming and going. A man, however, may make articles in the courtyard to take out and sell in the market, and his neighbor cannot prevent him on. The ground that he cannot sleep from the noise of the hammer or of the millstones or of the children tomorrow. Why is the rule in the second case not the same as in the first? Abbe replied, The second clause must refer to a man in another courtyard, said Rabbah to him. If that is so, the Mishnah should say in another courtyard it is permissible. No, said Rabbah Talmud, Mas Baba Batra. The concluding words refer to school children from the time of the regulation of Joshua B. Gamal of whom Rab Judah has told us in the name of Rab Barely the name of that man is to be blessed to which Joshua B. Gamal for but for him the Torah would have been forgotten from Israel. For at first, if a child had a father, his father taught him, and if he had no father, he did not learn at all by what verse of the scripture did they guide themselves by the verse, and yet shall teach them to your children, laying the emphasis on the word, yet it then made an ordinance that teachers of children should be appointed in. Jerusalem by what verse did they guide themselves by the verse for from Zion shall the Torah go forth even so however if a child had a father the father would take him up to Jerusalem and have him taught there and if not he would not go up to learn there they therefore ordained that teachers should be appointed in each prefecture and that boys should enter school at the age of 16 or 17 they did so and if the teacher punished them they used to rebel and leave the school at length. Joshua B. Gamal came and ordained that teachers of young children should be appointed in each district and each town and that children should enter school at the age of 6 or 7. Rab said to our Samuel B. Shalath before the age of 6 do not accept pupils from that age you can accept them and stuff them with floral like an ox. Rab also said to our Samuel B. Shalath when you punish a pupil only hit him with a shulash at the attentive one will read of himself and if one is inattentive put him next. To a diligent one, an objection was raised from the following against the answer of Rabbah. If a resident in a courtyard desires to become a mohel, a bloodletter, a tanner, or a teacher of children, the other residents can prevent him. The reference here is to a teacher of non-Jewish children. Come and here, if two persons live in a courtyard and one of them desires to become a mohel, a bloodletter, a tanner, or a teacher of children, the other can prevent him. Here, too, the reference is to a teacher of non-Jewish children. Come and here, if a man has a room in a courtyard which he shares with another, he must not let it either to a mohel, or bloodletter, or a tanner, or a Jewish teacher, or a non-Jewish teacher. The reference here is to the head teacher of the town who superintends the others. Rabbah said under the ordinance of Joshua ben Gamal, children are not to be sent every day to school from one town to another, but they can be compelled to go from one synagogue to another in the same town. If however there is a river in between we cannot compel them but if again there is a bridge we can compel them not however if it is merely a plank Rabba further said the number of pupils to be assigned to each teacher is 25 if there are 50 we appoint two teachers if there are 40 we appoint an assistant at the expense of the town Rabba also said if we have a teacher who gets on with the children and there is another who can get on better we do not replace the first by the second for fear that the second when appointed will become indolent Ardimi from Nihardia however held that he would exert himself still more if appointed the jealousy of scribes increases wisdom Rabba further said if there are two teachers of whom one gets on fast but with mistakes and the other slowly but without mistakes we appoint the one who gets on fast and makes mistakes since the mistakes correct themselves in time Ardimi from Nihardia on the other hand said that we appoint the one who goes Slowly but makes no mistakes for once a mistake is implanted it cannot be eradicated this can be shown from the scripture it is written for Job and all Israel remained there until he had cut off every male in Edom when Job came before David the latter said to him Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi why have you acted thus I he killed only the males he replied because it is written thou shalt blot out the male seeker of Amalek said David but we read the remembrance seeker of Amalek he replied I was taught to read seeker he Job then went to his teacher and asked how didst thou teach me to read he replied seeker thereupon he drew his sword and threatened to kill him why do you do this asked the other he replied because it is written curse be he that doth the work of the Lord negligently he said to him be satisfied that I am cursed to which Job rejoined it also says curse be he that keepeth back his sword from blood according to one report he killed him according to another he did not. Kill him, Rabbah further said a teacher of young children of vine dresser, a ritual slaughter of blood letter and a town scribe are all liable to be dismissed immediately if inefficient. The general principle is that anyone whose mistakes cannot be rectified is liable to be dismissed immediately if he makes one Arhuna said if a resident of an alley sets up a handbill and another resident of the alley wants to set up one next to him, the first has the right to stop him because he can say to him, You are interfering with my livelihood. May we say that this view is supported by the following fishing nets must be kept away from the hiding place of a fish which has been spotted by another fisherman. The full length of the fish's swim and how much is this Rabbah son of Arhuna says a part saying fishes are different because they look about for food said Rabbah to Rabbah. May we say that Arhuna adopts the same principle as Arjuna for we have learned Arjuna says that a shopkeeper should not. Give presents of parched corn and nuts to children because he thus entices them to come back to him. The sages, however, allow this. You may even say that he is in agreement with the rabbis. Also, for the ground on which the rabbis allowed the shopkeeper to do this was because he can say to his rival, Just as I make presents of nuts, so you can make presents of almonds. But in this case, they would agree that the first man can say to the other, You are interfering with my livelihood. An objection was raised against Rab Huna's ruling from the following A man may open a shop next to another man's shop or a bath next to another man's bath, and the latter cannot object because he can say to him, I do what I like in my property, and you do what you like in yours. On this point, there is a difference of opinion among ten as appears from the following very the residents of an alley can prevent one another from bringing in a tailor or a tanner or a teacher or any other craftsman but one. Cannot prevent another from setting up in opposition. Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel, however, says that one may prevent another. Arhuna, the son of Arjashua, said, It is quite clear to me that the resident of one town can prevent the resident of another town from setting up in opposition in his town. Not, however, if he pays taxes to that town, and that the resident of an alley cannot prevent another resident of the same alley from setting up in opposition in his alley. Arhuna, the son of Arjashua, then raised the question, Can the resident of one alley prevent the resident of another from competing with
Nahara, the townspeople tried to stop them from selling it. They appealed to Rav Kahana, who said they have a perfect right to stop you. They said we have money owing to us here. If so, he replied, you can go and sell enough to keep you till you collect your debts, and then you must go. Ardimi from Nihartia brought a load of figs in a boat. The Exilarch said to Rabba, go and see if he is a scholar, and if so, reserve the market for him. So Rabba said to our Adabi, Abba, go and smell his jar. The latter accordingly went out and put to him the following question: If an elephant swallows an osier basket and passes it out with its excrement, is it still subject to uncleanness? He could not give an answer. Are you Rabba? He asked our Adabi. The latter tapped him on his shoes and said, Between me and Rabba, there is a great difference. But at any rate, I can be your teacher, and so Rabba is the teacher of your teacher. They did not reserve the market for him, and so his figs were a dead loss. He appealed to our Joseph, saying, See how. They have treated me, he said to him, he who did not delay to avenge the wrong done to the king of Edom will not delay to avenge the wrong done to you, as it is written, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Moab, yet for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime shortly afterwards. Our Adabi Abadai, our Joseph said, It is through me that he has been punished, because I cursed him. Our Dimi from Nihardia said, It is through me that he has been punished, because he made me lose my fix. Abbe said, It is through me that he has been punished, because he used to say to the students, Instead of gnawing bones in the school of Abbe, why do you not eat fat meat in the school of Rabba? Rabba said, It is through me that he has been punished, because when he went to the butchers to buy meat, he used to say to the butchers, Serve me before the servant of Rabba, because I am above him. Our Naman B. Isaac said, It is through me that he has been. Punished how was this Arnaman B. Isaac was a regular preacher on Sabbaths every time before he went to give his discourse he used to run over it with our Adabi Abba and only then would he attend to Cal one day our Papa and our Huna the son of our Joshua got hold of our Adabi Abba because they had not been present at the concluding discourse of Rabba on the tractate Bekharat and said to him tell us how Rabba discussed the law of the tithing of cattle he then gave them a full account of Rabba's discourse meanwhile dusk had set in and Arnaman B. Isaac was still waiting for our Adabi Abba the rabbi said to him come for it is late why do you still sit sir he said he am waiting for the beer of our Adabi Abba soon after the report came that our Adabi Abba was dead the most likely opinion is that Arnaman B. Isaac was the cause of his punishment mission if a man has a wall running alongside his neighbor's wall he should not bring another wall alongside unless he keeps it at least four cubits. Away if there are windows in the neighbor's wall he must leave a clear space of four cubits whether above or below or opposite Demara he should not bring another wall etc. How came the first wall to be close up Rab Judah said the mission must be understood as follows Talmud, Mas Baba Batra B Talmud, Mas Baba Batra B if a man wants to build a wall alongside of his neighbor's wall he must not do so unless he keeps it at least four cubits away Rabba strongly objected to this on the ground that it says if a man already has a wall running alongside of his neighbor's wall no said Rabba what it means is this if a man had a wall running alongside of his neighbor's wall at a distance of four cubits and it falls down he must not bring another wall alongside unless he keeps it four cubits away the reason being that the treading of the earth between by foot passengers is good for the walls on both sides Rab said this mission applies only to the wall of a vegetable garden. But if the wall is that of a courtyard, he may bring his wall as close to it as he likes. Our Oshia, however, said it makes no difference whether it is a vegetable garden or a courtyard. He must not bring his wall closer to it than four cubits. Our Jose B. Hanada says there is no conflict between Rab and our Oshia. The former speaks of a courtyard in an old town and the latter of one in a new one. We learned if there are windows in the neighbor's wall, he must leave a clear space of four cubits. Whether above or below or opposite, and in a very the commenting on this, it is stated that a space must be left above so that he should not be able to peep into the other one's room and below so that he should not stand on tiptoe and look in and opposite so that he should not take away his light. The reason then why the second wall must be kept away from the first is that he should not take away his light and not as you say that the ground between should be trodden here in the very the we. Are dealing with a wall which runs at right angles to the first wall. How far must such a wall be kept away so as not to take away the other's light? Are yet the father in law of Ashi and Bina back said in the name of Rab the breadth of a window, but cannot he still look through our Zebit says we presume that he makes the top of the wall slope, but does not our mission say at least four cubits? There is no contradiction in the one case the wall running at right angles is on one side only of the window, in the other there are walls at right angles on both sides of the window. Come and here the wall must be kept away from the neighbor's roof gutter four cubits so as to allow room for setting a ladder. The reason it appears is that there may be room for a ladder, but not that there may be room for treading here. We are dealing with an overhanging gutter where there is no need to make allowance for treading because there is room to walk under the gutter mission. A ladder must be kept. Away from a pigeon coat four cubits so that a weasel should not be able to spring from the ladder onto the coat the wall must be kept four cubits from the neighbor's roof gutter so as to allow room for setting a ladder tomorrow shall I say that the mission does not concur with our Jose who has laid down that the one may dig a pit where he likes in his property and the other may plant a tree where he likes in his property you may say that even our Jose would concur with the mission here for our Ashi has told us that when we were with our Kahana he said to us that our Jose admitted that a man was responsible for the damage of which he is the cause here too it may happen that while the man is setting the ladder the weasel is sitting in a hole close by and jumps onto it but here he is merely the indirect cause said our Toby Bar Matana this is equivalent to saying that it is prohibited to cause damage indirectly even where the damage it caused need not be paid for our Joseph had some small Day trees Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra under which cuppers used to sit and let blood and ravens used to collect to suck up the blood and they used to fly onto the day trees and damage them so our Joseph said to the cuppers take away your croakers from here said Abbe to him but they are only the indirect cause he replied our Toby Bar Matana has expressly said this is equivalent to saying that it is prohibited to cause damage indirectly but our Joseph had given them a right to let blood under. The trees Arnaman has said in the name of Rabbi Abba there is no legal title to things causing damage but are we not told in a gloss on the statement that Armari says it refers for instance to smoke and Arzibit to a privy said our Joseph to him I am very sensitive and these ravens are as offensive to me as smoke or a privy mission a pigeon coat must be kept 50 cubits from a town a man should not put up a pigeon coat on his own estate unless there is a clear space of 50 cubits. All round our Judah says the space should be sufficient for the sewing of four core which is as much as a bird flies at a time if however he buys it from another with only the space for sewing a quarter of a cab round it he has a right to keep it tomorrow no more than 50 cubits does not this contradict the following snares may be spread for pigeons only at a distance of 30 rs from the Yishuk town or village Abbe replied pigeons cover much round but they eat their fill within 50 cubits of their starting point and do they fly no further than 30 rs has it not been taught where there are towns and villages nets should not be spread even within 100 miles our Joseph said this means where there is a succession of vineyards Rabba said it means where there is a succession of pigeon coats then should not the prohibition be laid down because of the pigeon coats themselves if you like I can answer that they, the intermediate coats belong to the man who sets the snares himself and if you like that they belong to heathens and if you like that they are no one's property Rajita says the space should be sufficient for the sewing of four he has a right etc our papa or according to others Arzib said this implies that the Bethdin may plead the cause of an heir and may plead the cause of a purchaser but we have already learned the rule about the heir in the following statement he who claims a property choir has no need to plead that his father bought it property the point of Arzib's statement lies in the reference to the purchaser but in regard to the purchaser also we have learned that if a man buys a courtyard in which our beams and balconies projecting over the main thoroughfare he has a legal right to retain them both statements are necessary for if I had only the statement regarding the main thoroughfare to go by I should say that the reason therefore allowing the right to stand is because the courtyard had been originally drawn Back from the main thoroughfare to allow room for the projection or that the public had waived its right to have them removed in his
The slain man shall bring a heifer that is to say even though there are other towns in the vicinity with a larger population we assume that there are none but if majority is a decisive factor why not take the biggest town anywhere scripture speaks of a town surrounded by mountains we learned a young pigeon which is found on the ground within 50 cubits of a coat belongs to the owner of the coat and this even though there may be a bigger coat in the neighborhood we assume that there is not if that is so then what of the next closet found beyond 50 cubits from the coat it belongs to the finder now if there are no other coats in the neighborhood there can be no question that the bird comes from this one our mission speaks in the first clause of a bird which can only hop since Marakba has laid down that the bird which can only hop does not go further than 50 cubits our Jeremiah raised the question if one foot is within 50 cubits and the other beyond how do we decided was for this that they turned our Jeremiah out of the Beth Hamid Rash come and here if it is found between two coats it belongs to the owner to whose coat it is nearer and this though one may have more birds than the other we are dealing here with the case where both are equal but if it is more than 50 cubits from each let us say that it comes from the biggest anywhere we are dealing here Talmud, Mas Baba Bath with a path between vineyards for though there is ground for saying that it came from a distance because it is more than 50 cubits from a coat yet here since it can only hop it cannot have come from a distant coat because a bird will only hop away from the coat so long as it can still see the coat on turning round but no further Abbe said we too know our Hannah's rule from the Mishnah which says if blood is found in the anteroom and there is any doubt about its character it is reckoned unclean because it is presumed to be from the source. Notwithstanding the fact that there is an upper chamber which is nearer said Robert to him you are speaking of a case where there is frequency as well as majority where there are both frequency and majority no one questions that they carry more weight than nearness our high top blood found in the anteroom renders the woman liable for a sin offering if she enters the sanctuary and Terima must be burnt on its account Robert remarked from this statement of our high three lessons may be derived. One is that where we have to choose between majority and nearness we decide on the ground of majority the second is that the rule of majority derives its warrant from the scripture the third is that our zero was right when he laid down that in the case of a piece of meat we decide on the ground of majority even though the town gates are closed because the case of the woman here is analogous to the case where the town gates are closed and even so we decide on the ground of majority but was it not Rabbah himself who said that where majority and frequency were combined no one questioned that they carried more weight than nearness whereas here he says that majority itself carries more weight Rabbah retracted the objection he then made to Abbe it has been stated if a barrel of wine is found floating on the river Euphrates Rab says if it is opposite a town where the majority of the inhabitants are Jews the wine is permitted and if opposite a town where the majority of the inhabitants are non-Jews the wine is prohibited Samuel however says that even if it is found opposite a town where the majority of the inhabitants are Jews it is prohibited because it may be supposed to have come from Hidekira may we say that the ground on which they join issue is the dictum of our Hanada that we follow the majority in preference to nearness Samuel accepting it and Rab not accepting it no both accept the dictum of our Hanada and the ground on which they join issue is this that in the Opinion of Rab if the barrel had come from Hidekir it would have been sunk or stuck in the bays or shallows of the river whereas Samuel thinks that it can have been carried along by the force of the stream a barrel of wine which had been stolen was found in a vineyard which was uncircumcised and Rabbana permitted the wine to be drunk shall we say it was because he held with our hand that there was a different reason in that case was that if the wine had been stolen from that vineyard it would not have been hidden there this however applies only to wine but stolen grapes might be hidden in the same vineyard a number of flasks of wine were found between trunks of vines of a Jew and Rabbah permitted the wine to be drunk shall we say that he did not hold with our hand there was a different reason in that case was that most Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabbi wine bottlers were Jews and we only say this if the flasks are big ones but if they are small ones we may argue that passers by not. Jews let them drop if however there are some big ones with them we can say that the small ones were merely used as ballast Mishnah trees must be kept at a distance of 25 cubits from a town carobs and sycamore trees 50 cubits Abbasal says that all wild fruit trees must be kept at a distance of 50 cubits if the town was there first the tree is cut down and no compensation is given if the tree was there first it is cut down but compensation must be given if there is a doubt which was first it is cut down and no compensation is given Gemara trees must be kept at a distance etc what is the reason for this regulation Ola says to preserve the amenities of the town but could we not derive this rule from the regulation that suburb must not be turned into cultivated field nor cultivated field into suburb the rule had to be stated here to meet the view of our Eliezer who said that cultivated field may be turned into suburb and suburb may be turned into cultivated field. Even on his view trees must not be planted close to the town so as not to spoil the amenities of the town and the rabbis too who said that a cultivated field may not be turned into suburb nor suburb into cultivated field meant this to apply only to the sowing of vegetables but not to the planting of trees yet here they too would prohibit on account of the amenities of the town what ground have you for saying that there is a difference in this respect between vegetables and trees because it has been taught if an enclosure big enough to sow more than two seahs in his fence round for dwelling purposes and if the greater part of it is sown with vegetables it is reckoned as a vegetable garden and it is forbidden to carry in it on sabbath but if the greater part of it is planted with trees it is reckoned as a courtyard and it is permissible to carry in it on sabbath if the town was there first the tree is cut down and no compensation is given etc why in the analogous case of a it is it laid down that the owner may cut down the tree but must give compensation whereas here it is cut down without compensation being given our kahana set a pot with two cooks is neither hot nor cold but what contradiction is there perhaps a difference is made between injury to the public and injury to an individual we must therefore say that if our kahana really made this remark he meant it to apply to the next clause in the mission if the tree was there first it is cut down but compensation must be given regarding this we may ask why cannot the owner of the tree say give me the money first and I will then cut it down and it was in regard to this that our kahana answered a pot with two cooks is neither hot nor cold if there is a doubt which was first it is cut down without compensation being given why in the analogous case of a pit is it laid down that he should not cut down the tree in the case of the pit where if the tree was certainly there first it is not to be Cut down and if there is a doubt we also do not say to him cut it down but in this case where even if the tree was certainly there first it has to be cut down and if there is a doubt we also order him to cut it down and if the question of compensation arises we say to him prove that it is yours and you will be paid mission a fixed threshing floor must be kept 50 cubits from a town a man should not fix a threshing floor on his own estate unless there is a clear space all round of 50 cubits he must keep it away from the plantation of his neighbor and his plucked fellow a sufficient distance to prevent damage being caused tomorrow why this difference between the beginning and the end of this mission Abbe said the last clause refers to a threshing floor which is not fixed what do you mean by a threshing floor which is not fixed our Jose said in the name of our hand one that does not require the use of a winnowing shovel our Ashi however said the last clause gives the Reason for the first as much as to say why is a fixed threshing floor kept 50 cubits away from a town to prevent it doing damage an objection to Abbe's opinion was raised from the following a fixed threshing floor must be kept 50 cubits away from a town and as it must be kept 50 cubits from a town so it must be kept 50 cubits from a neighbor's cucumber and pumpkin fields from his plantations and his plowed fallow to prevent damage being caused this squares with the opinion of our ashi but conflicts with that of Abbe does it not this indeed is a difficulty we can understand why the threshing floor must be kept away from the cucumber and pumpkin fields because the dust goes and penetrates into them and dries them up but why should it be kept away from the plowed fallow or Abbe's or it may be our Abbe's to reply Talmud, Mas Baba Bathro because it overmanures at Mishakari and graves and ten yards must be kept 50 cubits from a town a ten yard must only be placed on the east side of the town our Akiba however says it may be placed on any side except the west providing it is kept 50 cubits away flax water must be kept away from vegetables and leeks from onions and mustard plants from a beehive our Jose however declares it permissible to come near in the case of mustard Gemara the question was asked
for showing us the place of prayer as it is written and the host of heaven worshipeth the Araha Bar Jacob strongly demurred to this interpretation perhaps he said the sun and moon bow down to the east like a servant who has received a gratuity from his master and retires backwards bowing as he goes this indeed is a difficulty Arashai expressed the opinion that the Sheshanah is in every place for Arashai said what is the meaning of the verse thou art the Lord even thou alone thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens etc thy messengers are not like the messengers of flesh and blood messengers of flesh and blood report themselves after performing their office to the place from which they have been sent but thy messengers report themselves to the place to which they are sent as it says canst thou send forth lightnings that they may go and say to thee here we are it does not say that they may come and say but that they may go and say which shows that the Sheshanah is in all Places are Ishmael also held that the Sheshanah is in all places since are Ishmael taught from where do we know that the Sheshanah is in all places because it says and behold the angel that talked with me went forth and another angel went out to meet him it does not say went out after him but went out to meet him this shows that the Sheshanah is in all places are Shishi also held that the Sheshanah is in all places because when desiring to pray he used to say to his attendant set me facing any way except the east and this was not because the Sheshanah is not there but because the men prescribed turning to the east are about however said that the Sheshanah is in the west for so said are about what is the meaning of your yah it is equivalent to every yah of God Arjuna said what is the meaning of the verse my doctrine shall drop yah as the rain this refers to the west wind which comes from the back or of the world my speech shall distill tizzle as the dew this is the north Wind which makes gold flow and so it says who lavish has gold from the purse as the small rain as iron upon the tender grass this is the east wind which rages through the world like a demon as iron and as showers upon the earth this is the south wind which brings up showers and causes the grass to grow it has been taught our Eliezer says that the world Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B is like an exeter and the north side is not enclosed and so when the sun reaches the northwest corner it bends. Back and returns to the east above the firmament Arjashu however says that the world is like a tent and the north side is enclosed and when the sun reaches the northwest corner it goes round at the back of the tent till it reaches the east as it says it goeth toward the south and turneth again toward the north etc it goes toward the south by day and turneth again toward the north by night it turneth about continually in its course and the wind returneth again to its circuits this refers to the eastern and western sides of the heaven which the sun sometimes traverses and sometimes goes round here Joshua used to say we have come round to the view of our Eliezer since we have learned out of the chamber cometh the storm this is the south wind and from the scatter is cold this is the north wind by the breath of God ice is given this is the west wind and the abundance of waters in the downpouring this is the east wind but it has just been stated by a master that it is the south wind which brings showers and makes the grass grow there is no contradiction when the rain falls gently it is from the south and when it falls heavily it is from the east Arhisda said what is meant by the verse out of the north cometh gold this refers to the north wind which makes gold flow and so it says Ulavish Hazalem gold from the purse Raphram Papa said in the name of Arhisda since the day when the temple was destroyed the south wind has not brought rain as it says and he Decreed on the right hand and there was hunger and he consumed on the left and they were not satisfied and it is written north and right hand thou hast created them Raphram B. Papa also said in the name of Arhisda since the day when the temple was destroyed rain no longer comes down from the good storehouse as it says the Lord shall open up to thee his good treasure when Israel act according to the will of God and are settled in their own land and rain comes down from a good storehouse but when Israel are not settled on their own land and rain does not come down from a good storehouse our Isaac said he who desires to become wise should turn to the south when praying and he who desires to become rich should turn to the north the symbol by which to remember this is that the table in the tabernacle was to the north of the altar and the candlestick to the south our Joshua B. Levi however said that he should always turn to the south because through obtaining wisdom he will obtain Wealth as it says length of days are in her wisdom's right hand in her left hand are riches and honor but was it not our Joshua B. Levi who said that the Sheshanah is in the west he means that one should turn partly to the south said our Hannah to our Ashi those like you who live to the north of Eretz Israel should turn to the south how do we know that Babylon is to the north of Eretz Israel from the scriptural verse out of the north evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of it. Land flax water must be kept away from vegetables etc. A Tana has taught our Jose holds it permissible in the case of mustard because the owner can say to the other as well as you can tell me to remove my mustard from your bees I can tell you to remove your bees from my mustard because they come and eat the twigs of my mustard plants. Mishnah a tree must be kept away from a pit in a neighbor's field 25 cubits a sycamore or a carob 50 cubits it makes no difference whether the tree is on higher or lower ground or on a level with the pit if the pit was there first the owner can have the tree cut down on giving compensation if the tree was there first he cannot have it cut down if there is a doubt which was there first he cannot have it cut down our Jose however says that even if the pit was there before the tree the owner cannot have the tree cut down because this one digs in his property the other plants in his Gemara Aitana has taught whether the tree is on higher ground then the pit or the pit is on higher ground than the tree if the tree is on higher ground than the pit we can understand the prohibition because the roots spread and damage the pit but if the pit is higher than the tree what reason is there are Hagas said in the name of our Jose because the roots undermine the soil and damage the floor of the pit our Jose says that even if the pit was there before the tree the owner cannot have the tree cut down because this one digs in his property the other plants in his Arjuna says in the name of Samuel the Halachad is according to our Jose Arashi said when we studied with our Kahana we used to say that our Jose admits that a man is responsible for damage of which lies the cause Papi Yona was a poor man who made some money and built a country house there were in his neighborhood some sesame oil makers who when they crushed the sesame seeds used to make his villa shake he appealed against them to Arashi who said to him when we studied with our Kahana we used to say that our Jose admits that a man is responsible for the damage of which he is the cause how much Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra must the house shake to constitute damage enough to make the lid of a pitcher rattle when the people in the house of Barmeri and the son of Rabin used to be flax the dust used to fly about and the people they appealed to Rabin he said to them when we say that our Jose admits that a man is responsible for damage of which he is the cause this applies only to the case where he himself sets the cause of the damage in motion here it is the wind which carries the dust about and therefore they are not liable Marsan of Arashi strongly objected to the saying how do these men differ from a man winnowing on Sabbath when the wind carries the chaff further the case was stated before Mirmar and he said this is in fact on all fours with that of the man winnowing on Sabbath when the wind comes and helps him and how does Robin differentiate this case from that of the spark flying from the smith's hammer and doing damage for which the smith is responsible he could reply that the smith is glad to see the spark fly out but here the people beating the flax do not want the dust to fly about Mishnah a man should not plant a tree in his own field close to his neighbor's field unless he keeps it at a distance of four cubits this applies both to a vine and to all other trees if there is a fence between the two fields each may plant close up to the fence on his own side if the roots of one man's tree spread into his neighbor's field the latter can cut them away to a depth of three hand breadth so that they should not impede the plow if he digs a pit ditch or cave he can cut right down to any depth and the wood belongs to him Gemara Tana has taught the four cubits here mentioned are to allow space for the work of the vineyard Samuel said this rule was only laid down for Eretz Israel in Babylonia two cubits are sufficient. This is also stated in the very a man should not plant a tree nearer than two cubits to his neighbor's field but does not our mission say for it must be therefore as Samuel has explained this argument is also stated in the form of a contradiction which is afterwards reconciled thus our mission says a man should not plant a tree close to his neighbor's field unless he keeps it at a distance of four cubits but does not a very the say two cubits said Samuel there is no contradiction to it. Mission refers to Eretz Israel the Beretha to Babylon Rabbi son of Arhanan had some date trees adjoining a vineyard of Arjoseph and birds used to roost on the date trees and fly down and damage the vines so Rabbi son of Arhanan told Arjoseph to cut down his date trees said the latter but I have kept them four cub
Wood belongs to him, said our papa. Subsequently, I tried all kinds of argument with him, but I could not convince him. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. Delia, this the dictum of Rab Judah, a strip of land over which the public has established a right of way must not be obstructed after he or papa had left him. He or Huna said, Why did I not answer him? The prescriptive right of a tree is only within 16 cubits from the trunk, but I am cutting at a distance of more than 16 cubits if he digs. A pit ditch or cave he can cut right down to any depth and the wood belongs to him. Jacob of Hayday put the question to Arhista to whom does the wood belong? He replied, We can learn the answer from the following mission. If the roots of a tree belonging to a limb spread into a field belonging to the sanctuary, they may not be used by a limb, but their use does not involve a trespass. If now you say that the roots follow the tree, then there is a good reason why the use of them does not involve a trespass. But if you say that they take their character from the soil in which they are found, why is a trespass not involved? What then will you conclude that the tree is a decisive factor? If so, let us see what follows. If the roots of a tree belonging to the sanctuary spread into the field of a limb, they must not be used, but their use does not involve a trespass. Now, if the tree is a decisive factor, why is no trespass involved? In fact, this mission, I should say, tells us. Nothing about the question in hand because it is concerned with the subsequent growth and it holds that the law of trespass does not apply to subsequent growth. Rubin replied that there is no contradiction, although in the first case the tree is a decisive factor and not in the second. In the first case we suppose the roots to be within 16 cubits of the tree and in the second case beyond 16 cubits from it. Will said a tree which is nearer than 16 cubits to the boundary of a neighbor's field is a rubber and the offering of first fruits should not be brought from it. From whence does it arrive? This idea shall we say from the following mission which we learned if ten shoots are planted at equal intervals in a Beth Seah then the whole of the Beth Sea may be plowed up to New Year of the sabbatical year. This cannot be for what is the total area occupied 2,500 cubits. How much is that for each tree? 250 cubits. Now this. Is less than the space mentioned by Ola. Can it be then from the following mission, which we learned if there are in a field three trees belonging to three different men, they can be combined to place the field in the category of a plantation field and the whole Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Beth Sea may be plowed in virtue of them. What is the total area of the field? 2,500 cubits. How much is that for each tree? 833. And the third Ola still claims. More for his tree, we must suppose that Ola did not give an exact figure. Is that so? We may presume that an authority does not give an exact figure, whereby so doing he makes a law more stringent. But can I say that he does so where he makes a law less stringent? You are assuming that Ola was thinking of a square. In reality, he was thinking of a circle. Let us see the area of a square exceeds that of the inscribed circle by a quarter. Hence, there remains for the circle from which Ola's. Tree sucks 768 cubits, but the space allowed by the mission is still half a cubit more in length. That is where Ola was not exact, and he thereby made the law more stringent. Come and here, if a man buys a tree and the soil around, he brings first fruits from it and makes a declaration. Soil means any quantity, does it not? However, small, no, it must be 16 cubits. Come and here, if a man buys two trees in another man's field, he brings first fruits from them, but does not make the declaration. We infer from this that if he buys three, he does make the declaration, and any quantity of soil is sufficient. Is it not? No, here too, it must be 16 cubits. Come and here, our Akiva says the smallest piece of landed property is subject to the rule of the corner and first fruits and the principal Talmud. Mas Baba Bathrabi can be made out on the strength of it, and movables can be acquired by means of it. Here we are speaking of the first fruits of wheat. This is Indicated also by the expression in the mission of the very smallest come and here if a tree is partly in Eretz Israel and partly outside of Eretz Israel fruit subject to tithe and fruit not subject to tithe are mixed up in it. This is the opinion of Rabbi Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel however says that that which grows where the obligation extends I in Eretz Israel is liable and that which grows where the obligation does not extend I outside Eretz Israel is not liable the difference of opinion. Between them only consists in this does it not that the latter holds that we can decide retrospectively which fruit belongs to which root and the former holds that we cannot but both agree that anything which grows where the obligation does not extend is not liable no we here deal with the case where the roots are divided by a hard rock if so what is the reason of Rabbi for declaring the two kinds to be mixed together because they mix again higher up where and then lies the ground of it. Difference between Rabbi and Rabbin Simeon the former holds that the air mixes the saps though coming from separate roots and the latter holds that each remains separate and must the tree be kept 16 cubits from the boundary and no more have we not learned that a tree must be kept a distance of 25 cubits from a pit of a reply though the roots spread much further they only exhaust the soil up to a distance of 16 cubits no more when Ardimi came he reported that Reshlakish had asked Aryohan and what the ruling was regarding a tree situated within 16 cubits of the boundary and he had answered it is a rubber and first fruits should not be brought from it when Rabin came he said in the name of Aryohan and the rule both for a tree close to the boundary of a neighbor's field and for one which overhangs another's field is that the owner brings first fruits and makes a declaration since it was on that condition that Joshua gave Israel possession of the land. Mission if a man's tree overhangs his neighbor's field the latter may cut away the branches to a height sufficient to allow him to use the ox goat over the plow if the tree is a carob or sycamore he can cut down all the branches plumb with the boundary if the field is an irrigated one the branches of all trees may be cut down plumb Abbasal says that the branches of any wild fruit bearing tree can be cut down plumb Gemara the question was raised does Abbasal's statement refer to the first clause in the mission or the second comment here Abbasal says if the field is an irrigated one the branches of all trees may be cut down plumb because the shade is injurious to an irrigated field this shows that his statement refers to the first clause Arashi said the language of his statement as recorded in our mission also indicates that since it states any wild fruit bearing tree if this refers to the first clause the word any tree is in place but if it refers to the second Clause it should say simply wild fruit bearing trees that shows that it refers to the first clause mission if a tree overhangs a public thoroughfare the branches should be cut away to a height sufficient to allow a camel to pass underneath with its rider Arjuna says sufficient for a camel laden with flax or bundles of vine rods Arsimian says that the branches of all trees should be cut away plumb with the street to guard against Uncle and Eskimara who is a tana of the mission who rules that in making regulations to prevent damage we consider only conditions as they are at present and not as they are likely to become in the future Reshlakish replied this ruling is not a unanimous one and it follows the opinion of Arlizer for we learned a cavity must not be made under a public thoroughfare nor pits dishes or caves Arlizer says it is permissible if the covering is sufficient to bear a moving cart laden with stones Arjuna and said you may even say that the rabbis of that mission also concur with the ruling here for there they prohibit because the cover may give way unexpectedly but here every branch can be cut down as it grows Rajuda says a camel laden with flax or bundles of vine rods the question was asked which is the higher limit that of Arjuda or that of the rabbis there can be no doubt that the limit of the rabbis is higher for if the limit of Arjuda is higher how do the rabbis manage with anything that still comes within the limit of R. Juda you say then that the limit of the rabbis is higher how then will Arjuda manage with something which still comes within the limit of the rabbis i.e. the rider can bend down and pass underneath Rabbin Simeon says the branches of all trees should be cut away plumb to guard against Uncle Anas Atan taught in connection therewith because they can form a tent over uncleanness this is self-evident since we learn to guard against Uncle Anas if I only had our mission to go by might say that what it means is that a raven may bring uncleanness and throw it on the branches and therefore it is sufficient to thin out the branches now I know that this is not sufficient Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra chapter 3 mission of presumptive title to houses pits ditches and caves dovecoats baths olive presses irrigated field slaves and anything which is continually producing is conferred by three years unchallenged possession from day to day a presumptive title to a non irrigated field is conferred by three years possession not reckoned from day to day our Ishmael says it is sufficient to have three months in the first year three months in the last and twelve in the middle making eighteen months in all our Akiva says
has been enjoyed for three years the property becomes the fixed possession of the holder now if this is correct that the law of Hazaka is derived from the law of the oxid would follow that three years possession would confer a legal title even without a plea of justification why then have we learned that possession without a plea of justification does not confer a legal title the reason why we confirm the holder in possession when he pleads justification is because it is possible that his plea is truthful but if he himself advances no plea shall we put in a plea for him or are brought a strong objection against this analogy between the field and the ox on this principle he said a protest made not in the presence of the holder should not be valid after the analogy of the muad ox for just as in the case of the muad ox the warning must be given in the presence of the owner so here the protest should be made in the presence of the holder there in the case of the ox Scripture says and it hath been testified to his owner here in the case of property your friend has a friend and the friend of your friend has a friend now suppose we accept the ruling according to our mayor who said if there was an interval between the gorings the owner is liable all the more so than if they followed closely on one another on the analogy of this if a man gathered three crops on one dies for instance fix in three stages of ripeness this should constitute presumptive right should it not no the action must be strictly analogous to the case of the muad ox just as in the case of the muad ox at the time when the first goring took place there was as yet no second goring so here at the time when the first fruit is plucked the second must not yet be in existence but suppose he gathered three crops in three days as of a caper bush should not that confer presumptive right in this case also the second fruit exists already when he gathers the first crop and it merely goes on ripening but suppose he gathered three crops in 30 days as a clover should not this confer presumptive right how exactly do you mean that it is cropped as it grows then this is merely partial eating and not the full eating required to confer presumptive right but suppose then that he consumed three crops in three months as a clover should not this confer presumptive right who is meant by the rabbis who attended Ishar or Ishmael and this actually would be the view of our Ishmael as we have learned our Ishmael says this refers only to a cornfield but in a field planted with trees if a man harvests his grapes gathers in his olives and harvests his figs this counts as three years and whence do the rabbis derive the rule that three years possession confers presumptive right our Joseph said they derive it from the scriptural verse men shall buy fields for money and subscribe the deeds and seal them for there the prophet is speaking in the tenth year of Zedekiah and he warns the people that they will go into captivity in the eleventh set of A to him perhaps he was merely giving a piece of good advice Talmud, Mas Baba Batra for if you hold otherwise what do you make of the verse build your houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them that obviously is a piece of good advice and so here too the proof is that it says in the same connection and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days no said Rabbi the reason according to the rabbis is this for the first year a man will forego his rights to the produce for two years a man will forego his rights but for a third year no man will forego his rights said Abbe to him in that case when the land is restored to the original owner on claiming it after two years it should be restored without the produce why then has our nominee laid down that both the property and the produce have to be restored Rabbi therefore correcting himself said for the first your man is not particular about another man usurping his field nor is he particular for the second year but the third year he is particular said Abbe to him if that is so what of the people of Bar Elisha who object even to anyone crossing their field in their case should not occupation confer presumptive right immediately if they do not object and if you say that that if so then you introduce a kind of sliding scale Rabbah therefore again corrected himself and said for one year a man takes care of his title deed and so for two three years does he take care beyond that he does not take care said Abbe to him if that is so then it would follow that a protest made not in the presence of the holder is no protest since the latter can say if you had protested to me personally I should have taken more care of my title deed the other can retort you must have known of my protest because your friend has a friend and your friend's friend has a friend Arhuma said the three years Mentioned in the mission only count if the occupier took the crops in all three successively what does the statement tell us does not the mission say that presumptive title is conferred by three years possession from day to day you might think that the expression from day to day was only meant to exclude short years and that interrupted years were permissible now I know that this is not so our said Arhuna admits that interrupted years are also sufficient in places where it is customary. To leave fields fallow in alternate years is not this self-evident it required to be stated in view of the case where some owners leave their fields fallow and some do not this man being one of those who do you might think that in this case the claimant can say to him if the field is yours you ought to have sown it now I know that this is not so because the other can answer I cannot keep watch over a single field in the whole valley or he can also answer I prefer this way because it makes it Field more productive we learn presumptive title to houses I ask conferred by three years possession why should this be seen that in the case of houses we can know if a man lives there by day but not if he lives there by night Abbe answered who is it that testifies to a man having lived in a house the neighbors and the neighbors know whether he has lived in it by night as well as by day Rob answered the way it can be known is if for instance two persons come forward and say we hired the house from him and lived in it day and night for three years said Aryamar to Arashi but these men are interested witnesses because if they do not make this assertion we shall tell them to go and pay the rent to the claimant Arashi replied only incompetent judges would proceed thus know the case Rabba has in mind is where they come with the rent and inquire to whom they are to give it Marzitra said if the claimant demands that two witnesses should be produced to testify that the Occupier lived in the house three years day and night his demand is valid Talmud, Mas Baba Batra B and though in this case the court does not suggest the plea Marzitra admits that where the claimant is an itinerant peddler even if he does not raise the plea the court raises it for him Arhuna also admits that though normally the three years must be continuous in the case of the shops of Mahusa this is not necessary because they are only used by day and not by night Rami Bihama and R. Akba Bihama bought a maid servant in partnership the arrangement being that one should have her services during the first third and fifth years and the other during the second fourth and sixth their title to her was contested and the case came before Rabba he said to the brothers why did you make this arrangement so that neither of you should obtain a presumptive right against the other was it not just as you have no presumptive right against each other so you have no presumptive right against Outsiders this ruling however only holds good if there was no written agreement between them to share the maid servant if there was such an agreement it would become rooted abroad Rabba said if the occupier has utilized the whole field except the space of the sowing of a quarter of a cab he acquires ownership after three years of the whole field with the exception of that space said Arhuna the son of Arjashua this only applies if the space so left over was suitable for sowing but if it was not suitable for sowing it is acquired along with the rest of the field to this RBBB of a strongly objected saying if that is so how does a man acquire a piece of rock through occupation is it not by stationing his animals there and laying out his crops there so here too he should have stationed his animals there and laid out his crops there a certain man said to another what right have you in this house he replied I bought it from you and I have had the use of it for a period of Hezaka. To which the other replied but I have been living in an inner room and therefore did not protest the case was brought before Arnaman who said to the defendant you must prove that you have had constant use of the house for three years without the claimant said Robert to him is this a right decision is not the onus probandi in money cases always on the claimant a contradiction was pointed out between Robert's ruling here and his ruling in another place and between Arnaman's ruling here and his ruling in another place for a certain man Talmud, Mas Baba Batra said to another I will sell you all the property of Barsa since there was a piece of land which was called Barsa since but the vendor said this is not really the property of Barsa and though it is called Barsa since the case was brought before Arnaman and he decided in favor of the purchaser said Robert to him is this a right decision does not the onus probandi always lie on the claimant there is thus a contradiction between these two remarks of Rabbah and also between the two rulings of Arnaman and between the two remarks of Rabbah there is no contradiction in the latter case the seller is in possession in the former the purchaser is in possession neither is there any contradiction between the two rulings of Arnaman and in the latter case since the seller professed to sell the property of Barsasins and this land is called Barsasins it is for him to prove that it is not Barsasins but here let the occupier in pleading presumptive right be but treated as if he produced a document of sale in which case should we not say to him prove your document to be valid and you can remain in ownership of the property a certain
Prefer to go to law with you rather than with him on hearing of this Rabbah said he was quite within his rights in what he said to him what authority does Rabbah follow the authority of admin for we have learned if a man claims a field after having witnessed to the sale of it to another admin says that his claim is still admissible because he can say I prefer to go to law with the second rather than the first the sages however say that by so doing he forfeits his right to put forward a claim you may even say that Rabbah is in agreement with the rabbis also for in that case they quash his right to make a claim because he has actually done something which conflicts with it but in this case he has merely said something and a man may easily let a word slip out of his mouth a certain man said to another what right have you on this land he replied I bought it from so and so and I have had the use of it for the period of Hazakah said the first so and so is a robber but said the other I have witnesses to prove that you came the evening before and said to me sell it to me my idea was said the first to buy what I was already legally entitled to on hearing of it Rabbah said it is not unusual for a man to buy what he is already legally entitled to a certain man said to his neighbor what right have you on this land he replied I bought it from so and so and have had the use of it for the period of Hazakah said the other but I have a title deed to prove that I bought it from him four years ago said the other do you think that when I say the period of Hezakah I mean only three years I mean a lot of years said Rabbah it is not unusual to refer to a long period of years as the period of Hezakah this maxim would apply to the present case only if the occupier has had the use of the land for seven years so that his presumptive right came before the deed Talmud, Mas Baba Batra Talmud, Mas Baba Batra but if only six years then no protest could be more. Effective than this there was a case where one said this land belonged to my father and the other pleaded it belonged to my father the one brought witnesses to prove that it belonged to his father and the other brought witnesses to prove that he had had the use of it for the period of Hezakah Rabbah said in giving judgment what motive had he to tell a falsehood if he liked he could have pleaded without fear of contradiction I bought it from you and had the use of it for the period of Hazaka said Abay to him but the consideration why should he tell a falsehood is not taken into account where it conflicts with evidence so the occupier pleaded again yes it did belong to your father but I bought it from you and what I meant by saying that it belonged to my father was that I felt as secure in it as if it had belonged to my father the question here arises is a litigant allowed to alter his pleas in the course of the case or is he not allowed to alter his pleas Allah said he is allowed to alter his pleas the Nihardi and say he is not allowed to alter his pleas Allah however admits that if this man had pleaded at first it belonged to my father and not to yours he could not later alter his plea to say it did belong to yours Allah also admits that if a man does not amend his pleas in any way when in court but after leaving the court comes in again and amends and the rule that he may alter his original plea does not apply because we assume that someone has suggested the amended plea to him the Nihardians on their side admit that if after saying it belonged to my father he pleads my father who bought it from your father he is allowed to alter his plea to this effect also that if a man makes certain statements outside the court and then wants to plead something quite different in court he may do so because a man often does not wish to state his case save in actual court Amimar said I am a Nihardian and I'll hold that please may be altered and such is it. Accepted ruling that please may be altered a case arose in which one said this land belonged to my father and the other said to my father but the one brought witnesses to prove that it had belonged to his father and that he had had the use of it for the period of Hezaka and the other brought witnesses only to prove that he had had the use of it for a sufficient number of years to confer a legal title said Arnam and the evidence that the one has had the use of it cancels out the evidence. That the other has had the use of it and the land is therefore assigned to the one who brings evidence that it belonged to his father said Rabba to him but the evidence has been confuted he replied granted that it has been conf in regard to the user Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B has it been conf in regard to the father may we say that in principle the difference between Arnam and Rabba here is the same as that between Arhuna and Arhis in the following statement if two sets of Witnesses contradict one another so that one set must be giving false evidence. Arhuna says that each set may give evidence as a whole. In another case, Arhista, however, says, What have we to do with false witnesses? May we say then that Arnaman here follows Arhuna and Rabba Arhista? No, there is no difference between them in the application of Arhista's ruling. Where they differ is in the application of Arhuna's ruling. Arnaman would thus have acted on the ruling of Arhuna, whereas Rabba would maintain that Arhuna only meant it to apply to evidence given in another case entirely, but not as here to another part of the same case. He then brought witnesses to prove that the land had belonged to his father Arnaman. Thereupon said, As we put him out, so we can put him in, and we disregard any disrepute that this may bring on the Beth in Rabba or others. Say, Arzeira objected to this ruling on the strength of the following. If two witnesses declare that a man is dead and two others. Declare that he is not dead, or if to declare that his wife had been divorced from him and to that she had not been divorced, she must not marry again. But if she has married, she need not leave her husband. Armenaham son of Arhose says that she must leave the second husband. Said Armenaham son of Arhose, when do I say that she must leave a husband if the witnesses who say he is not dead came first and she married afterwards? But if she was married before these witnesses came, she need not leave her husband. Arnaman replied, I was going to act according to the declaration I just made now, however, that you have brought arguments against me and that Arhamna in Surah has likewise refuted me. I shall not act so in spite of the statement, however, he subsequently did act so. Those who saw it thought he had made a mistake, but this was not the case because he had the support of great authorities, for we learned a man is not given the status of priest on the evidence of one witness. Said. Our Eliezer, this is only when his title is called into question, but if no one calls his title into question, one witness is sufficient. Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel said in the name of our Simeon, the son of the Seek, and one witness is sufficient to prove a man's title to be a priest is not Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel merely repeating our Eliezer, and should you say that they differ in regard to the case where there is only one challenger, our Eliezer holding that an objection is valid if raised by one challenger. And Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel holding Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, that there must be two, then what of the statement of our Yohanan who said that according to all authorities no objection is valid unless it is raised by two challengers, we suppose therefore that the objection has been raised by two, and here we are dealing with a case where the father of this man is known to have been a priest, but a report has been spread that his mother was a divorced woman or a and we therefore deposed him. And then one witness came and testified that he was a genuine priest and we reinstated him and then two came and testified that his mother was a divorced woman or a halyza and we degraded him again and then one more witness came and testified that he was a genuine priest now all authorities agree that the evidence of the two witnesses who testified to his genuineness is combined although they did not testify in each other's presence and the point at issue is whether or not we disregard any disrepute that may be brought upon the Bethdin for altering its decision our Eliezer held that once we have deposed him we do not reinstate him for fear of bringing disrepute on the Bethdin whereas Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel says that just as we have deposed him so we can reinstate him and we disregard any disrepute that may be brought thereby on the Bethdin our Ashi strongly disputed this explanation saying if this is the case why should our Eliezer refuse to reinstate him if only one witness Appears at the end why not even if two come together no said Arashi all agree that we disregard any disrepute that may be brought on the Bethdin and the point at issue here is whether the evidence of different witnesses can be combined the point on which we find a difference between ten aim for it has been taught the evidence of the two witnesses is not combined and does not carry weight unless they both testify to have seen at the same time our Joshua B. Korha however says that the evidence is combined even if one testifies that he saw at one time and the other at another nor is there evidence accepted in the Bethdin unless they testify together our Nathan however says that the evidence of one may be taken on one day and the evidence of the other when he comes on the next day a certain man said to another what are you doing on this land he replied I bought it from you and here is a deed of sale Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B it is a forged document said the first on this the other Leaned over to Rabbi and whispered to him it is true that this is a forged document I had a proper deed but I lost it so I thought it best to come into court with some sort of document said Rabbi what motive has he for telling a falsehood if he had liked he could have said without fear of contradiction that the document was genuine said
On your behalf here is your bond said the other did I not pay you he rejoined did you not borrow the money from me again redb Abin before whom the case came sent a message to Abay inquiring as to the ruling for such a case Abay sent him back answer what do you want to know did you not yourself say that the accepted ruling is that of Rabbah in the case of the land and of our Joseph in the case of the money namely that the money should remain in its present ownership this however holds. Good only if the surety said to the other after repaying you again borrowed the money from me if however he says I returned it to you because the coins were worn or rusty the obligation of the bond still remains and was rumored of Rabbah B. Sharsham that he was using for himself land that belonged to orphans for whom he was trustee so Abay sent for him and said to him tell me now the main facts of the case he said I took over this land from the father of the orphans as a mortgage for money. That he owed me and he owed me Talmud, Mas Baba Batra other money besides when I had had the use of the land for the number of years covered by the mortgage I said to myself if I restore the land to the orphans and then tell them that I have still a claim on their father for more money I shall have to comply with the rule of the rabbis that anyone who claims to recover from orphans must support his claim with an oath I will therefore keep back the mortgage bond and continue to use it. Lent to the extent of the money still owing to me for since if I were to say that I had bought the land my plea would be accepted I shall certainly be believed when I say that they owe me money said of age to him you could not plead that you have bought the land because common report says that it belongs to the orphans go therefore and restore it to them and when they become of age claim your debt from them in court a relative of R.E.D.B. Abin died leaving a day tree R.E.D. and another man. Disputed its possession R.E.D. saying I am the nearer relative whilst the other man said I am the nearer relative and the other man seized the tree eventually however he admitted that R.E.D. was a nearer relative and R.H.D. assigned to him the tree R.E.D. then claimed let him return me the produce which he has consumed from the time he seized it said R.H.D. so this is the man who is said to be a great authority on what ground do you base your ownership on this man as admission but he has been saying till now that he was a nearer relative of A and Rab did not concur in Arhista's decision Talmud, Mas Baba Batra B they held that the man's admission covered the produce as well as the tree a case arose in which one said the land belonged to my father and another said to my father but while the one brought witnesses to prove that it had belonged to his father up to the time of his death the other brought witnesses to prove that he had had the use of it for the period. Of Hezaka when the case came before Arhista he said what motive has he who occupies it to tell a falsehood if he likes he can say I bought it from you and have had the use of it for the period of Hezaka Abay and Rabba however did not concur in this judgment of Arhista on the ground that we do not advance the plea what motive had he to tell a falsehood when it conflicts with direct evidence a certain man said to another what are you doing on this land he replied I bought it from you and have had the use of it for the period of Hezaka he then went and brought witnesses to prove that he had had the use of it for two years but could not find witnesses for the third Arnam and thereupon decided that he should restore both the land and the produce Arzibit said if he had pleaded I was working the land for the produce only as a Medea his plea would have been accepted for his not Rab Judah laid down that if a man takes a pruning knife and rope in his hand and says I am going to gather the dates from the tree of so and so who has sold them to me his word is accepted because a man would not take the liberty of gathering the dates from a tree which did not belong to him so here a man would not take the liberty to consume produce that did not belong to him but might not the same be said of the land also if he the occupier claims the land we say to him show us your deed of sale cannot we then say the same in the case of the produce also written agreements are not Usually made in regard to produce a certain man said to another what right have you on this land he replied I bought it from you and I have had the use of it for the period of Hezaka and he brought one witness to prove that he had had the use of it for three years the rabbis of the court of Abay propounded the opinion that this case was parallel to that of the bar of metal which was decided by Araba what happened was that a certain man seized the bar of metal from another and the latter brought the case before RMI before whom Araba was sitting at the time he brought one witness to prove that the man had snatched the article from him yes said the other I did snatch but it was my own property that I snatched RMI thereupon said Talmud Mas Baba Batra how are the judges to decide this case shall we make him pay there are not two witnesses against him shall we let him off scot free there is one witness shall we administer an oath to him but he admits that he snatched the article and since he admits that he is as far as this case goes a robber said our to him he is in the position of a man who is legally under obligation to take an oath and is yet unable to take it and the rule is that whoever is under obligation to take an oath which he cannot take must pay Abay however said to the rabbis are the two cases on all fours there in the case of the bar of metal the witness comes to oppose the defendant and if there were another witness with him we should make him give up the article here in the case of the land the witness comes to support the defendant and if there were another witness we should confirm his title to the land if you do wish to draw a parallel with the case of Arab it would be in the case of one witness who testifies that the occupier has had the use of the land two years and where the claim is for the produce Talmud Mas Baba Batra B there was a certain river boat about which two men were disputing one said it is mine and the other said it is mine one of them went to the Beth Din and appealed to them attach the boat until I bring witnesses to prove that it belongs to me in such a case should we attach the boat or not Arhuna says we should attach it and Rab Judah says we should not the Beth Din having attached the boat the man went to look for his witnesses but did not find them whereupon he requested the Beth Din to release the boat leaving it to the stronger to obtain possession in such a case should we release or not Rab Judah says we should not release our Papa says we should release the accepted ruling is that we should not attach in the first instance but if we have attached we should not release if there are two claimants to a property and one says it belonged to my father while the other says to my father without either of them bringing any evidence Arnaman says that whichever is stronger can take possession why it may be asked should the ruling be different here from the case in which two deeds of sale or gift relating to the same property and bearing the same day Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra are presented in court in which case Rab rules that the property should be divided between the claimants and Samuel that the judges should assign it according to their own discretion in that case there is no chance that further evidence should come to light here there is a chance that further evidence may come to light but why should the ruling here be different from what we have learned if a man exchanges a cow for an ass and it calves and similarly if a man sells a female slave and she bears a child if the seller says that the birth took place before the sale and the purchaser that it took place after the sale they must share the offspring in that case each Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra had at some time a pecuniary interest in the article in dispute but in this case of Arnaman if the property belonged to one it never belonged to the other than the Hardians. Laid down that if an outsider comes and seizes the property he is not forced to surrender it because Arhaya taught he who robs the public is not a robber in the legal sense Arashi said he is indeed a robber in the legal sense and why does Arhaya say that he is not a robber in the legal sense because he is unable to make restitution like an ordinary robber their period of Hezaka is three years from day to day Arabah said if the claimant of a piece of land helps a man in possession to lift the basket of produce onto his shoulders this at once creates a presumption that the land belongs to the latter Arzibit said if however he pleads I have installed him as a Medea with the right to the produce but not the ownership of the land his plea is accepted this too is only the case if the plea is made within three years of the alleged transfer but not later said Arashi to Arkahana if he had made him a Medea for more than three years what was he to do he said he should have Lush the protest within three years for were you not to say so then what about the so-called mortgage of Surah containing the stipulation on the termination of these X years this land shall be given up without payment now suppose the mortgagee suppresses the mortgage bond and asserts that he has bought the land are we indeed to say that his plea is to be accepted would the rabbis make a regulation which would expose the mortgage to unfair loss but the fact is that he can protect himself by lodging a protest within three years and so in this case also he can protect himself by lodging a protest within three years Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbi Jew who derives his title from a non-Jew is on the same footing as a non-Jew just as a non-Jew cannot prove his right save through producing a deed of sale so the Jew who derives his title from a non-Jew to a field originally belonging to a Jew cannot prove his right save through producing a deed of sale said Rabbi if however the Jew Pleads Talmud, Mas Baba Batra
Confer Hazaka if however added Rabba the field is in the neck of Mahusa this does confer Hazaka our nomin said the occupation of land which is full of cracks does not confer Hazaka if the land yields no more than is sown in it its occupation does not confer Hazaka members of the Exilarch's house do not obtain Hazaka through occupation of our fields nor do we obtain Hazaka through occupation of theirs and slaves etc. Is there then a presumptive title to slaves has not Reshlakish laid down? That there is no presumptive title to living creatures said Rabba what Reshlakish meant is that there is no presumptive title in regard to them immediately but there is after three years possession Rabba further said if the slave is an infant in a cradle presumptive right to it is conferred immediately surely this is self-evident it required to be stated on account of the case where the child has a mother you might think in that case that there is a chance that the mother brought it into it. House where it now is and left it there Rabba therefore tells us that a mother does not forget her child some goats went into a field in Nihartia and ate some peeled barley which they found there the owner of the barley went and seized them and made a heavy claim on the owner of the goats the father of Samuel said he can claim up to the value of the goats because if he likes he can plead that the goats themselves are his by purchase but surely Reshlakish has said that there is no Hazaka to living things goats are an exception because they are entrusted to a goat herd but they are left to themselves morning and evening in Nihartia thieves abound and the goats are delivered from hand to hand our Ishmael says three months etc may we say that the actual difference between our Ishmael and our Akiba is in regard to plowing our Ishmael holding that plowing does not help to confer Hazaka and our Akiba that it does if this were the case why should our Akiba require a month Talmud? Mas Baba Bathra B in the first and third years even one day would be enough no both are agreed that plowing does not help to confer Hazaka and the difference between them is whether a full or partially grown crop is required our rabbis taught plowing does not help to confer Hazaka some authorities hold however that it does help who are some authorities are his said this is the opinion of our Ahad as we see from the following if a man plows a field fellow one year and sows it two or even plows it fellow two years and sows it one this does not confer Hazaka our Ahad however says that it does give him a presumptive right RBB inquired of Arnaman what is the reason of those authorities who lay down that plowing does confer Hazaka he answered a man will not see someone else plow his field and keep quiet and what is the reason of those who say that plowed fellow does not confer Hazaka because the owner says to himself the more he plows the better for me the people Upon Nahara sent to inquire of Arnaman B. R. His as follows Will our master be so good as to instruct us whether Plowfellow helps to confer Hezaka or not? He replied, Araha and all the chief authorities of the age hold that Plowfellow does help to confer Hezaka. Arnaman B. Isaac said, You gain nothing by citing authorities for Rab and Samuel in Babylon and our Ishmael and our Akiba in Eretz Israel held that Plowing does not help to confer presumptive right of views of our Ishmael and our Akiba on the subject can be derived from the Mishnah. Where do we find the view of Rab on the subject in the following statement? Rab Judah said, In the name of Rab, this is the view of our Ishmael and our Akiba, but the sages say that the Hezaka of such a field is conferred only by occupation for three full years. Now the expression full years is intended to exclude Plowfellow. Is it not? Where is the view of Samuel on the subject expressed in the following statement? Rab Judah said, In the name. Of Samuel, this is the view of our Ishmael and our Akiba, but the sages say that Hezaka is not obtained until the occupier has gathered in three crops of dates and called three vintages and plucked three crops of olives. Where does the difference arise between Rab and Samuel? The difference arises in the case of a young date tree. Our Ishmael said this applies only to a cornfield, etc. Abbe said on the strength of our Ishmael's ruling, we may attribute the following opinion to the rabbi. Suppose a man has thirty trees in a field planted, ten to the Beth Seah, then if he takes the produce of ten in one year, ten in the next, and ten in the third year, this constitutes Hezaka Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra, for did not our Ishmael lay down that one kind of crop confers a presumptive title to the whole field, so here one set of ten trees confers a presumptive title to the others, and vice versa. This, however, is only the case if the other twenty did not produce in the other two years, for if they did produce. And he did not take the produce, he obtains no hezaka, and in any case it is necessary that the trees of which he does take the produce should be spread about the field. If a man sells a field to two persons, the ground to one and the trees to the other, and if the one takes possession of the ground and the other takes possession of the trees, Arzibit says that the one becomes legal owner of the trees and the other becomes the legal owner of the ground, our papa strongly objected to this ruling. According to this, he said the owner of the trees has no right whatever in the ground, and the owner of the ground can therefore tell him when the tree withers, cut down your tree and take it and be gone. No said our papa the law is that the one becomes owner of the trees and half the ground and the other of half the ground. There is no question that if a man sells a piece of ground and retains the trees on it for himself, he is entitled to a certain amount of ground around the trees. This ruling would be accepted even by our Akiba who said in regard to a field with a well in it that the seller interprets the terms of the sale liberally for this only applies to a well and a cistern which do not impair the soil but in the case of trees which do impair the soil Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B, he would certainly reserve for himself some of the soil since otherwise the purchaser can say to him when the tree withers pluck up your tree and be gone if however a man sells the trees in a field and retains the ground for himself in this there applies the dispute between our Akiba and the rabbis is whether the purchaser is entitled to any ground around the trees according to our Akiba who holds that the vendor interprets the terms of the sale liberally the purchaser is entitled to such ground according to the rabbis he is not that our Akiba would allow the purchaser such ground would not be questioned even by our Zibit, who said in the case mentioned above that he is not so entitled for. This was only where there were two purchasers the reason being that one can say to the other just as I have no share in the tree so you have no share in the ground here however the seller interprets the terms of the sale liberally that the rabbis in this case do not allow the purchaser such ground would not be questioned even by our papa who said above that he is so entitled for this was only where there are two purchasers the reason being that one the purchaser of the ground can say to the other just as the vendor interpreted the terms of sale generously for you so he did for me here however the seller interprets the terms of sale strictly the Nihardians say if the thirty trees mentioned above are planted close together the gathering in of their produce does not confer Hezaka Rabba strongly questioned this ruling on this view he said how is Hezaka to be obtained in a row of clover no said Rabba what we should say is that if a man sells saplings closely planted the purchaser does not acquire any of the soil. Our Zara said a similar difference of opinion is found between Tanaim and the following Mishnah. If a vineyard is planted on less than four cubits, our Simeon says that it is not a vineyard in the legal sense, whereas the rabbis say that it is a proper vineyard. The middle row being regarded as non-existent, the Nihardians say if a man sells a date tree to another, the purchaser acquires the soil under it from its base to the furthest depth. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra. A rabbi strongly questioned this ruling on the ground that the seller can say what else sell you is sold in the same way as garden crocus. Pluck up your garden crocus and be off. No said rabbi, this is only the case when he is able to plead so expressly. Markashi saw the son of Arhista said to Arashi, if the seller did sell him the tree in the same way as a plot of garden crocus, what was he to do? He should have lodged a protest within three years, for should you not say so then in the case of it? Mortgage of Surah which stipulates that on the termination of these X years this land shall be given up without payment if the mortgagee suppresses the bond and says that he has bought the land would his plea indeed be valid have the rabbis then made a regulation through which the mortgager is exposed to unfair loss of fact is that he should protect himself by lodging a protest so here also it is incumbent on him to lodge a protest mission there are in Eretz Israel three districts which are distinct from each other in the matter of Hezaka Judea Transjordan and Galilee thus if the owner is in Judea and the occupier in Galilee or the owner in Galilee and the occupier in Judea the occupation does not confer Hezaka it only does so if the owner is in the same district with the occupier our Judah says the period in which occupation confers Hezaka was fixed at three years only in order that it might be possible when a man is in Spain for another to occupy his field one year and for information to be brought to him which will also take a year and for him to return
His valid rabbin making this latter statement was giving the reason of the tana of our mission, but he did not himself concur. There is another version of this passage as follows: Rab Judah said, Rab laid down that occupation of the property of a fugitive does confer hazaka. When I related this to Samuel, he said, Of course, do you imagine the protest has to be made in the presence of the occupier? What then does Rab desire to indicate by this ruling that a protest made not in the occupier's presence is valid? But surely this has been laid down by Rab already. The truth is that this is what Rab wishes to indicate that even if the owner made his protest in the presence of two men who are not able to report it to the occupier, it is still a valid protest. For so Arain reported it has been expressly stated to me by Mar Samuel that if the protest is made in the presence of two men who are able to report it to the occupier, it is valid. But if of two men who are not able to report it to the Occupier, it is not valid, and Rab he goes on the principle that your friend has a friend, and your friend's friend has a friend. Rabbah said the law is that it is not permissible to take possession of the property of a fugitive, and a protest made not in the presence of the occupier is valid. Are not these two rulings contradictory? No, the latter relates to a fugitive on account of debt, the former to a fugitive on account of manslaughter. What constitutes a protest? Arzibit says if the owner says so, and so is a robber. This is no protest. If, however, he says so, and so is a robber who has seized my land wrongfully, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathre, and tomorrow I am going to sue him. This is a protest. Suppose the owner says to those to whom he makes the protest, do not tell the occupier. Is this a valid protest? Arzibit says it is not because he has distinctly told them not to tell our Papa. However, says that it is because what he meant was do not tell the occupier, but you can tell others and your friend. As a friend and your friend's friend has a friend if the men to whom he made the protest say we will not tell the occupier is it a protest or it says that it is not because they distinctly say we will not tell him or papa however says that it is because what they meant was we will not tell the occupier himself but we will tell others and your friend has a friend and your friend's friend has a friend if he said to them don't say a word about this is it a protest or it says it is not because he has told them not to say a word if they say to him we will not say a word about it even our papa says it is not a protest because they tell him distinctly we are not going to say a word Arhuna the son of our Joshua however says that it is a protest because if a man has no responsibility in regard to a certain statement he will blurt it out without thinking Rabbah said in the name of our nominee protest made not in the presence of the occupier is a valid protest Rabbah questioned Naman's ruling on the ground of the following Arjuda says that the period in which occupation confers Hazaka was fixed at three years in order that it might be possible for a man to be in Spain during the first year in which his field is occupied and for information to be brought to him in the second year and for him to return himself in the third year. Now if we are to assume he said that a protest made not in the presence of the occupier is a valid protest why should the man have to come back let him stay where he is and make the protest there Arjuda is merely suggesting as a piece of good advice that he should return and take possession of his land and the produce I from the fact that Rabbah questioned Arnaman's ruling it would seem that he was not of opinion that a protest made not in the occupier's presence is valid how can this be seeing that Rabbah has laid down that a protest made not in the presence of the occupier is valid he adopted this view after he had Learned it from Arnaman Ar Jose Bihanna once came across the disciples of Ar Yohanan and inquired of them whether Ar Yohanan had ever laid down the number of persons in whose presence a protest must be made. Ar Hai Bihab replied that Ar Yohanan had laid down that a protest must be made in the presence of two persons or Rabbah that it must be made in the presence of three persons. May we say that the difference in principle between Ar Hai Bihab and Ar is in regard to the dictum of Rabbah. Son of Arhuna for Rabbah, son of Arhuna said that disparaging remarks made in the presence of three persons Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi do not constitute slander. The one who says that a protest can be made in the presence of two persons Ar Hai Bar we would say does not accept the dictum of Rabbah, son of Arhuna, while the one who says that three persons must be present Ar does accept it. No, both accept the dictum of Rabbah, son of Arhuna, and the essential difference between them here. Is this the one who says that the protest may be made in the presence of two persons is of opinion that a protest made not in the presence of the occupier is no protest whereas the one who says that three persons must be present is of opinion that a protest made not in the presence of the occupier is valid alternatively we may reply that both our high and our agree that a protest made not in the presence of the occupier is valid and the point on which they join issue here is this that the one who says the protest may be made in the presence of two persons considers that what we require them for is to provide evidence while the one who holds that three persons must be present considers that what we require them for is to ensure that the matter should be brooded abroad it'll be minyumi had occasion to make a protest against the occupation of some land of his he found Arhuna and Hibirab and Arhilkiyab Toby sitting together and made his protest in there Presence a year later he again came to make a protest they said to him this is not necessary Rab has laid down distinctly that if the owner makes a protest in the first year he need not repeat it according to another report Hayabi Rab said to him since the owner made a protest in the first year he need not repeat it Resh Lakish said in the name of Barkabra it is necessary to repeat the protest every three years or Yohanan found this dictum very surprising can a robber he said obtain a title from continued occupation a robber do you say what you should rather say is can one who is like a robber obtain a title from continued occupation Rabbah said the law is that the owner must make a protest at the end of every three years Barkabra taught if an owner protests against the occupation of his land and after an interval repeats his protest a second and a third time if he always adheres to his first plea the occupation confers no title but if he does not then it does confer a Title Rabbah said in the name of our nominee protest against the occupation of property must be made in the presence of two persons Talmud, Mas Baba Bathre and they are at liberty to write it down without being definitely instructed by the protester to do so a moda must be made in the presence of two persons and they are at liberty to write it down without being definitely instructed to do so an admission of a debt must be made in the presence of two persons and they must not write it. Unless definitely instructed to do so a transfer by means of a cloth must be carried out in the presence of two persons and they may record it in writing without being definitely instructed to do so for certifying the signatures of witnesses to documents of Bethdin of three persons is required the mnemonic for these is Mamak said Rabbah if I have any difficulty about any of these rulings it is this how are we to regard this legal transfer by means of a cloth if it is on a PAR with a Proceeding of the Bethdin, then we should require three persons if it is not on a PAR with the proceedings of the Bethdin, why can it be recorded without the permission of the seller after posing the question he himself resolved it? In fact, a Kanyan he said is not on the same footing as a proceeding of the Bethdin, and the reason why the witnesses may record it in writing without definite instructions from the transferor is because a Kanyan, unless there are instructions to the contrary, is intended to be recorded in writing. Both Rabbah and our Joseph hold that a moda should not be issued save against a man who does not obey the decisions of the Bethdin. This is not the opinion of Abbe and Rabbah who said to one another it can be issued even against me and against you the Nihardi and say that a moda Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi that does not contain the words we the undersigned are cognizant that so and so is acting under duress is no moda of what kind of moda are we? Speaking of one relating to a get bill of divorce or a gift, why should the witnesses have to make this declaration seeing that it only states something which is more or less self-evident if again it is one relating to a sale has not Rabba laid down that we do not issue a motor relating to a sale we are in fact speaking here of one relating to a sale and Rabba admits that such a one may be issued where the seller acts under such constraint as is exemplified in the following. Case a man mortgaged an orchard to another man for three years the latter after he had had the use of the orchard for the three years necessary for Hazaka said to the owner if you will sell it to me well and good and if not I will suppress the mortgage deed and say that I purchased it outright in such a case a motor may be issued on the owner's behalf Rab Judah said a deed of gift drawn up in secret is not enforceable what is meant by a deed of gift drawn up in secret our Joseph said if it Donor said to the witnesses go and write it in some hidden place others report that what our Joseph said was if the donor did not say to the witnesses find a place in the street or in some public place and
possession and not that the other should obtain possession. The question was asked in the Beth Hamid Rash Talmud, Mas Baba Batra Talmud, Mas Baba Batra, what is the rule where the donor does not specify the place of writing? Rabbana said that we take no account of this. Rashi said that we do take account of it. The law is that we do take account of admission. The fact of possession, if not reinforced by some plea of right, does not of itself confer a title of ownership. For instance, if a man says to another, What are you doing on my property? and he replies, No one has ever said a word to me about it. His occupation confers no title. If, however, he pleads, I am here because you sold the land to me, because you gave it to me, because your father sold it to me, because your father gave it to me, then his occupation confers a title of ownership. and occupier by virtue of inheritance does not require any such plea. Gamara, the fact of possession, if not reinforced by some plea of right, does not. Of itself confer a title of ownership, surely this is self evident. The reason for stating it is this we might say the land really was sold to this man and he had a deed and has lost it. And the reason why he pleads as he does is because he thinks that if he says he bought the land, he will be asked to produce the deed of sale. Let the Beth Din and suggest to him that perhaps he had a deed and lost it on the principle of open thy mouth for the dumb. The Mishnah therefore tells us that this is not so. Nimonic and Abraham's field was flooded through the bursting of a dam. He afterwards went and restored the fence which, however, he built on land belonging to his neighbor. The latter on discovering this suit him before Arnaman, he said to him, You must restore the land, but he rejoined, I have become the owner of it by occupation. Said Arnaman to him, On whose authority do you rely on that of Arishmael and Arjuta who both lay down that if the occupation takes place in presence of the owner without protest it constitutes a title at once the law however is not in accordance with their ruling Arain and thereupon said but this man has tacitly waived his right because he came and helped me to build the fence Arnaman replied this was a waiver given in error you yourself had you known that the land was his would not have built the fence on it just as you did not know so he also did not know Arkahana's land was flooded through the bursting of a dam he afterwards went and built a new fence on land which did not belong to him Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi he came before Rab Judah and the other went and brought two witnesses one of whom asserted that Arkahana had encroached to the extent of two rows and the other to the extent of three rows Rab Judah said to Arkahana go and compensate the man for two out of the three rows said Arkahana who is your authority for this ruling he replied Rabbi Simeon B. Eliezer as it has been taught Rabbi Simeon B. Eliezer states that Beth Shammai and Bethel agreed that if there are two sets of witnesses to a loan, one of which says that the loan was for one mina and the other for two mina, their evidence is accepted in respect of the one mina because one mina is included in two where they differed was in the case where there is one pair of witnesses of whom one says that the loan was for a mina and the other that it was for two minas. In that case, Beth Shammai held that their evidence is at variance. Whereas Bethel held that two minas include one Arkahana rejoined, but I can bring you a letter from the West Eretz Israel to show that the Halacha does not follow our Simeon to which Rab Judah replied, Meanwhile, my decision can stand till you bring it. A certain man lived four years in an upper room in Kashta. One day the owner of the room came and found him there and said to him, What are you doing in this house? He replied, I bought it from so and so who bought it from you. He summoned him. Before Arhai who said to the occupier if you can bring evidence to show that the man from whom you bought the house lived in it even for a single day I will declare you the owner but otherwise not Rab said afterwards to his disciples I was sitting in front of my uncle and I said to him will not a man sometimes buy and sell a thing on the same night I noted however his agreement in the case where the occupier said the man from whom I bought it bought it from you in my presence then his word is accepted because had he wished he could have put forward a still stronger plea by saying I myself bought it from you Rab said the ruling of Arhai is more likely to be right because the Mishnah says here an occupier by virtue of inheritance does not require any plea it is a plea that he does not require but he does require to bring a proof that the person from whom he inherited the land occupied it possibly however the Mishnah means that he requires neither plea nor proof or if you like I can say that a purchaser is on a different footing from an heir because he is not likely to have thrown away money for nothing. The question was asked in the Beth Hamid Rash if the previous owner was seen on the property. What are we to infer? Abbe replied that is just what we mean. Rabbah however said it is quite possible for a man to measure out his field and not sell it after all three successive purchasers of the same field can count as one. Rab said this is only if all the purchases were affected by deed. Does this indicate that in Rab's opinion a sale by deed becomes generally known but a sale in the presence of witnesses does not become generally known? Surely Rab himself has laid down that if a man sells a field with a guarantee in the presence of witnesses the purchaser may recover even from property on which there is a lien. In that case the purchaser's Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra have only themselves to blame but did Rab indeed give this ruling have we? Not learned in a mission if a man lends money to another on a bond he may recover his debt even from property on which there is a lien supposing there are no free assets if however the loan was made only in the presence of witnesses he may only recover from property on which there is no lien and should you answer that Rab is himself considered a tenant and may dispute the ruling of a mission this can hardly be since Rab and Samuel have both laid down that a loan contracted by word of mouth cannot be recovered either from the ears of the debtor or from those who have subsequently purchased from him or you are giving from a loan to a sale when a man borrows money he does so as secretly as possible in order that his property may not depreciate if he sells land however he does so as publicly as possible in order that people may know about it our rabbis taught if the father occupies the field a year and the son two years or the father two years and the son one year or the father one year, the son one year, and the purchaser one year. Such occupation confers a title of ownership. Now this would indicate, would it not, that when a man purchases a piece of land, it becomes generally known. But this would seem to conflict with the following: if a man occupies a field in the lifetime of the father one year, and two years in the lifetime of the son, or two years in the lifetime of the father, and one year in the lifetime of the son, or one year in the lifetime of the father one year in the lifetime of the son, and one year in the lifetime of the purchaser. Such occupation confers a title of ownership. Now, if you assume that the purchase of a piece of land becomes generally known, surely there can be no protest stronger than this that the son has sold the land. Our Papa said the case of which this passage speaks is where the son sells all his fields without specifying anyone in particular. Mission craftsmen, partners, mediators, and trustees have no hazaka. Man has no hazaka in the property of his wife, nor has a woman hazaka in the property of her husband. A father has no hazaka in the property of his son, nor has a son hazaka in the property of his father. These statements apply only to cases where ownership is claimed on the ground of possession. In the case, however, where land is presented as a gift or a brother's dividing an inheritance or of one who seizes the property of a proselyte, ownership can be claimed as soon as the first step has been taken towards making a door or a fence or an opening. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Bigamara Samuel's father and Levi learned from the Mishnah that a partner has no hazaka. Still less a craftsman. Samuel, however, learned that a craftsman has no hazaka, but a partner has Samuel. And this is consistent for Samuel has said that partners have hazaka as against each other and can give evidence in one another's favor and can stand to one another in the relation of paid keepers of their common property. Our Abba pointed out the following contradiction to our Judah in the burial cave of our Zakai's field. Did Samuel really say that a partner has Hazaka? Has not Samuel said that a partner is regarded as having freedom of entry into the whole of the joint property and is not this equivalent to saying that a partner has no Hazaka against the other partner? He replied, There is no contradiction in the one case. Samuel is speaking of a partner who takes possession of the whole of the joint field, in the other of one who takes possession of only half of it. To the question which is which some answer one way and some the other. Rabbin has said in both cases, Samuel is speaking of a partner who takes possession of the whole of the joint field, but still there is no contradiction because in the one case he speaks of a field which has to be divided if either partner demands, and in the other of a field which has not to be divided if either partner objects to revert to a previous text. Samuel said that a partner is regarded as having freedom to work the whole of the joint property. What does this tell us that a partner has no hazaka? Why does he not say distinctly that a partner has no hazaka? Arnaman said in the name of
partner responsibility in respect of whom if we say responsibility in general then all the more would he prefer it to be in the hands of the partner and he is therefore an interested party we must therefore say responsibility in respect of his own debt and suppose the partner does renounce his interest in the property does he do so sincerely has it not been taught if a scroll of the law belonging to the inhabitants of the town has been stolen the judges of that town must not try the alleged culprit nor can the inhabitants of the town give evidence against him now if a partner can renounce his interest why cannot two of the townspeople renounce their interest in the scroll and try him a scroll of the law is different because it is for public reading come and here if a man says distribute a mainder to the inhabitants of my town and it is stolen the judges of that town must not try the alleged culprit nor may the inhabitants give evidence against him why should this be Cannot two of them renounce their share in the gift and try him here too. We are dealing with the scroll of the law. Come and here if a man says distribute a mainted to the poor of my town and it is stolen, the alleged culprit is not to be tried by the judges of that town and the inhabitants of that town cannot give evidence in the case. What do you imagine then that because the poor receive the judges are to be disqualified? What therefore you mean to say is this the case must not be tried by the poor judges of that town nor may the poor of the town give evidence. Why now should this be? Cannot two of them renounce their share and try the case here too? We are dealing with the scroll of the law and the reason why the donor designated the recipients as poor is because all are poor in respect of the scroll of the law. Or if you like again, I can indeed say that the poor literally are meant and the particular poor referred to are those who support devolves on the judges. How are we to? Understand this if there is a fixed levy, let two of them give their contribution and then try the case. We assume therefore that there is no fixed levy, or if you like, I can say that there is indeed a fixed levy, yet still the rich are pleased that the mainness should be given to the poor because after all there is a surplus. Samuel said above that partners may stand to one another in the relation of paid keepers of their common property. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, why should this be seeing that? This is a case of keeping with the owner present. Our Papa replied, Samuel's rule applies where one said to the other, You keep the whole property for me today and I will keep it for you tomorrow. Our rabbis taught if a man sells to another house or a field, he is not allowed to testify to the latter's title to it because he is responsible to him for it. If however he sells him a cow or a garment, he can testify to his title to it because he is not responsible to him for it. Why should the rule? In the second case be different from that in the first Arshis hate said the first rule applies to a case where for instance Reuben wrongfully takes a field from Simeon and sells it to Levi and then Judah comes and contests Levi's title Simeon then must not go and give evidence in favor of Levi thinking that if Levi retains it it will be easier for him to recover it but if he has once testified that it belongs to Levi how can he recover it from him we suppose that what he will say in evidence is I know that this field does not belong to Judah but cannot he recover it from Judah by means of the same proofs by which he recovers it from Levi he says it is easier for me to deal with the second Levi than with the first Judah or if you like I can reply that both Simeon and Judah have witnesses to prove their title and the rabbis have laid down that in such cases the land shall remain in possession of its present owner Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, but if the explanation of Arshi's hate is correct, why should the rule not be stated in reference to the robber himself? Because it was necessary to state the second clause is if he sells him a cow or a garment, for in this case the selling is essential in order that there may be both giving up on the part of the original owner and change of ownership. But if the robber does not sell the article, since in this case the original owner may still recover it, he may not give evidence. Hence in the first clause also the selling is inserted. But is this rule sound in regard even to the second clause granted that the original owner abandons his claim to the article itself? He has not abandoned his claim to the money as he the rule requires to be stated to cover the case where the robber has died. As we have learned, if a man robs someone of food and gives it to his children to eat or bequeaths it to them, they are not under obligation to repay it. But if this explanation is correct, why should not the rule be? Stated in reference to the heir of the thief, it is true there is a reason why it should not if we accept the opinion that the ownership of an heir of a thief is not on the same footing as the ownership of a purchaser from a thief, but on the view that the ownership of the heir is on the same footing as the ownership of the purchaser. What are we to say? And Abbe finds yet another difficulty in the explanation of Arshi's hate is that the expressions because he is responsible for it, because he is not responsible for it, are on this theory improperly used, and the very this should say because it may be recovered by him, because it cannot be recovered by him. We must therefore understand the above rulings in the light of the dictum enunciated by Rabin B. Samuel in the name of Samuel, because if a man sells a field to another even without accepting responsibility, he cannot give evidence as to the latter's title because he can keep it safe for his own creditor. This applies only. To a house or a field, but in the case of a cow or a garment, not only is there no question, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, be that if he sells them without having declared them security to a creditor, the creditor has no lien on them. The reason being that they are movables, and movables cannot be mortgaged to a creditor. And even if the debtor gives a written promise to pay from the coat on his back, that is only binding so long as they are actually there, but not if they are not there. But even if he did declare them to be security, the creditor still has no lien on them. The reason is to be found in the dictum of Rabba. For Rabba said, if a man declares his slave security for a debt and then sells him, the creditor can seize him in satisfaction of the debt. But if he declares his ox or his ass security for the debt and then sells it, the creditor cannot seize it in payment of the debt. The reason being that the former, the hypothecating of a slave, becomes generally known, but the latter that of an ox or an ass does not become generally known, but is there not a possibility that he, the seller, mortgage to him the creditor movables along with landed property? And Rabbah has laid down that if a man mortgages to another movables along with landed property, the latter acquires a lien over the land and acquires one over the movables. Also, providing our histiads, he inserts in the bond the words this bond is no mere is macta or draft form. We assume here that the seller sold the cow or the garment immediately after himself acquiring it, but is there not still a possibility that this is a case where the seller has given his creditor a bond on movables which he will hereafter acquire? And may we not learn from this fact that if a man gives his creditor a bond on movables which he is hereafter to acquire and then acquires them and sells them or acquires them and bequeaths them, the creditor has no lien on them. This, however, was only meant to apply to the case where the witnesses. Say we know that this man never owned any land but has not our papa said although the rabbis have laid down that if a man sells his field to another without a guarantee and his creditor comes and seizes it the purchaser cannot recover the price of the field from him yet if it is found that the field did not belong to him he can recover in this case we suppose that the purchaser recognizes the ass he bought as being the full of an ass belonging to the seller Arzibid however says that even if it is found that the field did not belong to the seller the purchaser cannot recover from him because he can say to him that was precisely why I sold to you without a guarantee to revert to the above text Rabin B. Samuel said in the name of Samuel if a man sells a field to another without accepting responsibility he cannot give evidence as to the latter's title because he can keep it safe for his own creditor how can this be Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, if he has other land the creditor can sees that if he has no other land what advantage has he from the land remaining in the hands of the purchaser the rule actually applies to the case where he has no other land and the reason for it is that the seller is anxious if possible not to be a defaulter but when all is said and done he does become a defaulter in respect of the purchaser the rule is still sound because he says it was for this very reason that I sold it to you without a guarantee Rabbah or some say our papa issued a proclamation know all you that go up to Eretz Israel or go down to Babylon that if an Israelite sells an ass to a fellow Israelite and a Gentile comes and forcibly takes it from him it is the duty of the first to help him to rescue it this however only applies if the purchaser cannot recognize the ass as the foal of the seller but if he can recognize it as the foal of the ass of the seller he need not help him further we only say that he has this duty if the non-Jew does not Forcibly take the saddle along with the ass, but if he takes the saddle along with the ass, we do not say so. Amimar said, even without all these qualifications, he need not help him, because generally speaking, the heathen is a grabber, and so scripture says of them, their mouth speak vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. A craftsman has no hazaka. Rabbi said this rule was meant to apply only to the
the craftsman to sell it to me or to present it as a gift in such a case since if he chose he could plead I bought it from you when he merely pleads in my presence you told him to sell it his plea is certainly accepted now the first ruling refers to the case where the claimant sees the article in the craftsman's possession what are the circumstances if there are witnesses that he entrusted the article to the craftsman let him bring the witnesses and obtain possession we must suppose Therefore that there are no witnesses and nevertheless if he sees the article he can seize it rabbi replies no the case is in fact one where the article has been entrusted in the presence of witnesses but we must suppose also that the claimant sees it in the possession of the craftsman but said abey you yourself said that if a man entrusts an article to another in the presence of witnesses he must return it in the presence of witnesses rabbi replied i retract this opinion rabbi sought to confute abey and to support rabbi from the following if a man gives his garment to a workman to repair it the workman says you undertook to give me two zuzim and the owner says i only undertook to give you one then as long as the garment is in possession of the workman it is for the owner to bring proof if the workman has returned it then if the prescribed time has not yet elapsed he can take an oath and recover his claim but if the prescribed time has elapsed then the rule Applies that the onus probandi is on the claimant now what are the circumstances if the owner gave the garment to the workman in the presence of witnesses then let us see what the witnesses say Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra we must suppose therefore that there were no witnesses and the ruling stated is that the word of the workman is to be taken since he is able to plead that he has bought it his word is taken as to his payment to which Abay answers no the case in fact is one in which there were no witnesses to the original transfer but we suppose that the owner has not seen it in the hands of the workman Arnam and B. Isaac raised an objection against Rabbah's opinion from the following a craftsman has no hazaka from which we infer that other persons have hazaka in such a case in what circumstances if there are witnesses who saw the article transferred why have other persons hazaka we must suppose therefore that the rule applies to the case where there are no Witnesses and yet it is laid down that a craftsman has no hazaka this refutation of rabbi is decisive our rabbis have taught if a man receives another person's articles of clothing instead of his own from the workshop where they have been sent for repair etc he may use them until the other comes and claims them if they have become exchanged in the house of a mourner or at a party he must not use them but must keep them on one side until the other comes and claims them why should they ruling in these two cases be different rab said i was sitting before my uncle and he said to me it is no unusual thing for a man to say to the workman sell my garment for me or high the son of arnam and said this rule holds good only where the workman himself gave him the coat but not if it was given him by his wife or his sons and even so he must not use it unless the workman says here is a garment but if he says here is your garment he must not use it because this is not his garment Abbe. Said to Rabbi, come and I will show you a trick of the sharpers of Pumadai. The man will say to his tailor, give me back my cloak that I gave you to repair. The other will deny all knowledge of the matter, but the owner will say, I can bring witnesses to declare that they saw it in your possession. That was a different one. He will reply, the owner will then say to him, bring it out and let us see to which he will reply. To be sure, I don't bring it out. Rabbi said to him, that is very clever of him. Seeing that Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be the rule laid down is that the owner must see it in the hands of the craftsman. Said Arashi, if he the owner is clever, he will procure a sight of it by saying to the tailor, the reason why you are keeping back the coat is because I owe you money. Is it not? Why not then bring it out and have it valued so that you can take what is yours and I can take what is mine. Arahabi Arawi said to Arashi, the tailor can say to him, I do not require your valuation. It has already been valued by the people before you Amedaye has no hazaka why so seeing that at first he took only half the produce and now for three years he has taken the whole Aryohan and said we are speaking here of hereditary Amedaye's Arnam and said Amedaye who installs other Amedaye's in his place has hazaka because a man will not usually allow Amedaye's to be installed in his field and say nothing Aryohan and said Amedaye who assigns parts of his field to other Amedaye's has no hazaka why so because we may presume that permission was given him to do so Arnam and B. R. Hista sent an inquiry to Arnam and B. Isaac saying would our teacher be so good as to instruct us whether Amedaye can testify to the title of his employer or not our Joseph was sitting before him and said to him Samuel has definitely laid down that Amedaye may so testify but it has been taught that he may not testify there is no conflict of opinion in the one case we suppose that there is produce on it. Lend in the other that there is no produce on the land. Nimad Amalek, like our rabbis taught a surety may testify on behalf of the borrower provided that the borrower has other land besides that which is being claimed from him. A lender may testify on behalf of the borrower provided that the borrower has other land besides that which is being claimed from him. A first purchaser may testify on behalf of a second purchaser provided that the latter has other land besides that which is being claimed from him. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, in regard to a go between some say that he may testify on behalf of the borrower and some say that he may not. Those who say that he may testify regard him as being on the same footing as a surety, whereas those who say that he may not consider that he prefers fields of both qualities to be in the hands of the borrower so that the creditor can have the choice of seizing from either. Our Yohan and said a craftsman has no hazaka but the son of a craftsman has. Hazaka Amedaye has no Hazaka but the son of Amedaye has Hazaka neither a robber nor the son of a robber has Hazaka but the grandson of a robber has Hazaka how are we to interpret this if we suppose that they base their title solely on the possession of their father then the son of a craftsman and the son of Amedaye should also not have Hazaka if again they do not base their title on the possession of their fathers but on claims of their own then the son of a robber should also have Hazaka they do base their title on the possession of their fathers and our rule applies to the case where witnesses declare the claimant admitted to him the father in our presence that he had sold the land to him in the case of the others the son of the craftsman and the Amedaye and the grandson of the robber the presumption is that they are telling the truth but in the case of the son of the robber even though he the claimant admits he sold it to the father we do not Believe him on the ground put forward by our Kahana that if he did not admit this the other would hand him and his ass over to the town prefect. Rabbah said there are occasions when even the grandson of a robber also has no hazaka as for instance when he bases his title on the possession of his grandfather. What sort of man is meant here by robber are Yohanan said one for instance who is generally presumed to have obtained the field under consideration by robbery are his said those like the people of a certain family we know who do not shrink from committing murder to extort money are rabbis taught a craftsman has no hazaka but if he abandons his trade he has hazaka Medaye has no hazaka but if he ceases to be a Medaye he has hazaka a son who leaves his father's roof and a woman when divorced are on the same footing as strangers in relation to the father or husband why mention this it is true that for specifying the rule about the son who leaves his father's roof I can find a Reason since I might think that we presume the father to have tacitly consented to his occupying the land but now I know that this is not so but that the divorced woman becomes a stranger to her former husband is surely self-evident no the rule is required Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be to define the position of the woman who is both divorced and not divorced on account of the dictum of Arzera who said in the name of Arzera my B. Abba who had it from Samuel that wherever a woman was described by the sages as being divorced and yet not divorced the husband is still responsible for her maintenance Arnam and said who has informed me that if any one of the classes mentioned above brings a proof that his title to the field is valid we accept the proof and confirm their title to the land if however a robber this proof we do not accept it and we do not confirm his title to the land what has he or who not told us in this latter clause we already know as much from it Following mission, if a man buys a field from the Sakaricon and then buys it again from the original owner, the purchase is void. Are who not meant to dispute the opinion of Rab who said in reference to the statement this rule was only meant to apply in such a case where the original owner merely said to the purchaser, Go and occupy the field and become the owner. But if he gave him a written deed, then the purchaser acquires ownership. He or who not therefore tells us that the right opinion is that of Samuel who said that even if the original owner gives the purchaser a written deed, the latter does not acquire ownership. He only does so if the original owner gives him a lien on the rest of his property. Rb quoted Arnam and is adding to the statement which he had made in the name of Arhuna. Though the robber has no title to the land which he has forcib
Reason in this case is that he may be well satisfied to do so retrospectively so as to have atonement made for his sins. We must therefore look for the reason in the next passage of the Baritha quoted similarly in the case of divorces where the rabbis have said that the husband can be forced to give a divorce. We say that what is meant is that force is applied to him till he says I consent, but there too perhaps there is a special reason is that it is a religious duty to listen to. The word of the sages what we must say therefore is that it is reasonable to suppose that under the pressure he really made up his mind to sell Rav Judah question this on the ground of the following mission a get bill of divorce extorted by pressure applied by an Israelite is valid but if the pressure is applied by a non-Jew it is invalid a non-Jew also however may be commissioned by the Beth Din to flog the husband and say to him do what the Israelite bids you now why should the get be invalid if extorted by the non-Jew cannot we say that in that case also the man makes up his mind under pressure to grant the divorce this rule must be understood in the light of the statement made by our Meshashi regarding it according to the Torah itself the get is valid even if extorted by a non-Jew and the reason why the rabbis on their own authority declared it invalid was so as not to give an opportunity to any Jewish woman to keep company with a non-Jew and so release herself. From her husband Arhamana questioned the rule on the ground of the following mission if a man buys a field from a Sigaruz and then buys it again from the original owner the purchase is void why so cannot we say here too that under pressure the owner makes up his mind to sell the field we must understand the statement in the light of the gloss added by Rab this rule was meant to apply only if the owner merely said to the purchaser go and take possession and acquire ownership but if he gives him a written deed he becomes the legal owner but if we take the view of Samuel that even if he gives him a deed he does not become the owner what are we to reply to Arhamana Samuel admits that the sale is valid if the purchaser actually pays the owner but if we take the view of Arnaman as completed by the statement of RBB that though the robber has no title to the land he has a title to the payment he made what reply can be made by Arhamana RBB it is a mere statement and such an opinion Arhuna did not feel bound to accept Rabbah said the law is that if a man sells a thing under pressure of physical violence the sale is valid this is only the case however Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabi if he is forced to sell a field but if he is forced to sell this field it is not valid and again even if he is forced to sell this field the sale is not valid only if he has not counted out the money received in payment but if he does count out the money the sale is valid and again. Even in the case of this field and even if he did not count out the money the sale is not valid only if it was not possible for him to wriggle out of it but if he did have a chance to wriggle out of it and did not do so then it is valid in spite however of the statement of Rabbah the accepted ruling is that in all these cases the sale is valid even in the case of this field for the betrothal of a woman is analogous to the buying of this field and yet Amimar has laid down that if a woman Consents to betroth herself under pressure of physical violence. The betrothal is valid. Marsan of Arashi, however, said in the case of the woman, the betrothal is certainly not valid. He treated the woman cavalierly, and therefore the rabbis treat him cavalierly and nullify his betrothal. Rabbi said to Arashi, We can understand the rabbis doing this if he betrothed her with money, but if he betrothed her by means of intercourse, how can they nullify the act? He replied, The rabbis declared his intercourse to be fornication. One to betide a certain poppy to a tree and kept him there till he sold his field to him. Subsequently, Rabbi Barhan signed as a witness both to a moda issued by poppy and to a deed of sale of the field. Arunah, on hearing of it, said he who signed the moda acted quite properly, and he who signed the deed of sale acted quite properly. How can both be right if it was right to sign the moda? It was not right to sign the deed of sale, and if it was. Right to sign the deed of sale, it was not right to sign the moda. What Arhuna meant was this: had it not been for the moda, the one who signed the deed of sale would have acted rightly. Arhuna is thus consistent with the opinion expressed by him elsewhere. For Arhuna said that a sale extorted by physical violence is valid, but this is not so. Seeing that Arnaman has said, if the witnesses to a bond say subsequently we only wrote the bond under cover of an amada, their word is not Talmud. Mas Baba Bathray accepted also if the witnesses to a deed of sale say we only wrote under reservation of a moda, their word is not accepted. This is the case where they make a verbal statement to this effect because a verbal statement cannot invalidate a written deed, but if they write a deed, then one deed can invalidate another. The preceding text states that Arnaman said if the witnesses to a bond say we only wrote it under cover of an amada, their word is not accepted. And if the witnesses to a deed say we wrote it under the reservation of a moda, their word is not accepted. Marsan of Arashi, however, says that if they say we only wrote it under cover of an amada, their word is not accepted. But if they say we wrote under the reservation of a moda, their word is accepted. The reason is that it is proper to commit to writing a moda, but it is not proper to commit to writing an amada. The husband has no hazaka in the property of his wife. Surely this is self-evident since he has a right to the produce of the wife's field. Therefore, however long he occupies it, we say that he is merely taking the produce. The rule required to be stated for the case in which he has made a written declaration that he has no right or claim to her property. But suppose he has done so, what difference does it make? Seeing that it has been taught, if a man says to another, I have no right or claim to this field, I have no concern in it, I totally dissociate myself from it. His words are of no effect in the school of Arjane. The answer was given that the Mishnah here is referring to the case where the husband made this declaration to the wife while she was still only betrothed to him, and such a declaration would be valid in virtue of the dictum of Arkahana Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabi, that a man is at liberty to renounce beforehand an inheritance which is likely to accrue to him from another place, and this rule again is based on the dictum of Rabba that if anyone says, I do not desire to avail myself of a regulation of the rabbis of this kind, we comply with his desire to what was Rabba referring when he said of this kind, he was referring to the statement made by Arhuna in the name of Rabbi, a woman is at liberty to say to her husband, You need not keep me and I will not work for you since the Mishnah says that a husband has no hazaka in the property of his wife. We infer that if he has proof that she sold it to him, the sale is effective yet why? Should this be cannot she say in this case also I merely wish to oblige my husband have we not learned if a man buys a field from the husband and then buys it again from the wife the purchase from the wife is void this shows that she can say I merely consented in order to oblige my husband and cannot she say here also that she merely wished to oblige her husband the truth is that this mission has been qualified by the gloss of Rabbi son of Arhuna the rule really required to be stated in reference to those three fields that are specially allotted to her one that the husband inserted in the Kethubah Talmud Mas Baba Bathra a second the one assigned to her as special surety for her Kethubah and the third which she had brought him as marriage dowry and for the money value of which he made himself responsible to her now what property does this exclude from the rule that the purchase is void shall we say it is to exclude the remainder of the husband's property Hardly for in regard to this she would certainly say that she did it to oblige her husband since otherwise he might fall out with her and say to her you have your eye on a divorce or on my death the property excluded must therefore be that of which the husband has a usufruct but how can this be seeing that Amimar has said if husband and wife sell the property of which he has a usufruct their action is null and void Amimar was speaking of the case where the husband sold it and then died in which case she can recover it or where she sold it and died in which case he can come and recover it according to the regulation of the sages recorded by our Jose Bihanana who said it was enacted in a shot that if a woman sold the property of which the husband had the usufruct and then died the husband could recover it from the purchaser where however they both sold it together to a third party or if the wife sold it to the husband the sale is valid alternatively I may say that Amimar Based his ruling on the view expressed by our Eliza, for it has been taught if a man sells his slave but stipulates with the purchaser that he shall continue to serve him for thirty days. Our Meir says that the rule of one or two days applies to the first, the original owner, because the slave is still under him, and it does not apply to the second, because the slave is not under him. Here, Meir holds that possession of the increment is on a par with possession of the principal. Our Judah says that the rule of one or two days applies to the second, the purchaser, because the slave is his money, but not to the first, because he is not his money. His opinion is that the possession of the increment is not on a par with possession of the principal. Our Jose says Talmud, Mas Baba Bath
field pit stitches or caves but has not our nomen set in the name of Rabu Biavua there is no Hazaka where damage is inflicted this should be read the ordinary rule of Hazaka does not apply where damage is inflicted alternatively I may meet this objection by pointing out that our Mary gave smoke as an instance of the damage referred to and our Ziba the Privy our Joseph said Rab in truth meant his dictum to apply to occupation by outsiders and the case he had in mind was where a man had had the use of the property for a time in the lifetime of the husband and for three years after his death in that case seeing that he could put forward the plea I bought it from you the wife if he merely pleads you sold it to him and he sold it to me his word is accepted the text above states that Rab said that one cannot obtain Hazaka in the property of a married woman Talmud Mas Babu Bathra the judges of the exile however say that one can obtain Hazaka the Halacha said Rab is that of the judges of the exile thereupon our Kahana and RC said to him does our master retract his ruling you replied you may suppose I refer to such a case as that mentioned by our Joseph a wife has no Hazaka in the property of her husband surely this is self evident since the husband has to maintain her we suppose that when she occupies the field she is merely deriving her maintenance from it the rule had to be stated to cover the case where he assigned her another field for her maintenance. Since the Mishnah says only that the wife has no Hazaka, we infer that if she brings proof that the field has been sold to her, the sale is valid, but cannot the husband plead against this that he merely desired to see if she had any money? May we then not learn from this Mishnah that if a man sells a field to his wife, she becomes the legal owner, and we do not say that he merely desired to see if she had any money? No, we infer rather thus, but if she brings a proof, it is effective in the case of a deed of gift, though not of a deed of sale. Our nomen said to our Hunai, pity your honor was not with us last night at the boundary when we drew up an exceptionally fine rule. Said the other one was this exceptionally fine rule which you drew up. You replied, if a man sells a field to his wife, she becomes the legal owner, and we do not say that he merely desired to see if she had money. Said our Hunai, this is obvious, take away the money, and she still becomes legal owner by means of a deed for. Have we not learned ownership in landed property is acquired by means of money payment deed or hazaka but said our nomen has not the following rider been attached to this Mishnah Samuel said that this was meant to apply only to a deed of gift but if the deed is one of sale legal ownership is not acquired until the money payment has been made and rejoined our Huna did not our Hamna refute this by quoting the following how is property acquired by a deed suppose he the seller writes on a piece of parchment or on a pot's herd which in themselves may be worth nothing my field is hereby sold to you my field hereby becomes your property it is effectively sold or given but did not our Hamna counter his own objection by adding this holds good only where a man sells his field because it is practically worthless our Ashi said he the seller referred to above really meant to transfer his field to the other as a gift and the reason why he made the transfer in the form of a sale was in order to make the recipient's title more secure an objection was raised from the following if a man borrows money from his slave and then emancipates him or from his wife and then divorces her they have no claim against him for the money so lent what is the reason for this is it not because we say that his object in borrowing was only to see if they had any money these cases are different because we presume that a man would not readily place himself in the position of a borrower who is a servant to the lender Arunabi Abin sent the following message if a man sells a field to his wife she becomes the legal owner Talmud Mas Baba Bathrabi but he still remains entitled to the produce Arab Arabau and all the chief authorities of that generation however said that in selling his real intention was to make her a gift of it and he only made out a deed of sale to her in order to make her title more secure an objection was raised against this on the ground of the following if a man borrows money from his slave and then emancipates him or from his wife and then divorces her they have no claim against him what is the reason is it not because we say that he merely wished to see if they had any money these cases are different because we presume that a man would not readily place himself in the position of a borrower who is a servant to the lender Rab said if a man sells a field to his wife she becomes the legal owner but he is still entitled to the produce if he makes her a gift of a field she becomes the legal owner and he is no longer entitled to the produce our Eliezer however said that in either case the wife becomes the legal owner and the husband is not entitled to the produce in a case which actually occurred Arista followed the ruling of our Eliezer Rabban Akba and Rabban Nehemiah the sons of the daughters of Rab said to Arista do you mean then sir to abandon the greater authorities and follow the lesser he replied I also am following a great authority for when Rabin came he said in the name of our Yohanan in either case the wife becomes the legal owner and the husband is not entitled to the produce Rabba said the law is that if a man sells a field to his wife she does not become the legal owner and the husband is entitled to the produce but if he gives it to her she becomes the legal owner and the husband is not entitled to the produce do not the two halves of Rabba's first statement contradict each other there is no contradiction to one. Half refers to the case where the wife had money hidden away the other to the case where she had no money hidden away since Rab Judah has laid down if the wife buys with money hidden away she does not acquire if with money not hidden away she does acquire our Rabbi's top pledges should not be taken either from women or from slaves or from children if one has taken a pledge from a woman he should return it to her if she dies to her husband if one has taken a pledge from a slave he should. Return it to the slave or if he dies to his master Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra if one has taken a deposit from a child he should invest it for him or if he dies restore it to his heirs if any of them at the time of his death says the article belongs to so and so he should act according to their intimation otherwise he should act according to his discretion when the wife of Rabbi Barhanna was on her deathbed she said those precious stones belong to Martha and his daughter's family he consulted Rab about it and the latter said to him if you think she was telling the truth act according to her instruction and if not use your own discretion according to another version Rab said to him if you think her a wealthy enough person act according to her instruction and if not use your own discretion if he has taken from a child he should invest it for him how invested are his said he should buy with it a scroll of the Lord, son of Arhuna said he should buy with it a day tree of which the child can eat the fruit a father has no hazaka in the property of his son nor a son in the property of his father our joseph said this applies even if they have parted rabba however said that if they have parted the rule no longer applies our jeremiah of Dipti said in a case which occurred our poppy decided according to the ruling of rabba arnam and b isaac said i have been told by our high from hormai's already sure who was told by our ahabi jacob in the name of arnam and b jacob that if they did. father and son have parted the rule of the mission it does not apply the law is that where they have parted they have no hazaka against one another it has also been taught to the same effect a son who has left his father's roof and a wife who has been divorced are on the same footing as strangers in regard to the father or husband it has been stated if a number of brothers live together and one of them has the management of the house and if there are deeds and bonds current in his name and he asserts they are mine and I obtained them from the legacy of my maternal grandfather Rab says that the onus probandi lies upon him and Samuel says that the onus probandi lies upon the brother said Samuel Abba must at least admit that if he dies and leaves children the onus probandi lies on the brothers our papa strongly questioned this do we ever he said advance a plea on behalf of orphans which their father could not have advanced on his own behalf and further did not Rabba order some orphans to return a pair of shears for clipping wool and a book of Gatta which were claimed from them though the claimants adduced no proof that they had lent them these being articles which are commonly lent or hired Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi and Rabba acting according to the message sent by our Hunabi Abin if things that are usually lent or hired are found in a man's possession and he pleads that he has bought them his word is not accepted this is really a difficulty our Hista said that Rule just laid down applies only if the brothers share a common table but if they eat separately the one against whom the claim is brought can say that he saved up money from his food allowance what sort of proof is required of the brother Rabbi said the testimony of witnesses Arshis hate said the confirmation of the document Rabbi said to our nomin here we have the opinion of Rabbi and of Samuel and again that of Rabbi and Arshis hate with whom do you agree he replied all I know is a very for it has been taught if brothers live together and one of them has the management of the house and if deeds and bonds are current in his name and he asserts I obtained them from the legacy of my maternal grandfather the onus probandi lies upon him similarly if a woman has the management of
Door or making a fence or an opening this constitutes a title of ownership Arhash I learned in the tractate Kiddush and edited in the school of Levi if he the buyer does anything at all in the way of setting up the door or making a fence or an opening in his the seller's presence this constitutes a title of ownership are we to suppose that this is only the case if the act is done in the seller's presence and not otherwise robber replied the meaning is this if the act is done in his presence he has no need to say to the buyer go occupy and acquire ownership Talmud, Mas Baba Batra but if the act is not done in his presence he must say go occupy and acquire ownership Rab inquired what is the rule in the case of a gift said Samuel what is Abba's difficulty seeing that in the case of a sale where the purchaser gives money if the seller says to him go occupy and acquire ownership he does acquire ownership but otherwise not how much more so in the case of a gift Rab. However was of opinion that a gift is usually made in a liberal spirit how much is meant by anything at all the answer is given in the dictum of Samuel if a man raises a fence already existing to ten handbreadths or widens an opening so that it allows of entry and exit this constitutes effective occupation how are we to picture this fence if we say that before the man touched it people could not climb it and now too they cannot climb it what has he done if again we say that before people could climb it but now they cannot he has done a great deal we must therefore say that before it could be climbed easily but now it can only be climbed with difficulty how are we to picture the opening if we say that before people could get through it and now too they can get through it what has he done if again we say that before people could not get through it but now they can he has done a great deal we must therefore say that before people got through with difficulty but now they get through easily R.C. said in the name of Aryohan and if in the estate of a deceased proselyte a man by placing a pebble or removing a pebble confers some advantage this action gives him a title to the land how are we to understand this placing and removing if we say that by placing the pebble there he stops water from overflowing the field or by removing the pebble he allows water to run off from the field he is merely in the position of a man who chases a lion from his neighbor's field we must say therefore that in placing the pebble he conserves the water and in removing the pebble he makes a passage for the water R.C. further said in the name of Aryohan and if the estate of a deceased proselyte consists of two adjacent fields with a boundary between them and if a man takes possession of one of them with the idea of becoming owner he acquires ownership of that one Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B if with the idea of becoming owner of both he becomes owner of that one but not of the other if with the idea of becoming owner of the other he does not acquire ownership even of that one Arzera put the following question suppose he takes possession of one of them with the idea of becoming owner of that one and of the boundary and of the other one how do we decide do we say that the boundary goes with this field and with that and so he acquires the whole or do we say that the boundary and the fields are separate this question must stand over our Eliezer put the question suppose he takes possession of the boundary with the idea of becoming owner of both fields how do we decide do we say that the boundary is as it were the bridle of the land and so he acquires ownership or our boundary and field separate this question also must stand over our nom and said in the name of Rabbi Abba if there are in the house two rooms one of which can only be reached through the other then if a man takes possession of the outer room with the idea of becoming its owner he acquires Ownership of it if with the idea of becoming owner of both rooms he acquires ownership of the outer room but not of the inner one if with the idea of becoming owner of the inner room he does not acquire ownership even of the outer one if he takes possession of the inner one with the idea of becoming its owner he acquires ownership of that one if with the idea of becoming owner of both he does acquire ownership of both if with the idea of becoming owner of the outer one only he does not acquire ownership even of the inner one Arnam and further said in the name of Rabbi Abba if a man builds a large villa on the estate of a deceased proselyte and another man comes and fixes the doors the latter becomes owner why is this because the first one merely deposited bricks there are Dimi Joseph said in the name of our Eliezer if a man finds a villa already erected on the estate of a deceased proselyte and he adds one coat of whitewash or mural decoration he acquires ownership how much must he whitewash or decorate our Joseph says a cubit to which our histiad and it must be by the door our room said the following dictum was enunciated to us by our she's hate and he showed us the proof of it from a very if a man spreads mattresses on the floor of a proselyte's estate and sleeps on it either by acquires ownership how did he show proof of this from a very by citing the following passage which has been taught how is ownership of a slave acquired by taking possession if the slave fastens or undoes his master's shoe or carries his clothes behind him to the bath or undresses him washes him anoints him scrapes him dresses him puts his shoes on or lifts him up he becomes his owner our Simeon said possession of this kind cannot be more effective than lifting up seeing that it confers ownership in all cases what does this mean we must understand the passage thus if the slave lifts his master up the latter acquires possession but if his master lifts him up he does not our Simeon said possession cannot be more effective than lifting seeing that it confers ownership in all cases our Jeremiah Bira said in the name of Rab Judah if a man Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra throws vegetable seeds into the crevices of a proselyte's land this act does not confer a title of ownership the reason is that at the time of his throwing the seeds no improvement is effected and the subsequent improvement comes automatically Samuel said if a man strips the branches from a day tree if his purpose is to improve the tree he acquires ownership by so doing but if his purpose is to procure food for his cattle he does not acquire ownership how can we tell which is which if he takes the branches from all round and we know that his purpose is to improve the tree but if from one side only then it is for the sake of his cattle Samuel further said if a man clears a field of sticks etc if his purpose is to prepare the soil for plowing either by acquires ownership but if it is to obtain firewood he does not how can we tell which is which if he picks up all the sticks both big and small then we know his purpose is to prepare the soil but if he takes the big ones and leaves the little ones then we know that he merely wants firewood Samuel further said if a man levels a field if his purpose is to prepare the soil for plowing he thereby acquires ownership but if he only wants to make threshing floors he does not acquire ownership how can we tell which is which if he has taken earth from the protuberances and thrown it into the depressions then we know that his purpose is to prepare the soil but if he merely smooths out the protuberances or levels up the hollows we know that he intended to make threshing floors Samuel further said if a man turns water into a field from a stream if he does so to irrigate the ground he thereby acquires ownership but if only to bring fish in he does not acquire ownership how can we know which is which if he makes two sluices one to let the water in and one to let it out we know that he is after the fish but if one sluice then we know that his chief purpose is irrigate the field a certain woman had to use a fruct of a date tree to the extent of lopping its branches for 13 years to give food to her cattle a man then came and hoed under it a little and claimed ownership he applied to Levi or as some say to Marakba who confirmed his title to the field. The woman came and complained bitterly to him but he said what can I do for you seeing that you did not establish your title in the proper way Rab said if a man draws a figure of an animal or bird on the property of a deceased proselyte he acquires ownership we ascribe this opinion to Rab because Rab acquired the garden adjoining his Beth Hamid Rash only by drawing a figure it has been stated if a field has a boundary marked all round Arhuna says in the name of Rab that as soon as a man Digs up one spadeful he becomes the legal owner Samuel however said that he becomes the owner only of as much as he turns up Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and if it is not bounded all round how much does he acquire by one stroke of the spade our Papa said the length of a furrow made by a pair of oxen there and back Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the property of a heathen is on the same footing as desert land whoever first occupies it acquires ownership the reason is that as soon as the heathen receives the money he ceases to be the owner whereas the Jew does not become the owner till he obtains the deed of sale hence in the interval the land is like desert land and the first occupier becomes the owner said Abay to our Joseph did Samuel really say this has not Samuel laid down that the law of the government is law and the king has ordained that land is not to be acquired save by means of a deed our Joseph replied I know nothing of that I only know that a case arose in Dur did. Ariweva in which a Jew bought land from a heathen and another Jew came and dug up a little of it and when the case came before Rab Judah he assigned the land to the latter Abbe replied you speak of Dura Ariweva there the fields belonged to people who hid themselves and did not pay
legal owner of the whole are who not be Abin sent to say that if a Jew buys a field from even and another Jew comes and occupies it before he receives the deed, we do not dispossess him and our Abin and our lay and all our teachers were in agreement on this matter. Rabbi said these three rules were told me by Abba Bini Amai the eggs large one that the law of the government in civil cases is law second that Persians acquire ownership by forty years occupation and the third that if property is bought from the rich landlords who buy up land and pay the tax on it the sale is valid this applies however only to land which is transferred to the landlords on account of the land tax if it is sold to them on account of the poll tax then a purchase from them is not valid because the poll tax is an impost on the person are who not the son of Arjashu however said that even barley in the jar is liable to be seized for the poll tax Arashi said who not be Nathan told me that Amimar found it difficult to accept this view because if this was so it would leave no room for the double portion to which a firstborn is entitled in an inheritance since all bequeathed property would in this way become perspective and a firstborn does not receive a double portion in perspective as in actual assets here Ashi remarked the same reasoning would apply to the land tax also but how then do you get over the difficulty in the case of the land tax by supposing that the father pays the land Tax of the year before he dies. Similarly, with the poll tax, we suppose that the father pays it for the year before he dies. Arashi further said, I questioned the scribes of Rabbah on this point, and they told me that the law is in accordance with the ruling of Arhuna, the son of Arjashu. This, however, is not correct, and they only said so to put themselves in the right. Arashi further said, A man of leisure must assist the community to pay its levy. This, however, is only if the community saved him from being taxed separately, but if the tax collectors exempted him and providence was kind to him, Arashi said, In the name of Arjuna, a boundary and assist as hedge serve as a partition in the estate of a proselyte. Not, however, for purposes of PEI and uncleanness. When Rabin came, he said, In the name of Arjuna, and for purposes of PEI and uncleanness, also, how does a partition affect PEI? As we have learned, these are the things which cut a field into two with respect to PEI River. Rivulet Talmud, Mas Baba Bath, a public carriage road or a private carriage road, a public field path or a private field path which is used both in the dry and the rainy season. How does the partition affect uncleanness? As we have learned, if a man goes into a plain in the rainy season where there is known to be uncleanness in a certain field and he says, I went to that place, i.e., plain, but I do not know if I went to that spot or not, our Eliezer declares him clean and the sages declare him unclean. For our Eliezer used to say that if there is a doubt whether a man entered a place of uncleanness, he is clean, but if there is a doubt whether he touched an unclean thing, he is unclean in respect of Sabbath. However, these things do not form a partition. Rabbah, however, says that they form a partition even in respect of Sabbath, as it has been taught if a man takes out half a dry fig into a public place and puts it down and then takes out another half a dry fig in one spell of unawareness that it with Sabbath he is penalized for breaking the Sabbath, but if under two spells of unawareness he is not penalized, our Jose said if he Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra takes the two half figs in one state of unawareness into the same public place he is penalized, but if into two different public places he is not penalized, this too said Rabbah is only the case if there is between the two public places a place the carrying into which from either of them would render him liable to a sin offering, but not. If there is only a Carmelith in between Abbe said even if there is a Carmelith between he is not penalized, but not if there is only a block of wood Rabbah said even if there is a block of wood between he is not penalized, Rabbah's view here that such a block can form a partition conforms with his other view that a place in respect of Sabbath has the same meaning as a place in respect of the horses if there is no boundary nor sister's hedge in the plain what is the ruling armor is explained. In his Arulizer's name that all to which his name is applied is reckoned as one field how are we to understand this our Papa said if for instance people call it the field of so and so as well as our Ahabiyah we was once sitting in front of R.C. he laid down the following rule in the name of R.C. behind an assistance hedge forms a partition in the estate of a proselyte what is assistance hedge Rab Judah said in the name of Rab the plant with which Joshua marked the boundaries of the land of Canaan for the Israelites Rab Judah also said in the name of Rab Joshua in his book enumerated only the towns on the borders Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel all the land which God showed Moses is subject to the obligation of tithe which part of the land does this exclude it excludes the Kenite the Kenite and the Kadmonite has been taught our Meir says that these are the Nabataeans the Arabians and the Salmoines Arulizer says they are Mount Seir Eman and Moab Arsimian says they our artist Kizaja and Aspamia Mishnah, if two men testify that a certain man had the usufruct of a piece of land for three years and they are found to be Zomemim, they must pay to the claimant all that he stood to lose through their false evidence. If two testify that the occupier had the usufruct for one year, two for a second year, and two for the third year, and they are found to be Zomemim Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B each set pays the claimant the third of three. Brothers testify one to each year, each along with the same second witness, then three testimonies of two witnesses each are offered one for each year, but the three are reckoned as one for the purpose of declaring the witnesses Zomemim Gemara. Our Mishnah does not agree with our Akiba, for it has been taught Rabbi Jose said when my father he to went to Aryohan and Benuri to study Torah with him. According to another report, when Aryohan and Benuri went to Abba he to study Torah with him, he Said to him, suppose a man had the usufruct of a piece of land for one year to the knowledge of two people, and for a second year to the knowledge of two other people, and for a third year to the knowledge of two others. How do we decide? He replied, This constitutes a title. Said the other, That is my opinion also, but our Akiva differs in this respect. For he used to say, Scripture states a matter shall be established by two witnesses and not half a matter. And how do the rabbis apply the principle of a matter and not half a matter? Shall I say that it is to invalidate the evidence where one witness says that there was one hair on her back and the other says that there was one hair in front? This is not only half a matter but also half a testimony. No, they would in virtue of it invalidate the evidence where two witnesses testify that there was one hair on her back and two that there was one in front. Rab Judah said, If one witness says that the occupier took crops of wheat off the land and it other that he took crops of barley this constitutes Hazaka Arnam and strongly descended from this on this ground he said if one witness said that he took crops in the first third and fifth years and the other that he took crops in the second fourth and sixth this would also constitute Hazaka said Rab Judah to him where is the parallel there in your case the year referred to by the one witness is not referred to by the other but here in my case both testify regarding the same year and why do we ignore their discrepancy because people easily make a mistake between wheat and barley if three brothers testify each along with the same second witness then three testimonies are offered but the three are reckoned as one for the purpose of declaring the witnesses Zomemim Talmud Mas Baba Bathra a certain document was brought into court bearing the signatures of two witnesses one of whom had died the brother of the one who was still alive came with another witness to testify to the signature of the other the deceased Rabbana was disposed to decide that this case was covered by the mission of three brothers each associated with the same witness at Arashi to him surely the cases are not on all fours in that case if the evidence of the brothers was accepted three quarters of the money would not be assigned on the evidence of brothers but in this case if we allow this man to testify three quarters of the money will be assigned on the evidence of brothers mission. Certain usages constitute Hazaka while certain others though similar do not constitute Hazaka if a man was in the habit of stationing his beast in a courtyard or of fixing there his oven handmill portable stove or hand coop or of throwing his manure there this does not constitute Hazaka but if he has been allowed to put up a partition for his beast ten handbreadths in height or for his oven or his stove or his handmill or if he has been allowed to bring fowls into the house or to make a pit. For his manure three hand breadths deep or he three hand breadths high this constitutes Hazaka Gemara why is the rule in the second case different from that in the first Allah said any act which confers legal ownership of the property of a deceased proselyte confers legal ownership of that of a fellow Jew and any act which does not confer legal ownership of the property of a deceased proselyte does not confer legal ownership of property of a fellow Jew Arshis had raised strong objections. Against this is this he asked a general principle what a plowed land which confers ownership of the property of a
The opinion of our Lizer as it has been taught our Lizer says one who has vowed to receive no benefit from another is forbidden to take even a make way from him or Yohan and said in the name of our Bana joint owners of a courtyard can stop one another from using the courtyard for any purpose save that of washing clothes since it is not fitting that the daughters of Israel should expose themselves to the public gaze while washing clothes it is written the righteous one is he that shutteth. His eyes from looking upon evil and commenting on this are high. The Abbasid this refers to a man who does not look at the women when they are washing clothes. How are we to understand this? If there is another road, then if he does not take it, he is wicked. If there is no other road, then how can he help himself? We suppose that there is no other road, and even so, it is incumbent on him to hide his eyes from him or Yohan and ask Arbana how long the undergarment of a Talmud Hakam should be. He replied, So long that his flesh should not be visible beneath it. How long should the upper garment of a Talmud Hakam be so long that not more than a handbreadth of his undergarment should be visible underneath? How should the table of a Talmud Hakam be laid? Two thirds should be covered with a cloth, and the other third should be uncovered for putting the dishes and vegetables on, and the ring should be outside. But has it not been taught that the ring should be inside? There is no. Contradiction in one case we suppose there is a child at the table and in the other that there is no child or if you like I can say that in both cases we suppose there is no child and still there is no contradiction in one case we suppose there is a waiter at table and in the other there is no waiter or if you like I can say that in both cases we suppose there is a waiter and still there is no contradiction in the one case we refer to the day and in the other to the night the table of an Amharas is like Talmud, Mas Baba Batra a hearth with pots all round what is the sign of the bed of a Talmud Hakam that nothing is kept under it save sandals in the summer season and shoes in the rainy season but the bed of an Amish Ahrez is like a packed storeroom Arbana used to mark out caves where there were dead bodies when he came to the cave of Abraham he found Eliza the servant of Abraham standing at the entrance he said to him what is Abraham doing he replied he is Sleeping in the arms of Sarah and she is looking fondly at his head he said go and tell him that Bana is standing at the entrance said Abraham to him let him enter it is well known that there is no passion in this world so he went and surveyed the cave and came out again when he came to the cave of Adam a voice came forth from heaven saying thou hast behold in the likeness of my likeness my likeness itself thou mayest not behold but he said I want to mark out the cave the measurement of it. Inner one is the same as that of the outer one came the answer those who hold that there was one chamber above another say that the answer was the measurement of the lower one is the same as that of the upper one Arbana said I discerned his Adam's two heels and they were like two orbs of the sun compared with Sarah all other people are like a monkey to a human being and compared with Eve Sarah was like a monkey to a human being and compared with Adam Eve was like a monkey to a human. Being and compared with the Shechan Adam was like a monkey to a human being. The beauty of our Kahana was a reflection of the beauty of Rab. The beauty of Rab was a reflection of the beauty of Arabad. The beauty of Arabad was a reflection of the beauty of our father Jacob. And the beauty of Jacob was a reflection of the beauty of Adam. There was a certain magician who used to rummage among graves when he came to the grave of Artobi Bimat. And Artobi took hold of his beard. Abbe came and said to him, Pray leave him. A year later he again came and he the dead man took hold of his beard. And Abbe again came, but he the dead man did not leave him till he Abbe had to bring scissors and cut off his beard. A certain man went on his deathbed said, I leave a barrel of dust to one of my sons, a barrel of bones to another, and a barrel of fluff to the third. They could not make out what he meant, so they consulted Arbana. He said to them, Have you any land? We have. They replied, Have you cattle? Yes, have you cushions again? The answer was in the affirmative. If so, said Arbana, that is what your father meant. A certain man heard his wife say to her daughter, Why do you not observe more secrecy in your amours? I have ten children, and only one is from your father. When the man was on his deathbed, he said, I leave all my property to one son. They had no idea which of them he meant, so they consulted Arbana. He said to them, Go and knock at the grave of your father until he gets up and tells you which one of you he has made his heir. So they all went to do so. The one who was really his son, however, did not go. Arbana thereupon said, All the estate belongs to this one. They then went and slandered him before the king, saying, There is a man among the Jews who extorts money from people without witnesses or anything else. So they took him and threw him in prison. His wife came to the court and said, I had a slave, and some men have cut off his head, skinned him, eaten the flesh, and filled. The skin with water and given students to drink from it, and they have not paid me either its price or its hire. They did not know what to make of her tale, so they said, Let us fetch the wise man of the Jews, and he will tell us. So they called Arbana, and he said to them, She means a goatskin bottle. They said, Since he is so wise, let him sit in the gate and act as judge. He saw that there was an inscription over the gateway, and any judge who is sued in court is not worthy of the name of judge. He said, If that is so, any man from the street can come and Talmud, Mas Baba Batra be sued the judge, and so disqualify him. What it should say is, Any judge who is sued in court and against whom judgment is given is no true judge. They therefore wrote, But the elders of the Jews say, Any judge who is sued in court and against whom judgment is given is no true judge. He saw another inscription which ran at the head of all death, and my blood at the head of all life, and my wine. How can that be? He said, If a man. Falls from a roof or a day tree and kills himself, does he die from excessive blood? And again, if a man is on the point of death, do they give him wine to drink? No, what should be written is this at the head of all sickness and my blood, at the head of all medicine and my wine. They therefore wrote, but the elders of the Jews say, at the head of all sickness and my blood, at the head of all medicine and my wine, only where there is no wine or drugs required over the gateway of Kapukia, there was an inscription. And pack and bag on tall, and what is an untall? It is the same as the fourth part in Jewish ritual measurements. Mishnah, there is no hazaka for a gutter pipe, but there is for its place, there is hazaka for a roof gutter, there is no hazaka for an Egyptian ladder, but there is for a tyrian, there is no hazaka for an Egyptian window, but there is for a tyrian, what is an Egyptian window, one through which a man cannot put his head, Arjuna says that if it has a frame, even though a man cannot put his head through. If there is Hazaka for it tomorrow, what is meant by saying that there is no Hazaka for a gutter pipe, but there is for its place? Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, it means this: there is no Hazaka for the gutter pipe at one particular end of the gutter, but there is a Hazaka for it to be placed either at one end or the other. Our Hannah said there is no Hazaka for the gutter pipe to the extent that if he, the owner of the courtyard, finds it too long, he can have it shortened, but there is Hazaka for its place to the extent that if he wants to remove it altogether, he is not at liberty to do so. Our Jeremiah B. Abba said there is no Hazaka for a gutter in so far that if he, the owner of the courtyard, desires to build under it, he may do so, but there is Hazaka for its place to the extent that if he wants to remove it altogether, he is not at liberty to do so. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, we learned there is Hazaka for a roof gutter. This fits in with the first two of the views. Just a dispot on the view that the statement that there is no hazaka for a gutter pipe means that if the owner of the courtyard wants to build under it, he may do so. What does it matter to him, the owner of the gutter? We are dealing here with a gutter of stone, the owner of which can say, I do not want my stonework to be weakened by building carried on underneath. Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, if a man has a pipe on his roof from which water drips into his neighbor's courtyard, and he wants to stop it up, the owner of the courtyard can prevent him, saying, Just as you have property in the courtyard for pouring your water into it, so I have property in the water that comes from your roof. It has been stated, Our Ashai said that the owner of the courtyard may prevent him, but Arhamah said he may not. They went and asked Arbisa, who replied that he can prevent him. Rami Biham applied to him, Our Ashai, the verse of threefold court is not easily broken. This he said is exemplified in. Arashai the son of Arhamah who is the son of Arbisa there is no Hazaka for an Egyptian ladder how is an Egyptian ladder to be defined the school of Arjani defined it as one which has not four rungs there is no Hazaka for an Egyptian window why should a definition be given in the mission of an Egyptian window and not of an Egyptian ladder because in regard to the size of the window the dissentient opinion of Arjuna was to be recorded in the next clause Arzara said there is Hazaka for a Tyrian window
Said in the name of Armani, if he obtains a right to a handbreadth, he obtains a right to four. What is the meaning of this? Abbe said it means that if he has obtained a right to a width of a handbreadth with a length of four, he ipso facto obtains a right to a width of four. If it is less than a handbreadth, there is no hazaka for it, and he cannot prevent it from being made. Arhuna said this only means that the owner of the roof cannot prevent the owner of the courtyard from using it, but the owner of the courtyard can prevent the owner of the roof. Rab Judah, however, said that the owner of the courtyard cannot prevent the owner of the roof. Either may we say that the point at issue between them is whether overlooking constitutes a genuine damage, one holding that it does, and the other that it does not. No, both consider overlooking to constitute a genuine damage, but here the case according to Rab Judah is different because the owner of the roof can say to the other, I cannot actually. Do anything on this far, all I can do with it is to hang things on it. When I do that, I will turn my face away, and the other Arunah he can rejoin that the other may say to him, You may become afraid of falling and not turn your face away. Mishnah, a man should not let his windows open onto a courtyard which he shares with others. If he takes a room in another adjoining courtyard, he should not make an entrance to it in a courtyard which he shares with others. If he builds an upper chamber over his house, he should not make the entrance to it in a courtyard which he shares with others. But he may, if he pleases, make an inner chamber in his house and then build an upper chamber over his house and make the entrance from his house. Gemara, a man should not let his windows open, etc. Why only in a courtyard which he shares with others? Surely the prohibition should apply also to the courtyard of his neighbor. The Mishnah takes an extreme case on the courtyard of his neighbor. He may. Certainly not let his windows open up, but in the case of a courtyard which he shares with others, he can say to the other owner, In any case, you have to take steps to preserve your privacy from me in the courtyard. We now learn, therefore, that the other can reply, Up to now, I had to take steps to preserve my privacy only in the courtyard, but now, if you make this window, I shall have to do so in my house. Also, our rabbis taught a certain man made windows opening onto a courtyard which he shared with others. He was eventually summoned before our Ishmael, son of our Jose, who said to him, You have established your right, my son. He was then brought before our high, who said, As you have taken the trouble to open them, so you must take the trouble to close them. Our Naman said, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, for closing a window, right is established immediately if the action is unchallenged, because a man will not allow his light to be obstructed without protest if a man takes a room in another. Adjoining courtyard, he should not make an entrance to it in a courtyard which he shares with others. What is the reason? Because he brings too many visitors through the courtyard. Look then at the following clause. He may, if he pleases, build an inner chamber in his house and then build an upper chamber over his house and make the entrance from the house. Will not this also bring more people through the courtyard? Arhuna said, when it says here that he builds a room, it means that he divides one of his rooms into two. And when it says that he builds an upper chamber, it means that he makes a balcony mission in a courtyard which he shares with others. A man should not open a door facing another person's door nor a window facing another person's window. If it is small, he should not enlarge it, and he should not turn one into two on the side of the street. However, he may make a door facing another person's door and a window facing another person's window. And if it is small, he may enlarge it. Or he may make two out of one tomorrow. Whence are these rules derived? Are Yohanan said from the verse of the scripture, and Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel dwelling according to their tribes. This indicates that he saw that the doors of their tents did not exactly face one another. Whereupon he exclaimed, Worthy are these that the divine presence should rest upon them. If it is small, he should not enlarge it. Rami Biham understood from this that if the door is of four cubits, the owner should not make it eight, because this would entitle him to eight cubits in the courtyard. But if it is of two cubits, he is quite in order in making it four. Said Rabbi to him, This is not so, because the other can say to him, I can preserve my privacy. If you have a small doorway, but not if you have a large one, he should not turn one door into two. Rami Biham understood from this that if the door is four cubits, why he should not turn it into two doors of two cubits each, because this would entitle. Him to eight cubits in the courtyard hut, he would be quite in order in turning a door of eight cubits into two of four cubits each. Said Rabbi to him, This is not so because the other can say to him, I can preserve my privacy from you if you have one door, but if you have two doors, I cannot on the side of the street. However, he may make a door facing another person's door. The reason is because he can say to him, In any case, you have to preserve your privacy from the eyes of the passers by end. Therefore, you may as well do so from me. Also, Mishnah, a cavity must not be made under a public place to whip pits, ditches, and caves are Eliza permits this, provided that the surface is strong enough to bear the passage of a wagon loaded with stone spars or beams must not be allowed to project from the wall of a house over the public way. The owner may, however, if he desires, draw back his wall from the street and then allow them to project if a man buys a courtyard in which are spars and beams. Projecting, he has a prescriptive right to keep them there. Gemara, our Eliezer says, etc. Why do the rabbis forbid this? Because the surface may wear thin without being noticed. Spars and beams must not be allowed to project, etc. RMI had a spar projecting over an alleyway, and another man had a spar projecting over a public way. Some passers by objected, and he was summoned before RMI. He said to him, Go and cut it down. But said the man, You sir, also have a projecting spar. Mind you replied, Projects over an alleyway, the residents of which have given me their consent. Yours projects over a street who is there to surrender the public's rights. Arjane had a tree which overhung the public way, and another man also had a tree overhanging the street. Some passers by objected, and he was summoned before Arjane. He said to him, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, go away now and come again tomorrow during the night. He sent and had his own tree cut down on the next day. The man came back and he told, him to go and cut the tree down, he said, but you sir also have one, he replied, go and see if mine is cut down, cut yours down, and if mine is not cut down, you need not cut yours down, what was Arjane's idea at first when he kept his tree, and afterwards when he had it cut down, at first he thought that passersby were glad of it because they could sit in its shade, but when he saw that they objected to it, he had it cut down, why did he not say to the man, go and cut yours down, and then I will cut down mine in conformity with the maxim of Reshlakish, who said it is written, Hithkoshishu wakoshu, trim yourselves, and then trim others, he may, however, if he desires, draw back his wall from the street and allow them to project, the question was asked, if a man draws back his wall and does not at once let any beams project, may he do so subsequently, Ar Yohanan said that though he has drawn back the wall, he may still make projecting beams, while Reshlakish said that once he has drawn back, he Cannot later make projecting beams. Our Jacob said to our Jeremiah B. Talafi, I will explain this to you on the question of projecting beams. There is no difference of opinion between the authorities, and both hold that they are permitted where they differ is on the question whether he may restore the walls to their former position, and the above statement should be reversed. I.E. Yohanan said that he may not go back to the original position, and Reshlakish said that he may. Our Yohanan ruled that he may not, in accordance with the dictum of Rab Judah, who said a path between two fields over which the public has established a right of way must not be damaged. Reshlakish, however, says that he may rule thus in the case of the path because there is no other space available, but here in the case of the street, there is still plenty of space available if a man buys a courtyard in which are sparse and beams projecting, he has a prescriptive right to keep them. Arhuna said if the wall falls down. He may build it as it was before an objection was raised against this from the following it is not proper to stucco or decorate or paint our houses at the present time if a man buys a house which is stuccoed or decorated or painted he is entitled to keep it so if it falls down he should not rebuild it so where the prohibition is based on religious grounds the case is different our rabbis taught a man should not stucco the front of his house with cement but if he mixes sand or straw with it he may our Judah says a mixture of sand makes a cement stony and therefore its use is forbidden but straw is permitted our rabbis taught when the temple was destroyed for the second time large numbers in Israel became ascetics binding themselves neither to eat meat nor to drink wine our Joshua got into conversation with them and said to them my sons why do you not eat meat nor drink wine they replied shall we eat flesh which used to be brought as an offering on the altar now that this Altar is in abeyance, shall we drink wine which used to be poured as a libation on the altar? But now no longer he said to them, if that is so, we should not eat bread either because the meal offerings
If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, what is meant by my chief joy are Isaac said this is symbolized by the burnt ashes which we place on the head of the bridegroom. Our papa asked Abbe where should they be placed? He replied, just where the phylactery is worn, as it says to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them a garland. P.E.R. for ashes, ever whoever mourns for Zion will be privileged to behold her joy, as it says, rejoice ye with Jerusalem, etc. It has been taught our Ishmael Ben. Elisha said, since the day of the destruction of the temple, we should by rights bind ourselves not to eat meat nor drink wine, only we do not lay a hardship on the community unless the majority can endure it, and from the day that a government has come into power which issues cruel decrees against us and forbids to us the observance of the Torah and the precepts and does not allow us to enter into the week of the sun according to another version, the salvation of the sun we ought by rights to bind. Ourselves not to marry and beget children and the seed of Abraham our father would come to an end of itself. However, let Israel go their way. It is better that they should err in ignorance than presumptuously Talmud. Mos Baba Batra chapter 4 Mishnah. If a man sells a house without further specification, the Yazia is not included with it even though it opens into the house nor is an inside room which is entered from it nor the roof so long as it has a parapet ten handbreadths high R. Judah says that if it has anything of the shape of a door even though the parapet is not ten handbreadths high it is not solo with the house Gemara. What is meant by the word Yazia here it was translated as a PSAR. Joseph said it means a veranda with a semi-open side for one who holds that a closed-in veranda is not sold with the room. There is no question that an open one is not but the one who says that the veranda excluded here is the open one would nevertheless include the closed-in. One R. Joseph learned three names are found for the structure in the scriptures Yazia Zelata Yazia as it is written the nethermost story Yazia was five cubits broad Zela as it is written and the side chambers Zelath were in three stories one over another and thirty in order Ta as it is written and every lodge Ta was one read long and one read broad and the space between the lodges was five cubits or if you like I can derive it the fact that a veranda is called Ta from here the wall of the sanctuary was six cubits and the Ta was six and the wall of the Ta was six Marzitra said a veranda is not sold with a room only if it has an area of four square cubits said Rubinage Marzitra on your view that it must be four square cubits what about the cistern of which we have learned that the cistern and the well are not included in the sale of the house even if he the seller inserts in the deed of sale the words to the height and to the depth are we to say that there likewise the rule applies only if they have an area of four cubits but otherwise not he replied how can you compare the two the cistern and the well are used for quite different purposes from the house but here both the veranda and the house are used for the same purposes hence if it is four cubits square it is reckoned as a separate structure but if less not nor an inside room which is entered from it if a veranda is not sold along with the living room do we need to be told that an inside room is not Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabbi it was necessary to state the rule to show that this is the case even if the seller drew the boundaries in the deed of sale outside the inner room this is based on the ruling laid down by Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abu Afar Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abu that if a man sells another an apartment in a large tenement house even if he draws the boundaries outside the whole tenement house we say that he only drew the boundaries why how are we to understand this rule if the apartment is called an apartment and the tenement a tenement then it is self-evident he is selling him an apartment not a tenement if again the tenement also is called an apartment then he sells the whole to him does he not the rule is required for the case where most people call the apartment an apartment and the tenement a tenement but some call the tenement also an apartment I might think that in this case if he draws it. Boundaries why he sells him the whole we are therefore told that since he might have inserted in the deed of sale the words and I have not reserved for myself anything from this transfer and did not insert them we assume that he did reserve something Arnaman also said in the name of Rabbi Abu if a man sells to another a field in a big stretch of fields even though he draw the outer boundaries right round the whole stretch he only sells the field because we say that he draws it. Boundaries why how are we to understand this if the field is called a field and the stretch is stretch the proposition is self-evident he is selling him a field not a stretch if again the stretch is also called field then the whole is sold to him is it not the rule is necessary for the case where some call the stretch a stretch and some call it a field you might think that in this case he sells him the whole therefore we are told that since he might have inserted in the deed of sale the words I have not reserved for myself anything from this transfer and did not insert them we are to assume that he did reserve something and both these rulings about the house and the field required to be stated for if had only the one about the house I might say that the reason why the tenement is not sold with the apartment is because they are used for different purposes but in the case of the stretch of fields and the field where the whole stretch is used for the same purpose I might Say that the whole is sold and if I had only the rule about the stretch of fields I might think that the reason why it is not all sold is because it is difficult to mark off one field in the middle of a stretch but in the case of the apartment where he could easily have marked it off and did not do so I might think that he has sold him the whole hence both are necessary what authority does our Mari the son of the daughter of Samuel B. Shalath follow in the statement he made in the name of Abbe if a man sells property to another he should insert in the deed of sale the words I have not reserved from this transfer for myself anything the authority is the dictum enunciated by Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abba a certain man said to another I will sell you the land of Hayes there were two pieces of land which were called Hayes Arashi said he sold him one piece of land not two if however a man says to another I will sell you some lands the minimum that can be called lands is two if he says all the lands this includes all his landed property except gardens and orchards if he says fields this includes gardens and orchards also but not houses and slaves Talmud, Mas Baba Batra if he says my property this would include houses and slaves also if the seller draws one of two parallel boundaries shorter than the other Rab says that the purchaser obtains only the width of the shorter line Arkahana and RC said to Rab should he not obtain as much as is bounded by the oblique line Rab made no reply Rab however had previously admitted that if the field in question is bounded by those of Reuben and Simeon on one side and by those of Levi and Judah on the other since if he desired to transfer only half the field he should have written either the boundaries or the field of Reuben on one side and opposite to it the field of Levi or else the field of Simeon on one side and opposite to it the field of Judah and he did not do so he meant to Transfer all within the oblique line from the end of Simeon's field to the end of Levi's. If the field is bounded by fields of Reuben on the east and west and by fields of Simeon on the north and south, he must write the field is bounded by fields of Reuben on two sides and by fields of Simeon on two sides. The question was raised if he merely marks the corners, how do we decide if he draws the boundaries like a gam? How do we decide Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B if he mentions one and skips one? How do we decide these questions must stand over if the seller defines the first, second, and third boundaries, but not the fourth? Rab says that the purchaser acquires the whole of the field with the exception of the fourth boundary, and Samuel said that he acquires the fourth boundary. Also, RC, however, said that he acquires only one furrow alongside of the whole. He so far agreed with Rab as to hold that he reserved something, but he further held that since he reserved the boundary, he reserved. The whole field Rabba said the law is that he acquires the whole field with the exception of the fourth boundary and even this is the case only if the fourth boundary does not lie within the adjoining two but if it does so lie the purchaser acquires it and even if it does not lie within the adjoining two he fails to acquire it only if there is on it a clump of date trees or it has an area of nine calves but if there is no clump of date trees on it and it does not contain an area of nine calves he does acquire it from this it can be inferred that if it lies between the adjoining boundaries then even if there is a clump of date trees on it and it has an area of nine calves the purchaser acquires it according to another version Rabba said that the law is that the purchaser acquires the whole including the fourth boundary this is the case however only if it lies between the two adjoining boundaries if however it does not so lie he does not acquire it and even where it does so lie he acquires it only if there is not on it a clump of day trees or it has not an area of nine caps but if there is on it a clump of day trees or it has an area of nine caps he does not acquire it from this we infer that when it does not lie between the two adjoining boundaries even though there is no clump of day trees on it and it has not an area of
Subsequently said I thought that because he made no reply he accepted my view but this was not so for I saw later some documents that were issued from the master's court where it was written the half that I have in the land the transaction was for half and where it was written the half of the land that I have the transaction was for a quarter rabble further said if the seller writes in the deed the boundary of the land is the land from which half has been cut off he sells half if he writes the boundary of the land is that from which a piece is cut off he only sells an area of nine cabs said Abbe to him what difference does it make whether he says one way or the other rabble made no reply the conclusion was drawn that in either case the proper rule was that he sold him half Talmud, Mas Baba Batra this however is not so because Aryamar Bishalimia has said Abbe has himself explained to me that whether he writes the boundary of the field is the field from which half has been cut off or the boundary of the field is a field from which a piece is cut off if he adds the words these are its boundaries then he sells him half and if he does not add the words these are its boundaries then he sells him nine cabs we take it for granted that if a man says let so and so share my property he is to receive a half if he says give so and so a share in my property what is to be done Robin of BG she said come and here it has been taught if a man says give so and so a share in a cistern Simica says that he is to receive not less than a quarter if the man says give him a share in the cistern for his pail he is to receive not less than an eighth if he says give him a share for his pot he is to receive not less than a twelfth if he says give him a share for his drinking cup he is to receive not less than a sixteenth our rabbis taught if a Levite sells a field to any ordinary Israelite with the stipulation that the first tithe Therefrom is to be given to him the first tithe from it must be given to him if he stipulated that it was to be given to him and to his sons and he then died it is to be given to his sons if the stipulation is as long as this field is in your possession and he the purchaser sells it and then buys it again the Levite has no claim on him how can all this be seen that a man cannot transfer to another possession of something that does not yet exist since the Levite stipulated that the first tithe should be given to him he in effect reserved to himself the area of the tithe Reshlakish said this shows that if a man sells an apartment to another with the stipulation that the top layer is still to belong to him the top layer belongs to him Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B for what purpose is the new rule laid down by Reshlakish in order to tell us that if the vendor desires to let out projecting spars from the roof he is at liberty to do so our Papa says in order to tell us that if he Desires to build an upper chamber over the apartment he is at liberty to do so accepting our view we understand why Reshlakish used the expression this shows but on the view of our Papa why should he have said this shows this is really a difficulty our of Nihardia said if a man sells an apartment to another even though he inserts in the deed of sale the words I sell you the depth and the height he must further insert the words acquire for thyself possession from the depth of it earth to the height of heaven because the space below and above is not transferred automatically hence the words depth and height avail to transfer the space below and above while the words from the depth of the earth to the height of heaven avail to transfer a well a cistern and cavities shall we say that the following mission supports our the vendor does not transfer the well and the cistern even though he inserts the words depth and height now if you should assume that the space below and above is transferred automatically then the insertion of the words depth and height should avail to transfer well cistern and cavities should they not we suppose the mission to refer to the case where these words were not inserted but the mission distinctly says although he inserts the words depth and height we must explain the mission thus even if these words are not actually inserted they are regarded as being inserted for the purpose of transferring the space below and above and as regards a well and a cistern if the words depth and height are inserted these are transferred but otherwise not come and here nor the roof so long as it has a parapet ten hand breadth high talmud mas baba batra now if you assume that the space below and above is transferred automatically what difference does it make if the parapet is ten hand breadth high since the parapet is ten hand breadth high the roof is reckoned as a separate structure Robin has said to our ashi come and here resh Lakish said this shows that if a man sells an apartment to another with the stipulation that the top layer still belongs to him, the top layer does still belong to him, and we asked what was the purpose of the new rule laid down by Resh Lakish and Arzibit said in order to tell us that if the vendor desires to let out projecting spars from the roof he may do so, and our Papa said in order to tell us that if he desires to build an upper chamber over the apartment he may do so now if you assume that the top layer is not transferred automatically, what does he gain by his stipulation? What he gains by the stipulation is the right to rebuild it if it falls in mission. The vendor of a house does not sell there with a well or a cistern, even though he inserts in the deed the words including the depth and the height he must, however, by himself if required the right of way to the well or cistern. This is the ruling of our Akiva. The sages, however, say that he need not buy the right of way are. Akiba on his side agrees that if the vendor inserts the words except these he need not buy himself a right of way if the owner of the house sells these to another our Akiba says that the purchaser need not buy a right of way to them but the sages say that he must buy it tomorrow Robin as he sat and studied the section ask is not well identical with cistern said Robin Tosfaya to Robin come and here it has been taught both well and cistern are excavations in the soil only a well is merely dug out whereas a cistern is faced with stone Arashi also as he sat and studied the section ask is not well identical with cistern said Mark Ashi saw the son of Arhista to Arashi come and here it was been taught both well and cistern are excavations in the soil only a well is merely dug out whereas a cistern is faced with stone he must buy himself the right of way this is the ruling of our Akiba the sages however say that he need not we may assume may we not that the point at issue between them is this Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B that in the view of our Akiva the vendor interprets the terms of sale liberally and in the view of the rabbis he interprets them strictly and further that wherever we find it stated that our Akiva decides according to his usual maxim that the vendor interprets the terms of sale liberally it is in the strength of this passage that we assign this maxim to him is this assumption justified perhaps the reason for their dispute is this our Akiva holds that a man does not like others to walk over ground which he has paid for and the rabbis hold that a man does not care to receive money on condition that he has to fly through the air to get to where he wants can we then base this assumption on the next clause if he sells these to another our Akiva says that the purchaser need not buy a right of way to them but the sages say that he must buy it no for perhaps the reason of their difference is this that according to our Akiva's view we have to Consult the wishes of the purchaser and according to the view of the rabbis we have to consult the wishes of the vendor can we base it on this the vendor does not sell with the field either a pit or a wine press or a dovecot whether they are in use or not in use and he must buy right of way to them this is the ruling of our Akiba but the sages say that he need not buy right of way to them now why should it repeat here the rulings of our Akiba and the sages surely it must be to show us that in general our Akiba holds that the vendor interprets the terms of sale liberally and the rabbis that he interprets them strictly no perhaps the mission desires to tell us by this that the difference between our Akiba and the sages is as stated above both in regard to a house and a field both being necessary for if it had stated the difference only in the case of a house I might have thought that there are Akiba says that the vendor has to buy right of way because the purchaser Desires privacy, but in the case of a field where this reason does not apply, I might say he need not. And if the difference had been stated only in regard to a field, I might have thought that there are Akiva says that the vendor has to buy right of way because the purchaser objects to his land being trodden down. But in the case of a house where this reason does not apply, I might say he need not. May we then base the assumption on the succeeding clause if he sells in the pit, etc. In a field to another, our Akiva says that the purchaser does not need to buy right of way while the sages say that he must. Now, why is there difference stated again? It is exactly the same here as in the previous case. We must therefore say that this shows that in the view of our Akiva, the vendor interprets the terms of sale liberally, and in the view of the rabbis, he interprets them strictly. It has been stated, Arhuna said in the name of Rab Talmud, Mas Baba Batra, the Halacha follows the ruling of. The sages are Jeremiah B. Abba however said in the name of Samuel that the Halacha follows the ruling of our Akiva said our Jeremiah B. Abba to Arhuna did I not frequently say in the presence of Rab that the Halacha follows the ruling of our Akiva and he did not say a word to me said Arhuna to him how did you report his ruling he said to him I reported them with the names reversed it is for that reason said Arhuna that he did not say anything to you Rabbana said to Arash
Agrees with Rabhans both statements are necessary are Naman said to Arunada's Allah follow our opinion or yours he replied the law follows your view since you have continual access to the gate of the exil arch where the judges are in session it has been stated if there are two apartments one within the other and both are sold or given away at the same time to two different persons they have no right of way against one another still less have they if the outer one is given and the inner one is sold if the outer one is sold and the inner one given the students wanted to infer from this that there is no right of way from one to the other but this is not correct for have we not learned this applies only to a sale but if the owner makes a gift he includes all these things this shows that a donor is presumed to make a gift in a liberal spirit so here the donor gives in a liberal spirit mission if a man sells a house he ipso facto sells with it the door but not the key he sells with an aim order fixed in the ground but not a movable one he sells with it the casing of a handmill but not the sieve and not a stove or an oven if he says to the purchaser I sell the house and all its contents Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabi all these things are included in the sale Gemara are we to say that the mission is not in agreement with our Meir for if it were according to our Meir surely he has laid down that if a man sells a vineyard he automatically sells with it the implements of the vineyard you may in fact say that it concurs with our Meir for there he was speaking of things which are part and parcel of the vineyard but here the mission speaks of things which are not part and parcel of the house but does not the mission mention a key side by side with the door as much as to say just as a door is part and parcel of a house so a key is part and parcel of the house and yet it is not sold with the house the more tenable opinion therefore is that the mission does not Agree with our mayor, our rabbis taught if a man sells a house, he ipso facto sells the door, the crossbar, and the lock, but not the key, the mortar that has been hollowed out of stone, but not one that has been fixed, the casing of the handmill, but not the seat, and not the oven, the stove, or the handmill. Our Eliezer, however, says that everything attached to the ground is in the same category as the ground. If the vendor uses the formula, the house and all its contents, all these things are sold within. Either case, however, he does not sell the well, the cistern, or the brand. Our rabbis taught if a man hollows out a pipe and then fixes it, water from it makes a mikway unfit for use. If, however, he first fixes it and then hollows it, it does not render the mikway unfit for use. To whom are we to ascribe this dictum? For it cannot be either our Eliezer or the rabbis. Which statement of our Eliezer have you in mind? Shall I say the one about the house? Possibly the reason why he says there that. Fixtures are in the same category as the ground is because he holds that the vendor interprets the terms of sale liberally whereas the rabbis hold that he interprets them strictly is it then a statement about the beehive as we have learned our Eliezer says that a beehive is on the same footing as the soil it may serve as a surety for a principal Talmud, Mas Baba Batra it is not liable to uncleanness where it is and if one takes honey from it on Sabbath he becomes liable for a sin offering it. Sages however say that it is not on the same footing as the soil that it cannot serve as a surety for a principal that it can become unclean where it is and that one who takes honey from it on Sabbath has not to bring a sin offering it is not the statement either for there our Eliezer's reason is as reported by our Eliezer that we find written in the scripture and he dipped it in the honeycomb from which he reasoned that just as one who plucks anything from a wood on Sabbath becomes liable. For a sin offering, so one who takes honey from a comb on Sabbath becomes liable for a sin offering. It must be then a statement of our Eliezer about the shelf, as we have learned. If a baker's shelf is fixed in the wall, our Eliezer says that it is not capable of becoming unclean. And the sages say that it is. We now ask again, which authority does the statement to above follow? If it is our Eliezer, then even if the pipe was first hollowed and then fixed, the water from it should not render the mikway unfit. If it is the rabbis, then even if it was first fixed and then hollowed, it should still spoil the mikway. It is in truth our Eliezer, and he makes a difference in the case of flat wooden articles because their uncleanness was decreed only by the rabbis. It would follow from this, would it not, that the rule about drawn water derives from the scripture Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabbi, but are not all agreed that it was decreed by the rabbis on their own authority? And further, our Jose son. Of our Hannah has said that the dispute between our Eliezer and the rabbis concerned the board of metal we must therefore say that in truth the above statement follows the rabbis and that they make a difference in the case of drawn water because its uncleanness was decreed only by the rabbis if that is the case then even if he first hollowed it and then fixed it it should not spoil the mikway there where it was hollowed and then fixed the case is different because it was in the category of a vessel while still unfixed our Joseph raised the following question if a man seeing the rain descend on the casing of his handmill decided to regard this as a washing what is its effect upon seeds if we accept the opinion of our Eliezer that anything attached to the ground is in the same category as the ground no question will arise where the question arises is if we accept the view of the rabbis who said that it is not in the same category as the ground this question must stand over our Nehemiah. The son of our Joseph sent to Rabbi the son of Arunazadi at Nihartia the following instruction when this woman presents herself to you Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra collect for her a tenth part of her father's estate even from the casing of a handmill or as she said when we were in the court of our Kahana we used to collect such dues from the rent of houses also mission if a man sells a courtyard he automatically sells the houses pit stitches and caves attached to it but not more if however he says to the purchaser I sell IT and all its contents all are included in the sale in either case however he does not sell a bath or an olive press that may be in it or Eliezer says if a man sells a courtyard he only sells with it the space of the courtyard Gemara our rabbis taught if a man sells a courtyard he sells with it the outer and the inner apartments and the sand field in it as to the shops those that open onto it are sold with it those that do not open onto it are not those that Open onto both sides are sold with it. Our Eliezer says if a man sells a court he sells only the air of the court. The master says here that shops opening onto both sides are sold with the courtyard. How can this be seen that our high has learned that they are not sold with it? There is no contradiction. The former speaks of shops of which the main entrance is in the courtyard. The latter of those of which the main entrance is in the street. Our Eliezer says if a man sells a courtyard he sells only the space of the courtyard. Rabbi said if the vendor says in Babylonia I sell you a dartha no one disputes that he means the apartments where the authorities differ is when he says darta one. Our Eliezer holding that in that case he means the open space only the other the rabbis that he means the apartments as well. According to another version Rabbi said if he said darta all are agreed that he meant the apartments as well where they differ is in the case where he said hazer one holding. That this means only the space of the courtyard and the other that it is analogous to the courtyard of the tabernacle. Rabbi further said if a man sells another the shore of a river and its bed if the purchaser takes possession of the shore he does not thereby acquire ownership of the bed and if he takes possession of the bed he does not thereby acquire ownership of the shore is that so has not Samuel laid down that if a man sells another ten fields in ten different provinces as soon as the purchaser has taken formal possession of one he becomes owner of all the reason there is that the earth is all one stretch and all the properties are utilized in the same way here however one thing is for one purpose and the other for another according to another version Talmud Mas Baba Bath Rabbi Rabbi said in the name of Arnaman if the purchaser takes formal possession of the shore he becomes thereby owner of the bed surely this is self evident since Samuel has laid down that if a man Sells the fields, etc. You might argue that in that case the reason is that all the earth is one stretch, but here one thing is used for one purpose and the other for another. Now I know that we do not argue thus. Mishnah: If a man sells an olive press, he automatically sells there with the sea and the pounding stone and the maidens, but he does not sell the thwarts nor the will nor the beam. If, however, he says to the purchaser, I sell it and all its contents, all these things are included in it. Sale: Our Eliezer says that if a man sells an olive press, he includes the beam. Gemara: The sea is what is called in Aramaic lentil. The pounding stone, according to our Abba Barmel, is what is called in Aramaic crusher. The maidens, according to our Yohanan, are cedar posts by which the beam is supported by thwarts. Is meant planks. The will is a winch. The beam is actually a beam. Our rabbis taught: If a man sells an olive press, he sells there with the planks and the tanks and the crushers and the lower. Millstone, but not the upper one. If he uses the formula and all its contents, all these are sold with it. In either case, he does not sell the stir
Decide from what we have learned if he says I sell you a bath and all its accessories all are included in the sale set of to him but is not our high learned that they are not all included are ashi therefore said we have to distinguish if the vendor says I sell you the olive press and all its accessories and these are its boundaries the purchaser requires them but otherwise not mission if a man sells a town he automatically includes the houses the pit stitches and caves the baths of pigeon. Coats and the irrigated fields attached to it but not mobile if however he used the words it and all its contents even if there were cattle and slaves in it they are all sold. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says that if one sells a town he sells also the center Gamar Arahabi are we said to Arashi from this mission we may conclude that a slave comes under the head of movable since if he came under the head of fixed property he would be sold along with the town you say then that a slave comes under the head of movables if so why does our mission say even slaves we must say therefore must we not that there is a difference between animate and inanimate movables you may thus also hold that a slave comes under the head of land but that there is a difference between mobile and immobile land Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel says that if one sells a town he does not sell the center what is meant by center here it was translated by Mahawan of the Simeon B. Abdullah says that it means tilling fields. According to the one who says that it means a recorder there is no question that fields are sold with the town but according to the one who says that it means fields the recorder is not sold with the town we learned olive presses and Beth Hashlaheen irrigated fields and it was assumed that Beth Hashlaheen meant tilling fields as indicated by the scriptural verse and God sent a sholia waters upon the fields now all is well and good if we adopt the opinion of the one who said the word. Sander means a recorder the first ten of the mission lays down that fields are sold with the town but not the recorder and Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel comes and tells us that the recorder also is sold but if we take the word to mean fields as not the first ten also said this you think that Shalaheen means tilling fields no it means orchards as indicated by the text I shoot Shalahai are an orchard of pomegranates and the first ten it tells us that these are sold but not tilling. Fields and our Simeon comes and tells us that tilling fields also are sold according to another version it was assumed that Shalaheen means orchards now it is all well and good if we take the word Sander to mean fields the first ten it says that orchards are sold with the town but not fields and Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel comes and tells us that fields are also sold Talmud, Mos Baba Bathrabi but if we take the word to mean recorder when the first ten it says that the man who sells the town sells. Also the orchards how can our Simeon supplement him by saying that he sells the recorder do you think that Shalaheen means orchards no Shalaheen means fields as indicated in the verse and sendeth waters upon the fields the first tana says that these are sold but not the recorder and Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel comes and says that the recorder also is sold which is right come and here our Judah says that the center is not sold but the town clerk is sold since the town clerk is a man must not be. Sander also be a man this does not follow the one can be one thing the other another but can you possibly maintain the scene that the Beretha in its next clause proceeds but one who sells the town does not sell its remnants nor its adjoining villages nor the woods that open onto it nor its preserves for animals birds and fishes and in commenting on this we said what are remnants beasley and what are beasley are said the fag ends of fields which shows that in our Judah's opinion only. Such fag ends are not sold with the town but the fields themselves are we must reverse the statement quoted above to read our Judah says that the Sander is sold but the town clerk is not sold but how can you make our Judah concur with Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel seeing that he concurs with the rabbis as the latter clause in the passage quoted above states not its remnants nor its adjoining villages whereas Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that if a man sells a town he does sell the adjoining villages. As it has been taught, if a man sells a town, he does not sell its adjoining villages. Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel, however, says that he does sell the adjoining villages. Our Judah agreed with him in one thing and differed from him in another, nor preserves of animals, birds, and fishes. A contradiction was pointed out between this and the following. If the town has adjoining villages, they are not sold with it. If one part of it is on an island and one part on the mainland, or if it has preserves of animals, birds, or fishes, these are sold with it. There is no contradiction in the one case they open towards the town and the other away from the town. But did we not learn above that the woods adjoining it are sold with it? We should read that are separated from it. Mission. If a man sells a field, he automatically includes the stones which are used in it and the vineyard canes which are used in it and the produce which is still attached to the soil and a clump of reeds occupying less than a beth roba. And a watchman's hut which is not cemented, and a young carob tree and a young sycamore tree, but he does not include stones which are not for use in the field, nor canes which are not for use in the vineyard, nor produce which has been detached from the soil. If he uses the words it and all its contents, all these are sold with it. In either case, however, he does not sell a clump of reeds covering a bath robe or more, nor a watchman's hut which is cemented, nor a full grown carob, nor a crop sycamore. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Gemara, what is meant by stones which are for use in IT? They translated it here as weight stones. Ola said that they are stones laid in order for making offense, but has not our high learned that they are stones piled up for making offense? Read instead of piled up laid in order. You say here they translate weight stones according to our measure. This means if they are ready for use, even though they have not yet actually been used, but according to the rabbis, only if. They have been actually used if we take the view of Ola that they are stones laid in order for making offense then according to our measure it would be sufficient if they are ready even though they have not been laid in order while according to the rabbis they must have been laid in order canes which are for use in the vineyard what are these canes for in the school of Arjana it was explained to mean canes which are placed under the vines to support them according to our measure they would be sold with the field if they are peeled even though they have not yet been fixed according to the rabbis only if they have been fixed produce still attached to the soil even though it is right for cutting down a clump of reeds less than a bethroba even though they are thick a hut that is not cemented even though it is not fixed in the soil a young carob and a young sycamore even though they are of good size but he does not sell the stones which are not for use in it according to our measure this is only if they are not ready for use, but according to the rabbis, even if they simply have not yet been used, if we take the view of Ola that they are stones laid in order for offense, then according to our measure they are not sold. Only if they are not yet ready for use, but according to the rabbis, even if they simply have not yet been laid in order, nor the canes of the vineyard which are not for use in it, according to our measure this is if they are not peeled, but according to the rabbis, even if they simply are not yet fixed nor produced, attached from the soil, although it still requires to be left in the field, nor a clump of reeds occupying a bath robe, even though the reeds are small, our high Abba said in the name of our Yohan, and this does not apply only to a clump of reeds, even a small perfume bed, if it has a name of its own, is not included in the sale of the field. Our Papa said what we mean by this is that it is known as so and so's roses, nor a watchman's hut, which is cemented, even though it is fixed in the ground. Our Eliezer asked what is the rule regarding the frames of doors where they are fixed to the wall with cement. There is no question that they are sold with since they are firmly attached. The question arises only where they are connected with hooks. This question must stand over. Our Zara asked what was the rule regarding the frames of windows. Do we say that they are purely for ornament or do we say that after all they are attached? This question must also stand over. Our Jeremiah asked what is the rule regarding the casters of the legs of a bed where they are moved with the bed. Of course, the question does not arise because they go along with it where there is room for question is where they are not moved with it. This also must stand over nor the full grown carob nor the crop sycamore talmud. Mas Baba Bathrabi whence is this rule derived? Rab Judah said in the name of Rab from the scriptural verse. So the field of Ephraim which was in Makla and all. The trees that were in the field that were in the border thereof, etc. This indicates that Abraham in buying the field acquired all the trees that require a boundary roundabout and that the purchase did not include those that do not require a boundary roundabout. Our measure she said this proves that the inclusion of the border in the purchase of a field is prescribed in scripture. Rab Judah said when a man sells a field he should write in the deed acquired here by the day trees other large trees, small trees and small day trees. It is true that even if he does not insert these words the transfer is valid but the deed is made more effective in this way if he says to him I sell you land and day trees we have to consider if he has any day trees he has to
Bind rap said when a vendor reserves trees, all those which have to be climbed by a rope ladder to pluck the fruit are reserved, while those which do not need this are not reserved. Talmud, Mas Baba Batra, the judges of the exile, however, say that all which are bent back by the yoke are not reserved, but all those which are not bent back by the yoke are reserved. There is really no conflict of opinion because the former speaks of day trees and the latter speaks of other trees are a hobby. Who not inquired of our who not if the vendor says I sell you the whole field with the exception of such and such a carob tree or such and such a sycamore? How do we decide? Is it that carob alone which the purchaser fails to acquire while he acquires all the rest, or does he fail to acquire the rest? Also, he replied he does not acquire them. Araha then raised an objection from the following: If the vendor says except such and such a carob tree, except such and such a sycamore, he does not obtain possession. Does this not mean that he fails to acquire possession of that carob, but he does acquire possession of the rest? No, he replied he fails to acquire possession of the other carobs. Also, the proof is this: suppose he was selling him a field and said to him, My field is sold to you, with the exception of such and such a field. Would this mean that the purchaser failed to acquire ownership of that field alone, but did acquire ownership of all the other fields belonging to the vendor of? Of course he would not acquire ownership so here too he does not acquire ownership some report this discussion as follows Rahab who not inquired of Arshis hate if the vendor said I sell you the field with the exception of half of such and such a carob tree or half of such and such a sycamore how do we decide of course he does not acquire the other carobs the question is does he acquire the half left over in the carob specified or does he fail to acquire even that he replied he does not acquire it. Araha then raised an objection from the following if the vendor says except half of such and such a carob half of such and such a sycamore he does not acquire the remaining carobs does not this mean that he only fails to acquire the remaining carobs but he does acquire the remainder of that carob no replied Arshis hate even the remainder of that carob he does not acquire the proof is this suppose he was selling him a field and said to him my field is sold to you with the exception of Half of such and such a field would he fail to acquire only that half and acquire the other half obviously he would not acquire it so here too he does not acquire our room inquired of our history if a man deposits something with another and receives a written acknowledgement for it and the other subsequently asserts I returned it to you how do we decide do we argue that since we should accept his word if he cared to say that he had lost it through circumstances over which he had no control now do we accept his word or do we accept the plea of the other if he says how comes your acknowledgement in my hand he replied we accept the word of the defendant but the claimant can plead how comes your acknowledgement in my hand said he or his dot on your own argument if the defendant said I lost it through circumstances over which I had no control could the claimant plead how comes your acknowledgement in my hand he or room replied when all Talmud, Mas Baba Bath is said and done even if he Pleads that it was taken from him by violence. Is he not required to take an oath here too? When I say that we accept his word, I mean that we accept it on his taking an oath. May we say that the point at issue between Arhista and Aramrum is the same as that between the following ten as it has been taught if a claim is made against orphans on the ground of a first bond. The judges of the exile say that the claimant is entitled on taking an oath to recover the whole, but the judges of Eretz Yisrael say that he is entitled on taking an oath to recover only half. Now all authorities accept the view of the Nihardians who say that this transaction is half a loan and half a deposit. May we not say then that the point in which they differ is this that the one authority, the judges of the exile, holds that the claimant may plead effectively how comes your bond to be in my hand, and the other holds that he cannot know all concur in the view of Arhista that he cannot end here the point of. Difference is this that the one the judges of the exile holds that if the borrower had paid before his death he would have told his children while the other holds that we may presume death to have prevented him or who not be sent a message that if a man places a deposit with another and receives an acknowledgement and the latter subsequently asserts that he has returned it his word is accepted and if a claim is made against orphans on the ground of a first bond the claimant is entitled on taking an oath to recover the whole have we not here two contradictory rulings in the second case there is a special reason that if he had paid he would have told his children Rabba said the law is that the claimant is entitled to take an oath and recover half Marzitra said that the law follows the decision of the judges of the exile said Rabbanage Marzitra has not Rabba laid down that he is entitled to take an oath and recover only half he replied in our version the reverse opinion is Ascribed to the judges of the exile Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Mishnah If a man sells a field he does not include the well nor the wine press nor the dukkot whether in use or not in use and if he requires a right of way to them he must buy it from the purchaser this is the opinion of our Akiva the sages however say that he is not required to do so our Akiva admits that if the vendor says to him I sell you all except these he need not buy right of way if he sells these things without the field our Akiva says that he the purchaser has no need to buy a right of way to them but the sages say that he has the above rule applies only to a vendor but a donor is held to make all these part of a gift if brothers divide an inheritance one who takes possession of a field taxes possession of all these things one who seizes the property of a proselyte in taking possession of a field takes possession of all these things if a man sanctifies his field he sanctifies all these things are Simeon, however, says that if a man sanctifies his field, he sanctifies only the full grown carob and the crop sycamore tree tomorrow. Why should the rule of a sale be different from that of a gift? Judah bin Akiza explained the reason in the presence of Rabbi saying the one the vendor specifies, the other the donor does not specify. What do you mean by saying that the one specifies and the other does not specify when the fact is that just as the one does not specify, so the other does not specify? What we should say is the latter ought to have specified. The former has no need to specify. A man gave instruction saying, Give to so and so a room holding a hundred barrels. It was found that the room in question would hold a hundred and twenty barrels. Marzitra, on hearing the case, said he gave him a space of a hundred barrels and not of a hundred and twenty. Said Arashi to him, Have we not learned this rule applies only to a vendor, but a donor is presumed to make all these part. Of the gift from which we infer that a donor is presumed to give in a liberal spirit, so here we say that the donor gives in a liberal spirit. If a man sanctifies a field, he sanctifies, etc. Arhuna said, although the rabbis have laid down that when a man buys two trees in another man's field, he does not acquire any of the soil with them. Yet if a man sells a field and reserves to himself two trees, he retains some of the soil with them. This rule is valid, even according to our Akiva, who says that the vendor sells in a liberal spirit, for this applies only to a well and a cistern which do not exhaust the soil, but in the case of trees which do exhaust the soil, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be. If the vendor did not tacitly reserve some soil for himself, the purchaser could say to him, When the trees wither, pluck up your tree and be off with it. We have learned our Simeon says that if a man sanctifies his field, he only sanctifies the full grown carob and the crop sycamore. Tree and in connection with this it was taught our Simeon said what is the reason because they suck from a sanctified field now if you assume that the sanctifier tacitly reserves something to himself then when the trees suck they suck from his property do they not we must suppose therefore that our Simeon follows our Akiva and that our was following the rabbis but if our was stating his rule from the point of view of the rabbis it is self-evident its practical bearing is that if it trees fall he can plant them again Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra but on the other hand can you make our Simeon concur with our Akiva seeing that it has been taught if a man sanctifies three trees in a field where ten are planted to a Beth Sea then he automatically sanctifies in addition the soil and the young trees between them therefore if he wants to redeem them he has to do so at the rate of fifty shekels of silver for the sowing ground of a homer of barley if they are planted more thickly or less thickly than this or if he sanctifies them one after another he does not thereby sanctify the soil and the trees between them therefore if he wants to redeem them he redeems the trees according to their value what is more even if he first sanctifies the trees one after another and then sanctifies the ground when he comes to redeem them he must redeem the trees at their actual value and then redeem the ground at the rate of 50 shekels for the sowing ground of a homer of barley who is the authority for these rules if our Akiva surely he says that the vendor sells in a liberal spirit all the more so than the sanctifier if the rabbi surely according to them it is the vendor who sells in a liberal spirit but the
one after another and then sanctifies the ground if he wants to redeem them he has to redeem the trees at their actual value and the ground at the rate of 50 shekels for the sowing place of a homer of barley now if this very is following our simian it should determine the valuation according to the time of the redemption so that the trees should be redeemed as part of the field for we know that our simian decides according to the time of redemption from what has been taught how do we know that if a man buys a field from his father and then sanctifies it and his father subsequently dies it is reckoned as a field of possession because scripture says and if he sanctifies a field which he hath bought which is not of the field of his possession he shall give thine estimation this signifies a field which is not capable of becoming a field of possession and we therefore accept from this rule such a one as this which is capable of becoming a field of his possession this is the opinion of our Judah and our Simeon. Our Meir says, From where do we know that if a man buys a field from his father and his father dies and he then subsequently sanctifies the field, it is reckoned as a field of his possession because it says, If he sanctifies a field which he hath bought which is not of the field of his possession, this signifies a field which is not a field of possession, and we therefore accept from this rule such a one as this which is a field of his possession. In contrast to this, our Judah and our Simeon compare a field which he sanctifies before his father dies to a field of his possession. Whence do they derive this? If from the verse just quoted, I might rejoin that this justifies only the lesson drawn by our Meir. We must therefore say that they rule thus because they go according to the time of redemption. Said our Naman B. Isaac as a general rule, our Judah and our Simeon do not go according to the time of redemption, but in this case they do so because they found a verse which they interpreted to this effect if so they said to our Meir it should say if he sanctifies a field which he has bought which is not his possession or even the field of his possession what is the force of the words which is not of the field of his possession it signifies one that is not capable of becoming the field of his possession and we accept from the rule one that is capable of becoming the field of his possession Arhuna said that the full-grown carob and the crop sycamore partly come under the law of trees and partly under the law of land they rank as trees to the extent that if a man sanctifies or buys two trees and one of these the soil in between is reckoned with they rank as land to the extent that they are not included in the transfer of land sold Arhuna further said that a sheaf of two seahs partly comes under the law of a sheaf and partly under that of a shock it ranks as a sheaf to the extent that while two sheaves can be regarded as forgotten while two with this one are not regarded as forgotten it ranks as a shock as we have learned if a reaper forgets a sheaf of two seahs it is not regarded as forgotten rabbi barhana said in the name of resh in regard to the full-grown carob and the crop sycamore we find a difference of opinion between our menahem son of our jose and the rabbi's talmud mas baba Batra, why does he not say between our simeon and the rabbis he intimates in this way that our menahem b jose was of the same opinion as our simeon chapter b mishnah he who sells a ship sells implicitly its mast sail anchor and all the implements needed for directing it but he does not sell the crew nor the packing bags nor the stores if however he said to him it and all that it contains and all these are included in the sail gemara torin is the mast for so it is written they have taken cedars from lebanon to make masts for the nest is the sail for so it is written a fine linen with richly woven work from Egypt was thy sail that it might be to thee for an ensign as to again our high top these are its anchors for so it is written would ye tarry for them till they were grown would ye shut yourselves off for them and have no husbands and all the implements needed for directing it are abba said this refers to the oars for so it is written of the oaks of Bashan have they made thine oars and if you desire you may infer it from the following text and all that handle the oars shall come down from their ships are rabbis taught he who sells a ship sells implicitly its wooden implements and its sweet water tank our Nathan says he who sells a ship sells implicitly its buzeth Simica says he who sells a ship sells implicitly its tujith rabba said buzeth and tujith are the same our Nathan the Babylonian called it buzeth as they say in Babylon the buzeth of Mazan while Simicus who was a Palestinian called it tujith for so it is written and your residue shall be taken away in Fishing boats Rabbi said seafarers told me the wave that sinks a ship appears with a white fringe of fire at its crest and when stricken with clubs on which is engraven I am that I am not the Lord of hosts Amen Amen Selah it subsides Rabbi said seafarers told me there is a distance of 300 parasangs between one wave and the other and the height of the wave is also 300 parasangs once they related we were on a voyage and the wave lifted us up so high that we saw the resting place of the smallest star and there was a flash as if one shot 40 arrows of iron and if it had lifted us up still higher we would have been burned by its heat and one wave called to the other my friend have you left anything in the world that you did not wash away I will go and destroy it the other replied go and see the power of the master by whose command I must not pass the sand of the shore even as much as the breadth of the thread as it is written fear ye not me saith it. Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence who have placed the sand for the bound of the sea and everlasting ordinance which it cannot pass? Rabbi said, I saw how Horman the son of Lilith was running on the parapet of the wall of Mahuza and a rider galloping below on horseback could not overtake him once they saddled for him two mules which stood Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be on two bridges of the Rognik and he jumped from one to the other backward and forward holding in his hands two cups of wine. Pouring alternately from one to the other and not a drop fell to the ground furthermore it was a stormy day such as that on which they that go down to the sea in ships mounted up to the heaven they went down to the deeps when the government heard of this they put him to death Rabbi said I saw an antelope one day old that was as big as Mount Tabor how big is Mount Tabor four parasangs the length of its neck was three parasangs and the resting place of its head was one parasang and a Half it cast a ball of excrement and blocked up the Jordan. Rabbi Barhana further stated, I saw a frog the size of the fort of Hadronia. What is the size of the fort of Hadronia? Sixty houses. There came a snake and swallowed the frog. Then came a raven and swallowed the snake and perched on a tree. Imagine how strong was the tree. Our Papa B. Samuel said, Had I not been there, I would not have believed it. Rabbi Barhana further stated, Once we were traveling on board a ship and saw a fish in whose nostrils a parasite had entered there upon the water, cast up the fish and threw it upon the shore. Sixty towns were destroyed there by sixty towns. Ate therefrom and sixty towns salted the remnants thereof. And from one of its eyeballs, three hundred kicks of oil were filled. On returning after twelve calendar months, we saw that they were cutting raptors from its skeleton and proceeding to rebuild those towns. Rabbi Barhana further stated, Once we were traveling on board a ship and saw a fish. Whose back was covered with sand out of which grew grass, thinking it was dry land. We went up and baked and cooked upon its back. When, however, its back was heated, it turned and had not the ship been nearby, we should have been drowned. Rabbi Barhana further stated, We traveled once on board a ship, and the ship sailed between one fin of the fish and the other for three days and three nights, it swimming upwards and we floating downwards. And if you think the ship did not sail fast enough, our Dimi, when he came, stated that it covered sixty parasangs in the time it takes to warm a kettle of water. When a horseman shot an arrow, the ship outstripped it, and our Ashi said that was one of the small sea monsters which have only two fins. Rabbi Barhana further related, Once we traveled on board a ship and we saw a bird standing up to its ankles in the water while its head reached the sky, we thought the water was not deep and wished to go down to cool ourselves, but a bath coal called out. Do not go down here for a carpenter's axe was dropped into this water seven years ago and it has not yet reached the bottom and this not only because the water is deep but also because it is rapid our ashi said that bird was this day for it is written and this day is with me rabbi barhana further related we were once traveling in the desert and saw geese whose feathers fell out on account of their fatness and streams of fat flowed under them i said to them shall we have a share of your flesh in the world to come one lifted up its wing the other lifted up its leg when i came before our eliezer he said unto me israel will be called to account for the sufferings of these geese nemotic like the sand of the purple blue scorpion stirred his basket rabbi barhana related we were once traveling in a desert and there joined us an arab merchant who by taking up sand and smelling it could tell which was the way to one place and which was the way to another we said Unto him how far are we from water he replied give me some sand we gave him and he said unto us eight parasangs when we gave him again later he told us that we were three parasangs off I changed it but was unable
Abba is an ass and every barbar Hannah is a fool you should have said Mufar Laki however thought that perhaps it was the oath in connection with the flood and the rabbis if so why woe is me he said unto me come I will show you the men of Korah that were swallowed up I saw two cracks that emitted smoke I took a piece of clipped wool dipped it in water attached it to the point of a spear and let it in there and when I took it out it was cinched thereupon he said unto me listen attentively to what you are about to hear and I heard them say Moses and his Torah are truth and we are liars he said unto me every thirty days Gehenna causes them to turn back here as one turns flesh in a pot and they say thus Moses and his law are truth and we are liars he said unto me come I will show you where heaven and earth touch one another I took up my bread basket and placed it in a window of heaven when I concluded my prayers I looked for it but did not find it I said unto him are there Thieves here he replied to me it is a heavenly will revolving wait here until tomorrow and you will find it or Yohanan related once we were traveling on board a ship and we saw a fish that raised its head out of the sea its eyes were like two moons and water streamed from its two nostrils as from the two rivers of Surah Arsafa related once we traveled on board a ship and we saw a fish that raised its head out of the sea it had horns on which was engraven I am a minor creature of the sea I am three hundred parts in length and I am now going into the mouth of Leviathan Arashi said it was a sea goat which searches for its food and for that purpose has horns or Yohanan related once we were traveling on board a ship and we saw a chest in which were set precious stones and pearls and it was surrounded by a species of fish called Carissa there went down Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B a diver to bring the chest but a fish noticed him and was about. To wrench his thigh thereupon he poured upon it a skin bottle of vinegar and it sank a bath coal came forth saying unto us what have you to do with the chest of the wife of our Hannah Abidosa who is to store in it purple blue for the righteous in the world to come Rab Judah the Indian related once we were traveling on board a ship when we saw a precious stone that was surrounded by a snake a diver descended to bring it up thereupon the snake approached with the purpose of swallowing the ship. When a raven came and bit off its head and the waters were turned into blood a second snake came took the head of the decapitated snake and attached it to the body and it revived again the snake approached intent on swallowing the ship again a bird came and severed its head thereupon the diver seized the precious stone and threw it into the ship we had with us salted birds as soon as we put the stone upon them they took it up and flew away with it our rabbis taught it happened that. Our Elizer and our Joshua were traveling on board a ship. Our Elizer was sleeping and our Joshua was awake. Our Joshua shuddered and our Elizer awoke. He said unto him, What is the matter, Joshua? What has caused you to tremble? He said unto him, I have seen a great light in the sea. He said unto him, You may have seen the eyes of Leviathan, for it is written, His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Our Ashi said, Our Hunabi Nathan related to me the following once we were walking in the desert and we had with us a leg of meat. We cut it open and picked out the forbidden fat and the nervous ischiaticus and put it on the grass while we were fetching with the leg regained its original form and we roasted it when we returned after twelve calendar months. We saw those coals still glowing when I came before MMR. He said unto me that grass was samter, those glowing coals were a broom. It is written and God created the great sea monsters here. They explained the sea gazelles are Yohan and said this refers to. Leviathan the slant serpent and to Leviathan the tortuous serpent for it is written in that day the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the slant serpent and Leviathan the tortuous serpent Nemonic all time Jordan Rab Judah said in the name of Rab all that the Holy One blessed be he created in his world he created male and female likewise Leviathan the slant serpent and Leviathan the tortuous serpent he created male and female and had they mated with one another they would have destroyed the whole world what then did the Holy One blessed be he do he castrated the male and killed the female preserving it in salt for the righteous in the world to come for it is written and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea and also behemoth on a thousand hills were created male and female and had they mated with one another they would have destroyed the whole world what did the Holy One blessed be he do he castrated the male and cooled the female and Preserved it for the righteous for the world to come for it is written low now his strength is in his loins this refers to the male and his force is in the stays of his body this refers to the female there also in the case of Leviathan he should have castrated the male and cooled the female why then did he kill the female fishes are dissolute why did he not reverse the process if you wish say it is because a female fish preserved in salt is tastier if you prefer say because it is written there is Leviathan whom thou hast formed to sport with and with a female this is not proper then here also in the case of behemoth he should have preserved the female in salt salted fish is palatable salted flesh is not rab Judah in the name of rab further said at the time when the holy one blessed be he desired to create the world he said to the angel of the sea open thy mouth and swallow all the waters of the world he said unto him lord of the universe it is enough that I remain with my own thereupon he struck him with his foot and killed him for it is written he stirreth up the sea with his power and by his understanding he smite through Rahab our Isaac said from this it may be inferred that the name of the angel of the sea was Rahab and had not the waters covered him no creature could have stood his foul odor for it is written they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain etc as the waters cover the sea do not read they cover the sea but in the sense they cover the angel of the sea Rab Judah further stated in the name of Rab the Jordan issues from the cavern of Panius it has been taught likewise the Jordan issues from the cavern of Panius and passes through the lake of Sabkay and the lake of Tiberias and rolls down into the great sea from whence it rolls on until it rushes into the mouth of Leviathan for it is said he is confident because the Jordan rushes forth to his mouth Rab Abiola objected this verse is written of Behemoth on a Thousand hills, but said our Abbiola when his behemoth on a thousand hills confident when the Jordan rushes into the mouth of Leviathan, Nemonic sees Gabriel hungry when Ardimi came, he stated in the name of our Yohanan the verse for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the flood speaks of the seven seas and four rivers which surround the land of Israel, and these are the seven seas, the sea of Tiberias, the sea of Sodom, the sea of Heleth, the sea of Hilda, the sea of Sukkah, the sea of Aspamia, and the great sea. The following are the four rivers, the Jordan, the Jarmuk, the Kiramine, and Pika. When Ardimi came, he said in the name of our Jonathan Gabriel is to arrange in the future Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, a chase of Leviathan, for it is said, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a fish or press down his tongue with a cord, and if the Holy One blessed be he will not help him, he will be unable to prevail over him, for it is said he only that made him can make his sword too. Approach unto him when Ardimi came, he said in the name of our Yohanan, when Leviathan is hungry, he emits fiery breath from his mouth and causes all the waters of the deep to boil, for it is said he make the deep to boil like a pot, and if he were not to put his head into the garden of Eden, no creature could stand his foul odor, for it is said he make the sea like a spice broth when he is thirsty, he makes numerous furrows in the sea, for it is said he make the path to shine after him or Ahabi. Jacob said the deep does not return to its strength until after seventy years, for it is said one thinks the deep to be hoary and hoary age is not attained at less than seventy years. Rabbi said in the name of our Yohanan, the Holy One, blessed be he will in time to come make a banquet for the righteous from the flesh of Leviathan, for it is said companions will make a banquet of it. Kara must mean a banquet, for it is said and he prepared for them a great banquet and they ate and drank. Companions must mean scholars for it is said thou that dwellest in the gardens the companions hearken for thy voice cause me to hear it the rest of Leviathan will be distributed and sold out in the markets of Jerusalem for it is said they will part him among the keen Adam and keen Adam must mean merchants for it is said as for keen and the balances of the sea are in his hand he loveth to oppress and if you wish you may infer it from the following whose merchants are princes whose traffickers are the honorable of the earth rabbi in the name of our Yohanan further stated the holy one blessed be he will in time to come make a tabernacle for the righteous from the skin of Leviathan for it is said canst thou fill tabernacles with his skin if a man is worthy a tabernacle is made for him if he is not worthy of the same ear covering is made for him for it is said and his head with a fish covering if a man is sufficiently worthy a covering is made for him if he is not worthy even of this a necklace is made for him for it is said and necklace is about the neck if he is worthy
cutting precious stones and pearls which were thirty cubits by thirty and on which were engravings of ten cubits by twenty. He said unto them, For whom are these? They replied that the Holy One, blessed be he, would in time to come set them up in the gates of Jerusalem when he came again before our Yohanan. He said unto him, Expound, O my master, it is becoming for you to expound as you said, so have I seen. He replied unto him, Raka, had you not seen, would not you have believed you are then? Sneering at the words of the sages, he set his eyes on him, and the student turned into a heap of bones, and objection was raised, and I will lead you. Koma Yath Armeir says it means two hundred cubits twice the height of Adam. Arjuna says a hundred cubits corresponding to the height of the temple and its walls, for it is said, We whose sons are as plants grown up in their youth, whose daughters are as corner pillars carved after the fashion of the temple. Our Yohanan speaks only of the ventilation. Windows wrap in the name of Our Yohanan further stated, The Holy One, blessed be he, will make seven canopies for every righteous man, for it is said, and the Lord will create over the whole habitation of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud of smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for over all the glory shall be a canopy. This teaches that the Holy One, blessed be he, will make for everyone a canopy corresponding to his rank. Why is smoke required in a canopy? Our Hanana said. Because whosoever is niggardly towards the scholars in this world will have his eyes filled with smoke in the world to come. Why is fire required in a canopy? Our Hanana said, This teaches that each one will be burned by reason of his envy of the superior canopy of his friend. Alas for such shame, alas for such reproach in a similar category is the following, and thou shalt put of thy honor upon him, but not all thy honor. The elders of that generation said the countenance of Moses was like that of the sun, the countenance of Joshua was like that of the moon. Alas for such shame, alas for such reproach. Our Hamabi Hanana said, The Holy One, blessed be he, made ten canopies for Adam in the Garden of Eden, for it is said, Thou wast in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering the cornelian, the topaz, and the emerald, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the carbuncle, and the emerald, and gold, etc. Marzitra says, Eleven, for it is said, Every precious stone are Yohanan said, the Least of all these was gold, since it is mentioned last, what is implied by the work of thy timbrels and holes. Rab Judah said, In the name of Rab the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Hiram, the king of Tyre, at the creation, I looked upon the observing thy future arrogance, and created therefore the excretory organs of man. Others say, Thus said the Holy One, blessed be he, I looked upon the Talmud, Mos Baba Bathra B, and decreed the penalty of death over Adam, what is implied by and over her. Assemblies Rabbi said in the name of our Yohanan Jerusalem of the world to come will not be like Jerusalem of the present world to Jerusalem of the present world anyone who wishes goes up but to that of the world to come only those invited will go Rabbi in the name of our Yohanan further stated the righteous will in time to come be called by the name of the Holy One blessed be he for it is said everyone that is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory I have formed him yet have made him our Samuel Binaman he said in the name of our Yohanan three were called by the name of the Holy One blessed be he and they are the following the righteous the Messiah in Jerusalem this may be inferred as regards the righteous from what has just been said as regards the Messiah it is written and this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord is our righteousness as regards Jerusalem it is written it shall be eighteen thousand reads round about in the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there, do not read there, but its name our Eliezer said there will come a time when holy will be said before the righteous as it is said before the Holy One, blessed be he for it is said, and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy rabbi in the name of our Yohanan further stated the Holy One, blessed be he will in time to come lift up Jerusalem three parts high for it is said, and she shall be lifted up and be settled in her place, in her place means like her place whence is it proved that the space it occupied was three parts in extent. Rabbi said a certain old man told me I saw ancient Jerusalem and it occupied an area of three parts unless you should think the ascent will be painful, it is expressly stated who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their coats are Papa said, hence it may be inferred that a cloud rises three parts are be Papa said. Holy One, blessed be he, wished to give to Jerusalem a definite size for it is said and said, I whither goest thou? And he said unto me to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. The ministering angel said before the Holy One, blessed be he, Lord of the universe, many towns for the nations of the earth hast thou created in thy world, and thou didst not fix the measurement of their length or the measurement of their breadth, wilt thou fix a measurement for Jerusalem in the midst of which is thy name, thy sanctuary, and the righteous thereupon an angel said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. Rush Lakish said, The Holy One, blessed be he, will in time to come add to Jerusalem a thousand gardens, a thousand towers, a thousand palaces, and a thousand mansions, and each of these will be as big as Sephoris in its prosperity. It has been taught our Jose said, I saw. Sephoris in its prosperity and it contained 180,000 markets for putting dealers it is written and the side chambers were one over another three and thirty times what is meant by three and thirty times our Levi in the name of our poppy in the name of our Joshua of Seekman said if in time to come there will be three Jerusalems each building will contain thirty dwellings one over the other if there will be thirty Jerusalems each building will contain three dwellings one over the other it has been stated in the case of a ship Rab said the buyer acquires legal ownership as soon as he pulled it however slightly whereas Samuel said he cannot become its legal owner until he has pulled its full length must it be said that they differ on the same principles as the following tanaim for we have learned how is the acquisition by Mezerai if the buyer seizes the animal by its who hear the saddle or the saddle bag upon it the bit in its mouth or the Bell on its neck he acquires legal possession how is the acquisition by Meshika if he calls it and it comes or if he strikes it with a stick and it runs before him he acquires legal ownership as soon as it has moved the foreleg and hindleg Araha some say Araha said not until it has moved the full length of its body must it be said that Rab follows the first Tana and Samuel follows Araha Rab can tell you what I have said is valid even according to Araha for his statement until it moved etc is applicable only to an animal which though it has moved the foreleg and hindleg remains in the same place but in the case of a ship when a small part of it moves the whole moves and Samuel can say what I have said is valid even according to the first Tana for his statement as soon as it has moved etc is applicable only to an animal for since one foreleg and one hindleg have been moved the other legs are on the point of being moved but in the case of a ship if he pulls it all he does acquire possession otherwise he does not must it be said that they differ on the same principles as the following tanaim for it has been taught a ship is legally acquired by Meshika or Nathan said a ship and letters are legally acquired by Meshika Talmud, Mos Baba Batra or by a bill of sale letters who mentioned them something is missing in the statement of the first tanah and the following is the correct reading a ship is acquired by Meshika and letters by Mezra R. Nathan said a ship and letters are acquired by Meshika and by a bill of sale but why should a bill of sale be required in the case of a ship surely it is a movable object but no the following is the correct reading a ship is acquired by Meshika and letters by Mezra R. Nathan said a ship is acquired by Meshika and letters by a bill of sale is not the statement of our Nathan a ship is acquired by Meshika identical with that of the first tanah may we not then conclude that they differ on the same principles as Rab and Samuel know the views of both are either like those of Rab or like those of Samuel and in the case of a ship there is no dispute whatsoever between them they differ only in the case of letters and this is what our Nathan said to the first Tana in the case of a ship I certainly agree with you but as regards letters if there is also a bill of sale he does acquire the right to the debt otherwise he does not and their dispute is analogous to that of the following Tana for it has been taught letters may be acquired by Mezra these are the words of Rabbi but the sages say whether the seller has written a bill of sale but has not delivered the bond or whether he has delivered the bond but has not written a bill of sale the buyer does not acquire possession until the seller has written the bill of sale and delivered the bond how has the matter been established that the first Tana is in agreement with Rabbi should not then a ship also be acquired by Mezra for it was taught a ship is acquired by
He said that Abay and Rabba follow Rabbi and not the rabbis who are the majority are as she said if the seller told him go take possession and acquire even the rabbis would say so here however we deal with the case when the seller said to him go pull and acquire the rabbis hold the opinion that by this expression he intimated his objection to any other mode of taking possession and the other holds the opinion that by this he was merely indicating to him a suitable place or papa said. He who sells a bond to his friend must also give him in writing the following statement acquire it and all rights contained therein are as she said when I quoted this law in the presence of Arkahada I said unto him possession of the debt is acquired accordingly only because he has written for him in this manner but had he not so written no possession would be acquired does one then require a bond to use as a stopple for his bottle he said unto me yes just to use it as a stopple Talmud, Moss. Baba Bathra Omimar said the law is according to Rabbi that letters are acquired by Mezra Arashi said to Omimar is this a tradition or a logical deduction he replied unto him it is a tradition Arashi said this may also be deduced logically because letters are words and words cannot be acquired by means of other words and can they not surely Rabbi B. Isaac said in the name of Rab there are two kinds of deeds if a person says take possession of the field on behalf of X and right. For him the deed he may withdraw the deed but not the field if however he says take possession of the field on condition that you write for him the deed he may withdraw both the deed and the field but our high Abin says in the name of Arhuna there are three kinds of deeds two have just been described and the third is one which the seller writes before the sale Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B in accordance with the law we have learned that a deed may be written for the seller though the Buyer is not with him in this case as soon as the buyer takes possession of the ground he acquires also the deed irrespective of the place in which it is kept and this accords with what we have learned that movable property may be acquired with landed property by means of money deed and possession acquiring a deed on the basis of land bought jointly with it is different from its independent acquisition for a coin which cannot be acquired by halifin may yet be acquired by virtue of land bought jointly with it as in the case of our papa he had a money claim of 12,000 zoos at BQZ he passed them over into the possession of our Samuel Biaha by virtue of his threshold when the latter came back he went out to meet him as far as Tug but he does not sell the crew nor the packing bags nor the stores etc what is the meaning of Intek our papa said the merchandise which it contains Mishnah he who sold the wagon has not sold the mules he who sold the mules has not Sold the wagon he who sold the yoke has not sold the oxen he who sold the oxen has not sold the yoke. Arjuna says the price indicates what is to be included in the sale. How if he said unto him, Sell me your yoke for 200 ZUZ, it is obvious that a yoke alone is not sold for 200 ZUZ, but the sages say the price is no proof. Gemara our Talafa, the Palestinian recited the Beritha before our Rabbi, he who sold the wagon has sold the mules, but surely the master said, We learned he has not sold. He said unto him, Shall I cancel it? He replied unto him, No, your teaching may be interpreted as dealing with the case when the mules were harnessed to it. He who sold the yoke has not sold the oxen, etc. How is this to be understood if it be said that the Mishnah speaks of a place where a yoke is called yoke and oxen are called oxen? In this case, surely he sold him the yoke, but has not sold him the oxen, and if the oxen also are called yoke, all was obviously sold the law in. The mission is necessary to be stated in order to provide for a place where a yoke is called yoke and oxen oxen while there are also some who call the oxen also yoke in such a case our Judah holds the opinion that the price indicates what was the intention of the seller and the rabbis the sages hold the opinion that the price is no proof but if the excessive price is no proof that the oxen were included in the sale the return of the overcharge or the cancellation of the entire purchase should follow Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra and should you reply that the rabbis do not accept the law of the return of overcharge or that of the cancellation of the purchase surely have we not learned our Judah says in the case of the sale of a scroll of the law of beast or a pearl the law of overcharging does not apply but they said unto him only about those mentioned above has this been said what is the meaning of the statement that the price is no proof that the entire sale is to be cancelled if you prefer I would say the rabbis apply the laws of overcharging and cancellation of sale only in cases where one is likely to be deceived but not when one is unlikely to be deceived for in the latter case it may be assumed that the difference was given as a gift Mishnah he who sells an ass has not sold its equipment Nahum the meat says he has sold its equipment Arjuna says sometimes it is sold sometimes it is not sold how so if the ass with its equipment upon it stood before him and he the buyer said unto him sell me this ass of yours then its equipment is sold if however he said I ask the ass here sell it to me its equipment is not sold Gemara Ola said the dispute between the first tana and Nahum the meat is only about the sack the saddlebag and pallet for the first tana is of the opinion that an ass is as a rule used for riding and Nahum the meat is of the opinion that an ass is as a rule used for carrying burdens but in the case of it Saddle pack saddle cover and saddle belt both agree that these are included in the sale and objection was raised it has been taught if one says to another I sell you the ass and its equipment he has sold him the saddle the pack saddle the cover and the saddle belt but he has not sold the sack the saddle bag and the pallet if however he said unto him I sell you with the ass and all that is upon it then all these are included in the sale from this follows that the reason why the buyer acquires possession of the saddle and the pack saddle is that the seller said I sell it and its equipment but if he had not said so the buyer would not have acquired these know the law that the saddle and the pack saddle are included in the sale is applicable even though the seller did not say unto him I sell you the ass and its equipment but by the inclusion of the statement he teaches us that although the seller said unto him I sell you the ass and its equipment he did. Buyer does not acquire the sack, the saddlebag, and the pallet. What is come nigh our Papa B. Samuel said a mattress seat for traveling women. The students inquired is the dispute between the first tana and Nahum the meat in the case when the sack and saddlebag are upon it, but when these are not upon it, Nahum the meat agrees with the rabbis, or is the dispute in the case when these are not upon it, but when they are upon it, the rabbis agree with Nahum. Come and here it is stated in the above. Bury the but when he said unto him, I sell you it, and all that is upon it, then all these are sold. Now this would be correct if it were assumed that the dispute related to the case when they are upon it, since this bury could be assigned to the rabbis. If however it is assumed that the dispute relates to the case when they are not upon it, but that in case they are upon it, both agree that they are implicitly included in the sale to whom could this bury be assigned it may. Still he said that the dispute relates to the case when they are not upon it and the Beritha may be assigned to the rabbis but read if however he said unto him it and all that ought to be on it come and here Arjuna says sometimes it is sold sometimes it is not sold now does not Arjuna presumably base his statement on what the first tana has said and since Arjuna specifically deals with the case when the equipment is upon the ass the first tana must also be speaking of a similar case no. Arjuna Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B speaks of a different case Rabbin has said to Arashi come and here we learned he who sold the wagon has not sold the mules and Artalafa the Palestinian recited in the presence of Arabah he who sold the wagon has sold the mules and the master said unto him surely we have learned that he has not sold and he replied shall I cancel it and the master said to him no your teaching may be interpreted as dealing with the case where the mules were harnessed to. If from this it must be inferred that the mission speaks of the case where the mules are not harnessed to the wagon and since the first part is concerned with the case when they are absent from it the latter part also must be dealing with the case when they are absent from it on the contrary consider the very first part which reads but he does not sell the crew nor the intech and it has been stated what is the meaning of intech our papa said the merchandise which it contains now. Since the first part deals with the case when it the merchandise is in it the ship the latter part also must deal with a similar case which is when it the equipment is upon it the ass but the only way out of the difficulty is to conclude that the tana dealt with different cases in the different parts of the mission and Imanic Zijemnes and Abbe said our Eliezer and our Simeon Begamaliel and our Meir and our Nathan and Simicus and Nahum the meat are all of the opinion that when a man sells. An object he sells it and all its accessories as to our Eliezer we learned our Eliezer says he who sells the building of an olive press has also sold the beam as to our Simeon Begamaliel we learned our Simeon Begamaliel says he who sells a town has also sold the center as to our Meir
He meant to say I sell you if the cow and its calf why is the foal called Sayah because it follows gentle talk our Samuel Binam and said in the name of our Yohan and what is the meaning of the verse wherefore Hamashalim they that speak in parable say etc. Hamashalim means those who rule their evil inclinations come Heshman means come let us consider the account of the world the loss incurred by the fulfillment of the precept against the reward secured by its observance and the gain gotten. By a transgression against the loss it involves thou shalt be built and thou shalt be established if thou dost so thou shalt be built in this world and thou shalt be established in the world to come Iar Sihon if a man makes himself like a young ass that follows the gentle talk of sin what comes next for a fire goes out me Heshman etc. A fire will go out from those who calculate the account of the world and consume those who do not calculate and a flame from the city of Sihon from the city. Of the righteous who are called trees it has devoured ARMO of this refers to one who follows his evil inclination like a young ass that follows gentle talk the high places of Arnon refers to the arrogant for it has been said whosoever is arrogant falls into Gehenna one around the wicked says there is no high one Heshman is perished the account of the world is perished unto Divin the Holy One blessed be he said wait until judgment cometh and we have laid waste Talmud, Mas Baba Batra even. Unto Nafa until there comes a fire which requires no fanning unto Medba until it will melt their souls others interpret until he had accomplished what he desired to do to the wicked Rab Judah said in the name of Rab whosoever departs from the words of the Torah is consumed by fire for it is said and I will set my face against them out of the fire are they come forth and the fire shall devour them when our came he said in the name of our Jonathan whosoever departs from the words of it. Torah falls into Gehenna for it is said the man that strayeth out of the way of understanding shall rest in the congregation of the shades and the shades must be synonymous with Gehenna for it is said but he knoweth not that the shades are there that her guests are in the depths of Sheol he who sold the dunghill has also sold the manure and it etc we learn elsewhere in the case of all objects which are suitable for the altar and not for the temple repair or for temple repair and not for the altar and also in the case of those which are suitable neither for the altar nor for temple repair they and their contents are subject to the law of Mi'ilah how so if one dedicated a cistern full of water dunghills full of manure a dove coat full of doves a field full of herbs or a tree bearing fruit the law of Mi'ilah is applicable both to them and to their contents if however one dedicated a cistern which was subsequently filled with water a dunghill which was subsequently filled with manure a dove coat which was subsequently filled with doves a tree which subsequently began to bear fruit or a field which was subsequently filled with herbs in all these cases the law of Mi'ilah is applicable to the objects but not to their contents these are the words of our Judah our Jose says if fields or trees are dedicated they and their products are subject to the law of Mi'ilah because the latter are the growths of consecrated property it has been taught rabbi said the opinion of our Judah is acceptable in the case of a cistern and a dove coat and the opinion of our Jose in the case of a field and a tree how do you understand that it is quite correct for rabbi to say that the opinion of our Judah is acceptable in the case of a cistern and a dove coat and thus to imply that he disagrees with him in the case of a field and a tree but as regards the expression the opinion of our Jose is acceptable in the case of a field and a tree which implies that he disagrees with him in the case of a cistern and a dove coat surely our Jose speaks only of a field and a tree and if you would reply that our Jose argues in accordance with the views of our Judah and that he himself is in entire disagreement with them surely it has been taught our Jose said I do not accept our Judah's views on a field and a tree because these are the products of consecrated objects this clearly proves that only in the case of field and tree he does not accept but in the case of cistern and Dukkot he does accept this is what Rabbi implied the opinion of our Judah is acceptable to our Jose in the case of a cistern and a Dukkot because even our Jose disagreed with him only on field and tree but on cistern and Dukkot he agrees with him our Rabbi's taught if one dedicated them empty and subsequently they were filled the law of Mi'ilah is applicable to them but not to their contents our Eliezer B. Simeon says the law of Mi'ilah is applicable to their contents also said Rabbi the dispute has reference to field and tree for the first Tana holds the same opinion as our Judah and our Eliezer B. Simeon is of the same opinion as our Jose but in the case of cistern and Dukkot both agree that the law of Mi'ilah applies to them and not to their contents have they said unto him but surely it has been taught if one dedicated them when full Mi'ilah is applicable to them and to their contents and our Eliezer B. Simeon reverses his previous view Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be now with it. Dispute has reference to field and tree. Why does he reverse his view? Consequently, Rabbi said the dispute has reference to cistern and dovecote. But in the case of field and tree, both agree that they and their contents are subject to the law of Mi'ilah. On what principle do they differ when the cistern and dovecote are empty? And on what principle do they differ when the cistern and dovecote are full? When the cistern and dovecote are empty, the dispute is analogous to that of Armadir. And the rabbis for the first tana is of the same opinion as the rabbis who said no one can hand over possession of a thing that does not exist. While our Eliezer B. Simeon is of the same opinion as Armadir who said that one can hand over possession of a thing that does not exist. But say where has Armadir been heard to express his view only in the case, for example, as that of fruits of the palm tree because they generally come up. But as to these who can assert that they will come, Rabbi said it is. Possible when water runs through his own courtyard into the cistern and when doves come through his dovecote into the dedicated dovecote and in what case do they differ when the cistern and dovecote are full? Rabbi said for example when he dedicated a cistern without mentioning its contents and our Eliezer B. Simeon holds the same opinion as his father who said we may infer the law concerning sacred property from the ordinary laws in the case of ordinary law one can say I sold you a cistern I did not sell you water so in the case of the law concerning sacred things one can say I dedicated the cistern I did not dedicate the water but can it be said that in the ordinary law the water is not implicitly sold surely we learned he who sold a cistern has also sold its water Rabbi replied this mission represents an individual opinion for it has been taught he who sold a cistern has not sold its water our Nathan said he who sold a cistern has sold its water Talmud, Mas Baba. Bathro Mishnah one who buys of another the annual issue of a dovecote must allow the first brood to fly with their dam if he buys the annual issue of a beehive he takes the first three swarms and the seller may then emasculate those remaining if he buys honeycombs he must leave two combs if he buys olive trees for felling he must leave two shoots Kamara has it not been taught that the buyer must leave the first and the second brood our Kahana replied one for itself it first brood one for the dam but if it is assumed that the mother dove will be attached to the daughter dove and to the mate left with it let it equally be assumed that the daughter dove also will be attached to its mother dove and to the mate left with it a mother is always attached to a daughter but not so a daughter to a mother if he buys the annual issue of a beehive he takes the first three swarms and the seller may then emasculate those remaining wherewith does he Emasculate them. Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel with mustard in Palestine. It has been stated in the name of our Jose B. Hanan. It is not the mustard that emasculates them, but the excessive quantities of honey which the bitterness in their mouths caused by the mustard makes them consume. Our Yohanan said the buyer takes the three swarms alternately in a very. It has been taught the buyer takes three swarms consecutively, and after that he takes them alternately if he buys honeycombs. He must leave two combs, etc. Our Kahana said honey in a beehive never loses the designation of food. This proves that he is of the opinion that no intention is required. An objection was raised. It has been taught honey in a beehive is neither regarded as food nor as drink. Abay replied this referred only to those two combs. Rabbi said this is in accordance with our Eliezer Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra before we learned as to beehive. Our Eliezer said it is regarded as landed property of Rosbul maybe. Written on the basis of it, and it is not subject to the laws of Levitical defilement. While in situ, any who takes honey out of it on the Sabbath is under the obligation of bringing a sin offering. But the sages say a principle may not be written on the basis of it. It is not regarded as landed property. It is subject to the laws of Levitical defilement. In situ, any who takes honey out of it on the Sabbath is absolved. Our Eliezer said, "What is the reason of our Eliezer for it is written, and he dipped it in the honeycomb Yerath. What is there in common between the forest and honey? But the verse tells you that as in the
Laws of Levitical defilement even if there was no intention to use it for human consumption if he buys olive trees for felling he must leave two shoots our rabbis have taught he who buys a tree from his friend for felling shall leave the height of a handbreadth from the ground and cut it if a virgin sycamore the cut must be made at no less a height than three handbreadths if a sycamore trunk two handbreadths in the case of reeds and vines the cut is to be made from the knot end. Above it in the case of palm trees and cedars he may again take them out with the roots because their stumps do not grow afresh does a virgin sycamore require as high a stump as three handbreadths what about the contradiction from the following a virgin sycamore must not be cut in the sabbatical year because cutting his work our Judah says to cut in the usual manner is prohibited but one may either leave a height of ten handbreadths and cut or raise the tree at ground level from. This it follows that only at ground level is the cut injurious but at any other point it is beneficial Abbe replied at a height of three handbreadths the cut is beneficial at ground level it is certainly injurious at any other point it is neither definitely injurious nor definitely beneficial consequently in the case of the sabbatical year the cut made must be one that is unquestionably injurious in the case of commercial transactions the cut made must be one that is Unquestionably beneficial it has been said that in the case of palm trees and cedars he may dig and take them out with the roots because their stumps do not grow afresh again does not the stump of a cedar grow afresh early our high and he gave the following exposition it is written the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon if palm tree has been mentioned why mention also the cedar and if cedar has been mentioned why mention also palm tree if cedar only had been mentioned and not palm tree it might have been implied that as the cedar produces no edible fruit so will the righteous produce no fruit therefore palm tree has been mentioned and if palm tree had been mentioned but not cedar it would have been implied that as the stump of the palm tree does not grow afresh so the shoot of the righteous will not grow therefore cedar is also mentioned the fact is that other kinds of cedar trees are spoken of in accordance with a Statement made by Rabbi Sun of Arhuna who reported that at the College of Rabbit had been stated as follows There are ten kinds of cedar trees for it is said I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia tree and the myrtle and the oil tree I will set etc. Eras means cedar, shita means pine, hottas means myrtle, easy, shiman means balsam tree, barosh means cypress, titter means tiku, ashur means sherbina are not these only seven kinds of cedar when Ardimi came he said the following were added to them Alanam Almanam Abajim Alanam Arpistachio trees Almanam Aroks Amajim Talmud Mas Baba Batra Ar Coral Some say Aranam Arminam Amajim Aranam Ar Arminam Ar Plain trees Amajim Ar Corals Mishnah One who buys two trees in another man's field does not acquire ownership of the ground Ar Meir says he does acquire ownership of the ground if the trees grew large the landowner must not cut down their branches whatever grows from the stem is his the buyer's end. Whatever grows from the roots belongs to the landowner. If the trees die, the buyer has no claim to the ground. One who bought three trees has implicitly acquired ownership of the ground. If they grew large, the landowner may cut down their branches. Whatever grows from the stem and from the roots belongs to him. The buyer, if the trees die, the buyer has a right to the possession of the ground. Gemara, we learned elsewhere, he who buys two trees in another man's field has to bring the bigram, but is not to recite the declaration. Armeir says he has to bring and recite. Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, Armeir subjects to the obligation. Even him who bought fruit in the market, whence is this to be inferred from the fact that a superfluous mission has been introduced? For it should be observed that Armeir has already taught that he who bought two trees has also acquired the ground. Is it not then obvious that he has to bring and to recite? Hence it may. Be inferred from this superfluous mission that Armeir subjects to the obligation even him who buys fruit in the market but is it not written which thou shalt bring in from thy land this is to exclude the fruit grown in foreign territory but is it not written the choicest first fruit of thy land thou shalt bring this is to exclude the land of a heathen but is it not written the first fruits of the land which thou hast given me this means the fruits for which thou hast given me money with which to buy them robber raised an objection it has been taught he who buys a tree in another man's field brings the first ripe fruit but does not recite the declaration because he has not acquired ownership of the ground these are the words of Armeir this is indeed a refutation our Simeon Beliakim said to our Eliezer Talmud Mas Baba Bathra what reason is there for Armeir's opinion in the case of one tree and for that of the rabbis in the case of two trees he Replied, do you interrogate me in the house of study on a matter about which the ancients gave no reason in order to shame me? Rabbi said, what is the difficulty? It is possible that Armeir was doubtful about one tree and the rabbis about two trees, but was Armeir in doubt? Surely it is stated distinctly because he has not acquired ownership of the ground. These are the words of Armeir. This should read, perhaps he has not acquired ownership of the ground, but ought we not to apprehend lest these are not bigram and consequently one would bring into the temple court unconsecrated fruit. He consecrates them, but must not the priest eat them. The bigram he redeems them, but perhaps they are not bigram and he thus excludes them from the heave offering and tithe. He does separate the heave offering and the tithes from them. In the case of the terra Magidola, this is correct, for he gives it to the priest the second tithe. Also he gives to a priest the poor man's tithe. Also he Gives to a poor priest, but to whom does he give the first tithe which belongs to the Levite? He gives it to a priest in accordance with the decision of our Eliezer B. Ezrai, for it has been taught Terra belongs to the priest, the first tithe belongs to the Levite. These are the words of our Akiva. Our Eliezer B. Ezrai says the first tithe also belongs to the priest, but perhaps they are bigram and consequently require recital of the declaration. The recital is not indispensable. Is it not indispensable? Surely our Zara said wherever proper mingling is possible, the mingling is not indispensable, but where proper mingling is not possible, the mingling is indispensable. He acts on the lines of the teaching of our Jose B. Hanna, who said he who cut the first ripe fruit and sent them to Jerusalem with a messenger, or if the messenger cut them and died on the way, the owner brings the fruit and does not recite the declaration, for it is written and thou shalt. Take and thou shalt bring Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra the taking and the bringing must be performed by the same man and in the present case this has not been done our Ahasan of Awiyah said to our Ashi behold are not these really scriptural verses let him recite them he replied unto him one must not recite the verses because it would appear as telling a lie our Meshachi the son of our high said because the fruit might mistakenly be excluded from the heave offering and from the tithe if the trees grew large the landowner must not cut down their branches etc what is considered to be from the stem and what is considered to be from the roots are Yohanan said whatever is exposed to the sun is of the stem and whatever is not exposed to the sun is of the roots how can it be said that all that grows from the stem belongs to the buyer is there not cause to apprehend that the ground might produce a livium covering up the knots of the lowest shoots and that the buyer would say to the landowner, You have sold me three trees, and I have therefore a share of the ground. But Arnaman replied, The buyer must cut them off. Our Yohanan also said, He must cut them off. Arnaman said, We have it by tradition that a palm tree has no stem. Arzibid was of the opinion that this means that the owner of the palm tree has no rights to that which grows from the stem, because since the tree is destined when it dries up to be dug and taken out with the roots, the buyer discards the shoots from his mind. Our Papa, however, raised the following difficulty. Surely the case of him who buys two trees includes also such trees as are destined to be dug up and taken out with the roots. And yet the Mishnah teaches that the buyer has a title to the stem. But said our Papa, The reason why the owner of the palm tree has no title to the stem is because the stem does not usually produce any shoots according to Arzibid. However, there Remains the difficulty of our mission. Our mission deals with the case where the trees were sold for five years. One who bought three trees has implicitly acquired ownership of the ground and how much ground our high B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan he has acquired the ownership of the ground beneath the trees and between them and round about them. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. As much as is required for a gatherer and his basket, our Eliezer raised a difficulty since he has no right of passage. Would he have a right to the ground required by a gatherer and his basket if he has no right of passage because the trees grow in another field? Should he then have a right to the ground required for a gatherer and his basket? Our Zara said
round about them as much as is required for a gatherer and his basket of a said to our Joseph who sows on that land reserved for the gatherer and his basket he replied you have learned that the external field owner sows the pathway he said unto him are these two cases alike there the buyer is not involved in any loss but here the owner of the tree is involved in a loss for he can point out to the seller that the fruit that would drop on the scattered seed would be soiled this case rather resembles the final clause of the mission in accordance with which neither the one nor the other may sow on the allotted space it has been taught in agreement with the opinion of Abbe he has acquired the ground beneath them and between them and round about them as much as is required for the gatherer and his basket and neither of them is allowed to sow it if the buyer of three trees is to acquire possession of the ground how much space must there be between the trees are Joseph said in the name of Rab Judah, in the name of Samuel, a distance of four to eight cubits between any two trees. Rabba said, in the name of Arnaman, in the name of Samuel, from eight to sixteen cubits. Abbe said to our Joseph, do not dispute with Arnaman, for we learned a mission that is in agreement with him. For we learned he who plants his vineyard and leaves distances of sixteen cubits between the rows may insert seed. There, our Judah said it occurred in Zalman that one planted his vineyard, leaving distances of sixteen cubits between the rows, and turned the branches of every two adjacent rows towards one side, and sowed the clearing. In the following year, he turned the branches towards the spot sown in the previous year, and sowed the uncultivated spaces. When the matter was reported to the sages, they allowed it. Here, Joseph said unto him, I am not aware of this, but there was a case Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, and Dura way where three trees planted at distances of less. Then eight cubits between them were sold, and when the disputants came before Rab Judah, he said unto the buyer, Go and give him his share in the ground, even though the spaces between the trees are just enough for a pair of oxen and their plowing outfit. I did not know at the time how large was the space of a pair of oxen and their outfit. When, however, I heard the following mission in which we learned a man must not plant a tree near his neighbor's field unless he has kept at a distance of four cubits. And in connection with this, it has been taught the four cubits mentioned are the dimensions of the space required for attending to the vineyard. I concluded that the space of a pair of oxen and their outfit is four cubits. But is there not also a mission which agrees with the report of our Joseph? Surely we learned our Meir and our Simeon say he who plants his vineyard, leaving distances of eight cubits between the rows, may insert seed. There, a practical decision is. Nevertheless, preferable the statement of our Joseph who follows our Simeon may be regarded as satisfactory since we have heard a definition of scattered trees and we have also heard a definition of closely planted trees with regard to trees scattered. We have the mission just mentioned as regards trees planted closely. It has been taught a vineyard planted on an area of less than four cubits is not regarded as a vineyard. These are the words of our Simeon and the sages say it is regarded as a vineyard. The intervening vines being treated as if they were not in existence. The statement, however, of our nomin who follows the rabbis cannot very well be considered satisfactory for we have heard a definition of scattered trees. But have we heard a definition of closely planted trees? This latter definition is arrived at logically since according to our Simeon, the distances between closely planted trees are half of those of scattered trees according to the Rabbis also the proportion of the distances is a half Rabbis said the law is that a buyer of three trees acquires implicitly the ground also when the distances between the respective trees are from four to sixteen cubits in agreement with Rabbis opinion it has been taught how near to each other may the trees be no nearer than four cubits and how far removed may they be no more than sixteen cubits he who buys three trees of these has implicitly acquired the necessary ground and the intervening young trees consequently if a tree dries up or is cut down the buyer of the trees retains his rights in the ground if the distances between the trees are less or more than the figures given or if the trees were purchased one after the other the buyer does not acquire either the ground or the intervening young trees consequently if a tree dries up or is cut down the buyer retains no title to the ground our Jeremiah inquired does one measure the required Distances between the trees from the thin or thick parts of the trees are to be high. Bikathal said to our Ashi, come and here we learned in the case of a layer of the vine one is to measure from the second root only. Our Jeremiah inquired what is the low when one sold three branches of one tree four cubits distant from one another and covered with alubium at their knot so that they appear as three separate trees are to be high. Bikathal said to our Ashi, come and here we learned where one bends. Three vines covering the middle parts with earth so that the layers when detached from the original vines may each form two vines and their new roots are seen. If there is a distance between them of four to eight cubits they combine set our LAs or to form a vineyard and if not they do not combine our papa inquired what is the low when he sold two trees in his field and one on its border do they combine or not if it is replied that in this case they combine what is the low when. He sold two trees in his own field and one tree which he owned together with its ground in the field of his neighbor. The matter stands undecided. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. R. Ashi inquired in the case of the sale of three trees. Does a water cistern situated between them form a division? If not, does a water canal form a division? If this also is not regarded a division, what is the law of Rishath Harabim intercepts or a nursery of young inoculated palm trees? The matter stands undecided. Hillel inquired from Rabbi, what if a cedar sprang up between them? Is it regarded as a division between the trees? What a question. If it sprang up after the sale, it obviously grew in the buyer's own territory. But no, this is the question. What if there was a cedar between them at the time of the sale? He replied unto him, He has certainly acquired its ownership. What must be the disposition of the three trees? Rab said as a straight line, and Samuel said like a Tripod he who said as a straight line agrees so much the more in the case when they are arranged as a tripod but he who said like a tripod holds the opinion that if the trees are arranged as in a straight line the ground is not acquired because one can sow between them or ham not erased a difficulty is not the reason given by him who insists on a triangular disposition that one cannot sow between them if so let the ground be acquired also by him to whom three Roman thorns have been sold since one cannot sow between them he replied to him those thorns are of no importance but these trees are important Mishnah he who sells the head of large cattle has not sold the feet he who sold the feet has not sold the head if he has sold the lungs he has not sold the liver if he has sold the liver he has not sold the lungs but in the case of small cattle if he has sold the head he has sold the feet if he has sold the feet he has not sold the head if he has sold it. Lungs he has sold the liver if he has sold the liver he has not sold the lungs for different laws are applicable to sales if one has sold wheat as good and it turns out to be bad the buyer may withdraw from the sale if sold as bad and it turns out to be good the seller may withdraw if as bad and it was found to be bad or as good and it was found to be good neither may withdraw if one has sold wheat as dark colored and it turns out to be white or as white and it turns out to be dark or if one has sold wood as olive and it turns out to be sycamore or as sycamore and it turns out to be olive or if a liquid has been sold as wine and it turns out to be vinegar or as vinegar and it turns out to be wine both may withdraw Gamar or his dust and if one has sold to another what was worth five or six and subsequently the price has risen to eight since the buyer has been imposed upon he may withdraw but not so the seller because Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrahi. The buyer can say unto him if you had not imposed upon me you would have had no right to withdraw can you have the right to withdraw now that you have imposed upon me and the tana of our mission who taught that if wheat was sold as good and it turned out to be bad the buyer may withdraw but not inferentially the seller confirms what has just been said or his stuff further stated if one has sold to another what was worth six for five and the price fell to three the seller since he has been imposed upon may withdraw but not so the buyer because the seller can say unto him if you had not imposed upon me you would have had no right to withdraw can you have the right to withdraw now and the tana of our mission who taught that if wheat was sold as bad and it turned out to be good the seller may withdraw but not inferentially the buyer confirms the statement what does he come to teach us surely the statement of his may be inferred from our mission if it had to be Inferred from our mission, it could have been said that in the cases dealt with in the statement of our Hisda, both may perhaps withdraw, and that the first clause of our mission comes to teach us that the buyer may withdraw, for without this mission, it might have been said that he cannot because it is written, it is bad, it is bad, Seth the buyer, if one has sold wheat as dark colored and it turned out to be white, etc. Our Papa said, since white is given as the contrast of the other color, it
It inferred that if one separates a heap offering from an inferior quality for the redemption of a superior quality his offering is valid for it is set and ye shall bear no sin by reason of it seeing that ye have set apart from it the best thereof but it is to be inferred if you do not set apart from the best but of the worst you shall bear sin if however the inferior quality does not become consecrated why should there be any bearing of sin hence it may be inferred that if one separates a heap offering from an inferior quality for the redemption of a superior quality his offering is valid as regards commercial transactions however all are of the opinion that wine and vinegar are not of the same kind because someone may like wine and not vinegar while another may like vinegar and not wine mission if one has sold fruit to another and the buyer has pulled them though they have not yet been measured ownership is acquired if however they have been measured but the buyer has not pulled them ownership is not acquired if the buyer is prudent he hires the place where they are kept if one buys flax from another he does not acquire ownership until he moves it from place to place and if it was attached to the ground and he plucked of it any quantity he acquires ownership Amar RC said in the name of our Yohanan if the buyer has measured with the seller's instruments and has put them in an alley he acquires possession Arzara said to R. I see is it not possible that my master has heard this statement only in the case where the buyer has measured into his own basket he replied unto him this young rabbi seems to think that people do not correctly memorize what they hear if the buyer had measured it into his own basket would there have been any need to tell that ownership is acquired did he accept it from him or not come and hear what Arjana said in the name of rabbi in the case of a courtyard in partnership it Partners may acquire possession of objects they buy from one another does not this refer to the case where the objects bought lie on the bare ground no this refers to the case when they were put into his basket this can also be supported by argument for our Jacob said in the name of our Yohanan if the buyer measures and puts them in an alley he does not acquire possession are not these contradictory but surely it must be concluded that one case refers to one who measures into his basket the other case to one who measures upon the bare ground this is conclusive come and here if however they have been measured but the buyer has not pulled them ownership is not acquired does not this refer to an alley no this refers to Rishath Harabim if so explain the first clause if he has pulled them though they have not yet been measured ownership is acquired does pulling acquire possession in Rishath Harabim surely both Abe and Rabbah have stated Mezra. Confers legal ownership in Rishath Harabim or in a yard which belongs to neither of them. Meshach confers ownership in an alley or in a yard owned by both of them and lifting confers ownership everywhere. Pulling mentioned in our mission also means from the Rishath Harabim to an alley. If so, explain the next clause of our mission. If the buyer is prudent, he hires the place where they are kept. Now, if the object is in Rishath Harabim, from whom could he hire? This is what the mission means. And if the object is in the domain of the owner, if the buyer is prudent, he hires the place where they are kept. Both Rab and Samuel have stated Talmud, Mas Baba Batra, a man's vessel acquires for him ownership everywhere except in Rishath Harabim. But both our Yohanan and our Simeon Bilakish have stated even in Rishath Harabim, our Papa said there is no dispute at all between them. The former speak of Rishath Harabim, the latter of an alley. Then why do they call it public territory? Because it is not private territory, this may also be proved by logical deduction for Arabab said in the name of our Yohanan, a man's vessel acquires ownership for him wherever he is permitted to set it down from this. It is to be deduced that only where he is permitted to set it down he does acquire ownership, but where he is not permitted he does not come and here four different laws are applicable to sales before the measure is filled, the contents remain in the possession of it. Seller when the measure is filled, the contents pass over into the possession of the buyer. These laws apply to a measure which belong to neither of them, but if the measure was the property of one of them, he whose measure it is acquires successive possession of every single unit of the quantity as soon as it is put in these laws furthermore apply to a Rishath Harabim and to a courtyard which belongs to neither of them, but if the purchase was on the premises of the seller, the buyer. Does not acquire possession until he has lifted it or has removed it from the seller's premises. If the purchase was on the premises of the buyer, he acquires possession as soon as the seller has consented to the terms of the sale. If the purchase was on the premises of one with whom it had been deposited by the seller, possession cannot be acquired by the buyer until the owner of the premises has consented to allow to the buyer a portion of his premises on which to effect acquisition of ownership, or until the buyer had hired the place it occupies. At any rate, it is taught here that possession by means of one's vessel may be acquired in Rishath Harabim and in a courtyard which belongs to neither of them. Talmud, Mas Baba Batrabi does not this mean an actual Rishath Harabim? No, it means an alley, but has it not been treated as being in a similar category to that of a courtyard which belongs to neither of them? The phrase courtyard which belongs to neither of them. Also signifies that the court is neither in the entire ownership of the one nor in the entire ownership of the other, but in the joint ownership of the two. Arshis hate inquired of Arhunat if the buyer's vessel stands on the premises of the seller, does the buyer thereby acquire possession of the purchase placed in it or not? He replied unto him, You have learned this in the following: If the husband has thrown it to get into his wife's lap or into her work basket, she is divorced. Arnaman said unto him, Why do you bring an answer from this which has been refuted by a hundred arguments to one? For Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, This law applies only to the case where the work basket was hanging upon her, and Rashlaik said, Fastened to though not hanging upon her. Arabi Ahab said, When the basket was standing between her thighs, Armeshashi the son of Arami said, When her husband was a seller of women's work baskets, Ar Yohanan said, The place occupied by her lap as. Well, as the place occupied by her work basket is her property, Rabbi said, Are you Hanan's reason is because a man does not mind conceding to his wife either the place occupied by her lap or the place taken up by her work basket, but concluded Arnam and bring your answer from this. It has been taught that if the purchase was on the premises of the seller, the buyer does not acquire possession until he has lifted it or has removed it from the seller's premises, does not this apply to the case when the purchase was in the buyer's vessel, no in the seller's vessel, but now since the first clause deals with the case where the purchase is in the seller's vessel, the final clause also must deal with the purchase in the seller's vessel. How then can you explain this final clause? It reads if the purchase was on the premises of the buyer, he acquires possession as soon as the seller has consented to the terms of the sale. Now if the purchase was as you assert in the seller's Vessel why does the buyer acquire possession the final clause deals with the case when the vessel belongs to the buyer and how do you arrive at such a definite decision it is usual that at the sellers the vessels of the seller are likely to be used at the buyers the vessels of the buyer are likely to be used Rabbah said come and here it has been taught if he has pulled his ass drivers who pulled with them their asses or his laborers and has thus brought them into his house while the loads remained on their backs whether the price was fixed before the measuring or the measuring took place before the price was fixed both may withdraw from the sale Talmud Mas Baba Batra if he has unloaded them and brought them into his house and fixed the price before measuring neither of them may withdraw if measuring took place before the price has been fixed both may withdraw now since the vessel of the seller if it is on the premises of the buyer does not serve as a means of Retaining possession for him, the vessel of the buyer also, if it is on the premises of the seller, does not serve as a means of acquiring possession for him. Or Naman B. Isaac replied, The law quoted refers to the case when the goods were emptied out from the seller's sacks into the territory of the buyer. Robert remarked indignantly, Does it state he emptied them? The statement reads, He unloaded them, but said, Mar, son of Arashi, the law here refers to bundles of garlic, who not the son of Mar. Zutra said to Robin, Observe that it has been said he unloaded them. What matters it then whether the price had been fixed or not? He Robin replied, When the price has been fixed, each of the parties acquiesces in the sale, but when a price has not been fixed, none of them acquiesces. Robin said to Arashi, Come and here it has been stated, both Rab and Samuel hold that a man's vessel acquires for him ownership everywhere. Does not this everywhere include the premises of the seller in? The case spoken of there the other replied the seller said to him go and acquire ownership we have learned elsewhere ownership of landed property is acquired by means of money deed and possession and movable property is acquired only by Meshika the following reported statement has been attributed in surah to our histiah pamadida to our kahana or according to others to rabbi the law of Meshika has been taught with reference only to heav
Buyer has pulled them though they have not yet been measured. Ownership is acquired. Surely fruit can be lifted up and yet it is taught that ownership of it is acquired by Meshika. Here we are dealing with fruit packed in large bags. If so, how can you explain the last clause which reads if one buys flax from another he does not acquire ownership until he moves it from one place to another is not flax also packed in large bags. Flax is different it has to be packed in small bags. Because otherwise it slips out. Robin is said to our ashi come and your large cattle are acquired by Mezra and small by lifting. These are the words of our Meir and our Simeon B. Eliezer. But the sages say small cattle are acquired by Meshika. Surely it may be asked small cattle can be lifted and yet it is taught that ownership of them may be acquired by Meshika. Cattle are different because they clutch the ground. Both Rab and Samuel said if the seller said I sell you a core for 30 he may. Withdraw even at the last SEI if however he said I sell you a core for 30 each SE offer a seller the buyer acquires possession of every SE as it is measured out for him come and here if the measure was the property of one of them he whose measure it is acquires successive possession of every single unit of the quantity as soon as it is put in surely this law applies even to the case where the measure had not been filled this law refers only to such a case as when the seller said to the buyer I sell you a hin for 12 sell I am every log for a seller and as our Kahana said there were marks in the hin of the temple so in this case also there were marks on the measures come and here it has been taught in the case where a man hired a laborer to work for him at the harvesting season for a dinar who's a day and paid him his wage in advance Talmud, Mos Baba Bathra, but at that season the laborer was worth a seller a day he must not derive any benefit. From it, if however a man hires a laborer to commence work at once and to continue through the harvesting season for a dinar who is a day, although at the harvesting season he was worth a seller, he is permitted to pay in advance and to have the benefit of the difference. Now, if you are of the opinion that if the seller said, I sell you a core for 30 each SE offer a seller, the buyer acquires possession of every SE as it is measured out here also since mention was made of a dinar who is a day every day that has passed should have been regarded as cut off from the other days of the period that follow and it should therefore be forbidden to derive any benefit from it. Why then has it been said that if a man hires a laborer to commence work at once and to continue through the harvesting season for a dinar who is a day, although at the harvesting season he was worth a seller, he is permitted to have the benefit is not this difference a reward for advancing it. Money robber replied, What a logical argument has it ever been forbidden to reduce one's higher to the lowest level wherein then lies the reason for the difference between the first and the last clause in the first clause since work does not begin at once the difference between the two rates of wage appears as a reward for advancing the money in the last clause where work begins at once the difference does not appear as a reward for advancing the money and it was attached to the ground. And he plucked of it any quantity he has acquired ownership does he acquire ownership of all the flax because he has plucked some of it or she's hate replied the case dealt with here refers to a seller who said to the buyer go improve for yourself any piece of land acquire possession of it and thereby acquire ownership of all that is upon admission if one sells wine or oil to another and it has become dearer or cheaper if the measure has not yet been filled the benefit or losses. The sellers after the measure has been filled the benefit or losses the buyers if there was a middleman between them and the cask was broken before delivery to the buyer the losses the middleman the seller must in favor of the buyer allow three drops to fall from the sides of his vessel into that of the buyer after the liquid has been poured out if he inclined the vessel after the three drops have been allowed to fall the accumulation of the remnants from its sides belongs to the seller a shopkeeper is not obliged to allow the three drops to fall our Judah said on Sabbath Eve towards dusk one is exempt Gemara whose measure was this if it is assumed to have been the measure of the buyer why should the benefit or loss be that of the seller before the measure has been filled surely it is the buyer's measure if however it is assumed that it was the seller's measure why should the benefit or loss be that of the buyer after the measure has been filled surely it is the seller's measure? Our lay replied the measure was the middleman's, but since it is taught in the latter clause, if there was a middleman between them and the cask was broken, the loss is the middleman's. Is it not to be inferred that the first clause does not deal with the case of a middleman? The first clause speaks of a measure in the absence of the middleman. The latter clause of the middleman himself, if the vessel has been inclined, the accumulation of the remnants from its sides belongs to the seller. When our Eliezer went up, he met Zeiri to whom he said, "Is there your Tana whom Rab has taught the mission of measures?" He showed him our Isaac be of Dimi. The latter said unto him, "What is your difficulty?" For the other replied, "We learned if the vessel has been inclined, the accumulation of the remnants from its sides belongs to the seller Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi. But have we not also learned if the vessel has been inclined, the accumulation from the remnants on its?" Sides is Terima, he replied unto him, surely about this it has been said, Arabab said the accumulation belongs to the seller because the law of the owner's resignation is applied to it, a shopkeeper is not obliged to allow to fall, etc. The question was raised, does Arjuna refer to the law in the earlier clause to relax it, or perhaps he refers to the law in the latter clause to restrict it, come and here it has been taught, Arjuna says a shopkeeper on Sabbath at dusk is exempt because a shopkeeper is at that time much occupied mission if a person sends his little son to a shopkeeper to whom he had previously given a dupontium and the shopkeeper measured out for him well for one ISAR and gave him the other ISAR and on his way home the child broke the bottle which his father had sent with him and lost the ISAR given him as change, the shopkeeper is liable for all the losses Arjuna absolves the shopkeeper since for that purpose the father had sent him it. Child, but the sages agree with Arjuna that in the case when the bottle was in the hand of the child and the shopkeeper measured out into it, the shopkeeper is absolved. Gemara one can well understand that in the case of the Isar and the oil, the dispute in our mission between the rabbis and Arjuna depends on the following views. The rabbis maintain that the father has sent the child merely to inform the shopkeeper of what he required, and Arjuna maintains that the father has sent the child in order that the shopkeeper should send him back with the things. But as regards the breaking of the bottle, why should the rabbis lay the responsibility on the shopkeeper? It is a loss surely for which its owner was well prepared. Our Hashai replied, Here we deal with an owner who is also a seller of bottles, and in the case when the shopkeeper took the bottle for the purpose of examining it, in such a case the shopkeeper assumes responsibility in accordance with a Decision given by Samuel for Samuel said he who takes a vessel from the artisan to examine it and an accident happens while it is in his hand is liable does this mean that the decision of Samuel is not generally accepted but is a matter of dispute between Tanaim surely this is not very likely but said both Rabbah and Arjuna the Mishnah here deals with the case of a shopkeeper who sells bottles and Arjuna follows his own reasoning and the rabbis follow their own reasoning if so explain the last clause the sages agree with Arjuna that in the case when the bottle was in the hand of the child and the shopkeeper measured out into it the shopkeeper is absolved but surely you said that the rabbis maintain the view that the father had sent the child merely to inform him but said both have a be and our hand of here we deal with the case Talmud Mas Baba Bathra is such as where the shopkeeper took the bottle to measure with it and by this action he becomes Responsible in accordance with the decision of Rabbah for Rabbah said if he struck a lost animal he assumed thereby the obligation of returning it to its owner might it not be suggested that Rabbah said so only in the case of living beings because he who strikes them assists in their running away would he however have said so in such a case as this but said Rabbah I and the line of the college who is Arzara have interpreted this as follows we deal here with a case where the shopkeeper took the bottle to use it as a measure for others and the dispute between the Rabbis and Arjuna is dependent on their respective opinions as to the legal status of one who borrows without the knowledge of the owner one is of the opinion that such a person is legally considered a borrower and the others are of the opinion that he is a robber reverting to the above text Samuel said he who takes a vessel from the artisan to examine it and an accident happened. While it was in his hand is liable this law applies only to the case where the price had been fixed once a person entered a butcher's shop and lifted up the thigh of the meat a rider came while he was holding it up and snatched it away from him he came before Aryamar who ordered him to pay its price but this law is applicable only to the case where the price has been fixed a person once brought pumpkins to Pum
Gamaliel said these laws apply only to moist commodities, but in the case of dry ones, there is no need for the cleaning Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra B and a shopkeeper must allow the provision scale to sink a handbreadth lower than the scale of the weights. If he gave him the exact weight, he must allow him the following additions: a tenth in the case of liquids and a twentieth in the case of dry provisions. Where the usage is to measure with a small unit, one must not use a big measure. If the usage is to measure with a big unit, one must not use a small measure. If the usage is to strike the measure, one must not heap it up. If the usage is to heap it up, one must not strike it. Gemara once is this law to be inferred. Rashi said scripture says a perfect and just measure shall thou have. This means make your weight just by giving up your own. If so, explain the next clause. It reads: If he gave him the exact weight, he must allow him it. Following additions now if giving overweight is a pentateuchal injunction how is he allowed to give him the exact weight only but came the reply the earlier clause is not based on a pentateuchal injunction but speaks of a place where there was a practice of giving overweight and the statement of Reshlakish has been made with reference to what has been said not in the earlier but in the latter clause which reads if he gave him the exact weight he must allow him the following additions and with reference to this it has been asked whence is this law and Reshlakish said scripture says and just which means make your weight just by giving him of your own and how much must be added to the weight our Abba B. Memel said in the name of Rab in the case of liquids a tenth of a pound for every ten pounds a tenth in the case of liquids and a twentieth in the case of dry etc the question was raised does this mean a tenth of the unit of the liquids for every 10 units of the liquid and a 20th of the unit of dry provisions for every 20 units of dry or does it perhaps mean a 10th of the unit for every 10 units of liquid and a 10th of the unit for every 20 units of dry provisions the matter stands undecided our Levi said the punishment for false measures is more rigorous than that for marrying forbidden relatives for in the latter case it has been said L but in the former early whence can it be shown that L implies rigorous punishment for it is written and the mighty LA of the land he took away is not only written also in the case of forbidden relatives that Ali has been written to exclude the sin of false measures from the punishment of Karath in what respect then are the punishments for giving false measures greater than those for marrying forbidden relatives their repentance is possible but your repentance is impossible our Levi further stated ordinary robbery is worse then the robbery of holy things for in the former case sin is placed before trespass while in the latter trespass is mentioned before sin our Levi further stated come and see how divine disposition differs from that of mortals the holy one blessed be he blessed Israel with 22 letters and cursed them only with 8 he blessed them with 22 from if ye walk in my statutes to make you go upright and he cursed them with 8 from and if ye shall reject my statutes to end their soul abhorred my statutes but Moses our teacher blessed them with 8 and cursed them with 22 he blessed them with 8 Talmud Mas Baba Bathra from and it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently to to serve them and curse them with 22 from but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken to and no man shall buy you where the usage is to measure with a big measure etc and neither exact weight nor heaped up with market officers and with a pound 3 and 10 to fetch weights a thick strike you shall not do he shall not do our rabbis taught once may it be inferred that the measure must not be leveled where the practice is to heap it up and that it must not be heaped up where the practice is to level it for it has been definitely stated a perfect measure and once may it be inferred that we are not to listen to one who says I will level where the practice is to heap up and reduce the price or I will heap up where they level and raise the price for it has been definitely stated a perfect and just measure thou shalt have our rabbis taught once is it to be inferred that the exact weight must not be given where the practice is to allow overweight and that overweight must not be allowed where the practice is to give the exact weight for it has been definitely stated a perfect weight and once may it be inferred that we are not to listen to one who says I will give the exact weight where the practice is to allow overweight and reduce the price or I will allow overweight where they give the exact weight and raise the price for it has been definitely stated a perfect and just weight Rab Judah of Surah said thou shalt not have anything in thy house why because of thy diverse measures thou shalt not have anything in thy bag why because of thy diverse weights but if thou keep a perfect and just weight thou shalt have possessions if a perfect and just measure thou shalt have wealth. Our rabbis taught thou shalt have teachers that market officers are appointed to superintend measures but no such officers are appointed for superintending prices those of the Nasai's house appointed market officers to superintend both measures and prices thereupon said Samuel to Karna go forth and teach them the law that market officers are appointed to superintend measures but no such officers are appointed to superintend prices but Karna went forth and gave them it. Following exposition market officers are appointed to superintend both measures and prices he said unto him is your name Karna let a horn grow out of your eye a horn consequently grew out of his eye but whose opinion did he follow that voice by Rami Bihama in the name of our Isaac that market officers are appointed to superintend both measures and prices on account of the impostors our rabbis taught if one asked him for a pound a pound must be weighed if half a pound half a pound must be weighed a quarter of a pound a quarter of a pound must be weighed what does this teach us that weights must be provided in these three denominations our rabbis taught if he ordered from him three quarters of a pound he shall not tell him weigh out for me the three quarters of a pound one by one but a pound weight is laid on the scale against a quarter of a pound weight with the meat on the other scale our rabbis taught if he ordered from him ten pounds he shall not say weigh out for me each pound separately and allow overweight for each but all are weighed together and one overweight is allowed for all of them our rabbis taught the nefesh of the balance must be suspended in the air three handbreadths removed from the roof from which the balance hangs and the scales must be three handbreadths above the ground the beam and the ropes must contain a total length of twelve handbreadths the balances of wool dealers and glassware dealers must be suspended in the air two handbreadths from the ceiling and two handbreadths above the ground their beams and ropes must contain a total of nine handbreadths in length the balance of a shopkeeper and of a producer must be suspended in the air one handbreadth from above and one handbreadth above the ground the beam and ropes must be of a total length of six handbreadths a gold balance must be suspended in the air three fingers from above and three fingers above the ground the length of its beam and Cords I do not know but what kind of balance is that which has been mentioned first Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. Our Papa said a balance used for heavy pieces of metal Armani B. Page said the same restrictions that have been said to apply to balances with reference to their disqualification for commercial uses have also been said to apply to them with reference to their liability to levitical defilement what does he come to teach us surely this has already been taught in the following the length of the cords of a shopkeeper's and a producer's balances which may be subjected to the laws of levitical defilement must be one hand breadth and since this restriction has specifically been applied to one kind of balance are not the other kinds of balance to be implied the statement of Armani is required on account of the sizes of the beam and the cords which have not been mentioned there are rabbis taught weights must not be made either of tin or of lead or of Gasitrin or of any other kinds of metal but they must be made of stone or of glass our rabbis taught the strike must not be made of a gourd because it is light nor of metal because it is heavy but it must be made of olive nut sycamore or boxwood our rabbis taught the strike may not be made thick on one side and thin on the other one may not strike with a single quick movement for striking in this manner causes loss to the seller and benefits the buyer nor may one strike very slowly because this is disadvantageous to the buyer and beneficial for the seller concerning all these sharp practices of traders are Yohan and Bizak I said woe to me if I should speak of them woe to me if I should not speak should I speak of them names might learn them and should I not speak the names might say the scholars are unacquainted with our practices and will deceive us still more the question was raised did he or Yohan and speak of these sharp practices or not our Samuel son of our Isaac Said he did speak of them and in so doing he based his decision on the following scriptural text for the ways of the Lord are right and the just do walk in them but transgressors do stumble therein our rabbis taught it is written you shall do no unrighteousness in judgments in meat yard in weight or in measure in meat yard relates to the measuring of ground one should not measure out for one person in the hot season and for another in the rainy season in weight means that one shall not keep his weights in salt in measure that one shall not cause liquids to froth and by inference from minor to major the following may be deduced if the Torah cared for proper measure in a
Quarter of a cab in the case of liquid measures, one may make a hint, half a hint, a third of a hint, a quarter of a hint, a log, half a log, a quarter of a log, an eighth of a log, and an eighth of an eighth of a log, which is a quarter of a log, should one not be allowed also to make a two cab measure, it might be mistaken for a tar cab, this proves that people may err by a third, but if so, one cab measure also should not be made since it might be mistaken for half a tar cab, but this is the reason. Why a two cap measure must not be made, it might be mistaken for half a tar cap. This proves that one mayor by a quarter, but if so, half a toman and an uckle measures also should not be made. Our popper replied, People are familiar with small measures and are not likely to mistake them for one another. Should not one be forbidden to make a third of a hint and a quarter of a hint since these measures were used in the temple? The rabbis have not enacted any precautionary prohibitions against their use. Let precautionary prohibitions be adopted in the case of the temple itself. Priests are careful. Samuel said measures must not be increased even when all the townspeople have agreed to alter the standards of the measures by more than a sixth, nor even by general consent may the value of a coin be increased by more than a sixth, and any profits on sales must not exceed one sixth. What is the reason why measures must not be increased by more than a sixth if it is said because? Market prices will rise above due proportions and for the same reason one should not be allowed to increase even by a sixth but if it be said because of the overcharge so that the entire purchase should not have to be cancelled surely Rabbah said one may withdraw from any transaction in which anything had been sold by measure weight or number even if the overcharge was less than the legal limit of overcharge but if it be said that the reason why no more than a sixth may be added to weights is that the dealer may not incur any loss as this law then been made it may be retorted on the assumption that a dealer must incur no loss but also requires no profit buy and sell at no profit and be called a merchant but said Arhista Samuel found a scriptural text and expounded it it is written and the shekel shall be twenty gears twenty shekels five and twenty shekels ten and five shekels shall be your main Talmud Mas Baba Bathrabi was the main two hundred and 40 denarii but three things are to be inferred from this it is to be inferred that the holy mano was doubled it is to be inferred that the standard of measures may be increased though that increase must not be more than a sixth and it is to be inferred that the sixth is to be exclusive our papa b samuel introduced a measure of three kephaza they said unto him did not samuel say that measures must not be increased by more than a sixth he said unto them i have introduced a new measure he sent it to papa but they did not adopt it he sent it to papunia and they adopted it and named it ras papa mnemonic sign orders of fruit must not hoard carry out profit twice in eggs prayers are offered and not caused to go out our rabbis talk concerning those who hoard fruit lend money on usury reduce the measures and raise prices scripture says saying when will the new moon be gone that we may sell grain and the sabbath that we may set forth corn making the ephah small and the shekel Great and falsifying the balances of deceit and concerning these it is further written in scripture the Lord hath sworn by the pride of Jacob surely I will never forget any of their works who for instance may be classed among fruit hoarders or Yohanan said a person for instance like Shabbatai the fruit hoarder Samuel's father used to sell fruit during the prevalence of the early market price s at the early price Samuel his son retained the fruit and sold them when the late market prices were current at the early market price word was sent from there the father's action is better than the son's what is the reason prices that have been eased remain so rap said a person may store his own cab of produce the same has also been taught elsewhere fruit and things which are life's necessities as for instance wines oils and the various kinds of flour must not be hoarded but spices cumin and pepper may the prohibitions mentioned apply only to one buying from it Market, but in the case of him who brings in for storage of his own, this is permitted in Palestine. One may store fruit for the following three years: the eve of the sabbatical year, the sabbatical year, and the conclusion of the sabbatical year. In years of famine, one must not hoard even a cab of carrots, because thereby one brings a curse on the market. Prices are Jose Bihan and said to his attendant, "Paga, go store away from me fruit for the following three years: the eve of the sabbatical year, and the sabbatical year, and the conclusion of the sabbatical year." Our rabbis taught one must not carry out of Palestine fruit and things which are life's necessities, such as, for instance, wines, oils, and the various kinds of flour are Jew to be, but there are permitted in the case of wine, because thereby one diminishes levity, and as it is not permitted to carry away out of the land of Palestine into a foreign country, so it is not permitted to carry away out of Palestine to Syria and rabbi permits. This Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra from one province on the border of Palestine and Syria to an adjacent province in Syria are rabbis taught in Palestine it is not permitted to make a profit as middleman in things which are life's necessary such as for instance wines oils and the various kinds of flour it has been said about our Eliezer B. Ezrai that he used to make a profit in wine and oil in the case of wine he held the same opinion as our Judah in the case of oil in the place of our Eliezer B. Ezrai oil was plentiful our rabbis taught it is not permitted to make a profit in eggs twice as to the meaning of twice Mari B. Mari said Rab and Samuel are in dispute one says two for one and the other says selling by a dealer to a dealer our rabbis taught public prayers are offered for goods which have become dangerously cheap even on the Sabbath our Yohanan said for instance linen garments in Babylon and wine and oil in Palestine our Joseph said this is only so when these have become so cheap that ten are sold at the price of six. Our rabbis taught it is not permitted to go forth from Palestine to a foreign country unless two seahs are sold for one seller. Our Simeon said this is permitted only when one cannot find anything to buy, but when one is able to find something to buy, even if a seah cost a seller, one must not depart. And so said our Simeon, Behoyelam, Elak, Malan, and Chilion were of the great men of their generation, and they were also leaders of their generation. Why then were they punished because they left Palestine for a foreign country? For it is written, and all the city was astir concerning them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? What is meant by is this Naomi? Our Isaac said, They said, Did you see what befell Naomi who left Palestine for a foreign country? Our Isaac further stated on the very day when Ruth the Moabites came to Palestine, died the wife of Boaz. This is why people say before a person dies, the master of his houses. Appointed Rabbi son of Arhuna said in the name of Rabbi Zin his Boaz what does he come to teach us by the statement the same that Rabbi son of Arhuna taught elsewhere for Rabbi son of Arhuna said in the name of Rabbi Boaz made for his sons a hundred and twenty wedding feasts for it is said and he Ibsen had thirty sons and thirty daughters he sent abroad and thirty daughters he brought in from abroad for his sons and he judged Israel seven years and in the case of every one of these he made two wedding feasts one in the house of the father and one in the house of the father in law to none of them did he invite me no for he said whereby will the barren mule repay me all these died in his lifetime it is in relation to such a case as this that people say of what use to you are sixty the sixty that you beget for your lifetime marry again and beget one brighter than sixty mnemonic sign king Abraham the ten years when he passed away he was exalted alone Arhin and B. Rabbi said in the name of Rebel Amalek and Salmon and such a one and the father of Naomi all were the sons of Nashon the son of Ammonadab what does he come to teach us by the statement that even the merit of one's ancestors is of no avail when one leaves the land of Palestine for a foreign country Arhan and Birabo further stated in the name of Rab the name of the mother of Abraham was Amathlai the daughter of Carnabo the name of the mother of Haman was Amathlai the daughter of Orapti and Ur. Mnemonic may be unclean to unclean clean to clean the mother of David was named Nisbet the daughter of Adel the mother of Samson was named Zilponeth and his sister Nashon in what respect do these names matter in respect of a reply to the heretics Arhan and Birabo further stated in the name of Rab Abraham our father was imprisoned for ten years three in Katha and seven in Kardu but Ardimi of Nihardia taught in the reverse order Arhista said the small side of Katha is Urabi. Child Ezarhan and Birabah further said in the name of Rab on the day when Abraham our father passed away from the world all the great ones of the nations of the world stood in a line and said woe to the world that has lost Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be its leader and woe to the ship that has lost its pilot and thou art exalted as head above all Arhan and Birabah said in the name of Rab even a superintendent of a well is appointed in heaven Arhai Bi Abin said in the name of Arjashu be Korha God forbid. That Elamelech
Study he that agrees with them falls into their hands as to him who trusts in them whatever is his becomes theirs. Why has it been written Malan and Chilion in one place and Josh and Seraph in another? Rab and Samuel explained once said their names were Malan and Chilion but they were called Josh and Seraph for this reason Josh because they lost hope in the messianic redemption of Israel and Seraph because they were condemned by the omnipresent to be burned and the other. Says their names were Josh and Seraph but they were called Malan and Chilion for this reason Malan because they profaned their bodies and Chilion because they were condemned by the omnipresent to destruction. There is a very taught in agreement with him who said that their names were Malan and Chilion for it has been taught what is the interpretation of the biblical text and Jokim and the men of Kuzba and Josh and Seraph who had dominion in Moab and Jashub and the things. Our ancient and Jokim is Joshua who kept his oath to the men of Gibeon and the men of Kuzba. These are the men of Gibeon who lied to Joshua and Josh and Seraph. These are Malan and Chilion and why were they called Josh and Seraph? Josh because they lost hope in the messianic redemption of Israel. Seraph because they were condemned by the omnipresent to be burned who had dominion in Moab means they who married wives of the women of Moab and Jashub refers to Ruth the Moabites who returned and kept fast by Bethlehem of Judah and the things are ancient means these things were said by the ancient of days these were the potters and those that dwelt among plantations and hedges there they dwelt occupied in the king's work these were the potters refers to the sons of Jonadab the son of Rechab who kept the oath of their father those that dwelt among the plantations has reference to Solomon who in his kingdom was like a constantly flourishing plant and hedges refers to the Sanhedrin who fenced in the breaches in Israel there they dwelt occupied in the king's work refers to Ruth the Moabites who saw the kingdom of Solomon the grandson of her grandson for it is said and Solomon caused a throne to be set up for the king's mother and our Eliezer said to the mother of the dynasty our rabbis taught it is written and yet shall eat of the produce the old store that is without the necessity for a preservative what is the meaning of without Solomon and our nomin said Without the grain worm and Arshis hate said without blast a berita has been taught in agreement with the interpretation of Arshis hate and the berita has been taught in agreement with that of Arnaman in agreement with that of Arnaman it has been taught it is written and yet shall eat the old store one might think that Israel will be looking out for the new produce because the old had been destroyed by the grain worm therefore it is expressly said until her produce came in that is until the produce will come naturally of itself in agreement with that of Arshis hate it has been taught it is written and yet shall eat of the produce of the old store one might think that Israel will be looking out for the new produce because the old was spoiled by the blast therefore it is expressly said until her produce come in that is until the produce will come in the natural course our rabbis taught it is written and yet shall eat old store long kept this teaches that the Older the produce the better it would be from this one infers only concerning things which are commonly stored away once may one also infer concerning things which are not commonly stored away it is explicitly stated old store long kept which implies in all cases it is written and yet shall bring forth the old from before the new this teaches that the storehouses would be full of old produce and the threshing floors of new and Israel would say how shall we take out one. Before the other our papa said all things are better when old except dates beer and small fishes Talmud, Mas Baba Bathray. Chapter 6 Mishnah If anyone has sold fruit to another not specifying whether as food or seed and the buyer sowed them and they did not grow even if they were linseed he is not responsible our Simeon B. Gamaliel said for garden seeds which are not eaten he is responsible Gamar it has been stated if one has sold an ox to another and it was found to have been wanted Gorav said the sale is under false pretenses but Samuel said the seller can say to him I have sold it to you for the purpose of slaughtering but cannot the object of the sale be seen from the following if he is a man that buys for slaughtering then the sale also must have been for the purpose of slaughtering and if for plowing it must have been for the purpose of plowing why then should there be a dispute between Rav and Samuel this dispute relates to the case of a man who buys for both but why not see what price was paid the dispute is applicable to the case when the price of meat has risen and stands at the same level as the price of an animal for plowing if so what difference is there whether the animal was bought for plowing or slaughtering there is a difference in respect of the trouble how is this to be understood Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B if there is no capital from which the buyer may be reimbursed let the ox be retained for the money as people say from your debtor except even brand in payment the dispute between Rav and Samuel is required only in the case where there is capital from which the buyer may be reimbursed in such a case Rav said the deal was made under false pretenses because one must be guided by the general practice and most people buy oxen for plowing but Samuel said in reply one is guided by the general practice in ritual but not in monetary matters Nimanic a woman and a slave an ox oxen and fruit an objection was raised if a woman has become a widow or has been divorced and she claims I was married as a virgin and he says to her it was not so but I married you as a widow if there are witnesses that she left her father's house for the wedding ceremony in a curtain litter or with uncovered head she is entitled to a kethub of 200 zoos now the reason why she receives 200 zoos is that there were witnesses but it may be inferred had there been no witnesses she would not have been entitled to the higher settlement why should it not be said? Be guided by what most women do and most women marry as virgins Robin has said because it may be assumed on the one hand that the majority of women marry as virgins and a minority as widows and on the other hand that whenever a woman marries as a virgin the fact is known consequently since in her case the fact is not known the majority principle as applied to her is impaired but if as you have said all who marry as virgins are known to have so married what use are? Witnesses surely since the fact that she married as a virgin is not known they must be regarded as false witnesses but this is the answer the majority of those who marry as virgins are known to have so married and since this one is not known the majority principle in her case is impaired come and here it has been taught if one sold to another a slave who was found to have been a thief or a gambler the sale is valid if the slave was found to have been an armed robber or one. Prescribed by the government the buyer may say to him this is yours take him now in the case of the first clause Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra is not the sale valid because most slaves are of such a character and does not disprove that even in monetary matters one is to be guided by the majority rule no all of them are such come and here we learned if an ox gored a cow and its embryo was found dead at its side and it is not known whether it gave birth before it was gored or after it was gored the owner of the ox pays half the cost of the damage in respect of the cow and a quarter in respect of the young now if in monetary matters one is guided as rab asserted by the majority rule why does the owner of the ox only pay a quarter of the loss let it be said be guided by what most cows do and most cows conceive and give birth to live calves and the miscarriage must consequently have been due to the goring there the majority rule is inapplicable because there is the uncertainty whether the ox approached from the front and the miscarriage was due to shock or from behind and the miscarriage was due to goring the indemnity is therefore like money of doubtful ownership and all money the ownership of which is in doubt must be divided between the parties concerned must it be said that they differ on the same principles as the following tanaim it has been taught if an ox was grazing and a dead ox was found at its side it must not be said although the one is gored and the other is want to gore one bitten and the other want to bite it is obvious that the one gored or bit the other are aha said in the case of a camel which covers among other camels and a dead camel was found at its side it is obvious that the one killed the other now assuming that the principles of majority and of confirmed legal status have the same force must it be said that rab is of the same opinion as aha and samuel is of the same opinion as the first tanarab can tell you what i have said is valid even according to the first tana for the first tana made a statement there that the killing is not to be attributed to the budding ox only because one is not to be guided by the principle of legal status but one is to be guided by that of majority and samuel can say what i have said is valid even according to aha for aha made a statement there that the covering camel is assumed to be the killer only because one must be guided by the principle of legal status since it is the camel itself that has been confirmed in that status and is standing nearby but one is not to be guided by the majority principle come and here if anyone has sold fruit to another and the buyer sowed them and they did not grow even if they were linseed he is not responsible does not even
principle as has been said is in dispute if it is assumed that they are our Jose and those who reply to him surely both it may be retorted follow the majority principle one follows the majority of many others the majority of the seed neither of these then can be said to agree with the opinion advanced by Samuel but the dispute referred to is either that between the first ten and our Jose or between the first ten and those who reply to him are rabbis taught what does he who has sold garden seeds which are not eaten refund the buyer who sowed them without success the cost of the seeds but not expenses and others say expenses also must be refunded who are these others are his da said it is our Simeon B. Gamaliel which of the teachings of our Simeon B. Gamaliel reflects such a view if it is suggested that the teaching is that of our Simeon B. Gamaliel of our mission where we learned if anyone has sold fruit to another and the buyer sowed them and they did not grow even if they were linseed he is not responsible now consider in view of this the last clause of our mission our Simeon B. Gamaliel said for garden seeds which are not eaten he is responsible does not the first tenet say the same thing for he said for linseed only he is not responsible which implies that for garden seeds which are not eaten he is responsible and this is the very law of our Simeon does not this force the conclusion that the difference between them is the question of expenses one holds the opinion that only the cost of the seeds is to be refunded and the other is of the opinion that the expenses also must be refunded how can this be proved is it not possible that the opinions of the two tenem are to be reversed this is no difficulty any tenet who is mentioned last enters the discussion for the purpose of adding some restriction the objection however is that all the mission may be the teaching of our Simeon B. Gamaliel and that only a few words are missing and that this is what the mission really teaches if anyone has sold fruit to another and the buyer sowed them and they did not grow even if they were linseed he is not responsible these are the words of our Simeon B. Gamaliel for our Simeon B. Gamaliel said for garden seeds which are not eaten he is responsible but it is this teaching of our Simeon B. Gamaliel reflecting the view of those others for it has been taught if one takes wheat to grind and the Miller does not moisten it prior to the grinding and makes it into bran flour or coarse bran or if one takes flour to a baker who makes of it bread which falls into pieces or if one takes a beast to a slaughterer who makes it unfit he is liable to pay compensation since he is like one who takes payment for his services our Simeon B. Gamaliel says he indemnifies him for the insult to him and to his guests how much more than must he refund his expenses and so our Simeon B. Gamaliel used to say there was a fine custom in Jerusalem if one entrusted the preparations of a banquet to another who spoiled it the latter had to indemnify him for the insult to himself and to his guests there was another fine custom in Jerusalem at the commencement of the meal a cloth was spread over the door so long as the cloth was spread guests entered when the cloth was removed no guest entered mission if one sells fruit to another the latter must accept a quarter of a cab of refuse for Every SEI if he sold him fix the buyer must accept 10 wormy ones for every hundred if a seller of wine he must accept 10 casks of pungent wine for every hundred if jugs in Sharon he must accept 10 bad jugs for every hundred Gamara Arkatna learned a quarter of a cab of pulse for each SEI and need he not accept sandy matter surely Rabbi Bihai of Teshaphone said in the name of Rabbi if a man picks out a pebble from his neighbor's threshing floor Talmud, Moss, Baba Bathra he must pay him for it the price of wheat of pulse a quarter of a cab must be accepted of sandy matter less than a quarter and need he not accept a full quarter of a cab of sandy matter surely it has been taught if one sells fruit to another the buyer must accept in the case of wheat a quarter of a lab of pulse for each SEI in the case of barley he must accept a quarter of a cab of chaff for each SEI in the case of lentils he must accept a quarter of a cab of sandy matter for each SEO now may it not be assumed that the same law applies not only to lentils but also to wheat and to barley lentils are different from wheat and barley because they are usually plucked but since the reason why lentils are allowed a full quarter of a cab of sandy matter is because they are usually plucked while wheat and barley are not inferred and from this that in the case of wheat and barley the buyer need not accept a full quarter of a cab of sandy matter it may be retorted that a buyer in fact must accept a full quarter of a cab of sandy matter in the case also of wheat and barley lentils however had to be specifically mentioned because it might have been thought that since they are usually plucked the buyer must accept even more than a quarter of a cab the quantity therefore had to be specifically stated Arhuna said if the buyer wishes to sift and unsifting the quantity of the refuses Found to be more than what is permitted he may sift all of it and the seller must compensate him for all the refuse even for the permitted quantity some say this is a law and others say this is a penalty some say this is a law because whoever pays money pays it for good fruit but a person does not take the trouble to sift if the refuse only amounts to a quarter of a cab for every SEI if more than a quarter a person does take the trouble and since he takes the trouble to start sifting he takes a little more trouble with all of it and others say this is a penalty because it is usual only for a quarter of a cab of refuse to be found in each SEI more is not usual he himself therefore must have mixed it and since he has mixed at least some of it the rabbis have imposed upon him the penalty of paying for all Nimon every two bills of Rabin son of Arnaman are overcharged and undertaking an objection was raised it has been taught every SEI a produce which contains a quarter of a cab of another kind shall be reduced in order that it be permitted to be sown. Now it has been assumed that the quarter in the case of Kilaim is in the same category as the quantity of more than a quarter here, and yet it has only been taught it shall be reduced while the rest may be sown. Why then in the case of a purchase must compensation be paid for all the refuse? No, a quarter in the case of Kilaim is in the same category as a quarter here. If so, why should it be reduced on account of the restrictions of the law of Kilaim? If so, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B explained the last clause of the Mishnah quoted, which reads Our Jose says he shall pick out all this would be correct if you assume that a quarter of a cab in Kilaim is like a quantity of more than a quarter of a cab of refuse for their dispute could then be said to depend on the following principles. The first tenet might hold the opinion that a penalty is not imposed on a permitted thing for the sake of a prohibited one and our Jose might hold the opinion that a penalty may thus be imposed but if it is said that a quarter of a cab of Kilaim is like a quarter of refuse why should he pick this is the reason of our Jose there because it seems as if he was retaining Kilaim come and here it has been taught if two persons deposited money with one man one of them a mina and the other two hundred zoos and the one says the two hundred zoos are mine and the other also says the two hundred zoos are mine one mina is given to the one and one mina to the other and the remainder must lie until the prophet Elijah comes does not this show that one is not penalized by being made to lose the whole for the sake of a part what a comparison in that case one mina certainly belongs to the one and one mina to the other but in this case who can say that he has not himself put it all in come and here a confirmation from the last Clause of the quoted Barry though which reads our Jose said if so what has the knave lost but all must be kept over until Elijah comes what a comparison in that case there is certainly one knave at least but in this case who can say that he has put it in at all come and here it has been taught if a bill of debt contains an undertaking to pay usury a penalty is imposed on the lender and he receives neither the principal nor the interest these are the words of our Meir does not disprove that a penalty may be imposed on the whole for the sake of its part what a comparison in that case the lender had committed the transgression from the moment of the writing but in this case who can say that he has put it in at all come and here an objection from the last clause of the quoted Barry and the sages say the lender receives the principal but not the interest does not this show that a penalty on the whole is not imposed on account of its part what a comparison in that case the principle at least is certainly a permitted sum but here who can say that all has not been put in by him come and here what Rabin son of Arnaman learned in case of the sale of a piece of ground under certain conditions though it was found to be bigger than arranged by an area equal to that of a quarter of a cab per SEI the sale is valid if however the difference is greater than not only must the surplus be returned but all the quarters also must be returned this shows clearly that whenever a part has to be returned all must be returned what a comparison Talmud, Mas Baba Batra in that case the seller explicitly said to him I sell you an area of a core more or less but a quarter of a cab is of no importance more than a quarter is of importance because since in the area of a core the quantity may be combined into nine cab they form an important independent field which must be returned but in the case of the refuse in
wine without specifying which seller there is a difficulty and if it means that he said to him the seller of wine there is also a difficulty and if he said to him the seller there is again a difficulty for it has been taught if one says I sell you a seller of wine he must give him wine all of which is good if one said I sell you the seller of wine he may give him such wine as is sold in the shop if one said I sell you the seller the sale is valid even if all of it is vinegar. How then is the Beritha to be reconciled with our Mishnah? Our Mishnah in fact deals with the case where the seller said to him I sell you a seller of wine without specifying which seller but read in the first clause of the Beritha as follows he must give him wine all of which is good but the buyer must accept 10 casks of pungent wine for every hundred must one however accept 10 casks of pungent wine when the seller was not specified surely our high has taught of a person has sold a jug of wine to another he must give him wine all of which is good a jug is different because it contains only one kind of wine did not however our of the school of our Ashai recite if the seller says I sell you a seller of wine he must give him a wine all of which is good if he says I sell you the seller of wine he must give him wine all of which is good and the buyer must accept 10 casks of pungent wine for every hundred Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and this is the seller about which the sages have taught in our mission well then our mission also speaks of the case where the seller said to him this but if so there is a contradiction between this and this there is no contradiction the one deals with the case where the buyer said to him that he required the wine for a dish the other where he did not say to him that it was required for a dish the berita of our deals with the case where the buyer said to him that the wine was required for a dish the other berita deals with the case where he did not say for a dish consequently if the expression used by the seller was a seller of wine and the buyer had said to him for a dish the former must give him a wine all of which is good if the seller said the seller of wine and the buyer had said for a dish he must give him a wine all of which is good and the buyer must accept 10 casks of pungent wine for every hundred if however the seller said this Seller of wine, but the buyer did not say for a dish he may give him such wine as is sold in the shop. The question was raised as to what was the law when the seller said a seller of wine and the buyer did not say for a dish. Araha and Rabbana are in dispute on the matter. One says the buyer must accept ten casks of pungent wine for every hundred, and the other says he need not accept. He who said that the buyer must accept deduces the law from the Beritha of Arzibid, which states that if the seller says I sell you a seller of wine, he must give him a wine all of which is good, and it has been settled that this refers to the case where the buyer said to him for a dish. The reason then is because he said to him for a dish, but had he not said for a dish, he would have had to accept. And he who says that the buyer need not accept deduces the law from the other Beritha, which states that if the seller says I sell you a seller of wine, he must give him a wine all of which is good and it has been settled that this refers to the case where the buyer did not say for a dish according to him who deduces the law from that Beritha of Arzibit is there no contradiction from the other Beritha no something is missing and this is the additional reading this only applies to the case when he said to him for a dish but if he did not say for a dish he must accept and if he said the seller of wine but did not say for a dish he may give him a wine which is sold in the shop and according to him who deduces the law from the other Beritha is there no contradiction from that of Arzibit which has been explained to refer to the case where he said to him for a dish from which it may be inferred that if he did not say to him for a dish he must accept no the same law that he need not accept applies even to a case where he did not say to him for a dish and this is the reason why it had to be explained to refer to the case where he said to him for a dish because there was a contradiction between this in the last clause of the Beritha of Arzibit and this in the second clause of the other Beritha but in the case of the first clauses there was no such contradiction Rab Judah said over wine which is sold in a shop the benediction of the creator of the fruit of the vine is to be said and our Hisda said of what use is wine that is turning sour and objection was raised over bread that has become moldy and over wine that has become sour and over a dish that has lost its color the benediction of by whose word everything was made must be said how then can Rab Judah say that over sour wine the benediction for proper wine is to be said Arzibit replied Rab Judah admits in the case of wine made of kernels which is sold at three corners Abbe said to our Joseph here is the opinion of Rab Judah here that of our Hisda whose does my master adopt he replied unto him I know Beritha Talmud Mas. Baba Bathra where it has been taught if one tested a wine jug for the purpose of taking from it periodically he offering for wine kept in other jugs and subsequently it was found to contain vinegar all three days it is certain and after that it is doubtful what does this mean are Yohanan said it means this during the first three days after the test it is regarded as certain wine after that is doubtful what is the reason because wine begins to deteriorate from above and this man had tasted it and ascertained that it had not deteriorated and if it be assumed that it had deteriorated immediately after it had been tasted even then during the first three days it had the odor of vinegar and the taste of wine and whenever the odor is of vinegar and the taste is of wine it is regarded as wine and our Joshua believe I said the meaning of the Beritha is that during the last three days it is regarded as certainly vinegar prior to that is doubtful what is it Reason wine begins to deteriorate from below and it is possible that it had already deteriorated during the test but he did not know moreover even if it is assumed that deterioration begins from the top and it will be argued that it must have been wine since this man had tasted it and ascertained that it had not then deteriorated it may be retorted that it is possible that it deteriorated immediately after he tasted it and it had the odor of vinegar and the taste of wine and the law is that wherever the odor is vinegar and the taste wine it is regarded as vinegar the scholars of the south of Palestine taught in the name of our Joshua v. Levi during the first three days it is regarded as certainly wine during the last three days as certainly vinegar during the intervening days as doubtful is not the self-contradictory since you said that during the first three days it is regarded as certainly wine it is obvious that if the odor is Vinegar and the taste wine it is regarded as wine and then you say that during the last three days it is regarded as certainly vinegar which proves clearly that if the odor is vinegar and the taste wine it is regarded as vinegar the second clause deals with the case when it was found to be very strong vinegar in which case it is known that had it not lost its taste three days previously it could not have been found to be such very strong vinegar according to whom did our Joseph answer him Armari and Arzibit are in dispute on this one says according to our Yohanan and the other says according to our Joshua B. Levi it has been stated in the case when one sold a jug of wine to another and it became sour Rab said during the first three days of the sale it is regarded as still in the possession of the seller after that it is regarded as in the possession of the buyer Talmud Mas Baba Bathra B and Samuel says wine leaps upon the shoulder of its owner our Joseph decided a case in accordance with the opinion of Rab in respect of the sale of beer and in accordance with that of Samuel in respect of wine and the law is in agreement with the opinion of Samuel our rabbis taught the benediction by whose word everything was made is to be said over beer of dates beer of barley and leaves of wine others say that over leaves which have the flavor of wine the benediction the creator of the fruit of the wine is to be said both Rabbi and our Joseph say the law is not in accordance with the view of the others Rabbi said all agree in the case where three jugs of water had been poured into the leaves and four came out that the liquid is regarded as wine for Rabbi is guided by his view that any wine which cannot stand an admixture of three units of water to one of wine is no wine in the case also where three jugs of water had been put into the leaves and three came out all agree that it is no wine their dispute has Reference only to the case where three were put in and three and a half came out for in such a case the rabbis hold the opinion that since for the three that were put in three were taken out only one half is over and one half in six halves of water is nothing but the others hold the opinion that for the three put in only two and a half were taken out a complete jug therefore remains over and one jug of wine in two and a half of water is regarded as good wine but how can it be said that there is a dispute at all in the case when more than the quantity put in has been taken out surely it has been taught Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra he who in making tomat poured water into leaves by measure and obtained the same quantity of tomat is exempt from the tithe and Arjuna makes him liable does not this imply that they are in disagreement only so far as the case where only the quantity put in is extracted but not where more than that quantity is obtained. No, they are in disagreement even where more than the quantity put in has been obtained, and the reason why they are in dispute in the case where only the quantity put in has been obtained is to show you how far reaching
Contradiction between the respective laws relating to consecrated things for here the law relates to objects which were themselves consecrated but there it relates to objects whose value only was consecrated there is also no contradiction between the respective laws relating to tithes for here the law relates to that which is certainly tithe but there it relates to tithe of Dimeo Yohan and said in the name of Arsimian Bija Hosea the same laws that have been said to apply. In respect of their prohibitions have similarly been said to apply in respect of their making objects fit for Levitical uncleanness what kind of making fit is meant if the infusion is regarded as consisting of water it certainly makes objects fit for the Levitical uncleanness and if it is regarded as consisting of wine it equally makes the objects fit for what purpose then is our Simeon's statement required it is required in the case where the demand was made of rainwater. But since he took up the rainwater and poured it into the vessel containing the lease he surely intended them for use and consequently there is again no difference between an infusion of wine and one of water why then our Simeon's statement it is required in the case where the demand was made without the aid of human effort but since he draws out the infusions one after the other does he not thereby reveal his intention of using them or proper applied in the case of a cow which Drank the infusions one after the others and consequently the owner's intention is not known. Arzitra Tobia said in the name of Rav the Kiddush of the day must be proclaimed on such wine only as is fit to be brought as a drink offering upon the altar. What does this exclude? If it is suggested that it excludes wine that comes from his bat it may be retorted did not our high teach one must not bring wine from his bat as a drink offering but if already brought it is permitted to be used. And since in the case of offerings it is permitted when brought it should be allowed for Kiddush even at the start also Talmud. Mas Baba Bath Rabbi moreover Rabbi said a man may press out a cluster of grapes and proclaim over it the Kiddush of the day or again if it is suggested that the object of Rav's statement is to exclude the wine at the mouth of the jug and at the bottom it may be retorted did not our high teach one must not bring wine as a drink offering from the jugs. Mouth or bottom, but if already brought, it is permitted to be used. And if it is suggested that the statement excludes black, white, sweet cellar and raisin wine, surely it has been taught that all these must not be brought. But if brought already, they are permitted. And if it is suggested that the statement excludes wine which is pungent, mixed, exposed, made of leaves, or having an offensive smell, as it has been taught that in the case of all these, one must not bring them. And even if brought, they remain unfit. It may still be retorted to exclude which of these was the statement made. If to exclude pungent wine, this is surely a matter of dispute between our Yohanan and our Joshua Levi. If to exclude mixed wine, surely when wine is mixed with water, it is improved. For our Jose Bihanan has said the sages agree with our Eliezer that in respect of the cup of grace after meals, no benediction may be said over it until water has been poured into it. If to exclude exposed wine. Surely it is dangerous if to exclude wine made of ease it may be asked how is this to be understood if three jugs of water were poured in and four jugs of wine came out this surely is good wine if three were poured in and three and a half came out this is a matter of dispute between the rabbis and the others but this is the object of the statement is to exclude wine which has an offensive smell if preferred it may be said that the statement may even exclude exposed wine and as to the objection raised it may be replied that it excludes such wine even though it was passed through a strainer in accordance with the teaching of our Nehemiah it nevertheless may not be used for Kiddush because presented now unto thy governor will he be pleased with thee or will he accept that person Arkahana the father-in-law of our Meshach inquired of Rabba may white wine be used as a drink offering he replied unto him look not thou upon the wine when it is red jugs in Sharon. Etc. It has been taught the bad jugs referred to in our mission are those which are thin and lined with pitch mission. If one sells wine to another and it turns sour, he is not responsible. But if his wine is known to turn sour, the purchase is one based on error. If he said unto him wine Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, that is sweet, I am selling you, he is responsible for its preservation until Pentecost. And if he said I sell you old wine, he must supply wine of the previous year, if very old wine. He must supply wine of three years standing. Gamar our Jose son of our Hanan has said the law in our mission is applicable only to the case where the wine is in the jugs of the buyer, but where it is in the jugs of the seller, the former can say to him, Take your wine and take your jug. But what matters it even if the jugs are the sellers, let him say to the buyer, You should not have kept it so long. The law mentioned is applicable to the case where the buyer said to him that he Required the wine for flavoring dish, yes, but what compels our Jose son of our Hannah to explain our mission as treating of the case where the jugs belong to the buyer and that he specially says to the seller that he requires the wine for flavoring dish, yes, let him rather explain that it treats even of the case where the jugs belong to the seller and where the buyer does not say to him that he requires the wine for flavoring dish, yes, Robert replied our mission presented to him a difficulty for it teaches if his wine is known to turn sour the purchase is one based on error why our Jose asked should that be so let the seller tell him you should not have kept it so long from this then it must be inferred that the buyer specifically said to him that he required the wine for flavoring dish, yes, this view is in disagreement with that of our high B. Joseph for our high B. Joseph said the condition of wine depends on its owner's luck for it is said yeah, moreover wine is Treacherous if the man is haughty, etc. Armari said one who is proud is not acceptable even to his own household, for it is said a haughty man abides not this means he abides not in his own abode. Rav Judah said in the name of Rav, anyone who is not a scholar and parades in the scholar's cloak is not admitted within the circle of the Holy One. Blessed be he for here it is written, and he abides not, and there it is written to thy holy abode. Rav said if a man sold a jug of wine to a shopkeeper with the intention to retail it, and when there still remained a half or a third, it turns sour, the law is that he must take it back from him. This, however, applies only to the case where the shopkeeper has not changed the bunghole, but not to the case where he has changed the bunghole. Furthermore, this applies only to the case where the market day has not yet arrived, but not to the case where the market day has already arrived. Rabba further stated if a man accepted wine for the Purpose of taking it to the markets of Wal Shafet, and by the time he arrived there, the price fell. The law is that the owner must accept it. The question was raised, What is the law if it turned into vinegar? Our Hillel said to our Ashi when we were at our Kahanas, He said unto us, In the case when it has turned into vinegar, the owner is not to bear all the loss, for the law is not in accordance with the opinion of our Jose son of our Hannah. Others say, Even when it has turned into vinegar, the seller must also bear all the loss in accordance with the opinion of our Jose son of our Hannah. Old wine, he must supply wine of the previous year, etc. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B.A. Tanit taught if wine was sold as very old, it must be capable of standing until the Feast of Tabernacles. Mission if one sells a place to another or accepts one from another for the purpose of building on it a wedding house for his son or a widow house for his daughter, it is to be built in the dimensions of no less. Then four cubits by six, these are the words of our Akiva. Our Ishmael said, This is an ox stall. He who desires to erect an ox stall is to build IT in the dimensions of no less than four cubits by six, a small house, six by eight, a big one, eight by ten, a hall, ten by ten. The height of any of these must be half its length and half its width. Proof of this, Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel said, Like the temple structure, tomorrow, why has it been stated a wedding house for his son or a widow house for his daughter, and not a wedding house for his son or daughter, or a widow house for his son or daughter? By this, the mission has taught us, incidentally, that it is not the proper way for a son in law to live at the house of his father in law, as it is written in Bensarah. I have weighed all things in the scale of the balance and found nothing lighter than brand, lighter than brand is a son in law who lives in the house of his father in law, lighter than such a son in law is a guest who brings in. With him another guest and lighter than such a guest is he who replies before he hears the question for it is written he that giveth answer before he heareth it is folly and confusion unto him. Richmail said this is an ox stall he who desires to erect etc. Who is the author of the statement on the ox stall? Some say the author is our Ishmael and some say our Akiva is the author. Those who say our Akiva is the author explain it thus although the size is that of an ox stall one sometimes makes his dwelling as small as an ox stall and those who say our Ishmael is the author explain it thus because he who desires to erect an ox stall makes it four cubits by six a hall ten by ten. What is the meaning of triple and arch tall adorned with roses? It
Space below was as that above as the space above served no material purpose so the space below served no material purpose that supports our Levi for our Levi others say our Yohanan said we have this as a tradition from our fathers that the place of the ark and the cherubim is not included in the measured space so indeed it has been taught the ark which Moses made had a free space of ten cubits on every side Robin is said in the name of Samuel the cherubim made by Solomon stood by Miracle for it is said, and five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub from the uttermost part of the one wing unto the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits where then were their bodies standing. Consequently, it must be inferred that they stood by a miracle. Abed they might have been standing with their bodies protruding under the wings like those of hands. Rabba demurred, perhaps they did not stand opposite one another. Our Ahabi. Jacob demurred, they might have been standing diagonally. Our the son of our Joshua demurred, the house might have been wider from above. Our Papa demurred, might not their wings have been bent. Our Ashi demurred, their wings might have been overlapping each other. How did they stand? Our Yohanan and our Eliezer are in dispute on the matter. One says they faced each other, and the other says their faces were inward. But according to him who says that they faced each other, it may be asked, is it not written? And their faces were inward. This is no difficulty. The former was at a time when Israel obeyed the will of the omnipresent. The latter was at a time when Israel did not obey the will of the omnipresent. According to him who says that their faces were inward, it may be asked, is it not written with their faces one to another? They were slightly turned sideways, for so it was taught. Akalos the proselyte said the cherubim were of image work, and their faces were turned sideways as a student who takes leave of his master. Mishnah, he who owns a cistern within another man's house goes in when it is usual for people to go in and goes out when it is usual for people to go out. He must not bring in his beast through the other's house to give a drink from his cistern, but must fill his vessel and give the beast to drink outside. One of them may make for himself a lock, and the other may also make for himself a lock. Tomorrow, where is the lock to be attached? Our Yohanan said both to. The cistern, this is right in the case of the owner of the cistern, for he has to protect the water of his cistern, but for what purpose does the owner of the house require a lock? Our Eliezer said Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B in order to avert suspicion from his wife Mishnah, he who has a garden within the garden of another man enters when it is usual for people to enter and goes out when it is usual for people to go out, he must not bring any dealers into it, he must not enter IT for the mere purpose of passing from it into another field, the external field owner may so the pathway of a side passage was given him with the consent of the two, he may enter whenever he desires and go out whenever he desires and may also bring dealers into it, he must not however enter IT for the mere purpose of passing from it into another field, neither the one nor the other may so it Gemara Rav Judah said in the name of Samuel, if one says to another I sell you land for an irrigation. Canal of the width of one cubit, he must, in addition to the width of the canal, allow him two cubits of land in the field itself, one cubit on either side of the canal for its banks. If he said, I sell you ground for a pond of the width of one cubit, he must, in addition to the pond, allow him one cubit of ground in the courtyard itself, half a cubit on either side of the pond for its banks. Who has the right of sowing these banks? Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, the owner of the field is entitled to sow them. Arnavan said in the name of Samuel, the owner of the field is entitled to plant them. He who said so them agrees even more so that he may plant them, but he who said plant them holds the opinion that he must not, however, sow them because they penetrate into the canal. Rab Judah further stated in the name of Samuel, a water canal whose banks have been worn away may be repaired with the earth of that field through which it runs for it is known. That the banks could not have been washed away except into that very field. Our Papa demurred. Let the field owner say to the owner of the canal, Your water has lowered your ground. But said our Papa, the reason why earth may be taken from the adjacent field is because the owner of the field has consented to this condition. Mishnah, he whose field is traversed by a public path and he closed it, substituting another path at the side forfeits that which he has given and that which he appropriated as. It does not pass into his possession. A private path has a width of four cubits. A public road has a width of sixteen cubits. The king's highway has no limit. As the path of a funeral cortege has no limit. As the halting place had said, the judges of Sepphoris an area of four cab tomorrow. Why should not that path which he appropriated as his pass into his possession let him take a whip and sit down to guard his path? Does this then imply that a man may not take the law in his own hands even? Where a loss is involved, Arzibid replied in the name of Rabbah, it is a decree that he is not allowed to substitute another path for the one already used by the public, lest he assign to them a crooked path. Our Meshashia said in the name of Rabbah, our Mishnah deals only with the case where he gives them a crooked path. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra A. Arashi said, Any path that runs along the side of a field is crooked, for it is near to one and far from another, but let him say to them, Take yours. And give me back mine. This law of our Mishnah is in accordance with the view of our Eliezer, for it has been taught. Our Judah said in the name of our Eliezer, If the public chose a path for themselves, that which they have chosen is theirs made, then the public according to our Eliezer act as robbers. Our Gidal replied in the name of Rabbah, our Eliezer speaks of a case where their path had been lost in that field. If so, why did Rabbah son of Arhuna state in the name of Rabbah that the is not? According to our Eliezer, the reporter of the one statement is not the reporter of the other. What then is the reason for the law of our mission? The reason is derived from that of Rab Judah. For Rab Judah said, A path of which the public has taken possession must not be destroyed. Whereby does the public acquire possession of the path? According to our Eliezer, by walking for it has been taught if he walked in it through the length of it and through the breadth of it, he has acquired the place where he walked. These are the words of our Eliezer, and the sages say, Walking is of no avail unless he has taken possession. Our Eliezer said, What is the reason of our Eliezer? For it is written, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And the rabbis there he said to him, Thus only because of his love for Abraham that his children may easily conquer the land. Our Jose, son of our Hanana, said, The sages agree with our Eliezer in the case of a path of Vineyard, since it was made only for walking, it is acquired by walking when they came before our Isaac BMI with the case of one who sold to another a path in vineyards. He said unto them, Give him a path so wide that he may carry through it a load of twigs and be able to turn round. This, however, has been said only in the case where the path is marked out by walls, but when it is not marked out by walls, the width of the path need be only so much as to allow him to lift up one foot and put down the other. A private path for cubits, a tanned taught others say that the path must be of such a width as an ass with its load may be able to pass. Arhuna said the Halachah is according to the others. The judges of the exile say the width is to be two cubits and a half, and Arhuna said that the Halachah is according to the judges of the exile. Did not Arhuna say that the Halachah is according to the others? Both measurements are identical. A public road, sixteen cubits are. Rabbis taught a private path is of the width of four cubits a path from one town to another is to have a width of eight cubits Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B a public road sixteen cubits the road to the cities of refuge thirty two cubits Arhuna said from what scriptural text may this be inferred from the text thou shalt prepare thee the way instead of a way it is written the way the king's highway has no limit s because a king may break a wall to make a way for himself and no one may prevent him the path of a funeral cortege has no limit s in deference to the dead the halting place had said the judges of Sepphoris an area of four cab etc our rabbis taught if a person has sold his family grave the path to this grave is halting place or his house of mourning the members of his family may come and bury him perforce in order to avert a slight upon the family our rabbis taught no less than seven halts and sittings are to be arranged for the dead corresponding to vanity. A vanity saith Kahila vanity of vanities all is vanity Araha the son of Rabbah said to Arashi what was their procedure he replied unto him as it has been taught Arjuna said at first they provided in Judea no less than seven halts and sittings for the dead in the following manner the leader called out after the escort had sat down on the ground stand dear friends stand up and after they had walked for some distance he again called out sit down dear friends sit down they said unto him if so such procedure should be permitted on the Sabbath also the sister of Rami B. Papa was married to Arjuna when she died he arranged in her honor a halting and sitting Arjuna said he heard on two points he heard in
from the wall on one side, three from the wall on the other, and two from the wall in front. The chambers must be four cubits in length, seven h a n d b r a d t h is in high Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra a and six handbreadths in width. Our Simeon says the central space of the grotto must contain an area of six cubits by eight, and thirteen chambers are to open out into it. Four on one side, four on the other, three in front of the entrance, one on the right of the entrance, and one on the left outside. The entrance to the grotto is to be made a court of six cubits by six, which is the space of beer, and those who bury it occupy two grottos are to be opened out into it, one on the one side and one on the other. Our Simeon says for one for each of its four sides. Our Simeon B Gamaliel says all depends on the quality of the rock. Tomorrow, where are these two chambers to project it outwards? They would surely be trodden upon. Furthermore, we have learned he who stands in the court of a family grave. Is Levitically clean our Jose Bihan and replied they are made in the shape of a doorbolt, but surely our Yohanan said Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B, this is a burial of asses according to our Yohanan, they are made in the corner S, but surely the chambers would touch each other. Our Ashi replied one can make them deeper for if you would not say so, how can four grottos be constructed according to our Simeon? Surely some of the chambers of adjacent grottos would be touching each other, but this you would say can be avoided by digging the overlapping chambers deeper than the others. In this case also the touching of chambers may be avoided by digging the corner chambers into the wall deeper than the adjacent ones. Arhuna the son of our Joshua stated the affected chambers in the four grottos according to our Simeon were made in the shape of palm wicks, but the statement of Arhuna B, our Joshua is to be rejected for it is to be observed every cubit square has a diagonal of a cubit end. Two fifths approximately the diagonal of the square formed by the adjacent walls of any two grottos measures eleven cubits and a fifth approximately is not the number of the chambers eight. How then is it possible to make eight chambers in a width of eleven cubits and a fifth? But that statement of Arhuna B. Ar Joshua must be rejected if you like it may be said as our Shisha son of Ar referred the case in for to miscarriages. So here also the chambers in question are for the burial of miscarriages. We have learned elsewhere in a mission if a corpse is found lying in a grave in the usual manner, both the corpse and the earth surrounding it are to be removed. If two corpses in similar conditions are found and the earth surrounding them are to be removed, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, if three corpses were similarly found and if the distance between them is from four to eight cubits, the area is to be considered a graveyard and a search must also. Be made over a distance of 20 cubits from that spot onwards. If at the end of 20 cubits a corpse is found, a search of another 20 cubits from that spot onwards must be made, for there is reasonable ground for the assumption that even a single grave is an indication of the existence there of other graves. Although if the single corpse had been found first, it should have been removed together with the earth surrounding it. The master stated from 4 to 8 cubits according. To whom is this mission? If according to the rabbis, surely they said that the area of a grotto is to be 4 cubits by 6. If according to Arsimian, surely he said that the grotto must contain an area of 6 cubits by 8. This mission is in fact in agreement with Arsimian, but it is in accordance with the version of Arsimian's view as reported by the following tana, for it has been taught if they were found close to one another and there was not a distance of 4 to 8 cubits. Between them the earth surrounding their bodies belongs to them but they do not constitute the ground as a graveyard our Simeon B. Judah said in the name of our Simeon the intervening ones are regarded as if they did not exist and the rest are combined if the distance is from 4 to 8 cubits since this has been assumed to be in accordance with our Simeon explain the final clause which reads a search must also be made over a distance of 20 cubits from that spot onwards according to whom is this if according to our Simeon the distance should be 22 if according to the rabbis it should be 18 it may in fact be according to the rabbis but there is a possibility that he made the search diagonally but since the one grotto is assumed to be searched diagonally the other also should be assumed to be searched diagonally and consequently the distance should be 22 cubits one diagonal search is expected two diagonal searches are not Talmud, Mas. Baba Bathra B. R. Shisha B. R. E. D. said it may in fact be in accordance with the view of Arsimian, but here it dealt with the case of miscarriages. But since the one is for miscarriages, the other also should be for miscarriages, and the distance should consequently be 18 cubits. One grotto for miscarriages is assumed. Two grottos for miscarriages are not contradictions were pointed out between two statements of the rabbis and also between two statements of Arsimian, for we learned. If a vineyard is planted on an area of less than four cubits, Arsimian says it is not regarded as a vineyard, and the sages say it is regarded as a vineyard. The intervening vines being treated as if they were not in existence is not the statement of the rabbis. They are contradictory to their statement with reference to corpses, and the statement there of Arsimian contradictory to his statement here. There is no contradiction between the two statements of Arsimian for their people. Do not plant vines with the object of pulling them out, but here a burial may sometimes take place at twilight and the corpse is put down temporarily. There is also no contradiction between the two statements of the rabbis for here since the body is disgraced, the spot cannot be designated a grave, but there the owner when planting the vines may think whichever tree will be sound will remain and whichever is a failure will be used for fire with chapter 7 mission. If one says to another I sell you a bethkor of arable land and it contained clefts ten handbreadths deep or rocks ten handbreadths high, these are not to be measured with it. If they are less than this, they are to be measured with it. If however he said to him about a bethkor of arable land, even if the land contained clefts deeper than ten or rocks higher than ten handbreadths, they are to measure with it. Tomorrow we learn elsewhere he who consecrates his field in the time when the laws of it. Jubilee year are in force must pay for an area in which a homer of barley may be sown fifty shekels of silver if it contained clefts ten handbreadths deep or rocks ten handbreadths high Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra these are not measured with it if they are less than this they are to be measured with it now why should they not be measured with it let them at least be treated as if they had been consecrated separately and if you will suggest that since they do not contain a full beth core they cannot become consecrated surely it has been taught why is it expressly said the field because since it was said the sowing of a homer of barley shall be valued at fifty shekels of silver one might infer only a similar consecration whence however may it be inferred that a lethek half a lethek sei tarkav and half a tarkav are also included in this law for this reason it has been expressly stated the field which implies consecration in any manner why then could not the Clefts or the rocks be consecrated separately are Bobby Hammer replied here is a case of clefts full of water in which no sewing is possible. This may also be proved by deduction for the clefts were mentioned in an analogous position to that of rocks. This proves it if so even if they are less than ten handbreadths they should also not be measured with the field. These are called small clefts of the earth and the spines of the earth. What is the law here? Our Papa said even though they are not full of water what is the reason a person does not wish to invest his money in one plot which has the appearance of two or three plots rub and erase an objection surely the clefts were mentioned in an analogous position to that of the rocks as the rocks are excluded because they are unsuitable for sewing so these also should be excluded only when unsuitable for sewing the similarity to rocks refers to the case where they are less than ten handbreadths are Isaac said the rocks which have been spoken of must not together cover more than an area requiring four cab of seed are Bobby Abba said and this only when they are distributed over an area which requires not less than five cab of seed are high B Abba said in the name of our Yohan and this only when they are distributed over the greater part of the field are high B Abba inquired what is the law if the greater part of them is scattered over its smaller part and the smaller part of them over its greater part. The matter is undecided our Jeremiah inquired Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B what is the law if they are arranged like a ring like a straight line in the shape of a stadium or in that of a crooked road the matter is undecided Atan taught if a rock is isolated it is not measured with the field however small that rock might be and even if it was in the field but near the boundary it is not measured with the field however small that rock might be our Papa inquired what is the law of some. Earth intervenes between the rock and the boundary. The matter is undecided. Arashi inquired, "What is the law if there was earth beneath and rock above, or earth above and rock beneath?" The matter is undecided. Mishnah: If a man says to another, "I sell you a bethkor of arable land measured with the rope," and he gave him less, even if
if only by a fraction it is to be returned to him thus it is to be inferred that had not the expression measured by the rope been explicitly used it would have been just the same as if the expression more or less had been actually used explain however the concluding clause which reads if however he said more or less the sale is valid even if he gave at the rate of a quarter of a cab per SELS or more thus it is to be inferred that had not the expression more or less been explicitly used it would have been just the same as if the expression measured by the rope had actually been used but one must conclude that nothing may be deduced from this mission to come and here it has been taught if a man says to another I sell you a Bethcore of arable land or I sell you about a Bethcore of arable land or I sell you etc more or less the sale is valid even if he gave at the rate of a quarter of a rap per SELS or more this clearly proves that even when nothing had been specified it is the same as if the expression more or less had been used that supplies no proof for it is an explanatory statement implying the following in which case is the expression of Bethcore regarded as the expression about a Bethcore when one said to the other more or less are actually demurred to this if so for what purpose is the expression I sell you thrice repeated consequently the deduction may be made that even when nothing had been specified it is the same as if the expression more or less had been used this proves it what is the buyer to return to him the money etc does this mission imply that we are to look after the interests of the seller and not after those of the buyer surely it has been taught if the land purchased was by seven cab and a half per core less or by seven cab and a half per core more than the area agreed upon the sale is valid if the surplus is greater than this the seller is compelled to sell and it buyer to buy there we deal with the case where land was first dear and is now cheap in such a case the seller is told if you wish to give him the land give it to him at the present cheaper rate but has it not been taught when he gives it to him it must be at the rate at which he had bought of him that refers to the case where it was first cheap and is now dear if therefore there was a surplus in the field of an area of nine cab etc are who not said the law of nine cab spoken of applies even in the case of a large valley but our nomin said seven cab and a half must be allowed for every court talmud mas baba bath rabi and if there is a surplus amounting to nine cab it is to be returned robber raised the following objection against our nomin if therefore there was a surplus in the field of an area of nine cab does not this refer even to the case where two core were sold no only when one core was sold but the mission further stated and in the garden an area of half a cab does not this refer even to the case where two SEL were sold no only where one SEL was sold but the mission also states and according to our akiva a quarter of a cab does not this refer even to the case where SEL was sold no only when half SEL was sold our ashi inquired what is the proportion allowed in the case of a field which was converted into a garden or a garden which was converted into a field the matter is undecided it has been taught if the field sold adjoined Another field of is even if the surplus was ever so little the land must be returned. Our Ashi inquired does a water cistern form a division if not does a water canal form a division if not does a public road form a division does a nursery of young inoculated palm trees form a division the matter is undecided not only the quarter is to be returned but all the surplus is not the order reverse Ravine son of Arnaman has taught the mission implies this not only is the surplus to be returned but also all the quarters mission if the seller says I sell you measured by the rope more or less the condition of more or less cancels that of measured by the rope if he says more or less measured by the rope Talmud Mas Baba Bathra the condition measured by the rope cancels that of more or less these are the words of Ben Nanyas Kamara Arab Abimemel said in the name of Rab his colleagues are in disagreement with Ben Nanyas what does this teach us surely we have Learned it happened at Sephoris that a person hired a bathhouse from another for twelve gold denarii per annum one denar per month and the matter was brought before our Simeon Begamaliel and before our Jose who said that the rent for the intercalary month must be divided what then does Rab come to teach us if the inference had come from there it might have been said that there only do the rabbis hold the opinion that the rent for the month is to be divided because it might be assumed that the owner had changed his mind and it might also be assumed that with the second expression he was merely explaining the first but here where the seller has clearly changed his mind it might have been thought that the rabbis do not disagree with Ben Nanyas hence it was necessary for Rab to teach us Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel this is the assertion of Ben Nanyas but the sages say the expression which confers the least advantage upon the buyer is to be followed. This would imply that he Samuel himself is not of the same opinion but surely both Rab and Samuel said if a seller said I sell you a core for 30 salayim he may withdraw even at the last SEI if however he said I sell you a core for 30 each SEI for a seller the buyer acquires possession of every SEI as it is measured out for him this surely shows that Samuel is of the same opinion as Ben Nanyas but it may be replied that this may denote that Samuel is of the same opinion does Samuel however hold the same opinion surely Samuel said the mission which states that the rent of the bathhouse for the intercalary month is to be divided speaks only of the case where the owner comes in the middle of the month but where he comes at the beginning of the month all the rent of the month belongs to the owner and if he comes at the end of the month all the rent of the month belongs to the tenant does not this prove that Samuel disagrees with Ben Nanyas. Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabi, but it may be replied this in fact implies that Samuel is not of the same opinion as however his reason therefore dividing the monthly rent of the bathhouse is because each one of the parties is in possession of a part of that concerning which they are in dispute so here also the reason why the buyer acquires every SEI as it is measured out to him is because it is then in his possession Arhuna said in the name of the school of Rab if one says that he would sell an object for an istira a hundred mile he is entitled to a hundred mile if he says a hundred mile an istira he is entitled to an istira what does this teach us that the second expression is to be preferred surely Rab has said it once for Rab said had I been there I would have given all to the owner why then need Rab say it again since it might have been said that the reason Rab would have assigned all to the owner of the bathhouse was because he held that the Second expression was merely explaining the first therefore it was necessary for Rab to teach us the case of the Ispira Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Mishnah if one says I sell you this Bethkor within its marks and boundaries the sale is valid if the difference is less than a sixth if it amounts to a sixth deduction must be made tomorrow it was stated Arhuna said the law of a sixth is like that of less than a sixth Rab Judah said the law of a sixth is like that of more than a sixth according to Arhuna who said that the law of a sixth is like that of less than a sixth the ten of our Mishnah means to say thus the sale is valid in the case where the difference is less than a sixth as well as when it is exactly a sixth if it is more than a sixth deduction is to be made according to Rab Judah who said that the law of a sixth is like that of more than a sixth the ten means to say thus the sale is valid when the difference is less than a sixth of it is more than a sixth as well as when it is exactly a sixth deduction is to be made an objection was raised it has been taught if one states I sell you a field within its marks and boundaries and it was found to contain a sixth less or more the case is like that of judicial appraisement and the sale is valid now surely in the case of judicial appraisement the law of a sixth is the same as that of more than a sixth Arhuna can reply to you and according to your argument. Is there here no difficulty surely it is stated the sale is valid hence this must be the explanation the case is like judicial appraisement in one respect and unlike judicial appraisement in another it is like judicial appraisement with respect to the sixth and it is unlike judicial appraisement for there the purchase is cancelled while here it is valid our papa bought a field from a certain person Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi who stated that it contained an area of twenty griba but it contained only 15 he came before Abbe who said unto him surely you realized its size and accepted but did we not learn the sale is valid if the difference is less than a sixth if it amounts to a sixth deduction must be made this applies only where the buyer is not acquainted with the field but where he is acquainted with it it is assumed that he understood the conditions and accepted but argued our papa he said to me 20 he replied the seller might say that he meant that the field was as good as one of 20 it was taught our Jose said when brothers divide an estate all of them acquire possession of their respective shares as soon as the lot for one of them is drawn on what ground is possession acquired our Eliezer said possession is acquired in the same way as at the beginning of the settlement of the land of Israel as at that beginning the acquisition was by lot so here also it is by lot since there however the division was made through the ballot box and the Urim and Tumim should not the division here also be made through the ballot box
SEI, if however he said I sell you a core for 30 each SEI for a seller the buyer acquires possession of every SEI as it is measured out for him this shows that even a decision arrived that may be upset Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra and there the rabbis have made a provision which is convenient for the seller and also for the buyer it was stated in the case where two brothers divided an inherited estate between them and a creditor of their father came and DIS tearing the share of one of them rap said the division is cancelled Samuel said he has forfeited his claim and RC said he takes a quarter either in land or in money rap said that the division was to be cancelled because he holds the opinion that brothers even after having divided their father's estate between them remain coer Samuel said that he whose share was seized forfeited his claim because he holds the opinion that brothers after having divided their father's estate between them stand to each other in the relationship of Vendees each being in the position of a purchaser without a warranty of indemnity RC is in doubt whether they still remain coers or stand in the relationship of Vendees he whose share was seized takes therefore a quarter either in land or in money our papa said the law in all the cases dealt with in these traditions is that a portion or portions must be relinquished Amimar said the original division is cancelled and the law is that the original Division is cancelled. Our rabbis taught in the case where three experts went down to the estate of male orphans to assess it, and one values the estate at a mina and the two value it at 200 zoos, or if one values it at 200 zoos and the two value it at a mina, the one being in the minority is overruled. If one values the estate at a mina, one at 20 sella and one at 30 sella, it is to be adjudged at a mina. Our Eliezer B. R. Zadok said it is to be adjudged at 90 zoos. Others said the difference between them is calculated and divided by three. He who said it is to be adjudged at a mina adopts the middle course. Our Eliezer B. R. Zadok who said it is to be adjudged at 90 is of the opinion that the land Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B, is worth 90 zoos, and the reason why one valued it at 20 sella is because he had underestimated it by 10 zoos, and he who valued it at a mina overestimated it by 10 zoos. On the contrary, let it be. Assume that the land is worth 110 zoos and that he who valued it at a main underestimated it by 10 zoos and he who said 30 overestimated it by 10 zoos at all events one should adopt the first two since both do not exceed the sum of one main of the others who said the difference between them is calculated and divided by three hold the opinion that the land is worth 93 zoos and a third and that he who valued it at 20 sella underestimated it by 13 zoos and a third he who valued it at a main overestimated by 13 zoos and a third logically the latter should have given a higher estimate but the reason why he did not do it is because he thought it is enough that I have exceeded my colleague's estimate by so much on the contrary let it be said the land is worth 113 zoos and a third he who valued it at a main underestimated it by 13 zoos and a third and he who valued it at 30 sella overestimated it by 13 zoos and a third and logically he should have submitted a higher estimate but he thinks it is enough that I have exceeded my colleagues by so much at all events one should adopt the first two since both do not exceed the sum of main Arhuna said the Halajah is in accordance with the opinion of the others Arashi said we do not know the reason for the opinion of the others shall we administer the law in accordance with their view the judges of the exile taught the difference between them is calculated and divided by three Arhuna said the law is in accordance with the teaching of the judges of the exile Arashi said we do not know the reason for the opinion of the judges of the exile shall we administer the law in accordance with their view Mishnah if one says to another I sell you half a field a compromise is made between them and he takes the half of his field if one says I sell you half of it on the southern side a compromise is made between them and he takes its southern half he must undertake to supply space for the wall and for the bigger and smaller trench and what is the width of the bigger trench six hand breadths and that of the smaller one three gamara our high b abba said in the name of our yohan and the buyer takes the poorer side of it said our high b abba to our yohan and surely we have learned that a compromise was to be made between them he replied unto him while you were engaged in eating date berries in babylon i expounded this with the aid of the concluding clause for in the concluding clause it is taught if one says i sell you half of it on the southern side a compromise is made between them and he takes its southern half but why according to your reasoning should a compromise be made between them surely he explicitly said to him half of it on the southern side but you must say that the expression there refers to the price here also it must be assumed that the expression used refers to the price he must undertake to supply the space for the wall etc. It was taught the bigger trench is without and the smaller one is within and both are made behind the wall on its outer side Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra and Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra in order that an animal may not jump over the wall let then the big trench be made and not also the small one since it is why the animal might stand in it and jump then let the smaller trench be made and not the bigger one since it is small the animal might stand on the outer edge and jump how much space must there be between the bigger and the smaller trench one hand breadth chapterbii mission some relatives inherit from and transmit to each other some inherit but do not transmit some transmit but do not inherit and some neither inherit nor transmit the following inherit from and transmit to each other a father inherits from and transmits to his sons and sons inherit from and transmit to their father and brothers from the same father inherit from and transmit to each other a man inherits from his mother and from his wife but does not transmit his estate to them if he dies first and sisters sons inherit from their uncles but do not transmit their estates to them a woman transmits her estate to her sons and a wife to her husband but they do not inherit from them and mothers brothers transmit their estates to their nephews but do not inherit from them and brothers from the same mother neither inherit from nor transmit to each other tomorrow why does the mission teach first the father inherits from and transmits to his sons let it first teach the sons inherit from and transmit to their father for in the first place one should not commence with something suggestive of misfortune Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and secondly one should follow the order of the Torah as it is written if a man die and have no son the tenor prefers to Begin with the case of a father who is heir to his son because this law has been arrived at through an exposition. What is the exposition that has been taught? His kinsman refers to the dead man's father. This teaches that a father takes precedence over brothers. One might assume that he also takes precedence over a son. Therefore, it was expressly stated that is next to him, which implies he who is nearest takes precedence. What reason is there for including the son and excluding the brother? The son is included because, as is known, he is entitled to take his father's place in designating the Hebrew handmaid of his father to be his wife, and also in the redeeming of a field of his father's possession. On the contrary, rather say the brother is included because he also takes the place of his brother. In the case of a Levi rate marriage, surely Levi rate marriage only takes place where there is no son, but where there is a son, there is no Levi rate marriage from what has. Been said it appears that the only reason for the precedence of a son is that there is this reply but had it not been so it would have been held that a brother takes precedence but cannot this law be deduced Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra from the fact that in one case there are two advantages and in the other only one the very law of a son's precedence in the case of the redemption of a field of his father's possession was deduced by the Tana from this very argument this. Surely Levi rate marriages only take place where there is no son but where there is a son there is no Levi rate marriage but why not say thus his kinsman refers to the father this teaches that a father takes precedence over a daughter one might assume that he also takes precedence over a son it was therefore expressly stated that is next to him which implies he who is nearest takes the precedence since in respect of Levi rate marriages a son and a daughter have the same standing a Son and a daughter must have the same standing in the case also of inheritance. Why again not say thus his kinsman refers to the father? This teaches that a father takes precedence over the dead man's father's brothers. One might assume that he also takes precedence over brothers. It was therefore expressly stated that his next, which implies he who is nearest takes the precedence. The father's brothers do not require any scriptural text for from whom do the father's brothers derive their right from the father should then the brothers of the father inherit when the father himself is alive. But surely the scriptural verses are not written in this order, for it is written, and if his father have no brethren, etc., the verses are not written in the proper order of succession. The following tan derives it from the following, for it was taught our Ishmael son of our Jose gave the following exposition. It is written, if a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance. To pass on to his daughter this implies that where there is a daughter the inheritance is passed from the father but no inheritance is passed from the father where there
Thy mother's near kinswoman robber replied the scriptural text says that is next to him of his family and he shall possess it the family of the father is regarded as the proper family but the family of the mother is not regarded as the proper family for it is written by their families by their father's houses but is not the mother's family regarded as the proper family surely it is written and there was a young man out of Bethlehem in Judah of the family of Judah who was a Levite and he sojourned there now this is self-contradictory for it is said who was a Levite which clearly indicates that he descended from Levi and it is also said of the family of Judah which clearly shows that he descended from Judah must it not then be concluded that his father was of the tribe of Levi and his mother of that of Judah and yet the text speaks of him as of the family of Judah Rabbi son of Arhan and replied no he may have been a man whose name was Levi if so is this the Reason why Micah said now Noah that the Lord will do me good seeing I have a Levi as my priest yes he was glad that he happened to obtain a man whose name was Levi but was Levi his name surely his name was Jonathan for it is said and Jonathan the son of Gershom the son of Manasseh he and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites he said unto him but even according to your argument it may be objected was he the son of Manasseh surely he was the son of Moses for it is written the son of Moses Gershom and Eliezer but you must say that because he acted wickedly as Manasseh the scriptural text described his descent to Manasseh so also here it may be said that because he acted wickedly as Manasseh who descended from Judah the scriptural text described his descent to Judah Aryohan and said in the name of Arsimian Bohe from here one may infer that corruption is ascribed to the corrupt Arhose Bihan and said this may be inferred from the following it is Written and he was also a very goodly man and he was born after Absalom was not Adonijah the son of Hajat and Absalom the son of Makkah but because he acted in the same manner as Absalom who rebelled against the king the scriptural text associated him with Absalom our Eliezer said one should always associate with good people for behold from Moses who married the daughter of Jethro there descended Jonathan while from Aaron who married the daughter of Ammonadab there descended Phinehas but did not Phinehas descend from Jethro surely it is written and Eliezer Aaron's son took him one of the daughters of Putile to wife does not this mean that he descended from Jethro who crammed calves for idol worship no it means that he descended from Joseph who conquered his passions did not however the tribes near at him and say have you seen this beauty son of youth whose mother's father crammed calves for idol worship should kill the head of the tribe in Israel Talmud Mos Baba Bathra, but this is really the explanation if his mother's father descended from Joseph his mother's mother descended from Jethro if his mother's father descended from Jethro his mother's mother descended from Joseph this may also be confirmed by deduction for it is written of the daughters of Putile from which two lines of ancestry are to be inferred Rabbah said he who wishes to take a wife should inquire about the character of her brothers for it is said and Aaron took Elisheba the daughter of Ammonadab the sister of Nashon since it is stated the daughter of Ammonadab would it not be obvious that she is the sister of Nashon then why should it be expressly stated the sister of Nashon from here then it is to be inferred that he who takes a wife should inquire about the character of her brothers it was taught most children resemble the brothers of the mother and they turned aside thither and said unto him who brought thee hither and what doest thou in this place and what hast thou here? They said unto him, Are you not a descendant of Moses of whom it is written? Draw not nigh hither. Are you not a descendant of Moses of whom it is written? What is this in thy hand? Are you not a descendant of Moses of whom it is written? But as for thee, stand thou here by me. Would you be made a priest for idol worship? He said unto them, I have the following tradition from my grandfather's family. At all times shall one rather hire himself out to idol worship than be in need of the help of his fellow creatures. He thought that Abu Dazara meant actual idol worship, but it is not so. The meaning being work which is strange to him, as Rab said to Archahana, flay a carcass in the street and earn a wage and say not, I am a great man, and the work is degrading to me. When David saw that he had an exceptional liking for money, he put him in charge over the treasuries. For it is said, Shabul, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, was ruler over the treasuries, but was his name. Shabul surely his name was Jonathan Aryohan and said he was called Shabul because he returned to God with all his heart and sons inherit from and transmit to their father whence is this derived it is written if a man die and have no son then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter from this it is to he inferred that the reason is because he have no son but if he have a son the son takes precedence our papa said to have a might it not be inferred that if there be a son the son is to be the heir if there be a daughter the daughter is to be the heir and if there be both a son and a daughter neither the one is to hear nor the other but Talmud Mas Baba Bath Rabihu then should he the heir should the town collector he the heir it is this that I suggest if there be a son and a daughter neither the one nor the other should inherit all the estate but both together should inherit it Abbe said to him is then a scriptural verse required to tell us that where there is a one and only son he inherits all the property is it not possible however that scripture meant to teach this that a daughter also has a right of inheritance this is deduced from and every daughter that posse seth an inheritance are ahabi jacob said the law of a son's precedence over a daughter may he infer from here why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he had no son the reason then is because he had no son but had he had a son the son would have taken precedence but it is not possible that the daughters of zelophi had only said so and that when the torah was given the lord received a new interpretation but the best proof is that given at first rubin has said the law of a son's precedence may he infer from here that is next to him i.e he who is nearest in relationship takes precedence and in what respect is the relationship of a son nearer than that of a daughter is it in that he is entitled to take his father's place in designating the Hebrew handmaid of his father to be his wife and in the redeeming of a field of his father's possession surely as regards designation a daughter is not one to designate and as regards the redemption of a field of possession a daughter also may he entitled to the same privilege as a son by logical deduction from the self-same objection from which the Tana had deduced the law that a son is entitled to this privilege is there any Levi right? marriage except where there is no son but the best proof is that given at first if you like I can say the law of the son's precedence may be inferred from here and you may make them an inheritance for your sons after you meaning your sons but not your daughters but in that case does that your days may be multiplied and the days of your sons also mean your sons and not your daughters it is different in the case of a blessing and brothers from the same father inherit from and transmit etc. Whence is this derived? Rabbi said it may be deduced from a comparison of this brotherhood with the brotherhood of the sons of Jacob as there the brotherhood was derived from the father and not from the mother so here the brotherhood spoken of is that from the father and not from the mother what need is there for this inference surely it is written of his family and he shall possess it and it has been deduced that the family of the father is regarded as the family but the family of the mother is not regarded as the family this is so indeed but the statement of Rabbi was made with reference to the law of Levi right marriage a man inherits from his mother etc. Whence are these laws derived for our rabbis taught Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrae it is written and every daughter that posse seth an inheritance in the tribes of the children of Israel how can a daughter inherit from two tribes obviously only when her father is from one tribe and her mother from Another tribe and both died and she inherited from them from this one may only derive the law in respect of a daughter once made the law respecting a son he derived one may derive it by an inference from minor to major if a daughter whose claims upon her father's property are impaired has strong legal claims upon the property of her mother should a son whose claims upon the property of his father are strong not justly have strong legal claims upon the property of his mother and by the same argument as there a son takes precedence over a daughter so here a son takes precedence over a daughter our Jose son of our Judah and our Eliezer son of our Jose said in the name of our Zechariah H. both a son and a daughter have equal rights in the inheritance of a mother's estate what is the reason it is sufficient for a law that is derived by argument to he like the law from which it is derived and does not the first ten expound it is sufficient etc surely the Exposition of Deo is pentateuchal for it was taught an example of an inference from minor to major is and the Lord said to Moses if her father had but spit in her face should she not hide in shame seven days would not one expect by inference from minor to major that in the case of the divine presence she should hide in shame for fourteen days but it is held that it is sufficient for a law that is derived by argument to he like the law from which it is derived elsewhere he does expound Deo
Prince came to meet them. He said to him, The man who comes towards us is distinguished, and his cloak is distinguished. When he came nigh him, Arjani touched it and said to him, This cloak, its legal minimum size as regards love, it uncleanness is but that of sackcloth. He inquired of him, Whence is it derived that a son takes precedence over a daughter in the inheritance of a mother's estate? He replied to him, From tribes where the plural indicates that the mother's tribe is to be. Compared to the father's tribe, as in the case of the father's tribe, a son takes precedence over a daughter. So in the case of the mother's tribe, a son takes precedence over a daughter. He said to him, If so, let it be said that as in the case of the father's tribe, a firstborn takes a double portion. So in the case of the mother's tribe, a firstborn shall take a double portion. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be called to his attendant lead on this man does not desire to learn what then is the reason of a replied scripture says of all that he hath implying he and not she might it not be suggested that these words apply to the case where a bachelor married a widow, but where a bachelor married a virgin, he takes a double portion also in the estate of his mother Arnam and H. Isaac replied scripture said, For he is the first fruits of his strength, from which it is to be inferred that the law applies to the first fruits of his strength and not of her strength, surely that word. Is required for the law that though one was born after a miscarriage, he is nevertheless regarded as the firstborn son in respect of inheritance. The text implying that only he for whom a father's heart grieves is included in the law, but that a miscarriage for which it does not is excluded. If so, the text should have read, For he is the first fruits of strength, why his strength two laws therefore are to be deduced from it, but still might it not be suggested that these words apply only to the case of a widower who married a virgin, but where a bachelor married a virgin, the firstborn son takes a double portion also in the estate of his mother. But Rabbah said, This is the proper reply. Scripture states the right of the firstborn is his, and this indicates that the right of the firstborn is applicable to the estate of a man and not to that of a woman, and a man inherits from his wife, etc. Whence is this derived? Our rabbis taught his kinsman refers to his wife. And this teaches that the husband is heir to his wife. One might say that she also is heir to him. It is therefore expressly stated, and he shall inherit her, meaning he is heir to her, but she is not heir to him. But surely the scriptural verses are not written like that. Abbe said, Interpret thus: He shall give his inheritance unto one that is next to him, as to his kinswoman. He shall inherit her. Rabbah said, A sharp knife is dissecting the biblical verses. But said Rabbah, This is what the text implies: He shall give the inheritance of his kinswoman into him. Rabbah, holding the view that prefixes and suffixes may he detached from words and added to others, and a new interpretation may then he given to the biblical text. The following tenet derives it from the following text: For it was taught, and he shall inherit her. Teaches that the husband is heir to his wife. These are the words of our Akibar Ishmael. However, said this is not necessary, for it is said, and every daughter that. Posse saith an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be wife unto one of the family, etc. This text speaks of a transfer from one tribe to another that may be occasioned through the husband. Furthermore, it is said, So shall no inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. Furthermore, it is said, So shall no inheritance remove from one tribe to another tribe. Furthermore, it is said, And Eliezer the son of Aaron died, and they buried him at the hill of Phinehas. His son whence could Phinehas possess a hill which did not belong to Eliezer, but this teaches that Phinehas took a wife who died, and he was her heir. Furthermore, it is said, And Sekub begot Jair who had three and twenty cities in the land of Gilead Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra whence could Jair possess cities which did not belong to Sekub, but this teaches that Jair took a wife who died, and he was her heir. For what purposes? Furthermore, it is said, required in case it be said that. Scripture is only concerned for a transfer through the son, but that a husband was not heir to his wife. Proof was brought from so shall no inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. And in case it be said, its purpose is to teach that one would transgress thereby both a negative and a positive precept. Proof was brought from so shall no inheritance remove from one tribe to another tribe. And in case it is said that the purpose of this is to teach that one would transgress two negative precepts. And one positive proof was brought from an Eliezer the son of Aaron died, etc. And in case it be said that it was Eliezer who took a wife who died, and that it was Phinehas who was her heir. Proof was brought from and Sekub begot fair, etc. And in case it be said there also the same thing may have happened, it may be replied if so. Why two scriptural verses are Papa said to have a wherefrom is it not indeed possible to maintain that a husband is not heir to? His wife as to the scriptural verses these may speak of a transfer through the son as interpreted above and that Jair may have bought the cities and Phinehas also may have bought the hill he replied unto him it cannot be said that Phinehas had bought the land for if so it would follow that the field must return in the jubilee year and the righteous man would thus be buried in a grave which was not his own but say that it may have fallen to him as a field devoted Abbe replied. After all the inheritance would be removed from the tribe of the mother to the tribe of the father but how is it not possible that that case is different because the estate had already been transferred he said to him the argument because it had already been transferred is rather weak Aryamar said to Arashi if the argument because it had already been transferred is to be used one can very well understand the verse as having reference either to transfer through the son or to transfer. Through the husband, if however it is said that the argument because it had already been transferred is not to he used of what benefit is it when she is married to a man of the family of her father's tribe, surely the inheritance is removed from the tribe of her mother to that of her father. She may he given in marriage to a person whose father is of the tribe of her father and his mother of the tribe of her mother. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. If so, that verse should have read to one of the family of the tribe of her father and her mother. If it had been written thus, even the reverse might have been assumed. Hence, the need for the present reading it was taught that a daughter inheriting an estate must marry one of her father's tribe in order to prevent transfer from tribe to tribe through the son. And it was also taught that the object is to prevent transfer through the husband. It was taught that the object is to prevent transfer through the son, for it is written so. Shall no inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe? Scripture speaks here of transfer through the son. Thou sayest that it speaks of a transfer through the son. Perhaps it speaks only of a transfer through the husband, since it was said, So shall no inheritance remove from one tribe to another tribe. Behold, transfer through the husband has been spoken of to what then shall one apply? So shall no inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe? It must be. Assume therefore that Scripture speaks here of transfer through the son. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, it was taught in another very So shall no inheritance remove from tribe to tribe. Scripture speaks here of a transfer through the husband. Thou sayest that it speaks of a transfer through the husband. Perhaps it speaks only of a transfer through the son, since it was said, So shall no inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. Behold, transfer through the son has. Been spoken of to what then shall one apply so shall no inheritance remove from one tribe to another tribe it must be assumed therefore that scripture speaks here of transfer through the husband both at all events agree that in from one tribe to another tribe scripture speaks of transfer through the husband how is this to be inferred rabbi son of Arshila said scripture states is not is written in both but said Arnam and B. Isaac scripture states shall cleave is not the phrase shall cleave written in both but said rabbi scripture states the tribes shall cleave Arashi said scripture states from one tribe to another tribe but a son is not of another Arab said in the name of Aryohanan in the name of Arjane in the name of Rabbi and some trace it to our Joshua B. Korha once is it proved that a husband does not receive as heir the prospective estate of his wife as he does that which was already in her possession it is said and Sekub begot Jair who had Three and twenty cities in the land of Gilead whence could Jair possess cities which did not belong to Sekub, but this teaches that Sekub took a wife and she died in the lifetime of those whose heirs she would have been and when these died Jair inherited her estate furthermore it is said and Eliezer the son of Aaron died and they buried him etc. whence could Phinehas possess a hill which did not belong to Eliezer but this teaches that Eliezer took a wife who died in the lifetime of those whose heirs she would have been and when these died Phinehas inherited her estate for what purpose is furthermore it is said required in case it be said that it was Jair who took a wife who died and that he inherited from her it is therefore expressly stated and Eliezer
Talmud, Mas Baba Badra at night however even three persons may only write down instructions but are not permitted to constitute themselves into accord what is the reason because they have become witnesses and a witness may not act as a judge he said unto him yes I indeed mean the same it was stated with regard to symbolical acquisition how long may one withdraw Rabbi said so long as the session is in progress are Joseph said so long only as they are dealing with that subject are. Joseph said logical reasoning supports my view for Rav Judah said three persons who came to visit a sick man may if they wish either write down his instructions with reference to the disposal of his estate or if they prefer it give judgment now if it is assumed that the testator may withdraw during the whole time the session is in progress how can they give judgment surely it may he apprehended that he might withdraw or as she said discussing this tradition in the presence of our Kahana. Argued is this right and according to our Joseph surely according to his view also it may be apprehended that he might withdraw but what have you to say in reply that they would he passing Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be from one subject to another here also it may he reply that they stand up and then sit down again the law is in accordance with the view of our Joseph in the case of field subject and half a woman transmits her estate to her sons etc for what purpose is the statement. Also required surely it has been taught already in an earlier clause that a man inherits from his mother and from his wife it teaches us this that the transmission of the estate of a woman to her son is to be in the same manner as the transmission of the estate of a woman to her husband as in the case of the transmission of the estate of a wife to her husband the husband is not heir to his wife in the grave so in the case of the transmission of the estate of a woman to her son the son in the grave does not inherit from his mother to transmit the inheritance to his brothers on his father's side are you had said in the name of our Judah son of our Simeon it is the word of the Torah that a father is heir to his son and that a woman is heir to her son for it is said tribes which implies that the tribe of the mother is compared to the tribe of the father as in the case of the father's tribe a father is heir to his son so in the case of the mother's tribe a woman is heir to her son Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrae are Yohanan pointed out to our Judah son of our Simeon the following objection have we not learned a woman transmits her estate to her sons and to her husband but does not inherit from them and mother's brothers transmit their estates to their nephews but do not inherit from them he replied to him as to our mission I do not know who is its author but why did he not say to him that it may represent the views of our Zechariah B. Hakazab who does not expound tribes our mission cannot be upheld as representing the views of our Zechariah H. Hakazab for it teaches and sisters sons and attended taught that this implies sisters sons only but not sisters daughters and the question was asked in respect to what law and our she's hate answered in respect of precedence now if it were assumed that our mission was a representation of the views of our Zechariah B. Hakazab it could rightly have been objected surely he said both. A son and a daughter have equal rights in the inheritance of a mother's estate as to the tenor of our mission how are his views to be reconciled if he expounds tribes a woman also should hear to her son if he does not once does he deduce the law that a son takes precedence over a daughter in inheriting his mother's property he does in fact expound tribes but here the case is different for scripture says and every daughter that possesseth an inheritance from which it is to he inferred that she may inherit from but not transmit to her mother mission the order of succession is as follows if a man die and have no son and ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter a son takes precedence over a daughter all lineal descendants of a son take precedence over a daughter a daughter takes precedence over the brothers lineal descendants of a daughter also take precedence over the brothers brothers take precedence over the brothers of the father lineal Descendants of brothers also take precedence over the brothers of the father. This is the general rule. The lineal descendants of anyone with a priority to succession take precedence. A father takes precedence over all his descendants. Gemara, our rabbis taught it is written son from which one only learns that a son has a prior claim to heirship. Once may it he deduce that a son of the son or a daughter of the son or a son of the daughter of the son has the same rights it is. Expressly stated and low which is taken to imply hold and inquire concerning him it is written daughter from which one only learns that a daughter is next in succession to a son. Once may it he deduce that a daughter of the daughter and the son of the daughter and a daughter of the son of the daughter have also the same rights it is expressly stated and low which is taken to imply hold and inquire concerning him. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. In what manner is this inquiry carried out? In a manner that the estate may ultimately find its way to Reuben, let him say to Jacob, Abbe replied, We have it by tradition that no tribe would become extinct. Arhuna said in the name of Rab, anyone, even a prince in Israel who says that a daughter is to inherit with the daughter of the son, must not he obey, for such a ruling is only the practice of the Sadducees, as it was taught on the 24th of Tevath. We return to our own law for the Sadducees, having maintained that a daughter inherited with the daughter of the son, Arhuna and H. Zakai joined issue with them. He said to them, Fools, whence do you derive this? And there was no one who could reply a word except one old man who cried at him and said, If the daughter of his son who succeeds to an inheritance by virtue of his son's right is heir to him, how much more so his daughter who derives her right from himself? He read for him this verse, These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lot, and Shubal and Zibian and Anna and lower down it is written and these are the children of Zibian and Anna but this teaches that Zibian had intercourse with his mother and begot Anna is it not possible that there were two called Anna Rabbi said I would say something which King Shubur could not have said and who is he Samuel others say that it was our Papa who said I would say something which King Shubur could not have said and who is he Rabbi scripture says this is Anna implying the same Anna that was mentioned before he said unto him O master do you dismiss me with such a feeble reply he said to him fool Talmud Mas Baba Bathra shall not our perfect Torah be as convincing as your idol talk your deduction is fallacious for the reason why a son's daughter has a right of inheritance is because her claim is valid where there are brothers but can the same he said of the deceased daughter whose right of inheritance is impaired where there are Brothers thus they were defeated and that day was declared a festive day and they said they that our escape must be as an inheritance for Benjamin that a tribe be not blotted out from Israel or Isaac of the school of RMI said this teaches that a stipulation was made concerning the tribe of Benjamin that a son's daughter is not to be heir together with his brothers or Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon be the holy one blessed be he is filled with anger against anyone who does not leave a son to he is therefore here it is written and you shall cause his inheritance to pass and there it is written that day is a day of wrath such as have no changes and fear not God our Yohanan and our Joshua believe I are in dispute as to the exposition of this text one says whosoever does not leave behind a son and the other says whosoever does not leave a disciple it may he prove that it was our Yohanan who said a disciple for our Yohanan said this is the bone of my tenth son thus it is Prove that it was our Yohanan who said a disciple, but since our Yohanan said a disciple, our Joshua believe I must have said a son. Is it not a fact, however, that our Joshua believe I did not go to a house of mourning unless it was the house of him who died without leaving any sons? For it is written, but we sore for him that goeth away. And Rab Judah said in the name of Rab that this means he who goes from the world without leaving male children, but it must be our Joshua believe I who said a disciple. Since, however, it is our Joshua believe I who said a disciple, our Yohanan must have said a son. A contradiction then arises again between one statement of our Yohanan and another statement of his. There is no contradiction. One statement is his own. The other, his teachers, Nehemiah, had a poverty sage. Our Phinehas Behama gave the following exposition with reference to the scriptural text, and when had it heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Job, the captain of the host, was dead, why was? The expression of sleeping used in the case of David and that of death in the case of Job sleeping was used in the case of David because he left a son death was used in the case of Job because he left no son did not Job leave a son surely it is written of the sons of Job Obadiah the son of Jehiel but this is the reply with David who left a son like himself the expression of sleeping was used with Job who did not leave a son like himself death was used Arphine has behama gave it. Following exposition poverty in one's home is worse than fifty plagues for it is said have pity upon me have pity upon me oh yeah my friends for the hand of God hath touched me and his friends answered him take heed regard not inquiry for this hast thou chosen rather than poverty Arphine has Hama gave the following exposition whosoever has a sick
Stated this is the general rule the lineal descendants of anyone with a priority to succession take precedence if then Isaac had been alive Isaac would have taken precedence now also that Isaac himself is not alive Jacob should take precedence Mishnah the daughters of Zelophehad took three shares in the inheritance of Cain and the share of their father who was of those who came out of Egypt and his share among his brothers in the possessions of Hepher which consisted of two sins. He was a flow born son who takes two shares Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Gemara our Mishnah thus agrees with the opinion of him who said that the land of Canaan was divided according to those who came out of Egypt for it was taught our Josiah said the land of Canaan was divided according to those who came out of Egypt for it is said according to the names of the tribes of their fathers they shall inherit to what however may the verse unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance he applied unto these means like these excluding the minors are Jonathan said the land was divided according to those who entered the land for it is said unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance to what however may according to the tales of the tribes of their fathers they shall inherit he applied to the following this manner of inheritance is different from all other modes of inheritance in the world for in the case of all other successions in the world the living are heirs to the dead, but in this case the dead were heirs to the living. Rabbi said, I will give you an example to which this thing may be compared to two brothers, priests who were in one town, one had one son and the other had two sons, and these went to the threshing floor. He who has one son receives one portion, and the one who has two sons receives two portions. They then return with the three portions to their father and redivide the total in equal shares. Are Simeon B. Eliezer. Said Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrubi, the land was divided according to these and according to those in order to carry out the injunctions in those two verses. How was this affected? He who was of those who came out of Egypt received his share among those who came out of Egypt. He who was of those who entered the land received his share among those who entered the land. He who belonged to both categories received his share among both categories. The share of the spies was taken by Joshua and Caleb the murmurers and the company of Korah had no share in the land their sons however received shares by virtue of the rights of the fathers of their fathers and the rights of the fathers of their mothers what proof is there that according to the names of the tribes of their fathers was written with reference to those who came out of Egypt perhaps it was said with reference to the tribes because it is written and I will give it you for a heritage I am the Lord which means it is your inheritance from your fathers and this was addressed to those who subsequently came out of Egypt Nemotic to the Moors Elohihad and Joseph multiplied Manasseh shall be enumerated our Papa said to Abbe according to him who said that the land was divided in accordance with the number of those who came out of Egypt it is correct for scripture to say to the more thou shalt give the more inheritance and to the fewer thou shalt give the less inheritance Talmud Mas Baba Bathro, but According to him who said that the division was made in accordance with the number of those that entered the land, what purpose does the instruction to the more you shall give the more inheritance service is a difficulty? Our Papa further said to Abbe, according to him who said that the land was divided in accordance with the number of those who came out of Egypt, one can well understand why the daughters of Zelophehad complained, but according to him who said that the division was made in accordance with the number of those that entered the land, why did they complain? Surely he was not there that he should be entitled to receive a share, but their complaint was with reference to the reversion to and their right of taking a share in the possessions of Hepher. According to him who said that the land was divided in accordance with the number of those that come out of Egypt, one can well understand why the sons of Joseph complained as it is written and it. Children of Joseph spoke, but according to him who said that the division was made in accordance with the number of those that entered the land, why did they complain? Surely all of them had received their respective shares. They complained on account of the many miners they had in their tribe. They said from this it is to be inferred that there was not even one who did not receive a share in the land. For should it enter your mind to say that there was one who did not receive a share? Would he not have complained? And if it be said that scripture recorded the case of him only who complained and benefited, but did not record the case of anyone who complained and did not benefit, it may be retorted the children of Joseph surely complained and did not benefit, and yet scripture recorded their case there. It may be replied, Scripture desired to impart to us good advice, namely that a person should he on his guard against an evil eye, and this indeed is the purpose. Of what Joshua said unto them as it is written, and Joshua said unto them, If thou be a great people, get thee up to the forest. It is this that he said to them, Go and hide yourselves in the forest, so that an evil eye may have no power over you. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, they said unto him, We are of the seed of Joseph, over whom the evil eye has no power. As it is written, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine by a fountain. And Arabah said, Do not render by the fountain, but those who transcend. The I.R. Jose, son of Arhanan, said, This is inferred from the following verse, and let them grow like fishes into a multitude in the midst of the earth. This means that as the fishes in the sea are covered by the waters, and no eye has any power over them. So in the case of the seed of Joseph, no evil eye has any power over them. The share of the spies was taken by Joshua and Caleb. Whence is this derived? Will reply from the scriptural verse, which states, But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of those men what it may be asked is meant by the expression remained alive if it means that they actually remained alive surely another verse is already on record stating and there was not left a man of them save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun what then is meant by remained alive they lived on their portion the murmurers and the company of Korah had no share in the land but has it not been taught elsewhere Joshua and Caleb took the shares of the spies of the murmurers and of the company of Korah this is no difficulty one master compares the murmurers to the spies while the other master does not compare the murmurers to the spies for it was taught our father died in the wilderness refers to Zelophehad and he was not among the company of them refers to the company of the spies that gathered themselves together against the Lord refers to the murmurers in the company of Korah bears the obvious meaning Thus one master compares the murmurers to the spies and the other master does not our papa further said to Abbe but according to him who compares the murmurers to the spies have Joshua and Caleb had their shares multiplied so many times that they inherited all the land of Israel he said to him we mean the murmurers in the company of Korah our papa further said to Abbe according to him who said that the land was divided in accordance with the number of those who came out of Egypt it is correct for scripture to state and there fell tell parts to Manasseh because the six parts for the six houses of their fathers and the four parts of these are ten but according to him who said that the land was divided in accordance with the number of those who entered the land the number of the parts would only have been eight since six parts for the six fathers houses and two parts of theirs are only eight and according to your reasoning were there not nine parts only even according to him who said that the division was in accordance with the number of those who came out of Egypt all however you can say in reply is that they had also a share of one brother of their father here then also it may be said that they had the shares of two brothers of their father for it was taught thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance refers to the inheritance of their father among their father's brethren refers to the inheritance of their father's father and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them refers to the portion of the birthright our Elizabeth B. Jacob said they also took the share of their father's brother for it is said thou shalt surely give but according to him who said that they had two fathers brothers that is deduced from a possession of an inheritance our papa further said to Abbe whom does scripture enumerate if children are enumerated there were surely more than ten fathers Houses are enumerated, these were only six Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, father's houses are in fact enumerated, but scripture had taught us that the daughters of Zelophehad had also taken the portion of the birthright, consequently the land of Israel was regarded even before the conquest as if it had already been in the possession of Israel. The master stated their sons received shares by virtue of the rights of the fathers of their fathers and the rights of the fathers of their mothers. Was it not taught elsewhere by virtue of their own rights? This is no difficulty that is in agreement with him who said that the division was in accordance with the number of those who came out of Egypt. This is in agreement with him who said that the division was in accordance with the number of those who entered the land. If you like, you may say both statements are in agreement with the view that the division was in accordance with the number of those who entered the land and Yet there is no difficulty the one deals with the case of him who was twenty years of age the other with the case of him who was not yet twenty years of age since he was a firstborn son who takes two shares but why surely the estates of Hepher were only prospective and a firstborn son is not entitled to take a double share in the prospective
did not know by which kind of death he was to die and it was fitting that the section of the man who gathered sticks should have been written through Moses only the gatherer had brought guilt upon himself and it was written through him as teaches you Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be that merit is brought about by means of the meritorious and punishment for guilt by means of the guilty now if it be assumed that the land of Israel was regarded as being even before the conquest in the possession. Of those who came out of Egypt why was he in doubt he was in doubt on this very question it is written and I will give it you for a heritage I am the Lord does this mean it is for you an inheritance from your fathers or perhaps it means that they would transmit it but would not themselves ears and it was made clear to him that the text implies both it is an inheritance for you from your fathers yet you would only transmit and not yourselves inherit it and this accounts. For the scriptural text thou bringest them in and plantest them in the mountain of thine inheritance it is not written thou bringest us in but thou bringest them in this teaches that they prophesied and knew not what they prophesied and they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes and all the congregation is it possible that they stood before Moses etc and they did not say anything to them so that they had to stand before the princes and all the congregation. But the verses to be turned about and expounded is these are the words of our Josiah Abahan and said in the name of our Eliezer they were sitting in the house of study and these came and stood before all of them wherein lies their dispute one master is of the opinion that honor may he shown to a disciple in the presence of the master and the other is of the opinion that it is not to he shown and the law is that honor is to be shown and the law is that honor is not he shown surely this is a contradiction between one law and the other there is no contradiction the one refers to the case where his master shows him respect the other where his master does not it was taught the daughters of Zelophehad were wise women they were exegetes they were virtuous they must have been wise since they spoke at an opportune moment for our Samuel son of our Isaac said scripture teaches that Moses our master was sitting and holding forth an exposition on the section of Levi rate marriages as it is said if brethren dwell together they said unto him if we are to he as good as son ask give us an inheritance as to a son if not let our mother be subject to the law of Levi rate marriage and Moses immediately brought their cause before the Lord they must have been exegetes for they said if he had a son we would not have spoken but was it not taught a daughter our Jeremiah said delete daughter from here they said the explanation is that they said even if a son of his had a daughter we would not have spoken they were virtuous since they were married to such men only as were worthy of the moralizer be Jacob taught even the youngest among them was not married under 40 years of age but can this he so surely are his da said one who marries under 20 years of age beget till 60 at 20 begins till 40 at 40 does not beget any more since however they were virtuous a miracle happened in their case as in that of Joshua as it is written and there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra how could she be called daughter when she was 130 years old for our Hamabi Hannah said it was Joshua who was conceived on the way and born between the walls of Egypt for so it is written who was born to Levi in Egypt which implies that her birth was in Egypt but her conception was not in Egypt why then was she called daughter our Judah Bezi but said this teaches that marks of youth reappeared. On her the flesh of her body was again smooth, the wrinkles of old age were straightened out, and her beauty returned instead of, and he took it should have read, and he took again our Judah Bezi, but as said this teaches that he arranged for her a ceremonial of the first marriage, placing her in a bridal litter, while Aaron and Miriam sang in her honor, and ministering angels recited the joyful mother of the children further on scripture enumerates them according to their age and here. According to their wisdom, this is evidence in support of RMI for RMI said at a session priority is to be given to wisdom at a festive gathering age takes precedence. Our Ashi said this only when one is distinguished in wisdom, and that only when one is distinguished in old age, the school of our Ishmael taught the daughters of Zelophehad were all alike, for it is said, and they were implying all of them possess the same status. Rab Judah said in the name of our Samuel, the daughters of Zelophehad were given permission to be married to any of the tribes for it is said let them be married to whom they think best how then may one explain the text only into the family of the tribe of their father shall they be married scripture gave them good advice namely that they should be married only to such as are worthy of them rabbi raised an objection say unto them means to those who stood on Mount Sinai throughout your generations refers to the coming generations if fathers were mentioned why were sons also mentioned and if sons were mentioned why should fathers be mentioned because some precepts which apply to the fathers are inapplicable to the sons and some which apply to the sons are inapplicable to the fathers in the case of the fathers it is said and every daughter that posse seth an inheritance while many precepts were given to the sons and not to the fathers since therefore certain precepts apply to the fathers and not to the sons while others Apply to the sons and not to the fathers it was necessary to specify the fathers and it was also necessary to specify the sons at all events it was taught in the case of the fathers it is said and every daughter that posse seth an inheritance he raised the objection and he also replied to it with the exception he said of the daughters of Zelophehad the master said in the case of the fathers it is said and every daughter that posse seth an inheritance etc what evidence is there that this applied to the fathers and not to the sons Rabbi said scripture states this is the thing which implies this thing shall he applicable only to this generation Rabbi Zudi said to Arashi if this is the case does this is the thing said in connection with animals slaughtered outside the temple also imply that that jaw was to apply to that generation only there the case is different for it is written throughout their generations Talmud Mas Baba Bathra B does this is the thing Said in connection with the heads of the tribes also imply that that jaw was to apply to that generation only he said unto him in that case this is inferred from this that is mentioned there let this in the present case also be inferred from this mentioned there what a comparison there one may rightly compare one this to the other this because these expressions are in any case required for another comparison here however for what other purposes it needed the text could simply have omitted it altogether and one would have known that the law applied to all generations what is the other comparison just referred to it was taught this is the thing has been said here and this is the thing has also been said elsewhere just as there it was spoken to Aaron and his sons and all Israel so here it was spoken to Aaron and his sons and all Israel and just as here it was spoken to the heads of the tribes so there it was spoken to the heads of it. Tribes the master has said just as there it was spoken to Aaron and his sons and all Israel so here it was spoken to Aaron and his sons and all Israel in respect of what law has this comparison been made our Abba Jacob said to infer that the annulment of vows may be affected by three laymen but surely the heads of the tribes is written in connection with it as our Hista said in the name of our Yohanan by a qualified individual so here also it may be said by a qualified individual. It has been said just as here it was spoken to the heads of the tribes so there it was spoken to the heads of the tribes in respect of what law has this comparison been made our Shishate said to infer that the law of absolution is applicable to consecrated objects according to Beth Shammai however who maintains that the law of absolution is not applicable to consecrated objects as we learned Beth Shammai maintains that mistaken consecration is regarded as proper consecration. And Beth Hillel maintains that it is not regarded as proper consecration to what other purpose do they apply this and this the expression this is the thing used in connection with animals slaughtered outside the temple is required for the inference that one is guilty only for slaughtering but not for pinching the express sign this is the thing mentioned in connection with the heads of the tribes is required for the inference that only a sage can dissolve a vow but a husband cannot dissolve a vow only a husband can declare a vow void but a sage cannot declare it void whence does Beth Shammai who does not use the inference from the similarity of expression derive the law that the element of vows may be performed by three limb and they derive it from what was taught in the following very and Moses declared unto the children of Israel the appointed seasons of the Lord our Jose the Galilean said Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra the appointed seasons of the Lord were said but the weekly Sabbath was not said unto them Benazay said the appointed seasons of the Lord were said but the annulment of vows was not said unto them our Jose Benathan studied this very and did not know how to explain it going after our hate to Nehardia and not finding him he followed him to Mahusa where he found him he said unto him what is meant by the appointed seasons of the Lord were said but the weekly Sabbath was not said unto them it. other replied unto him this is the meaning the appointed seasons of the Lord require a proclamation by a court but the weekly Sabbath does not require a
This is the thing implies this thing shall only apply to this generation. Rabbi Barhanna said in the name of Aryohan, and it was the day on which the tribe of Benjamin was allowed to enter the congregation. This was for a time prohibited, for it is written now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. What was their exposition of us, but not of our children? Our Dimi Joseph said in the name of Arnon, and it was the day on which the dying in the wilderness had ceased. For a master said, Before the dying in the wilderness had ceased, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, there was no divine communication with Moses, for it is said, So it came to pass when all the MEM of war were consumed and dead from among the people that the Lord spoke unto me, saying, Only then said Moses, Was there speaking to me? Ola said, It was the day on which Hosea, son of Allah, removed the guards whom Jeroboam had placed on the roads to prevent Israel. From making the pilgrimages to Jerusalem, our Matina said it was the day on which the slain of Beta obtained suitable burial. For our Matina said elsewhere on the day when the slain of Beta obtained burial, the benediction who are kind and dealest kindly was instituted at Jabna who are kind was instituted because they did not decompose and dealest kindly was instituted because they obtained burial. Both Rabbah and our Joseph said it was the day on which they ceased cutting wood for the altar. It was taught our Elizer the Great said as soon as the fifteenth of arrived, the power of the sun weakened and they chopped no more wood for the altar. Our Manasseh said they called it the day of the breaking of the axe. From that day onwards, he who adds from the night to the day will also add length of days and years for himself, and he who does not add from the night to the day decreases his years. What is meant by decreases? Our Joseph learned his mother will bury him. Our Rabbis taught seven men span the life of the whole world for Methuselah saw Adam Shem saw Methuselah Jacob saw Shem Rome saw Jacob Ahijah the Shilonite saw Rome Elijah saw Ahijah the Shilonite and he is still alive and did Ahijah the Shilonite see him Rome surely it is written and there was not left a man of them save Caleb the son of Jephun and Joshua the son of Nun Arham Nun replied the decree was not directed against the tribe of Levi for it is written your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward this implies that a tribe that was numbered from twenty years old and upward came under the decree the tribe of Levi however having been numbered from thirty years old was excluded did none of the members of the other tribes enter the promised land surely it was taught Jahir the son of Manasseh and Machir the son of Manasseh were born in the days of Jacob and did not die. Before Israel entered the promised land, for it is said, and the men of the Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, and it was taught actually thirty six men. These are the words of our Judah, our Nehemiah, however, said unto him, Was it said thirty and six? Surely it was said about thirty and six, but this must refer to Jahir the son of Manasseh, who was equal to the greater part of the Sanhedrin, but said, Our Ahabi Jacob, the decree was directed neither against one who was under twenty years of age, nor against one who was over sixty years of age, it was directed neither against one under twenty years of age, for it is written from twenty years old and upward, nor against one over sixty years of age, for and upward is deduced from and upward in the section of valuations as there one over sixty years of age is like one under twenty years of age, so here one over sixty years of age is like one who is under twenty years of age. The question was raised was the land of Israel. Divided according to the number of the tribes, or was it perhaps divided according to the number of the head s of the men Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, come and here according to the lot shall their inheritance be divided, whether many or few. Furthermore, it was taught the land of Israel will in time to come be divided between thirteen tribes, for at first it was only divided among twelve tribes and was divided only according to monetary values, as it said, whether many or few are Judah said a Sei in Judea is worth five Sei in Galilee, and it was only divided by lot, for it is said, notwithstanding the land shall be divided by lot, and it was only divided by the direction of the Urim and Tumim, for it is said, according to the speaking of the lot, how could this be done? Eliezer was wearing the Urim and Tumim while Joshua and all Israel stood before him, and urn containing the names of the twelve tribes, and an urn containing descriptions of the boundaries were placed. Before him animated by the Holy Spirit he gave directions exclaiming Zebulun is coming up and the boundary lines of Akko are coming up with it thereupon he shook while the urn of the tribes and Zebulun came up in his hand likewise he shook while the urn of the boundaries and the boundary lines of Akko came up in his hand animated again by the Holy Spirit he gave directions exclaiming Naphtali is coming up and the boundary lines of Genesar are coming up with it thereupon he shook while the urn of the tribes and Naphtali came up in his hand he likewise shook while the box of the boundaries and the boundary lines of Genesar came up in his hand and so was the procedure with every other tribe and the division in the world to come will not be like the division in this world in this world should a man possess a cornfield he does not possess an orchard should he possess an orchard he does not possess a cornfield but in the world to come there will he no single individual who will not possess land in mountain lowland and valley for it is said the gate of Reuben one the gate of Judah one the gate of Levi one the holy one blessed be he himself will divide it among them for it is said and these are their portions saith the Lord God at all events it was taught here that at first the land was only divided among twelve tribes from which it may be inferred that the division was in accordance with the number of the tribes this proves that the master has said the land of Israel will in time to come be divided among thirteen tribes for whom is that extra portion are his said for the prince for it is written and he that serves the city the out of all the tribes of Israel shall serve him our papa said to have a might it not be said to refer merely to public service this cannot be assumed at all for it is written and the residue shall be for the prince on the one side and on the other of the holy offering and of the possession of the city and it was divided only according to monetary values as it is said whether many or few in what respect if it be suggested that compensation was to be given in respect of lands of superior and inferior quality it could be retorted are we discussing fools but this is the explanation in respect of an estate that was near and one that was distant this is in accordance with the opinion of one of the following Tanay Marilizer said compensation was given in money our Joshua said compensation was given in land and it was only divided by law for it is said notwithstanding the land shall be divided by law Tanay taught notwithstanding by law Joshua and Caleb being excluded in what respect if it be suggested that they did not take any portion at all it might be retorted if they took that which was not theirs could there be any question as to whether they should take what was theirs but this means that they did not receive their shares by lot but by the Command of the Lord Joshua for it is written according to the commandment of the Lord they gave him the city which he asked even to Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra it is written Sarah and it is also written Harry Sarah Eliezer said at first its fruits were as dry as a pot's herd and afterwards its fruits emitted all offensive odor others say at first they emitted an offensive odor and afterwards they were as dry as a pot's herd Caleb for it is written and they gave Hebron unto Caleb as Moses had spoken and he drove out thence the three sons of Anak was not Hebron a city of refuge Abbe replied its suburbs were given to Caleb for it is written but the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave they to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for his possession mission of both a son and a daughter have equal rights of succession except that a son when firstborn takes a double portion in the estate of his father but does not take it in the estate of his Mother daughters must be maintained out of the estate of their deceased father, but not out of the estate of their deceased mother. Tomorrow, what is meant by both a son and a daughter have equal rights of succession? If it is suggested that the meaning is that they have equal status in heirship, surely it may be retorted. We have learned a son takes precedence over a daughter, and all lineal descendants of a son take precedence over a daughter. Our nom and B. Isaac replied, It is this that was meant. Both a son and a daughter are equally entitled to take their shares in a prospective estate of the deceased, as in that which is in his possession at the time of his death. Surely we have learned this also. The daughters of Zelophehad took three shares in the inheritance of Cain and the share of their father, who was of those who came out of Egypt, and his share among his brothers in the possessions of Heber. Furthermore, what is the force of except but said our papa, it is this that. Was meant both a son and a daughter are entitled to take the prospective portion of the birthright of their father. Surely we have learnt this also since he was a firstborn son who takes two shares. Furthermore, what is the force of except but said Arashi? It is this that was meant as regards
He is co-heir with five as in the case of inheriting his share with one brother he receives twice as much as the one so in the case when he inherits his share with five brothers he should also receive only twice as much as one or perhaps argue this way let his share when he is co-heir with one brother be compared with his share when co-heir with five brothers as his share when co-heir with one is a double portion in all the estate so is the case when he inherits his share. With five he should also receive a double portion in all the estate it was expressly taught and it shall be in the day that he causeth his sons to inherit the Torah thus assign the greater portion to the brothers consequently the deduction is not to be made according to the second proposition but according to the first furthermore it is said and the sons of Reuben the firstborn of Israel for he was the firstborn but for as much as he defiled his father's couch his birthright was given. Unto the sons of Joseph the son of Israel yet not so that he was to be reckoned in the genealogy of firstborn furthermore it is said for Judah prevailed above his brethren and of him came he that is the prince but the birthright was Joseph's birthright was set in relation to Joseph and birthright was set in relation to coming generations just as the birthright that was set in relation to Joseph consisted in his receiving a portion twice as much as any one of the others so that birthright that was set in relation to the coming generations is to consist in the receiving of a portion twice as much as any one of the others furthermore it is said moreover I have given thee one portion above thy brethren which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow did he take it with his sword and with his bow surely it has already been said for I trust not in my bow neither can my sword save me but my sword means prayer and my bow means Supplication what need was there for quoting the several scriptural verses in case you should suggest that that verse was required for the indication that the law is in accordance with the view of our Yohanan be Baraka come and hear the verse and the sons of Reuben the firstborn of Israel and in case you should suggest that birthright from his birthright may not be deduced come and hear the verse but the birthright was Joseph's and in case you should say once is it proved that Joseph himself received twice as much as any one of the others come and hear the verse moreover I have given thee one portion above thy brethren our Papa said to Abay might it not be suggested that Joseph received merely a palm tree he replied unto him for your sake scripture said Ephraim and Manasseh even as Reuben and Simeon shall be mine our hellbow inquired of our Samuel be Namani what reason did Jacob see for taking away the birthright from Reuben and giving it to Joseph what did he see surely it is written for as much as he defiled his father's couch but this is the question what reason did he see for giving it to Joseph let me give you a parable this thing may be compared to a host who brought up an orphan at his house after a time that orphan became rich and declared I would let the host have some benefit from my wealth he said unto him but had not Reuben since Jacob would not have bestowed upon Joseph any benefit at all but our Jonathan your master did not say so the birthright he said should have emanated from Rachel as it is written these are the generations of Jacob Joseph but Leah anticipated her with her prayers for mercy on account however of the modesty which was characteristic of Rachel the Holy One blessed he restored it to her what was it that caused Leah to anticipate her with her supplications for mercy it is written and the eyes of Leah were weak what is meant by weak if it is suggested that the meaning is that her Eyes were actually weak as this it may be asked conceivable if scripture did not speak disparagingly of an unclean animal for it is written of the clean beasts and of the beasts that are not clean would scripture speak disparagingly of the righteous but said our Eliezer the meaning of raucous is that her bounties were extensive rap said her eyes were indeed actually weak but that was no disgrace to her but a credit for at the crossroads she heard people saying Rebecca has two sons and Laban has two daughters the elder daughter should be married to the elder son and the younger daughter should be married to the younger son and she sat at the crossroads and inquired how does the elder one conduct himself and the answer came that he was a wicked man a highway robber how does the younger man conduct himself a quiet man dwelling in tents and she wept until her eyelashes dropped and this accounts for the scriptural text and the Lord saw that Leah was hated what could be the meaning of hated if it is suggested that it means that she was actually hated surely it may be retorted is this conceivable if scripture did not speak disparagingly of an unclean animal would it speak disparagingly of the righteous but the meaning is this the holy one blessed be he saw that Esau's conduct was hateful to her so he opened her womb wherein did Rachel's modesty lie it is written and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebecca's son was he not the son of her father's sister but he said to her will you marry me and she replied to him yes but father is a sharper and you will not be able to hold your own against him wherein he asked her does his sharp dealing lie I have she said a sister who is older than I and he will not allow me to be married before her I am his brother he said to her in sharp dealing but she said to him may the righteous indulge in sharp dealing yes he replied with the pure Scripture says thou dost show thyself pure and with the crooked thou dost show thyself subtle thereupon he entrusted her with certain identification marks while Leah was being led into the bridal chamber she thought my sister will now be disgraced and so she entrusted her with these very marks and this accounts for the scriptural text and it came to pass in the morning that behold it was Leah which seems to imply that until then she was not Leah but this is the explanation on account of the identification marks which Jacob had entrusted to Rachel who had entrusted them to Leah he knew not who she was until that moment Abba Halifa of Kiryu inquired of Arhai B. Abba with regard to those who entered Egypt with Jacob why do you find the number 70 in their total and only 70 minus 1 in their detailed enumeration he said unto him a twin sister was born with Dinah for it is written with Eth his daughter Dinah but if so was there also a Twin sister with Benjamin for it is written Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be with F. Benjamin his brother his mother's son he said I possess the precious pearl and you seek to deprive me of it thus said Arhamabi Hanan it was Jochebed who was conceived on the way and born between the walls of Egypt for it is said who was born to Levi in Egypt which implies that her birth was in Egypt but her conception was not in Egypt our Helbo inquired of our Samuel bin Amani it is written and it came to pass. When Rachel had born Joseph etc why just when Joseph was born he replied to him Jacob our father saw that Esau's seed would be delivered only into the hands of Joseph's seed for it is said and the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble etc he pointed out to him the following objection and David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day he replied to him he who taught you the prophets did not teach you the Writings for it is written as he went to Ziklag there fell to him of Manasseh Abba and Josabad and Jeiel and Michael and Josabad and Elihu and Zilithi captains of thousands that were of Manasseh are Joseph raised an objection and some of them even of the sons of Simeon five hundred men went to Mount Seir having for their captains Palatia and Miriah and Raphai and Uziel the sons of Ishi and they smote the remnant of the Amalekites that escaped and dwelt there unto this day Rabbi. Sheila replied Ishi descended from the sons of Manasseh for it is written and the sons of Manasseh were Heber and Ishi are rabbis taught the firstborn son of a priest takes a double portion in the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw consecrated objects and in the natural appreciation of an estate that accrued after the death of the father how is this to be understood if their father had bequeathed to them a cow that was rented out to others for half profit or given on hire. At a fixed rate or feeding in the meadow and it gave birth to a firstling he takes in it a double portion but if they built houses or planted vineyards the firstborn does not take in them a double portion how is one to understand the statement about the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw if these were already in the possession of their father it is obvious that the firstborn is to take a double portion and if they were not already in the possession of their father at the time of his death this is a case of prospective property and surely a firstborn does not take a double portion in prospective property as he does in that which was in the actual possession of his father at the time of his death the lawyer relates to the case where the givers were acquaintances of the priest and the beast was ritually killed in the lifetime of the father and the tana holds that the priestly gifts are regarded as already given even though they have not actually been given consecrated things surely are not as the lawyer relates to consecrated objects of a minor degree and it is in accordance with the view of our Jose the Galilean who holds that they are the property of the owner for it was taught and committed trespass against the Lord and deal falsely with his neighbor etc includes consecrated things of a minor degree which are the property of the owner these are the words of our Jose the Galilean if their father had bequeathed to them a cow that was rented out
Collected debt if a bond of indebtedness were a debt incurred by the father was produced against them the firstborn must pay a double portion of the debt if however he said I neither give nor take the double portion he is allowed to do so what is the reason for the opinion of the rabbi scripture says giving him a double portion that all merciful has thus called it a gift as a gift does not become his until it comes into his possession so the portion of the birthright does not become his until it comes into his father's possession but rabbi maintains since scripture says a double portion the portion of the birthright is to be compared to the ordinary portion as the ordinary portion is his although it has not yet come into his father's possession so is the portion of the birthright although it has not yet come into his possession but as to the rabbis also surely it is written a double portion that expression indicates that the two portions to be Given to him or to adjoin one another, but as to Rabbi also surely it is written giving him that expression is to indicate that if he said I neither take nor give the double portions he is permitted to do so. Our Papa said in the case where a young palm tree was bequeathed and it became stronger or a plot of it and it produced alluvial soil, all agree that the firstborn takes a double portion. The dispute only relates to the case where half are turned into well developed heirs. Of corn or where undeveloped dates turned into fully developed dates. One master is of the opinion that this is regarded as natural appreciation, and the other master as hold the opinion that this is a case of complete transformation. Rabbi Bihana said in the name of our high he who acts in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi is acting correctly, and he who acts in accordance with the opinion of the sages is acting correctly. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra before he was in doubt as to. Whether the halacha is in accordance with the decision of rabbi when it is in opposition to that of his colleague but not when it is opposed to that of his colleagues or is the halacha in accordance with rabbi when in opposition to his colleague and even when he is opposed to his colleagues are and said in the name of rabbi is forbidden to act in accordance with the decision of rabbi for he holds the opinion that the halacha is in accordance with rabbi when in opposition to his colleague but not when he is opposed to his colleagues are in his own name however said it is permitted to act in accordance with the decision of rabbi for he holds the opinion that the halacha is in accordance with rabbi when in opposition to his colleague and even when opposed to his colleagues rabbi said it is forbidden to act in accordance with the decision of rabbi but if one did act accordingly his action is legally valid for he is of the opinion that at the College it was said that they were only inclined in favor of the opinion of the rabbis Arnaman learned in the other books of the school of rabbis all that he had excludes the appreciation of an estate which the heirs have produced after the death of their father but in the natural appreciation of the estate that accrued after the death of their father he does take a double portion and who is the author of the statement it is Rabbi Rami Bihama learned in the other books of the school of rabbis all that he had excludes the natural appreciation of an estate that accrued after the death of their father and much less is he entitled to take a double portion in the appreciation which the heirs produced after the death of their father and who is the author of the statement the rabbis Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel a firstborn son does not take a double portion in a loan according to whom was the statement required if it is suggested according to the rabbis it may be retorted if the rabbis maintain that an appreciation which accrues to his possession the firstborn takes no double portion is there any need to state that he takes no double portion in a loan but the statement was required according to rabbi who then was the author of what has been taught if they inherited a bond of indebtedness the firstborn takes a double portion both in the loan and in the interest neither rabbi nor the rabbis the statement may indeed be required according to the view of the rabbis for it might have been assumed that in the matter of a loan since he is in possession of the bond the debt is regarded as collected hence the law had to be stated a message was sent from palestine the firstborn takes a double portion in a loan but not in its interest according to whom is this law if it is suggested that it is according to the rabbis it may be retorted if the rabbis maintain that in an appreciation which Accrues to his possession the firstborn is not to take a double portion is there any question as to whether he takes a double portion in a loan but the statement is according to rabbi does not the firstborn however according to rabbi take a double portion in the interest also surely it was taught rabbi said a firstborn takes a double portion both in a loan and in its interest this is really in accordance with the rabbis but a loan is regarded as collected arahabi rab said to rabbin omimar once happened to come to our place and gave the following exposition a firstborn takes a double portion in a loan but not in its interest he said to him the scholars of nihartia follow their own view for our and said if land was collected for the debt the firstborn has no double portion if money was collected he has it but rabbi said if money was collected he has no double portion if land was collected he has said to rabbi following you there is a difficulty following Arnam and there is a difficulty following you. There is this difficulty Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra, what is the reason why he does not take a double portion if money was collected? Is it not because their father did not bequeath that particular money in the case of land? Also, their father surely did not bequeath that land. Furthermore, you, O Master, have said that the reason of the Palestinians is logical for if the grandmother had sold her estate. Before her death, her sale would have been valid following Arnam and there is this difficulty. What is the reason why he does not take a double portion when land was collected? Is it not because their father did not bequeath that land in the case of money? Also, their father did not bequeath that money. Furthermore, surely Arnam and said in the name of Rabbi Abba, if orphans collected a plot of land for their father's death, the creditor may recollect it from them. You reply to him. There is no difficulty according to me nor is there any difficulty according to our nom and we were stating the reason of the Palestinians but we ourselves do not hold this opinion what was the story of the grandmother once a certain person said to them Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be my estate is bequeathed to my grandmother and after her demise to my ears he had a married daughter who died during the lifetime of her husband and the lifetime of her grandmother after the grandmother died the husband came to claim the estate Arhuna said to my ears implies even to the ears of my ears and Arain and said to my ears implies but not to the ears of my ears a message was sent from Palestine the law is in accordance with the statement of Arain and but not because of his reason the law is in accordance with the statement of Arain and that the husband is not to be the ear but not because of his reason for whereas Arain holds the opinion that even though his daughter had a son he would not be heir the law is not so for had his daughter had a son he would certainly have been heir the reason why the husband is not heir is this because the estate was prospective property and the husband is not entitled to receive a prospective property as a property which is already in the possession of his wife at the time of her death does this imply that Arhuna holds the opinion that a husband is entitled to receive of the prospective property of his wife as of that which is already in her possession at the time of her death our Eliezer said the subject began with the great and ended with the small Arhuna's reason is this whosoever says another person shall be my heir after you is regarded as one who said that person shall be my heir from now Rabbi said the reason given by the Palestinians is logical for had the grandmother sold the estate prior to her demise the sale would have been legally valid our Papa said the law is that a husband does not receive of the prospective estate of his wife as of that which is in her possession and the firstborn son does not receive of the prospective estate of his father as of that which is in his father's possession the firstborn son furthermore does not receive a double portion in a loan owing to his father whether the heirs had collected in payment land or whether they had collected money Talmud, Mas Baba Bathray and in the case of a loan that is with him it portion of the birthright is to be divided between him and the other heirs Arhuna said in the name of R.C. if the firstborn son had protested against the proposed improvements in the bequeathed estate his protest is valid Rabbi said the law of R.C. stands to reason in the case where grapes were cut or where olives were plucked but where these were pressed the firstborn does not receive a double portion but R. Joseph said even if they were pressed if you said they were Pressed surely at first they were grapes now they turned into wine as Arak Babi Hamma said elsewhere compensation is to be paid to him for any damaged grapes so here also compensation is paid to him for any damaged grapes in what connection was the statement of Arak Babi Mama made in connection with what Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel where a father bequeathed to a firstborn and to an ordinary son grapes which they cut or olives which they plucked the firstborn receives a double portion even if they press the grapes if they press the grapes it was asked were these not first grapes and now they are turned into wine to this Arak Babi Mama replied compensation is paid to him for any damaged grapes R.C. said if a firstborn son accepted a share of a field equal to that of any other
The dates of the buyers the latter beat then is it not enough said the orphans relatives to them that you bought up their property but you must also beat them they came before Rabba and he said to them the sale is invalid Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi one master holds the opinion that Rabba's meaning was that the sale of a part only of the estate was invalid and the other master holds the opinion that Rabba's meaning was that the entire sale was invalid a message was sent from Palestine if a firstborn son had sold his share before the division of the estate took place that sale is invalid this shows that the firstborn is not regarded as the legal possessor of his share before distribution had taken place and the law is that the firstborn is the possessor of his share even before distribution of the estate had taken place Marzitra of Derich but divided a basket of pepper with his brothers in equal shares when he came before Arashi the latter said to him since you have renounced your rights in a part of the estate you have implicitly renounced them in all of it mishnah if anyone said my firstborn son shall not receive a double portion or x my son shall not be here with his brothers his instructions are disregarded because he made a stipulation which is contrary to what is written in the Torah if one distributed his property verbally and gave to one son more and to another one less or if he assigned to the firstborn a share equal to that of his brothers his arrangements are valid if however he said as an inheritance his instructions are disregarded if he wrote either at the beginning or the middle or the end as a gift his instructions are valid gemara must it be said that our mishnah is not in accordance with our judah for if it be suggested that it is in accordance with our judah surely he said it may be asked that in money matters one stipulation is valid for it was taught if a man said to a woman, Behold, thou art consecrated unto me on condition that thou shalt have no claim upon me for food, rhyme, and conjugal rights. She is consecrated, but the stipulation is null. These are the words of our Mayor Arjuda said in respect of the money matters. His stipulation is valid. Our mission may be said to be in agreement even with the view of Arjuda. Only there she knew his conditions and renounced her privilege, but here the son did not renounce his privileges. Our Joseph said, If one said X is my firstborn son, the latter is to receive a double portion, but if he said X is a firstborn, the latter is not to receive a double portion, for he may have meant the firstborn son of his mother. A certain person once came before Rabbi Barhana and said to him, I am certain that this man is a firstborn. He said to him, Once do you know this because his father called him foolish firstborn? He might have been the firstborn of his mother only because. The firstborn of a mother is also called foolish firstborn. A certain person once came before our Hannah and said to him, I am certain that this man is firstborn. He said to him, Once do you know this? The other replied to him, Because when people came to his father, he used to say to them, Go to my son Shikath, who is firstborn, and his spittle heals. Might he not have been the firstborn of his mother? Only there is a tradition that the spittle of the firstborn of a father is healing, but that of the firstborn of a mother is not healing. Our I said, A tum tum firstborn who having been operated upon was found to be a male does not receive a double portion, as therefore scripture says, And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, which implies that he cannot be regarded as firstborn unless he was a son at the beginning of his being, our nom and B. Isaac said, Neither is he tried as a stubborn and rebellious son, for scripture says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which Implies that he must have been a son at the beginning of his being Talmud, Mas Baba Badra Omimar said, Nor does he reduce the portion of the birthright, for it is said, and they have borne him sons, which implies that he must have been a son at the time of his birth. Arshezbai said, Nor is he circumcised on the eighth day of his birth, for scripture said, If in woman be delivered and bear a man child, and in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, which implies that he must be a male at the time of his birth. Arshezbai said, Nor is his mother Levitically unclean on account of his birth, for scripture said, If in woman be delivered and bear a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days, which implies that she is not unclean unless he was a male at the time of his birth. An objection was raised, it was taught if a woman miscarried a tum tum or an androgynous, she must continue in her Levitical uncleanness and cleanness as for both a male and a Female is not this an objection to the statement of Arsh Arabia, this is an objection may it be suggested that this is also all objection against the statement of Arshes by the Tana may have been in doubt and consequently he imposed a double restriction if so it should have been stated that she should continue in her uncleanness for a male and for a female and for her menstruation this is a difficulty Rabbah said it was taught in agreement with the view of RMI the expression. A son implies but not a tum tum the expression of firstborn implies but not a doubtful case the statement in son but not a tum tum can well be explained in accordance with the view of RMI but what does the statement of firstborn but not a doubtful case exclude it excludes the opinion arrived at through Rabbah's exposition for Rabbah gave the following exposition if two women gave birth respectively to two male children in a hiding place these may write out an authorization for. One another our papa said to Rabbi Shirley Rabin had sent a message stating this question I have asked of all my teachers but they told me nothing the following however was reported in the name Arjan A if they were identified and afterwards they were exchanged they may give written authorization to one another if they were not identified they may not give written authorization to one another subsequently Rabbi appointed Amora by his side and made the following exposition would have told you was an error but this indeed has been reported in the name of Arjan A if they were identified and afterwards they were exchanged they may give written authorization to one another if they were not identified they may not give written authorization to one another the men of Akriti Agama addressed the following inquiry to Samuel will our master instruct us as to what is the law in the case where one was generally held to be a firstborn son but his father declared that another son was the firstborn he sent to them the following reply they may write on an authorization Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra be for one another what is really your opinion on the matter if Samuel holds the same view as the rabbis he should have sent word to them according to the rabbis if he holds the same view as our Judah he should have sent word to them according to our Judah he was in doubt as to whether the law is according to our Judah or according to the rabbis what is that dispute it was. Taught he shall acknowledge implies he shall be entitled to acknowledge him before others from this our Judah deduce that a person is believed when he declares the son of mine is firstborn and as a person is believed when he declares the son of mine is firstborn so one is believed when one declares this is the son of a divorced woman or this is the son of a Haliza, but the sages say he is not believed Arnam and B. Isaac said to Rabbah according to our Judah it is correct for scripture to say he Shall acknowledge according to the rabbis, however, what need is there for the expression he shall acknowledge when acknowledgement is required in what legal respect as regards giving him a double portion should he even be regarded as but a stranger could he not give it to him if he desired to make a gift of it. This is required only in the case where property has come into his possession afterwards, but according to our mayor who said a man may give possession of a thing that has not come into existence, what need is there for he shall acknowledge it is needed for the case where property came into his possession while he was dying. Our rabbis taught where a son was held to be a firstborn and his father declared another son to be the firstborn, the father is believed where however a son was held not to be a firstborn and his father declared him to be a firstborn, the father is not believed the first clause harmonizes with the view of Arjuda and the last clause. Harmonizes with that of the rabbis are Yohanan said if a person declared this is my son and then retracted and declared he is my slave he is not believed if however he said he is my slave and then he retracted and declared he is my son he is believed for he may mean who attends upon me as a slave this law however is reversed when the statements were made at a custom house if when passing the custom house he declared this is my son and then he retracted and said he is my slave he is to be believed if however he declared he is my slave and then he retracted and said he is my son he is not believed an objection was raised it was taught if a man attended upon another as a son and the latter came before the court and declared he is my son and then he retracted and stated he is my slave he is not believed if however he attended upon him as a slave and the latter came to the court and declared he is my slave and then he retracted and stated he is my son he is not Believed Arnam and B. Isaac replied the case there refers to one whom he called a slave of a rope of a hundred. What is meant by a rope of a hundred? A rope of a slave who is worth a hundred zoos. Arabah sent to our Joseph Behama. If one says to another, You stole my slave, and the other says, I did not steal him. And when the first inquires, In what capacity is he with you? The latter replies, You sold him to me, Talmud. Mas Baba Batra, you gave him to me as a gift, but if you wish, take an oath, and you will get
First degree also Marsan of Arashi permitted a grandson to act as witness for his father's father. The law, however, is not in accordance with the view of Marsan of Arashi. Our Abbas sent to our Joseph Bihama if a person possessed evidence in one's favor in the matter of a plot of land before he became blind and then became blind, he is disqualified. Samuel, however, said he is permitted to give evidence since it is possible for him to gauge the extent of its boundaries. But in the case of a cloak, he is not to be admitted as witness. Our Shis said even in the case of a cloak, his evidence is admissible for it is possible for him to gauge the measurements of its length and of its breadth. But not in the case of a bar of metal. Our Papa said even in the case of a bar of metal, for it is possible for him to gauge its weight. An objection was raised if a person possessed evidence affecting another before he became his son-in-law and subsequently he became his son-in-law. Or if that witness had the faculty of hearing and became deaf, the faculty of seeing and became blind, sane and became insane, he is disqualified from giving evidence. If, however, he possessed evidence affecting him before he became his son-in-law, and when he became his son-in-law, his daughter died. Or if he had the faculty of hearing, became deaf and regained his hearing. Or if he had the faculty of seeing, became blind and regained his eyesight. Or if he was sane, became insane and regained his sanity. In all these cases, he is qualified to act as witness. This is the general rule. Whenever his beginning or his end was under a disqualification, he is disqualified. But whenever his beginning and his end find him in a suitable condition, he is permitted to give evidence. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, be this surely presents an objection against all of them. This is indeed an objection. Our Abbas sent to our Joseph Bihama. If one said something concerning a child among his sons, he is to be. Trusted and our Yohanan said he is not to be trusted. What does this mean? Abbe replied, it is this that was meant if one said concerning a child among his sons that he shall be heir to all his estate, he is to be trusted in accordance with the view of our Yohanan be Baraka and our Yohanan said that he is not to be trusted in accordance with the view of the rabbis. Rabbah pointed out a difficulty if that is the meaning why the expressions trusted and not trusted he shall be heir and he shall not be heir should have been the expressions used, but said Rabbah, it is this that was meant if one said concerning a child among his sons that he was the firstborn, he is to be trusted in accordance with the view of our Judah and our Yohanan said that he was not to be trusted in accordance with the view of the rabbis. Our Abbas sent to our Joseph Behemoth if one said, Let my wife receive a share in my estate as any one of my sons, she is to receive a share like any one of the sons, Rabbah said. But only in the property which he had in his possession at that time and among the sons who may appear subsequently are Abbas sent to our Joseph Behama in the case when one produces a bond of indebtedness against another and the lender states I received no payment at all and the borrower pleads I have paid a half while witnesses testify that all the debt was paid that borrower must take an oath and the lender collects the other half from the borrower's free property but not from that which has been disposed of for the buyers or the creditors can say we rely upon the witness and even according to our Akiva who said that he is to be treated in the same way as one who returns a lost object these words apply only to the case where there are no witnesses but where there are witnesses his admission may be due to the fact that he is simply afraid Marsan of Arashi pointed out a difficulty on the contrary even according to our Simeon B. Eliezer who said in the case Mentioned that he is to be treated as one who admits part of the claim. These words, it may be argued, are applicable only to the case where there are no witnesses who support him, but where there are witnesses who support him, he should certainly be treated as one who returns a lost object. Marzitra taught in the name of Arshai Mabi Ashi. The law in the case of all these reported statements is in accordance with the messages which Arabah sent to our Joseph Bihama Rabbah said to Arashi. What about the law of Arnaman? He replied to him, We learned that message of Arabah as they may not be seized, and so said Arnaman. What then does the declaration of the law exclude Talmud? Mas Baba Bathra, if its purpose is to exclude Rabbah's law, surely he merely adds to that of Arabah. If to exclude the law of Marsan of Arashi, surely it has already been stated that the law is not according to Marsan of Arashi. If to exclude the laws of Samuel and Arshi's hate and our Papadu. These surely objections have already been raised, but this is the object of the declaration to exclude the law of our Yohanan and that which was to be implied by the difficulty of Marsan of Arashi if one distributed his property verbally and gave to one son more and to another one less, etc. How is one to understand the giving of a gift at the beginning in the middle or at the end when Ardimi came? He stated in the name of our Yohanan, if one wrote, let a certain field be given to X. And he shall inherit it. This is called a gift at the beginning. If he wrote, let him inherit it, and it shall be given to him. This is called a gift at the end. Let him inherit it, and let it be given to him, so that he may inherit it. This is a gift in the middle. This law is only applicable to the case of one person and one field, but not to the case of one person and two fields, or one field and two persons. Our Eliezer said the same law applies even to the case of one person and two. Fields or one field and two persons. The law, however, is not applicable in the case of two fields and two persons. When Rabin came, he said, In the case where one road let this field be given to X and let Y inherit that other field, our Yohanan said he acquires possession, and our Eliezer said he does not acquire possession. Said Abed to Rabin, You have given us satisfaction in one respect and cause for demurring in another, for as regards the apparent contradiction between the statement of our Eliezer and the other statement of his one can well explain that there is no real difficulty since one statement may be said to refer to the case of one person and two fields and the other to two persons and two fields. The contradiction, however, between the first statement of our Yohanan and his second one presents a difficulty. We are wrong in dispute as to which were the views of our Yohanan. Reshlakish, however, said no possession is ever acquired unless the Testator had said, Let X and Y inherit this and that particular field which I had assigned to them as a gift so that they may inherit them. The following Amram are in the same dispute as that of those mentioned. Our Hamnan said the law that possession is acquired was only taught in the case of one person and one field, but not in the case of one person and two fields, or one field and two persons. And Arnaman said the same law applies even to the case of one person and two fields, or one field and two persons, but not to that of two fields and two persons. And Arshis hate said possession is acquired even in the case of two fields and two persons. Arshis hate said, I derive my decision from the following very If one said, Give my children a shekel a week and they require a sella, a sella is to be given to them. If however he said, Give them no more than a shekel, only a shekel is to be given to them. But if he gave instructions that if these die Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi. Others shall be his heirs in their stead. Only a shekel a week is to be given to them. Whether he used the expression give or give no more now here, surely it is a case similar to that of two fields and two persons, and yet it is taught that possession is acquired. He raised this as an objection to the opinions of his colleagues, and he himself gave the reply. The very that deals with such persons as are entitled to be his heirs, and this law is in agreement with the law of our Yohanan B. Barak Arashi said, Come and hear if a person said, I give my estate to you, and after you X shall be my heir, and after X Y shall be heir. When the first dies, the second acquires the ownership. When the second dies, the third acquires the ownership, and if the second died in the lifetime of the first, the estate reverts to the heirs of the first. Now here, surely the case resembles that of two fields and two persons, and yet it was taught that possession is acquired, and if it be suggested that here also one deals with the case of one who is entitled to be his heir and that it is in accordance with the view of our Yohanan B. Baraka. If so, the question arises how can it be said that if the second died the third acquired possession surely our Aha the son of Aruha sent the following message according to the view of our Yohanan B. Baraka. If one said my estate shall be yours and after you it shall be given to X and the first is one who is entitled to be his heir the second has no claim whatsoever in face of the first for this is not a specific expression of gift but rather of inheritance and an inheritance cannot be terminated is not this then a refutation of the views of all of them this is a refutation may this be regarded also as a refutation of the view of Rush Lakish. how can you think so did not Rabba say the law is in accordance with the views of Rush Lakish. in these three cases this is no difficulty for here the expressions of gift and Inheritance may have been uttered one immediately after the other. There, the two expressions may not have been uttered one immediately after the other, and the laws that expressions uttered immediately after one another are always regarded as having been uttered simultaneously, except in the
maintains that even another legal heir may be appointed where there is a daughter and that a daughter may be appointed as heir where there is a son it may be retorted surely it has been taught our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said there was no dispute between father and the sages concerning the law that one's instructions are invalid when another legal heir was appointed where there was a daughter or where a daughter was appointed heir where there was a son there. Dispute related only to the case of an appointment as sole heir of a son among other sons or of a daughter among other daughters in which case father said the one appointed inherits and the sages say that he does no inherit if you wish it may be replied since he said that they did not dispute it may be inferred that the first tana is of the opinion that they did dispute and if you prefer it may be replied that all the mission represents the views of our Yohanan B. Baraka only some words are missing from the text which should read as follows if a person said X shall be my heir where there is a daughter or if he said my daughter shall be my heir where there is a son his instructions are to be disregarded but in the case of the appointment as heir of a daughter among other daughters or of a son among other sons if the father said that one of them should inherit all his estate his instruction is legally valid for our Yohanan said if a person said it concerning one who is entitled to be his immediate heir his instructions are legally valid our Judah said in the name of Samuel the Halashah is in agreement with the view of our Yohanan B. Baraka and so said Rabbah the Halashah is in agreement with the view of our Yohanan B. Baraka Rabbah said what is the reason for the opinion of our Yohanan B. Baraka scripture said then it shall be in the day that he causeth his sons to inherit from which it is to be inferred that the Torah Gave authority to a father to cause anyone whom he desires to inherit his estate. Abbe said to him, This law surely could be deduced from he may not make the son of the beloved the firstborn. That text is required for the purpose of another inference, as it was taught Abbe and said in the name of our Elizer Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, what need was there for scripture to say he may not make the son of the beloved the firstborn, since it was said that it should be in the day that he causeth his sons to inherit. One might argue that it is a matter of logical deduction, thus, if in the case of an ordinary son who is privileged to receive a share in any prospective property of his father, as in that which is actually in his possession, the Torah nevertheless gave authority to the father to transmit his estate to him, so ever he pleases, how much more should he have this right in the case of the firstborn whose rights are impaired in that he does not receive the portion? Of the birthright in prospective property is in that which is actually in the possession of his father, hence it was expressly stated he may not make the son of the beloved the firstborn. Then let scripture say he may not make the son of the beloved the firstborn. Why should it also state that it shall be in the day that he causeth his sons to inherit? Because one might argue is not this a matter of logical deduction if in the case of the firstborn whose rights are impaired in that he does not receive the portion of his birthright in prospective property is in that which is actually in his father's possession. The Torah nevertheless said he may not make the son of the beloved the firstborn. How much less should he have this right in the case of an ordinary son who is privileged to receive in prospective property is in that which is actually in his father's possession? Hence it was expressly stated that it shall be in the day that he causeth his son to inherit. In order to make it clear that the Torah gave a father authority to transmit his estate to whomsoever he pleases, our Zerika said in the name of Rmi, in the name of Arhana, in the name of Arjane, in the name of Rabbi, the Halachah is in agreement with the views of our Yohanan B. Baraka. Our Abba said to him the statement was that he only gave such a decision wherein lies the difference. One master holds that an Halachah is preferable and the other master holds that a practical decision is of greater importance. Our rabbis taught the Halachah may not be derived either from theoretical conclusion or from a practical decision unless one has been told that the Halachah is to be taken as a rule for practical decisions. Once a person has asked and was informed that an Halachah was to be taken as a guide for practical decisions, he may continue to give practical decisions accordingly provided he draws no comparisons. What could be meant by provided he draws no? Comparisons surely in the entire domain of the Torah comparisons are made. Arashi said it is this that was meant provided one draws no comparisons in ritual questions relating to Trifath for it was taught in the laws of Trifath it must not be said this one is equal to that and do not be astonished that this for an animal may be cut on one side and die yet when it is cut on another side it remains alive. Arashi said to our Yohanan may we when the master tells us the Halachah is so and so give a practical decision accordingly he said do not use it as a practical guide unless I declare it to be an Halachah in connection with a practical decision Rabbah said to our Papa and to our Huna the son of our Joshua when a legal decision of mine comes before you in a written form and you see any objection to it do not tear it up before you have seen me if I have a valid reason for my decision I will tell it to you and if not I will withdraw after my death you shall neither tear it up nor infer any law from it you shall neither tear it up since had I been there it is possible that I might have told you the reason Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra and nor infer any law from it because a judge must be guided only by that which is I see Rabbah inquired what is the law in the case of a person in good health does our Yohanan B. Baraka speak only of the case of a dying man who has the right to appoint an heir on the spot but not of one who is in good health or does he perhaps speak also even of one in good health our Meshashia said to Rabbah come and hear our Nathan said to Rabbi you have taught your mission in accordance with the views of our Yohanan B. Baraka for we learned a husband who did not give his wife in writing the following statement is the male children that will be born from our marriage shall inherit the money of thy marriage settlement in addition to their shares with their brothers is nevertheless liable because it is a condition Laid down by the court and Rabbi replied to him we learned they shall take later however Rabbi stated it was childishness on my part to be presumptuous in the presence of Nathan the Babylonian the fact is that the law is well established that male children may not seize any sold property of their father in payment for their mother's kathu but now if it is assumed that we learned they shall take why may they not seize sold property consequently it must be inferred that we learned they shall inherit now who has been heard to hold this view surely our Yohanan be Baraka thus it may be inferred that the law applies even to the case of one who is in good health our Papa said to Abbe whether according to him who said that the reading was they shall take or according to him who said that the reading was they shall inherit the question may be asked surely one has not the right to give possession of something which is not yet in existence and even our Meir who Maintains that one may give possession of that which is not yet in existence applies this law only to the case where the possession was given to one who is already in existence but not to the case where possession is given to one who does not exist. The reason however must be that a condition imposed by a court is different from an ordinary assignment here. Likewise it could have been explained that a condition imposed by a court is different. He replied to him because he first used the expression they shall inherit subsequently. Abbe said what I said is nothing for we learned a husband who did not give his wife in writing the following undertaking is the female children that will be born from our marriage shall live in my house and be maintained out of my estate until they shall be taken in marriage by men is nevertheless liable because that fatherly duty is a condition imposed by the court. Consequently this is a case of giving to one as a gift and to another as an inheritance and wherever something is given to one person as an inheritance and to another as a gift even the rabbis agree that the assignments are valid are not you may one said it was our hand and you may ask Abbe Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi whence it is to be inferred that both provisions were made by one court is it not possible that they were made by two different courts this possibility cannot be entertained for in the earlier part of the mission cited it was stated our Eliezer B. Ezra gave the following exposition in the presence of the sages in the vineyard of Jabna since it was provided that the sons shall be heirs to their mother's ketuba and the daughters shall be maintained out of their father's estate the two cases are to be compared as the sons cannot be heirs except after the death of their father so the daughters cannot claim maintenance except after the death of their father now if it is granted that both provisions were Enacted by one court one can well understand why an analogy was drawn between one provision and the other if however it is argued that they were enacted at two different courts how could an analogy be drawn between one provision and the other what proof it is quite possible still to maintain that the provisions were enacted by two different courts but the latter court had to frame its provisions on the lines analogous to those of the former court in order that there might be no discrepancy between the one provision and the other Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel if a dying man gave all his property to his wife in writing either by only appointed her administratrix it is obvious that if he assigned all his property to his grown
but not to a person in good health since he himself is alive or is it the same with a man in good health since thereto he may desire to make provision that respect may be paid to her already in his lifetime come and here it was taught if a person gives the use of fruit of his estate to his wife in writing she may nevertheless collect her capital from his landed property if he gave her a half a third or a quarter she may collect her capital from the rest if he gave all his property to his wife in writing and a bond of indebtedness was produced against him or Eliza said she may tear up the deed of her gift and claim the rights of her capital but the sages said she tears up her capital remains with the claim of her gift and forfeits both and Arjuna the baker related such a case once happened with the daughter of my sister who was a bride and when the matter was brought before the sages they decided that she must tear up her capital remain with the claims of her gift and forfeit both front this very it follows that the reason why the widow forfeits her claims is that a bond of indebtedness had been produced against her husband but had no such bond been produced she would have acquired possession of the entire estate now with what kind of testator is a very concerned if it be suggested that it deals with a dying man surely it may be pointed out it has been said that a person in such a condition merely appointed her Administratrix must it not then be concluded that the Baritha deals with a person in good health? No, the Baritha side may really be concerned with a dying man, but Arara establishes it as dealing with all cases, while Rabana establishes it as dealing with one's betrothed or divorced wife. Our Joseph B. Menumi said in the name of Arnaman the Halachat is that she is to tear up her Kathuka remain with the claim of her gift and forfeit. Both does this imply that Arnaman is not guided by an assumption? Surely it has been taught in the case of a person whose son went to a distant country and having heard that the latter had died, assigned all his property in writing to strangers, though his son subsequently appeared, his gift is nevertheless legally valid. Our Simeon B. Manasia said his gift is not legally a gift, for had he known that his son was alive, he would not have given it away. And Arnaman said the Halachat is in accordance with our Simeon B. Manasia, there it is different for. She is content to renounce her claim to her kathuka for the pleasure of having it known that her husband had presented her with that property. We learned elsewhere if a person assigns his property to his sons in writing and he also assigns to his wife a piece of land of any size whatsoever, she loses the claims of her kathuka. Does she lose her kathuka because he assigned to her any small piece of land? Rab replied, This applies to the case where he confers the ownership upon them through her agency. Samuel replied, This applies also to the case where he made the distribution in her presence and she remained silent. Our Jose B. Hanna replied, This may also apply to the case where he said to her, Take this piece of land in place of your kathuka. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathur B. and the laws taught here are among those in which the claims relating to a kathuka are weaker than those of creditors. We learned our Jose said if she accepted explicitly, although the husband did not put her gift in writing she loses her kathuka does not this is imply that the first tana holds the opinion that both writing and her explicit acceptance are required and if it be suggested that the whole mission represents the view of our jose surely it may be retorted it was taught arjuna said when is it said that she lost her kathuka only when she was there and accepted explicitly but if she was there and did not accept or accept it and was not there she did not lose her kathuka this surely is a refutation of the views of all the previous explanations it is a refutation rabba said to arnaman here is the explanation of rab here that of samuel and here that of our jose the son of our what is the opinion of the master he replied to him it is my opinion that since he made her partner with the son she lost her kathuka the same was also said elsewhere our jose b menumi said in the name of arnaman since he made her a partner with the Son, she loses her kathuka. Rabba inquired, "What is the law in the case of a person in good health? Shall we say that this is only in the case of a dying man, since she knows that he has no more property, and therefore by her acceptance renounces her claims? But in the case of a person in good health, we do not assume that she renounces her claims, since she might expect that he would again acquire property, or perhaps in the latter case also she is assumed to renounce her claims, since now at least he has none. Let it stand. Once a certain dying man said to his executors, a half shall be given to one daughter of mine, a half to the other daughter, and a third of the fruit to my wife Arnaman, who happened to be at that time at Sura, was visited by Arhista, who inquired of him as to what was the legal position in such a case. He replied to him, "Thus said Samuel, even if he allotted to her one palm tree for its use of her kathuka, is lost. Arhista asked him." Again, is it not possible that Samuel held this view only there where he allotted to her a share in the land itself, but not here where only fruit was allotted? Arnaman replied to him, Do you speak of movable objects? I certainly do not suggest that the law quoted is to be applied to movables. Once a certain dying man said to his executors, A third of my estate shall be given to one daughter of mine, a third to the other daughter, and a third to my wife, then one of his daughters died. Our poppy intended to give his decision that the wife receives only a third Talmud. Mas Baba Bathre Arkahana, however, said to him, If her husband had subsequently bought other property, would she not have been entitled to seize it? Now, since if he had bought other property, she would have been entitled to seize it. In this case, too, she is also entitled to seize the dead daughter's third. Once a certain dying man divided his estate between his wife and his son and left over one palm tree. Rubin intended to give his decision that she can only have that one palm tree. Aryamar, however, said to Rubin, if she had no claim upon the son's share, she should have no claim even upon the one palm tree. But since she may seize the palm tree, she may also seize all the estate. Arhuna said, if a dying man assigned all his estate in writing to another person, the matter is to be investigated. If he is entitled to be his heir, he receives it as an inheritance. And if not, he receives it as a gift. Arnaman said to him, why should you indulge in circumlocution if you hold the same view as Aryohan and Bibarika? Say the Halachat is according to Aryohan and Bibarika, for indeed your statement runs on the same lines as those of Aryohan and Bibarika. But perhaps you meant your statement to apply to a case like the following once while a person was in a dying condition, he was asked to whom his estate shall be given, shall it perhaps be given to? X he was asked and he replied to them to whom else then and is it on such a case as this that you told us if that person is entitled to be his heir he receives it as an inheritance and if not he receives it as a gift he replied to him yes this is exactly what I meant in respect of what legal practice our Adabi Ahabah wished to explain before Rabbah that if he is entitled to be his heir his widow is maintained out of his estate and if not his widow is not maintained out of his estate Rabbah however said to him should she be worse off in the case of a gift if in the case of an inheritance which is biblical it has been said that his widow is to be maintained out of his estate how much more should that be so in the case of a gift which is only rabbinical but said Rabbah the difference lies in a case like the following which was sent by Arahasan of Arwah according to the view of Aryohan and Bibarika if a dying man said my estate shall be yours and after you it shall be given to exit the first was one entitled to be his heir the second has no claim whatsoever beside the first for this is not a specific expression of gift but rather of inheritance and an inheritance cannot be terminated Rabbah said to Arnaman surely he has already intercepted it he thought erroneously that it could be intercepted but the all-merciful said it cannot be terminated Talmud Mas Baba Bathur B once a certain man said to his friend my estate shall be yours and after you it shall pass over to X the first was one entitled to be his heir when the first died the second came to claim the estate our Eilish proposed in the presence of Rabbah to give his decision that the second also is entitled to receive the bequest Rabbah however said to him such decisions are given by arbitration judges is not the case exactly the same as that which was sent by our Ahasan of Uyah as he became embarrassed Rabbah applied to him the scriptural text I the Lord will hasten it in its time. Mishnah, if a person gives his estate in writing to strangers and leaves out his children, his arrangements are legally valid, but the spirit of the sages finds no delight in him. Arsimian B. Gamaliel said, If his children did not conduct themselves in a proper manner, he will be remembered for good. Gemara, the question was raised whether the rabbis were in disagreement with the view of Arsimian B. Gamaliel or not. Come and here, Joseph B. Joseph had a son who did not conduct himself in a proper manner. He had a lot full of an and he consecrated it for the temple. He, the son, went away and married the daughter of King Janay's wreath maker. On the occasion when his wife gave birth to a son, he bought for her a fish opening and he found therein a pearl. Do not take it to the king, she said to him, for they will take it away from you for a small sum of
from a bad son to a good son much more when they are from a son to a daughter our rabbis taught once it happened with a certain person whose sons did not conduct themselves in a proper manner that he took the definite step of assigning his estate in writing to Jonathan B. Uziel. what did Jonathan B. Uziel do he sold Ather consecrated Ather and returned Ather to his sons thereupon Shammai came upon him with his staff and bag he said to him Shammai if you can take back what I have sold and what I have consecrated you can also take back what I have returned Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra if not neither can you take back what I have returned he exclaimed the son of Uziel has confounded me the son of Uziel has confounded me why did he first hold a different opinion on account of the incident at Beth Haran for we learned once it happened at Beth Haran with a person whose father was forbidden by about to derive any benefit from him celebrating the marriage of his own son. He said to his friend the court and the banquet are presented to you as a gift but they are at your disposal only with the object that my father comes and dines with us at the banquet the other said to him if they are mine behold they are consecrated to the temple the first said to him I did not give you my possessions that you shall consecrate them to the temple you gave me your said the other only with the object that you and your father might eat and drink and be reconciled to one other while the sin will fall upon my head thereupon the sages said any gift which is not of such a character as would allow it to become sacred when the recipient consecrated it is not a proper gift our rabbis taught Hillel the elder had eighty disciples thirty of them deserved that the divine presence shall rest upon them as upon Moses our teacher thirty of them deserved that the sun shall stand still for them as for Joshua the son of Nun twenty were of an average character. The greatest of them was Jonathan B. Uziel, the least of them was our Yohanan B. Zakai. It was said of our Yohanan B. Zakai that his studies included the scriptures of Mishnah, the Gemara, the Halashat, the Yagadot, the subtle points of the Torah, and the Minushi of the scribes, the inferences from minor to major, and the verbal analogies, astronomy, and geometry, washers, proverbs, and fox fables, the language of the demons, the whisper of the palms, the language of the ministering angels, and the great matter, and the small matter, the great matter is the manifestation of the divine chariot, and the small matter is the arguments of Abbe and Rabbah, thereby is fulfilled the scriptural text that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and that I may fill their treasuries now, if the least among them was so, how great must have been the greatest among them, it was related of Jonathan B. Uziel, that when he sat and studied the Torah, every bird that flew over him was burned Mishnah, Person states this is my son he is believed if however he states this is my brother he is not believed but he receives a share with him in his portion if he dies the property reverts to its owner if however he acquired property from other sources his brothers share the inheritance with him Gemara this is my son he is believed in respect of what legal practice Rav Judah said in the name of Samuel as regards the right of heirship and the exemption of his wife from Levi right marriage. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B as regards the right of heirship is it not obvious that a father is believed the statement was required in respect of the exemption of his wife from Levi right marriage surely this also has been taught elsewhere a person who declared at the time of his death I have sons is believed if he declared I have a brother he is not believed there the law refers to the case where it was not known that he had a brother but here it refers even to a case where it is known that he had a brother our Joseph said in the name of Rab Judah in the name of Samuel why has it been stated that if a person said this is my son he is believed because a husband who said I divorced my wife is believed God of Abraham exclaimed our Joseph could he have proved that which we have learned from that which we have not learned if however that statement was made it must have been in the following terms Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel why has it been stated that if a person said this is my son he is believed because it is in his power to divorce her now that you have accepted the principle of because continued our Joseph a husband is believed if he stated I divorced my wife because it is in his power to divorce her when our Isaac B. Joseph came he stated in the name of our Yohanan a husband who said I divorced my wife is not believed our she's hate blew upon his hand exclaiming our Joseph's because has gone but it is not so for surely our high B. Abin said in the name of Aryohan and a husband who stated I divorced my wife is believed there is no difficulty one speaks retrospectively the other of the future the question was raised is a husband who testified retrospectively believed as regards the future do we divide his statement or do we not divide it our Mari and our Zibit are in dispute on the matter one said we do divide and the other said we do not divide it wherein is this different from the law of Rabba for Rabba said if a husband testifies X had intimate intercourse with my wife he and one other witness may combine to procure his death his death but not her death in the case of two individuals we may divide a statement in the case of one individual it is possible that we may not divide Talmud Mas Baba Bathra once a certain man was dying being asked to whom his wife was permitted to be married and he replied to them she is suitable for the high priest in considering this case Rabba said what is there to Apprehend surely our high B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan that a husband who said I divorced my wife is believed. Abba said to him, but surely when our Isaac B. Joseph came, he said in the name of our Yohanan that a husband who said I divorced my wife is not believed. He said to him, is he not surely? It has been explained that one report speaks retrospectively and the other as to the future. Shall we then came the reply rely upon an explanation thereupon said Rabba to our Nathan B. M. I take this into consideration. A certain person was known to have no brothers, and at the time of his death he declared that he had no brothers. In considering the case, our Joseph said, what is there here to apprehend? In the first place, it is known that he has no brothers, and secondly, he himself has declared at the time of his death that he had none. Abba said to him, but people say that in the countries beyond the sea there are witnesses who know that he has brothers. Now at any rate, replied it. Other they are not before us is not this case the same as that of our Hannah for our Hannah said shall she be forbidden because there are witnesses at the North Pole Abbe said to him shall we relax along in the case of a married woman because we relaxed it in the case of a captive woman thereupon said Rabba to our Nathan B. Anam I take this into consideration this is my brother he is not believed and what do the other brothers say if they say he is our brother why should he only take a share with him in his portion and no more if however they say he is not our brother how will you explain the latter clause if however he acquired property from another source his brothers share the inheritance with him why should they inherit surely they had declared of him he is not our brother this law is required in the case only where they say we do not know Rabba said this implies that if a person claims from another you owe me a mina and the other replies I do. Not know he is exempt said Abbe Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. It may still be maintained that he is liable but here the case is different for it resembles the case where one states you owe a mina to another person if he dies the property reverts to its owner etc. Rabba inquired what is the law in respect of the natural appreciation of the estate as regards appreciation which reaches the carriers there is no question at all since this resembles property acquired from other sources. The question however arises as to what is the law in the case of appreciation which does not reach the carriers as for example where he gave him a palm tree and it grew stronger or a plot of land and it yielded alluvial soil this remains undecided mission if a person died and a will was found tied to his thigh it is of no legal value if thereby he made an assignment to someone whether this person is one of theirs or not his instructions are legally valid Gemara or rabbis taught what? Is a diatiki any deed in which is written this is to stand and to be and which is a legal gift any deed in which is written acquire the gift from this day and after my death but accordingly a gift would be legal only when it is written from this day and after my death if however it were written from now the gift would not be legal Abbe replied it is this that was meant which is a gift of a person in good health that is regarded as a gift of a dying man and that no possession of its fruit is acquired until after death any deed in which it is written from this day and after my death Rabbi son of Arhuna sat in the hall of the schoolhouse and reported the following statement in the name of Arhuna and if a dying man said write the deed and deliver a mina to X and he died they must neither write not deliver since it is possible that he has determined to give him the right of ownership by means of the deed only and no deed may be the means of Acquiring possession after the testator's death, our Eliezer said to them, Be careful about this. Our Shezbi said that our Eliezer had reported it, and that our Yohanan said to them, Be careful about this. Our Naman B. Isaac said, Logical reasoning favors the opinion of our Shezbi. For if it be said that our Eliezer had reported it, it was quite right for our Yohanan to corroborate his statement. If, however, it be said that our Yohanan had said it, was it necessary for our
Deed and deliver remained at 2x and he died they must neither write nor deliver but it follows in the case of a dying man they may both write and deliver he raised the objection and he himself explained that this refers to the case where the testator desired to strengthen his claim how is one to understand whether a testator desired to strengthen the beneficiary's claim Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Ezra Hizda said this is a case where the witness's record and we have acquired legal possession of him in addition to the presentation of this gift so here also the testator's motive may be known when he declared also write and sign and deliver to him it was stated Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the Halachah is that the deed of a gift is written and delivered and Rabba in the name of Arnaman said likewise the Halachah is that the deed is written and delivered Mishnah if a person desires to give his estate in writing to his sons he must write this estate is Assigned from this day and after my death, these are the words of Arjuna. Our Jose said, This is not necessary if a person assigned his estate in writing to his son to be his after his death. The father may not sell IT because it is assigned in writing to the son, and the son may not sell IT because it is in the possession of the father. If the father sold the estate, the sale is valid until his death. If the son sold IT, the buyer has no claim whatsoever upon it until the father's death. Gemara, what avail is it that he wrote from this day and after my death? Surely we learned if one inserts in a divorce from this day and after my death, the divorce is valid and invalid, and if he dies, she is subject to the law of Elizabeth, but not to that of the Levite marriage. There it is doubtful whether it is a condition or a retraction here. However, it is obvious that he meant to say this to him, acquire the land itself today. The fruit after my death, our Jose said, This is not. Necessary Rabbi Abu was indisposed and Arunah and Arnaman came in to see him ask him said Arunah to Arnaman is the Halacha in accordance with the view of Arhuzay or is the Halacha not in accordance with the view of Arhuzay I do not even know Arhuzay's reason replied the other shall I ask him about the Halacha you inquire of him said Arunah whether the Halacha is according to Arhuzay or not and as to his reason I will tell you it later thereupon Arnaman inquired of Rabbi who replied to him thus said Rabbi the Halacha is in accordance with the view of Arhuzay when they came out Arunah said to him this is Arhuzay's reason he is of the opinion that the date of the deed proves its import thus it was also taught elsewhere Arhuzay said this is not necessary because the date of the deed proves its import Rabbi inquired of Arnaman what is the law in the case of a deed of transfer he said to him in the case of a deed of transfer this is not required our poppy said there are deeds of transfer where this is required and there are deeds of transfer where this is not required if the deed reads he conferred upon him possession concluding with and we acquired it from him there is no need for this if however it reads we acquired it from him concluding with he gave him possession this is required our hand of surah is there anything we do not know and the scribes would know the scribes of abay were asked and they knew the scribes of rabba and they knew Arunah the son of our joshua said whether the order was he conferred upon him possession and we acquired it of him or we acquired it of him and he conferred upon him possession the insertion of from this day is not required and their dispute has reference only to the case where the deed reads a memorandum of the transaction that took place in our presence our kahana said i mentioned the reported statements in the presence of our of Nihardia. And he told me, read thus, but we have the following version. Rabbi said in the name of Arnaman, in the case of a deed of transfer, this is not required. Whether the formula was he conferred upon him possession, and we acquired it of him, or we acquired it of him, and he gave him possession. Their dispute has reference only to the case where the formula is a memorandum of the transaction that took place in our presence. If a person assigned his estate in writing to his to be his, after his death it was stated if the son sold the estate during the lifetime of his father and died while his father was still alive. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. R. Yohanan said the buyer does not acquire ownership, and Reshlakish said the buyer does acquire ownership. R. Yohanan said that the buyer did not acquire ownership because possession of usufruct is like the possession of the capital, and Reshlakish said that the buyer did acquire ownership because possession of usufruct is not. Like the possession of the capital, but surely on this principle they have once disputed, for it was stated if a person sells the use of of his field, Aryohan and said the buyer must bring the Bikurim and recite the declaration, and Reshlakish said he must bring, but does not recite Aryohan and said that he must bring and recite because he holds the opinion that possession of use of is like the possession of the capital, and Reshlakish said that he must bring, but not recite because, in his opinion, the possession of use of is not like the possession of the capital, Aryohan and can answer you, although possession of use of is generally like the possession of the capital itself, it was necessary to restate the principle here since it might have been supposed that a father would renounce his claims in favor of his son, so he taught us that this is not so, and Arsimian Bilakish can answer you, although possession of use of is generally not like the possession of. The capital itself it was necessary to restate the principle here since it might have been supposed that whenever it is a matter of self-interest a man considers himself first even where there is a son so he taught us that this is not so are you and raised an objection against Rush Lakish if a person said I give my estate to you and after you x shall be my ear and after x y shall be my ear when the first dies the second acquires the ownership when the second dies the third acquires ownership if the second dies in the lifetime of the first the estate reverts to the ears of the first now if it were so it should revert to the ears of the original owner he replied to him Rab Hashai in Babylon has already explained this it is different when the expression after you was used Rab son of Arhuna pointed out the same incongruity in the presence of Rab who likewise replied it is different when one used the expression after you but surely it was taught the estate reverts to the ears of the original owner Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra this law is a matter of dispute between Tanaim for it was taught if a person said my estate shall be yours and after you it shall be given to X and the first recipient went down into the estate and sold it and spent the money the second may reclaim the estate from those who bought it these are the words of Rabbi Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said the second may receive only what the first had. Left an incongruity was pointed out if a person said my estate shall be yours and after you it shall be given to X the first may go down into the estate and sell it and spend the money these are the words of Rabbi Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said the first has only the right of use of this surely presents a contradiction between one statement of Rabbi and the other statement of his and between one statement of Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel and the other statement of his there. Is no contradiction between the two statements of Rabbi since one may refer to the capital and the other to the use of rock. There is also no contradiction between the two statements of Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel since one may speak of what is the proper thing the other of the law. Ex post facto Abbe said who is a cunning rogue who counsels to sell an estate in accordance with Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel or Yohanan said the Halachah is according to Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel who however admits that if the estate was assigned as a gift of a dying person the transaction is invalid what is the reason Abbe said because the gift of a dying person is acquired only after death and by the time after you had preceded him but did Abbe say so surely it was stated when his possession of the gift of a dying man acquired Abbe said at death and Rabbi said after death Abbe withdrew from that opinion once is it proved that he withdrew from this view perhaps he withdrew from that this cannot be entertained for we have learned if a dying man said to his wife here is thy divorce should I die or here is thy divorce after my present illness or here is thy divorce after my death the divorce in all these cases is invalid Arzira said in the name of our Yohanan the Halachah is according to Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel and even if the estate contains slaves whom he liberated is this not obvious it might have been presumed that he could be told that it was not given to him for the purpose of doing what was prohibited hence he taught us that we do not say so our Joseph said in the name of our Yohanan the Halachah is according to Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel and even in the case where a dead man's shrouds were made of it this is surely obvious it might have been presumed that it was not given to him to turn into something of which it is forbidden to have any benefit so he taught us that this is not so our Naman B. R. Hista gave the following exposition. If one said to another the cetric is given to you as a gift and after you it shall be given to X and the first recipient took it and performed with it his duty this will be a point of dispute between Rabbi and Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel Arnaman B. Isaac Demur the dispute between Rabbi and Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel can only extend as far as the case there because one master is of the opinion
returned it to me and the recipient used it for its ritual purpose then if he subsequently returned it he is exempt if he did not return it he is not exempt hereby we are taught that a gift presented on the condition that it be returned is regarded as a proper gift a certain woman owned a palm tree on ground belonging to our bbb of a whenever she went to cut it he showed resentment so she made it over to him for life he thereupon went and made it over to his little son arunavid Son of Bar Joshua said because you are yourselves frail beings you speak frail words even Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel gave his decision only in the case where the original owner had assigned the estate to another person but not when it is to return to the owner himself Rabbah said in the name of Arnaman if one said to another this ox is given to you as a gift on the condition that you return it to me and the recipient consecrated and returned it both the consecration and it. Restitution are legally valid but what asked Rabbah of Arnaman has he returned to him and what replied the other has he taken away from him but said Arashi the matter is looked into if he said to him on condition that you return it he has no claim upon the donee for he had surely returned it if however he said to him on condition that you return it to me he can claim compensation since he implied that the return must be of a thing which he may use Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel. If a person assigned his estate in writing to another and the latter said I do not want it he acquires possession of it even if he stands and protests or Yohanan however said he does not acquire possession or Abu Bimel said there is really no difference of opinion between them Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra one refers to the case where he protested and the outset the other where he kept silent at first and then protested Arnam and B. Isaac said if a donor transferred ownership to one through the medium of another and the former kept silent and ultimately protested we have arrived at a dispute between Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel and the rabbis for it was taught if a person had assigned to another in writing an estate of his part of which consisted of slaves and the latter said I do not want them they may nevertheless if their second master was a priest eat of the heap offering Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel said as soon as the donee had said I do not want them ears of it. Testator become their legal owners and when we were discussing the subject the question was raised would the first Tana consider the assignee legal owner even if he stands and protests Rabbah and some say are Yohanan said in the case where he protested from the outset all agree that he does not acquire ownership if he first kept silent and finally he protested all agree that he does acquire ownership they are in disagreement only in the case where the testator transferred ownership to the donee through a third party and he at first kept silent and finally he protested in such a case the first Tana holds the opinion that since he kept silent at first he acquired ownership and that the reason why he protests now is because he has simply changed his mind Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel however holds the opinion that his final act proves what he had in his mind at the beginning and that the reason why he did not then protest is because he thought why should I Cry before they come into my possession or rabbis taught if a dying man said give 200 Zeus to X 300 to Y and 400 to Z it must not be assumed that whoever is mentioned in the deed first gains possession first hence if a note of indebtedness was produced against him the debt is to be collected from all of them if however he said give 200 Zeus to X and after him 300 Zeus to Y and after him 400 Zeus to Z the law is that whoever is mentioned first in the deed acquires possession first hence if a note of indebtedness was produced against him the debt is collected from the last mentioned if he has not enough collection of the balance is made from the one mentioned before him if the share of this one also does not suffice collection of the remaining balance is made from the one mentioned first or rabbis taught if a dying man said give 200 Zeus to X who is my firstborn son in accordance with his do he receives these as well as the portion of his birthright if however he said as his birthright he is given the choice he may if he wishes receive these he may if he prefers receive the portion of his birthright if a dying man said give 200 Zeus to X who is my wife in accordance with her do she receives these as well as her Kethuba if however he said as her Kethuba Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B she is to have the choice she may if she wishes receive these she may if she prefers receive her Kethuba if a dying man said give 200 Zeus to X who is my creditor in accordance with his due he receives these as well as his debt if however he said as his debt he receives these in payment of his debt should he then because he said in accordance with his due receive these and receive also his debt when it is possible that he meant in accordance with what is his due on account of the debt Arnaman replied Huna has told me that this law represents the view. Of our Akiba who draws inferences from superfluous expression S for we learned he sold neither the sister nor the seller even though he has included in the contract debt and height he must however buy for himself a passage to these these are the words of our Akiba but the sages say he need not buy for himself a passage our Akiba however admits that where he said to him except these he need not buy a passage for himself from this it clearly follows that where a person mentioned that which was not necessary his object was to add something so here also since he mentioned that which was not necessary his object was to add something our rabbis taught if a dying man said X owes me a main the witnesses may write it down although they do not know whether there is any truth in the statement consequently when the debt is collected proof has to be brought these are the words of our mayor but the sages say the witnesses must not write unless they know the statement to be True consequently when the debt is collected there is no need for proof to be produced Arnaman said who not told me that a tanner reported the following Armeyer said the witnesses must not write and the sages say they may write and even Armeyer said this only on account of a court that might hear Ardimi of Nihardia said the law is that there is no need to provide against all erring court and why is this case different from that of Rabba for Rabba said Elizabeth must not be arranged. Unless the court know the widow and her brother-in-law nor may a declaration of refusal be accepted unless the court know the parties consequently it is permissible for witnesses to write out a certificate of Elizabeth as well as a certificate of refusal even though they do not know the parties has not this precaution been taken in order to provide against an erring court no a court does not minutely examine the decision of another court that of witnesses however it does. Minutely examine mission a father may pluck the frit and give it to anyone he wishes for consumption and any plucked fruit which he leaves after his death belongs to all the heirs gemara plucked fruit only belongs to all the heirs but not fruit that is still attached to the ground talmud mas baba bathra surely it was taught the fruit attached to the ground is valued for the viral reply there is no difficulty here the law deals with one's own son there it deals with a stranger in the former case attached fruit belongs to the son because a person is favorably disposed towards his son mission if one left sons who were of age as well as minors those who are of age are not to be supported at the expense of the minors nor are the minors to be fed at the expense of those who are of age but all receive equal shares in the entire estate if those who were of age married the minors also may take a similar sum towards their marriage expenses if the minors however claimed we desire to take as much as you have taken their request is disregarded but what their father had given them is regarded as a gift if one left daughters who were of age as well as minors those who are of age are not to be supported at the expense of the minors nor are the minors to be fed at the expense of those who are of age but all receive equal shares in the distribution of the estate if those who were of age married the minors also may take a similar sum towards their marriage expenses if the minors however claimed we desire to take as much as you have taken their request is disregarded in the following respect daughters are of greater importance than sons for daughters are fed at the expense of the sons but not at the expense of other daughters Gamara Rabba said if the eldest of the brothers drew upon the general funds of the estate for his dress and outfit his action cannot be disputed but surely we learned those who are of age are not to be supported at the expense of the minors our mission refers to those who are without a calling in the case of one without a calling is this not obvious since it might have been assumed that the brothers desire that he should not be disgraced it was necessary to teach us that this is not so if those who were of age married the minors also may take what does this mean Rab Judah replied it is this that was meant if those who were of age had married after the death of their father the minors also may take after the death of their father if however those who were of age had married during the lifetime of their father and the minors after the death of their father claimed we desire to take as much as you have taken their request is disregarded but what their father had given them is regarded as a legal gift if one left daughters who were of age as well as minors have a sent to Rabba will our master teach us in the case of a woman who took a Loan and spent it and thereupon married whether the husband has the legal status of a buyer or that of an heir is he regarded as a buyer and consequently he need not repay her debt since a verbal loan cannot be collected from a buyer or is he perha
Such an obligation is generally known. Our Papa said to Rabba, Is not this the very case which Rabin had sent in his letter? If a person died, he wrote and left a widow and a daughter. His widow is to receive her maintenance out of his estate. If the daughter married his widow, is still to receive her maintenance out of his estate. If the daughter died, Rab Judah, the son of the sister of our Jose Bihanna, said, I had such a case, and it was decided that his widow is to receive her maintenance out of his estate. Now, if it be granted that he is regarded as an heir, it is quite correct that his widow should be maintained out of his estate. If, however, it is held that he is regarded as a buyer, why should she be maintained out of his estate? Abbe said, Would we not have known this if Rabin had not sent his letter? Surely we learned the following: Do not return in the jubilee year the portion of the birthright Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, and that which a husband inherits from his. Wife Rabba said to him, and now that he did send his letter, do we know this? Surely our Jose Bihanna stated at Ashad it was ordained that if a woman had sold during the lifetime of her husband Yusuf property and died, the husband may seize them from the buyers. But said our Ashi, the rabbis have given a husband the status of an heir and also the status of a buyer, and whichever was better for him, they gave him in respect of the jubilee year. The rabbis gave him the status of an heir in order to prevent loss to him. In the case of the statement of our Jose Bihanna, the rabbis gave him the status of a buyer also in order to avert loss to him. In respect of the statement of Rabin, however, in order to avert a loss to the widow, the rabbis gave him the status of an heir. But surely in the case of our Jose Bihanna, where the buyers suffered loss, the rabbis had yet given him the status of a buyer. There they caused the loss to themselves, for since it was known that a husband was. Involved, they should not have bought from a woman who is subject to a husband's jurisdiction. Chapter 9 Mishnah In the case of one who dies and leaves sons and daughters, if the estate is large, the sons inherit IT and the daughters are maintained from it. If the estate is small, the daughters are maintained from it and the sons shall go begging. It been said, Am I to be the loser because I am a male? Our Gamaliel said, It means view has my approval tomorrow. What is considered a large estate, Rab? Judah said, In the name of Rab, out of which both may be maintained for twelve months. When I recited this before Samuel, he said, This is the view of our Gamaliel, the Rabbi. But the sages say that the estate must be large enough to provide for the maintenance of both until they reach their majority. So it was also stated elsewhere when Rabin came, he said, In the name of our Yohanan, others say that it was Rabbi Barhana who said it in the name of our Yohanan when the estate is large enough to. Provide for the maintenance of both until they have reached their majority. It is considered large if less it is regarded as small, and if the estate does not suffice for both until they have reached their majority, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, would the daughters receive all of it? But said Rabba, the amount required for the maintenance of the daughters until they reach their majority is drawn from the estate, and the balance is given to the sons. It is obvious that if the estate was large and it depreciated, the heirs have already acquired ownership thereof. What is the law? However, if the estate was small and it depreciated, does it remain in the possession of the heirs and consequently has appreciated in their possession, or are the heirs perhaps entirely disregarded? Here come and here are a C said in the name of our Yohanan that if orphans anticipated the daughters and sold the estate where it was small, their sale is valid. Our Jeremiah sat before our Abad when he addressed to. In the following question, does one's widow reduce the value of an estate? Do we assume that since she receives maintenance, she thereby reduces its value, or perhaps since she would receive none if she married, she is regarded as if she has none even now? If you would find some reason for saying that since she would receive none if she married, she is regarded as if she has none even now, the question arises whether his wife's daughter reduces the value of the estate. Do we say that since she would receive her maintenance even if she married, she does reduce the value of the estate, or perhaps since she would receive none if she died, she does not reduce its value? And if you would find some ground for saying that since she would receive nothing if she died, she does not reduce its value, the question arises whether a creditor reduces the value of the estate. Do we say that he reduces its value since he would receive his debt even if he died, or perhaps he? Does not reduce it since the debt still requires collecting others report that he put the questions in the reverse order does a creditor reduce the value of the estate Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B does his wife's daughter reduce its value does his widow reduce its value in the case of claims of his widow and her daughter who is to have the preference he said to him go away today and come tomorrow when he came he said to himself at least one problem for our Abba said in the name of R.C. that the relationship between a widow and her daughter in the case of a small estate has been put on the same basis as that of the relationship between a daughter and brothers as in the case of the relationship between the daughter and brothers the daughter is maintained out of the estate while the brothers have to go begging at people's doors so in the case of the relationship of a widow and her daughter the widow is maintained and the daughter may go begging at People's doors have been said, Am I to be the loser because I am a male, etc. What does he mean? Abbe replied, He means this, Am I to be the loser because I am a male and am capable of engaging in the study of the Torah? Rabbi said to him, Now then, would he who is engaged in the study of the Torah be entitled to heirship, and he who is not engaged in the study of the Torah not be entitled to be here? But said, Rabbi, he means this, Am I because I am a male and am entitled to be here in the case of a large estate to be the loser of my rights? In the case of a small estate, Mishnah, if a man left sons and daughters, and one whose sex is uncertain, the males may wear the estate is large, refer him to the females. If the estate, however, I am small, the females may refer him to the males. If a man said, Should my wife bear a male child, he shall receive a mina, and his wife did bear a male child, he receives a mina. If he said, Should my wife bear a female, she shall receive 200 ZUZ, and she or a female she takes 200 ZUZ if he said should she bear a male child he shall receive a mina and if a female she shall receive 200 ZUZ and she gave birth to a male and a female the male receives a mina and the female receives 200 ZUZ if she bore a tumtum he receives nothing if however he said whatever my wife shall bear shall receive a certain portion he receives it and if there is no other ear but this one he inherits all the estate. Gamara how can it be said that the males refer him to the females and he presumably receives maintenance as a daughter seeing that in the latter clause it states if she bore a tumtum he receives nothing Abbe replied they refer him to the females and he receives nothing Rabbah however said they refer him and he does receive maintenance and the latter clause of our mission represents the view of Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel for we learned if an animal gave birth to a tumtum or an Androgynos Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel said that the sanctity does not extend to either of them. An objection was raised. A tumtum inherits like a son and receives maintenance like a daughter. According to Rabbah, the statement may well be explained as follows. He inherits like a son in the case of a small estate and receives maintenance like a daughter in the case of a large estate. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, according to Abbe, however, what is meant by he receives maintenance like a daughter? Granted, your argument is right. How will you explain according to Rabbah what is the meaning of he inherits like a son? But you must explain it as meaning that he is entitled to inherit but actually receives nothing. So here it may be explained as entitled to maintenance but in fact receives nothing. If a man said, Should my wife bear a male child, etc., does this imply that a daughter is dearer to him than a son? Surely, our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon B. Oh, the Holy One, blessed be he. Is filled with wrath against anyone who does not leave a son to be his heir for it is said and you shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter and by the expression of causing to pass wrath is implied for it is said that day is a day of wrath as regards succession a son has preference as regards maintenance a daughter is given preference and Samuel said we deal here with the case of a mother who gave birth for the first time and this is to be understood in accordance with a saying of Arhista for Arhista said if a daughter is born first it is a good sign for the children some say because she rears her brothers and others say because the evil eye has no influence over them Arhista said to me however daughters are dearer than sons if preferred it may be said that the tenor of our mission is in agreement with the view of Arjuna which view of Arjuna if it is suggested that relating to the exposition of an all for it was taught and the Lord blessed. Abraham with all our Meir said the meaning is that he had no daughter and Arjuda said the meaning is that he had a daughter whose name was Inal it may be objected that from this one may only infer that according to Arjuda the All-Merciful did not deprive Abraham even of daughter this is no proof
The male amena then if she gave birth to a male he receives amena if however he said he will receive amena if he brings me tidings that she gave birth to a female then if she gave birth to a female he receives amena and if she gave birth to a male and a female he only receives amena but surely he did not speak of a male and a female this refers to the case where he also said he shall also receive amena if he brings tidings that a male and a female were born. What then did he mean to exclude to exclude a miscarriage once a certain man said to his wife my estate shall be his with whom you are pregnant Arhuna said this is a case of making an assignment to an embryo through the agency of a third party and whenever such an assignment is made the embryo does not acquire possession Arnaman raised an objection against Arhuna's ruling if a man said should my wife bear a male child he shall receive amena and his wife did bear a male child he receives amena he replied to him as to our mission I do not know who is its author but should he not have replied to him that it represents the view of Armadir who stated that a man may convey possession of a thing that has not yet come into the world dash it is possible to say that Armadir holds this view only when possession is conveyed to that which is already in the world but has he been heard to hold the same view when possession is conveyed to that which is not yet in the world but let him reply to him that it represents the view of our Jose who said that an embryo acquires possession for we learned an embryo disqualifies his deceased father's slaves from eating the heat offering but does not confer the right of eating it on his mother these are the words of our Jose an inheritance which came to one under the ordinary laws of succession is different but let him reply to him that it represents the view of our Yohanan Biberica who said that there was no difference between an inheritance and a gift for we learned our Yohanan Biberica said if a person said it concerning one who is entitled to be his heir his instruction is legally valid dash it is possible to say that our Yohanan Biberica has been heard to hold the view only where possession is given to that which is already in the world but did he say that the same law applies also to that which is not in the world and let him reply to him that it represents the view of our Yohanan B. Berica and that he holds the same opinion as our Jose who can say that he holds such an opinion let him then reply to him that our mission speaks of the case where the money was offered by a husband to him who would bring me tidings, if so explain the last clause wherein it is stated and if there is no other heir but this one he inherits all the estate if the mission speaks of a reporter what has he to do with heirship then let him reply to him that our mission speaks of it. Case where she has already given birth to the child if so the last clause is wherein it is stated if however he said whatever my wife shall bear shall receive a certain portion he receives it instead of whatever she shall bear should have read whatever she has born Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra but let him reply to him that our mission speaks of the case where he said after she will have born the child Arhuna follows his own view for Arhuna said a child does not acquire. Ownership even where the father had said after she will have born him for it was stated Arnaman said if a person conveys possession through the agency of a third party to an embryo the latter does not acquire ownership if however he said after she will have born the child does acquire ownership but Arhuna said even where he said after she will have born the child does not acquire ownership Arshis hate however said whether he used the one or the other expression the child acquires ownership said Arshesh it wants to derive this from the following if a proselyte died and Israelites plundered his estate and subsequently they heard that he had a son or that his wife was pregnant they must return whatever they have appropriated if having returned everything they subsequently heard that his son died or that his wife miscarried he who took possession the second time has acquired ownership but he who took possession the first time has not acquired Ownership now if it could be assumed that an embryo does not acquire ownership why should they need to take possession a second time they have surely already taken possession once have they however said an inheritance which comes to one under the ordinary laws of succession is different Rabba said there it is different because at first they were really uncertain of the legality of their acquisition what practical difference is there between them there is a difference between them in the case where a report was brought that he died while in fact he was not dead and after that he died come and hear a babe who is one day old inherits and transmits from this it follows that only one who is one day old may inherit but not an embryo surely Arshis had explained this as meaning he inherits the estate of his mother to transmit it to his paternal brothers hence only then when he is one day old but not when an embryo what is the reason Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi. Because the embryo dies first and no son in the grave may inherit from his mother to transmit the inheritance to his paternal brothers do you mean to say that it dies first surely there was a case when it made three convulsive movements Mar son of Arashi replied those were only reflex movements like those of the tail of a lizard which moves convulsively even after it has been cut of Mar the son of Ar Joseph said in the name of Rabba this teaches that he causes a diminution in the portion of the birthright this however applies only to a child who is one day old but not to an embryo what is the reason the all merciful said and they have born to him for so said Mar the son of Ar Joseph in the name of Rabba a son who was born after the death of his father does not cause a diminution in the portion of the birthright what is the reason the all merciful said and they shall have born to him which is not the case here thus it was taught at Surah at Pumadiva, however it was taught as follows Mar the son of Ar Joseph said in the name of Rabbi a firstborn son who was born after the death of his father does not receive a double portion what is the reason the all merciful said he shall acknowledge and surely he is not alive to acknowledge him and the law is in accordance with all those versions which Mar the son of Ar Joseph quoted in the name of Rabbi Ar Isaac said in the name of Ar Yohanan if possession was given to an embryo through the agency of a third party it does not acquire ownership and if objection should be raised from our mission it may be replied that there it is different because a person is favorably disposed towards his son Samuel said to Ar Hannah of Baghdad go bring me a group of ten people and I will tell you in their presence that if possession is given to an embryo through the agency of a third party it does acquire ownership but the law is that if possession is given to an embryo through the agency of a third party it does not acquire ownership once a certain man said to his wife my estate shall belong to the children that I shall have from you his eldest son came and said to him what shall become of me he replied to him go acquire possession as one of the other sons those can certainly acquire no ownership since they are not yet in existence as however this lad an additional share beside the other sons or has the lad no additional share beside the other sons are Abin and Armisha and Ar. Jeremiah say the lad receives an additional share beside the other sons are Abu and Ar Hanabi Papi and Ar Isaac Napaha say the lad receives no additional share beside the other sons are Abu said to Ar Jeremiah is the law in accordance with our view or in accordance with yours he replied to him it is obvious that the law is in accordance with our view because we are older than you and that the law cannot be according to your view because you are only juniors the other retorted. Does the matter then depend on age? Surely the matter depends on reason. And what is the reason? Our Jeremiah asked. Go to Arab and reply. Arab to whom I have explained the matter. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra at the college, and he expressed his approval. He went to him when the other explained. Would anyone acquire possession if he were told acquire ownership as an ass? For it was stated if one was told acquire possession like an ass, he does not acquire ownership. If however one was told you, and an ass shall acquire possession. Arnaman said he acquires the ownership of half. And Arhamana said the statement is invalid. And Arshis hate said he acquires the ownership of all. Arshis hate said once do I derive this? For it was taught. Arhose said in cucumbers the inner portion only is bitter. Consequently, when a person is giving a cucumber as a heave offering, he must add to the external part of it and thus gives the heave offering. But why this is surely the same as the case of. You and the ass there it is different for biblically it is perfect terima for our lay said whence is it inferred that if one separates a heat offering from an inferior quality for the redemption of a superior quality that his offering is valid for it is said and ye shall bear no sin by reason of it seeing that ye have set apart from it the best thereof from this it is to be inferred that if you do not set apart from the best but of the worst you shall bear sin if however the inferior quality does not become consecrated why should there be any bearing of sin hence it follows that if one separates a heat offering from an inferior quality for the redemption of a superior quality his offering is valid our Mordecai said to our Ashiara we raised an objection from the following mission it once happened with five women among whom there were two sisters that a person gathered a basket of figs which were theirs and which were also of the fruit of the sabbatical year and said Behold you are all betrothed unto me by this basket and one of them accepted on behalf of all the sages said the sisters are not betrothed from this it follows
Government once imposed crown money upon Buell and Stardage and Rabbi said Buell shall give a half and Stardage a half what a comparison there when an order was issued on previous occasions it was directed to Buell yet Stardage contributed together with them and the government knew that they were assisting what and did they now direct the order to both Buell and Stardage obviously to indicate that these as well as those shall each contribute a half are zero raised an objection if a person said I undertake to bring a meal offering of a hundred iceron in two vessels he must bring sixty in one vessel and forty in the other vessel Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and if he brought fifty in one vessel and fifty in the other he has also fulfilled his duty from this it follows that only if he had already brought has he fulfilled his duty but that this is not the proper thing to do now if it could be assumed that in any such case half and half is meant this should have been allowed even at the outset what a comparison there we are in a position to testify that this person first intended to bring as big an offering as possible and that the reason why he said in two vessels was because he knew that it was impossible to bring all in one vessel hence we order him to bring as much as it is possible and the law is in accordance with the view of our Joseph in the case of field subject and half a certain man once sent home pieces of silk rmi said those which are suitable for the sons belong to the sons those suitable for the daughters belong to the daughters this however has only been said in the case where he has no daughter-in-law but if he has a daughter-in-law it is assumed that he sent it for his daughter-in-law however his daughters were not married the gift belongs to them because one would not neglect one's daughters and send to his daughter-in-law once a certain person said my estate shall be given to my sons he had a son and a daughter do people call a son sons or perhaps they do not call a son sons and his intention was to include his daughter in the gift have said come and here and the sons of Dan Hashim Rabbah said to him perhaps this is to be explained in accordance with the Tana of the school of Hezekiah that they were as numerous as the leaves of a reed but said Rabbah and the sons of Peleu Bar Joseph said and the sons of Ethan Ezra a certain person once said my estate shall be given to my sons he had a son and a grandson do people call a grandson son or not Arhabah said people call a grandson son Marson of Arashi said people do not call a grandson son of Aritha was taught in agreement with the view of Marson of Arashi he who is forbidden by a vow to have any benefit from his sons is allowed to derive benefits from his grandson's mission had one left sons who were of age and minors and those who were of age improved they state they improved IT4 the common good if however they said see what our father has left we desire to cultivate our own shares and to enjoy the profits the proceeds belong to them likewise in the case where the wife had effected improvements in the estate she improved it for the common good if however she said see what my husband has left me I desire to cultivate my share and to enjoy the benefits the proceeds belong to her Gamar Arhabah the son of our Joseph son of Rabbah said in the name of Rabbah the law of our mission is applicable only to the case where the improvement of the estate was affected out of the funds of the estate but if it was improved at the expense of the elder brothers the profits belong to themselves but this is not so for surely our Hannah said even if their father had left them nothing but Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra a covered cistern the proceeds are to be equally divided but the proceeds of a covered cistern are surely due to the elder brothers themselves eh? Covered cistern is different since it only requires washing and even miners can keep a watch over it. They said see what our father has left we desire to cultivate our own shares and to enjoy the profits the proceeds belong to them. Our Safra's father left some money he took it and carried on with it a business then came his brothers and sued him before Rabbah he said to them our Safra is a great man he is not expected to leave his studies in order to toil for others where the wife had effected improvements in the estate she improved it for the common good what has a wife to do with the property of orphans our Jeremiah replied the Mishnah speaks of a wife who is an heiress is this not obvious it might have been assumed that since it is not usual for her to look after an orphan's estate she is entitled to all the profits even where she did not first make a specific declaration as if she had actually made it hence it was necessary to teach us that this is not so if however she said see what my husband has left me I desire to cultivate my share and to enjoy the benefits the proceeds belong to her is not this obvious it might have been assumed that since it is creditable to her when people say that she works for the orphans she might consequently forego her claims hence it was necessary to teach us that this is not so our Hannah said if a person marries his adult son in a house of his he acquires its ownership but this only in the case of one who is of age and only where he married a virgin and only when she is his first wife and only where he is the first son whom he married it is obvious that where his father had set aside for him a house and there is an upper story thereon the latter acquired the ownership of the house but not of the upper story what is however the law in the case of a house and an exeter or in the case of two houses one within the other this is undecided an objection was raised if his father had set aside for him a house and it contains furniture he acquires possession of the furniture but not of the house our Jeremiah replied this refers to a case where for instance his father's store s were kept there the Nihardians say even if only a duck coat our Judah and our poppy say even if only a pot of fish Hashmar Zitra married his son and hung up for himself a sandal our Ashi married his son and hung up for himself a jug of oil Marzitra said the following Three things have been enacted by the rabbis as fixed law without adducing any reason. One is this, the other is that which Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, namely that a dying man who gave all his property to his wife in writing thereby only appointed her administratrix. And the third is that which Rab had stated if one said you only a man to give it to X in the presence of the three parties X acquires possession. Mishnah Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. If one of the brothers who are partners in the inherited estate was appointed to a government post, the income from the appointment is to be equally divided between all the brothers. If one of them contracted a disease and had himself cured, the expenses of the cure must be defrayed out of his own Gemara. A taught the appointment in our mission means a government appointment. Our rabbis taught in the case where one of the brothers was appointed tax collector or overseer if the appointment was. Due to the brothers the income belongs to the brothers if the appointment was due to himself the income belongs to himself if the appointment was due to the brothers it was said the income belongs to the brothers is not this obvious this is required only in the case where he is exceptionally smart since it might have been said that his smartness had caused him to receive the appointment it was necessary to teach us that this is not so our rabbis taught if one of it brothers took from an inherited estate 200 zoos to study Torah or to learn to trade the brothers can tell him if you are with us you can have your maintenance if you are not with us you can have no maintenance but let them give it to him wherever he is this is proof in support of our for our said the blessing of a house is proportionate to its size then let them give him according to the blessing of the house that is so if one of them contracted a disease and had Himself cured the expenses of the cure must be defrayed out of his own Rabin sent in the name of RLA. This applies only to the case where he contracted the disease through his own negligence, but if by accident the cost of the cure is defrayed from the common funds, what is meant by negligence says our Hannah taught for our Hannah said everything is in the power of heaven except illness through cold or he for it is said cold and he are in the way of the forward he that keepeth his soul holdeth himself far from the mission. If some of the brothers have bestowed gifts as groomsmen in the lifetime of their father when the wedding gifts are reciprocated, they revert to the common funds of the estate for the reciprocation of wedding gifts may be claimed through a court of law. If however one has sent to his friend jars of wine or jars of oil, he cannot claim them through a court of law because the presentations of such gifts are mere acts of Loving kindness Gamara a contradiction was raised if his father had sent through him a wedding gift the reciprocated gift returns to him if a wedding gift was sent to his father the reciprocated gift is to be returned from the common funds. R.C. replied in the name of Aryohan and Armisha also speaks of the case where the gift was sent to his father but surely it was stated if some of the brothers acted as groomsmen read to some but surely it was taught when the wedding gifts are reciprocated it means this when it has to be reciprocated it is returned from the common funds R.C. said there is no difficulty here it is a case where the father did not specify here it refers to the case where he did specify as it was taught if his father sent wedding gifts through him the reciprocated gift belongs to him if his father however sent wedding gifts without specifying which son was to take them the reciprocated gift reverts to the common estate and Samuel. Explained here it is a case of a lover who is not entitled to receive the prospective possessions of his dead brother as those which he already possessed does this then imply
said in truth the sages said where it is the custom to return it must be returned where it is the custom not to return it need not be returned does not argue to the prince say exactly the same thing as the first tana must it not then be explained that the difference between them lies in the admissibility of the plea give me my husband and I will rejoice with him and that there is a lacuna in the text which should read thus in the case where a person betroths a woman if a virgin she is entitled to two hundred zoos and to a main if a widow this applies only to the case where he has retracted but if she died the token of betrothal is to be returned where it is the custom to return where it is the custom not to return it need not be returned this furthermore applies only to the case where she died but where he died it need not be returned what is the reason because she can plead give me my husband and I will rejoice with him and with Reference to the statement Arjuna the prince said in truth the sages stated that whether he died or she died it is to be returned where it is the custom to return where it is the custom not to return it need not be returned and she cannot say give me my husband and I will rejoice with him no all may agree that she may advance the plea give me my husband and I will rejoice with him and in the case where he died no one in fact disputes this their dispute has reference only to the case where she died their point of disagreement centering here on the question whether a token of betrothal is unreturnable our Nathan holds the opinion that a token of betrothal is not unreturnable and Arjuna the prince holds the opinion that a token of betrothal is unreturnable but surely it was taught where it is a custom to return it must be returned he means this and as regards the gifts they must certainly be returned where it is a custom to return them these Tanaim differ on the same principle as the following Tanaim for it was taught if one betroths a woman with a talent if a virgin she is entitled to 200 zoos and to a main if a widow these are the words of our Meir Arjuda said a virgin is entitled to 200 zoos and a widow to a main and the remainder she returns to him our Jose said if he betrothed her with 20 shekels he gives her in addition 30 halves if he betrothed her with 30 shekels he gives her in addition 20 halves now of what case is it spoken here if it is suggested of that where she died does she in such a case it may be asked receive her kefu but in the case where he died why it may be argued again does she return to him the remainder let her advance the plea give me my husband and I will rejoice with him if however it be suggested that we deal with the case of the wife of an Israelite who committed adultery then it may be queried in what circumstances did this happen if with her consent does she in such a case receive her kefu and if under duress she is surely permitted to continue to live with him hence the barrier must deal with the case of the wife of a priest who committed adultery under duress and the point of disagreement between them is the question of whether a token of betrothal is unreturnable our mayor holds the opinion that a token of betrothal is unreturnable and our Judah holds the opinion that a token of betrothal is not unreturnable while our Jose is doubtful as to whether it is returnable or not and consequently if he betrothed her with 20 shekels he gives her in addition 30 halves and if he betrothed her with 30 shekels he gives her 20 halves our Joseph B. Menumi said in the name of our Naman wherever it is a custom to return it must be returned and the explanation is Nihartia what is the practice in the rest of Babylon both Rabbah and our Joseph stated Presents are returned tokens of betrothal are not returned our papa said the law is that whether he died or she died or he retracted presents are to be returned tokens of betrothal are not to be returned if she retracted even tokens of betrothal must also be returned Amimar said a token of betrothal must not be returned this is a preventive measure against the possibility of assumption that betrothal would take effect in the case of her sister Arashi said her bill of divorce would prove her status but the statement of Arashi is to be rejected for there may be some who heard of the one and did not hear of the other for the reciprocation of wedding gifts may be claimed through a court of law our rabbis taught five things were said in respect of reciprocation of a wedding gift it may be claimed through a court of law it is to be reciprocated at its proper time and it is not subject to the restrictions of usury Talmud, Mas Baba Bathur B and it. Sabbatical year does not cause its cancellation and the firstborn does not receive of it a double portion it may be claimed through a court of law what is the reason it is like a loan and it is not subject to the restrictions of usury because he did not give it to him with this intention and the sabbatical year does not cause its cancellation because the scriptural injunction he shall not exact cannot be applied to it and the firstborn does not receive a double portion because it is perspective and a firstborn does not receive a double portion in perspective property as in that which was in his father's possession at the time of his death Arkahana said this is the rule of groomsmanship if he was in town he should have come if he could hear the sound of the wedding bells he should have come if he could not hear the sound of the bells the other should have informed him he has therefore a grievance against him but must nevertheless repay him and up to how much Abbe said wedding guests are in the habit of putting in their stomachs up to the value of a zoos brought in their hands up to four zoos a half of the value of the gifts is paid in case of any higher values every man according to his importance our rabbis taught if a person rendered service to a bridegroom at a public wedding and he now desires the latter to reciprocate his services at a private wedding he may tell him at a public wedding I will act for you as you have acted for me if he rendered service to one who married a virgin and he now desires the latter to reciprocate on the occasion of his marriage with a widow he can say to him at your marriage with a virgin I will act for you as you acted for me if he rendered service to one on the occasion of his second marriage and he now desires the latter to reciprocate on the occasion of his own first marriage he can say to him when you will marry a second wife I will reciprocate if he rendered service to one on the occasion of his marriage with one woman and he now desires the latter to reciprocate on the occasion of his marriage with two the latter can say to him on the occasion of your marriage with one I will act for you as you acted for me our rabbis taught rich in possessions and rich in pomp that is a master of a rich in money and rich in oil that is a master in dialectics rich in products and rich in stores that is a master of traditions all however are dependent on the master of wheat i.e. Gemara Arzara said in the name of Rab what character is meant by the scriptural text all the days of the poor are evil a master of Gemara but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast refers to a master of the Mishnah Rabba reverse the order and this is what our Meshach has stated in the name of Rabba what characters are referred to in the scriptural text whoso Koryat stones shall be heard there with any that Cleaveth wood is warmed up thereby as he that Coriath stones shall be heard there with his reference to the masters of the mission and he that cleaveth wood is warmed up thereby as reference to the masters of Gemara our Hanada said all the days of the poor are evil refers to him who has a wicked wife but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast refers to him who has a good wife our Janay said all the days of the poor are evil refers to one who is fastidious but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast refers to one of a robust constitution our Yohanan said all the days of the poor are evil refers to one who is compassionate but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast refers to one who is cruel and our Joshua be Levi said all the days of the poor are evil refers to an impatient man but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast refers to a contented man Talmud Mas Baba Bathray our Joshua be Levi further stated all the days of the poor are evil surely there are Sabbaths and festivals. The explanation, however, is according to Samuel. For Samuel said a change of diet is the beginning of sickness. It is written in the book of Bensera. All the days of the poor are evil. Bensera says the nights also lower than all roofs is his roof, and the rain of other roofs lowers down upon his roof on the height of mountains is his vineyard, and the earth of his vineyard is washed down into the vineyards of others. Mishnah, if a person had sent wedding presents to the house of his father-in-law, even if he sent a hundred mina and ate there a bridegroom's meal, even if it were only of the value of one dinar, they cannot any more be reclaimed. If, however, he did not eat there a bridegroom's meal, they may be reclaimed. If he sent many presents which were to return with her to the house of her husband, these may be reclaimed. If, however, he sent a few presents which she was to use at the house of her father, these may not be. Reclaimed Gemara Rabbah said only when the meal was worth a dinar but not when it was worth less than a dinar is not this obvious we have surely learned one dinar it might have been assumed that the same law applies even to the case where it was worth less than a dinar and that the reason why a dinar was mentioned was because that was the usual cost hence it was necessary to teach us that we do not say so we learned he ate what is the law if he drank we learned he what is it. Law in the case of his representative we learned there what if it was sent to him come and hear what Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel it once happened with a certain man who had sent to the house of his
The appreciation took place in her possession. This is undecided. Rabba inquired, What is the law in the case of gifts intended to be used up that were not used up? Come and hear. And this practical question was brought up by Araha, the governor of the castle, before the sages Adisha, and they decided that gifts intended to be used up cannot be reclaimed, and such as are not intended to be used up may be reclaimed. Does not this refer even to the case where they were not used up nowhere? They were used up. Come and hear. If, however, he sent a few presents which she was to use at the house of her father, these may not be reclaimed. Rabba interpreted the mission as referring to a veil or a hairnet. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, it once happened that a certain person sent to the house of his father in law new wine and new oil and garments of new linen at the Pentecost season. What does this teach us? If you wish, I would say the praise of the land of Israel and if you. Prefer it, I would say that if he advances such a plea, it is accepted. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, it once happened that a certain person was told that his wife was defective in the sense of smell. He followed her into a ruin to test her. He said unto her, I sense the smell of radish in Galilee Talmud. Mas Baba Bathrabi, she said to him, Would that one gave me of the dates of Jericho and El would eat with it there upon the ruin fell upon her and she died. The sages decided since he only followed her in order to test her, he is not entitled to be her heir if she died during the test. Few presents which she was to use at the house of her father, etc. Rabin the elder sat before our papa and stated the following whether she died or he died or he retracted the wedding gifts are to be returned. Food stuff S and drink S are not to be returned if however she retracted even a bundle of vegetables must be returned. Arhuna the son of our Joshua said and it is valued for them at the Cheap ER price of meat up to how much is considered cheap up to a third mission. If a dying man gave all his property in writing to others and left for himself some piece of land, his gift is valid. If however he did not leave for himself some piece of land, his gift is invalid. Gamari, who is the tanner that holds a view that the assumed motive is a determining factor, our nomin replied, It is a view of our Simeon Bimanasia, for it was taught in the case of a person whose son went to a distant country and having heard that the latter had died, assigned all his property in writing to a stranger, though his son subsequently appeared, his gift is nevertheless legally valid. Our Simeon Bimanasia said his gift is not legally valid, for had he known that his son was alive, he would not have given it away. Our she's hate said it is a view of our Simeon Chizuri, for it was taught at first it was held that when one who was let out in chains said, Write a bill of divorce for my wife. It is to be written and delivered to her later. However, it was held that the same law applies also to one who goes out to sea or on a caravan journey. Our Simeon Chizuri said the same law also applies to one who is dangerously ill. For what reason, however, does not our Naman establish it in accordance with the view of our Simeon Chizuri? There, the case is different since he said right. And why does not our Shizhate establish it in accordance with the view of our Simeon Bimanasia? Well, grounded assumption is different. Who is the author of the following ruling, which was taught by our rabbis? If a person was lying ill in bed and was asked to whom shall your estate be given, and he replied, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra El thought I had a son. Now, however, that I have no son, let my estate be given to X. Or if a person was lying ill in bed and on being asked to whom his estate shall be given, he replied, I thought my wife was with child. Now, however, that my wife is not with. Child, let my estate be given to X, and it subsequently transpired that he had a son or that his wife was pregnant. His gift is invalid. Is it to be assumed that the statement represents the view of our Simeon Bimanasia and not that of the rabbis? It may even be said to represent the view of the rabbis, but I thought is different. And what did he then raise the question? Imagine it might be suggested that he was merely mentioning his grief, hence it was necessary to teach us that this is not so. Our Zara said in the name of Rab, whence is it proved that the gift of a dying man is considered valid by the Torah? For it is said, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter, which implies that there exists another transfer which is the same as this one, and which is that it is a gift of a dying man. Our in the name of Rabbi Abba said it may be derived from the following, then shall ye give his inheritance unto his brethren, which implies that there Exist another giving which is like this one and which is it, it is a gift of a dying man why does not our nomin derive it from and ye shall cause to pass he requires that expression for the following according to rabbi for it was taught rabbi said in the case of all the relatives the expression of giving is used but here the expression used is that of causing to pass in order to teach you that no other but a daughter causes an inheritance to pass from one tribe to another tribe since in her case her son and her husband are her heirs and why does not our zera derive it from and shall ye give this is the usual expression of scripture our be jeremiah said it may be derived from the following in those days was hezekiah sick unto death and isaiah the prophet the son of Amos came to him and said unto him thus set the lord set thy house in order for thou shalt die and not live by mere verbal instruction rami be ezekiel said it may be derived from it Following and when Ahitophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home into his city and set his house in order and strangled himself by mere verbal instruction. Our rabbis taught Ahitophel advised his sons three things: take no part in strife and do not rebel against the government of the house of David. And if the weather on the festival of Pentecost is fine, Saudi Marzitra stated it was said cloudy. The Nehardian said in the name of our Jacob, fine. Does not mean absolutely fine, nor does cloudy mean completely overcast. But even when it is cloudy and the north wind blows, the clouds it is regarded as fine. Our rabbis said to our Ashi, we rely upon the weather information of our Isaac B. of Dimi. For our Isaac B. of Dimi said at the termination of the last day of tabernacles, all watched the smoke of the wood pile. If it inclined towards the north, the poor rejoiced and landowners were distressed because that was an indication that the yearly. Rains would be heavy and the crops would decay if it inclined towards the south. The poor were distressed and landowners rejoiced because that was an indication that the yearly rains would be scanty and the crops could be preserved if it inclined towards the east. All were glad towards the west. All were distressed. The contradiction was raised. The east wind is always beneficial. The west wind is always harmful. The north wind is beneficial for wheat that reached the stage of a third of its maturity and harmful for olives in blossom. And the south wind is injurious for wheat that reached the stage of a third of maturity and beneficial for olives in blossom. And our Joseph, others say Marzitra and others say Arnaman B. Isaac said, Your mnemonic is table in the north and cantilever in the south. The one increases its own and the other increases its own. There is no difficulty this for us and that for them it was taught. Abbasal said, Fine weather at the festival of Pentecost. Is a good sign for all the year. Arzibit said, if the first day of the new year is warm, all the year will be warm. If cold, all the year will be cold. Of what religious significance is this weather information? Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, in respect of the prayer of the high priest on the day of atonement, Rabbah, however, said in the name of Arnaman, the validity of the verbal gift of a dying man is a mere provision of the rabbis, lest his mind become affected. But did Arnaman say so? Surely are. Naman said, although Samuel had stated that if a person sold a bond of indebtedness to another and subsequently remitted the debt, it is remitted, and that even an heir may remit, Samuel nevertheless admits that if he presented it to him as a gift of a dying man, he cannot subsequently remit it. Now, if it is agreed that this is biblical, one can well understand the reason why one cannot remit the debt. If, however, it is maintained that this is merely rabbinical, why should he not be able? To remit it, it is not biblical, but was given the same force as a law of the Torah. Rabbi said in the name of Arnaman, if a dying man said, Let X live in this house, or let X eat the fruit of the state tree, his instructions are to be disregarded unless he used the following expression, Give this house to X that he may live in it, or give the state tree to X that he may eat of its fruit. Does this mean to imply that Arnaman holds the opinion that only the rights that a man in good health may confer may also be conferred by a dying man, while those which a man in good health cannot confer can neither be conferred by a dying man? Surely Rabbi said in the name of Arnaman Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, if a dying man said, Give my loan to X, his loan is immediately acquired by X, although a man in good health has no such power. Our Papa replied, Since an heir inherits it, Araha, the son of Rik, replied, Alone is also transferable in the case of a man in good health, and this is in. Accordance with the statement of Arhuna in the name of Rab, for Arhuna said in the name of Rab, if one said you owe me a man to give it to X in the presence of the three
specifically added except its upper story Rabba said in the name of Arnaman if you can find a reason for the decision that he who sold a house to one and its upper story to another has not reserved anything from the airspace of the courtyard if he specifically added except its upper story he did reserve a portion of the airspace of the courtyard and this is in accordance with the view of Arzibit who stated that if he wished to attach moldings to it he may do so from this. It clearly follows that because he specifically reserved for himself the upper story he has also reserved the place of the moldings are Joseph B. Menumi said in the name of Arnaman if a dying man gave all his property in writing to strangers the following should be noted if he did it by way of distribution and if he died all of them acquire possession if he recovered he may withdraw in the case of all of them if however he did it after consideration and if he died all of the acquire possession if he recovered he may only withdraw in the case of the last but is it not possible that he merely considered the matter and then gave the further gifts it is usual for a dying man carefully to consider the whole matter first and subsequently to distribute the gifts are Abu B. Menumi said in the name of Arnaman if a dying man gave all his property in writing to strangers and then recovered he may not withdraw the gifts since it may be suspected that he has possessions in another country under what circumstances however is the case of our mission where it is stated that if he did not leave some ground his gift was invalid possible our hammer replied in the case where he said all my possessions Marsan of Arashi replied in the case where it is known to us that he has none the question was raised is partial withdrawal considered complete withdrawal or not come and here if a dying man gave all his possessions to the first and a part of them to the second the second acquires ownership and the first does not does not this refer to the case where the testator died nowhere he recovered logical reasoning also supports this view since the final clause reads if he gave a part of his possessions to the first and all of them to the second the first acquires ownership and the second does not now if the barita is said to refer to the case where he recovered one can well understand why the second does not acquire Possession if however it is said to refer to the case where he died both should have acquired ownership are Yamar said to Arashi even if it be explained as referring to the case where he recovered the following objection may be raised if it is said that partial withdrawal is considered complete withdrawal one can at least understand why the second acquires possession if however it is said that partial withdrawal is not considered complete withdrawal the testator should be regarded as one who distributes his possessions and none of them should acquire ownership and the law is that partial withdrawal is considered complete withdrawal hence the first clause of the barita may be applicable either to the case where he died or to that where he recovered the final clause can only be applicable to the case where he recovered the question was raised if a dying man consecrated all his possessions and subsequently recovered what is the law is it Assume that whenever it is a case of consecrated objects the transfer of possession made is unqualified or perhaps when it is a matter of personal interest one does not transfer unqualified possession if the answer is in the affirmative the question arises what is the law in the case where he renounced the ownership of all his property is it assumed that since ownerless property may be seized by the poor as well as by the rich he transfers therefore unqualified possession or perhaps whenever it is a matter of personal interest one does not transfer unqualified possession if the answer is in the negative what it may be asked is the law where he distributed all his possessions among the poor is it assumed that in a matter of charity he has undoubtedly transferred unqualified possession or perhaps wherever it is a matter of personal interest one does not transfer unqualified possession this is undecided or she's hate stated he shall take acquire occupy and own use by a dying man are all legal expressions denoting gift in the Beretha. It was taught the expressions of he shall receive the bequest and he shall be heir are also legal in the case of one who is entitled to be his heir and this is in accordance with the view of our Yohan and Bibaraka. The question was raised Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, what if he said let him have the benefit of them thus either by imply that they all shall be treated as a gift or perhaps he only meant that he shall have some benefit from them. What is the law where he said he shall see them stand in them recline upon them? This is undecided. The question was raised what is the law in the case where a dying man has sold all his possessions? Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if he recovered he may not withdraw sometimes. However Rab Judah said in the name of Rab that if he recovered he may withdraw but there is no contradiction between the two statements. The one refers to the case where the money is. Still available the other to the case where he paid away for his debt the question was raised what if a dying man spontaneously admitted a debt come and here the proselyte Israel had 12,000 zoos deposited with Rabbah the conception of his son Armari was not in holiness though his birth was in holiness and he was then at school Rabbah said how could Mari gain possession of this money if as an inheritance surely he is not entitled to it as an heir if as a gift the gift surely of a dying man has been given by the rabbis the same legal force as that of an inheritance and consequently whosoever is entitled to an inheritance is also entitled to a gift and whosoever is not entitled to an inheritance is not entitled to a gift either if by pulling they are surely not with him if by exchange a coin cannot be acquired by exchange if on the basis of land he has no land if in the presence of the three of us if he were to send for me I would not go R. I.K. son of R.M. I demurred while let Isra acknowledge that that money belongs to Armari and the latter would acquire it by virtue of this admission. Meanwhile there issued such an acknowledgement from the house of Isra whereupon Rabba was annoyed and said they teach people what to say and cause loss to me Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and left for himself some piece of land his gift is valid and how much is some Rab Judah said in the name of Rab land sufficient for his maintenance while our Jeremiah B. Abba said even if only movables that are sufficient for his maintenance our Zara exclaimed how accurate are the reported traditions of the elders what is the reason in the case of the reservation of land because he depended on it for his maintenance if he should recover in the case of movables also it may be assumed that he depended on them if he were to recover our Joseph demurred where is the accuracy against him who said movables it may be objected that we learned. Land while against him who said sufficient for his maintenance it may be objected that we learned whatsoever Abbe replied to him do you suggest that wherever land is stated land only is meant surely we learned if one gave all his property to his slave in writing the latter goes forth as a free man if he left for himself any land whatsoever the slave does not go forth as a free man our Simeon said the slave is always free unless the master said all my possessions are given to my slave x except the ten thousand part of them Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra A and Ardimi B. Joseph said in the name of our Eliezer movables in the case of a slave were regarded as a reservation but movables in the case of a Kathubo were not regarded as a reservation there are Joseph retorted it would have been proper that the term land should not have been used at all only because in the first part of the mission it was stated our Akiba said land of any size is liable to have the ears at its corner s left for the poor and to the bringing of its first ripe fruit to Jerusalem the principle may be written in connection with it and movable property may be acquired in conjunction with it by means of money deed and possession the term land was in consequence used in the second part of this mission also and do you suggest Abbe again ask our Joseph that wherever whatsoever was taught no minimum size is required surely we learned our dose of Behorkin has said five views which supply fleeces of the weight of a mina and a half each are subject to the law of the fist of the fleece but the sages said even five views which supply any quantity whatsoever of wool and to the question how much was meant by any quantity whatsoever Rab replied a total of a mina and a half provided each supplies no less than a fifth of the total quantity there are Joseph retorted it would have been proper that the expression any quantity whatsoever should not have been used at all only because the first tana speaks of a large quantity the sages also speak of a small quantity which is described as any quantity whatsoever it is obvious if a person said my movables shall be given to x the latter requires possession of all the things he used except wheat and barley if he said all my movables shall be given to x the latter requires possession even of wheat and barley and even of the upper millstone except the lower millstone if he said all that can be moved the latter requires possession even of the lower millstone the question however was raised is a slave regarded as real estate or as movables are Ahasan of Arawi said to Arashi come and here he who sold a town has also sold its houses dishes and caves its bathhouses olive presses and irrigation works but not the movables that it contains in the case however where he said it and all that it contains all its contents even if it consisted of cattle or slaves are sold now if it is granted that slaves are like movables one can well understand why they are not included in the sale in the first case if however it is assumed that they are like real estate why are they
Real estate that moves is different from real estate that does not move. Robin said to Arashi, Come and here if one gave all his property to his slave in writing a letter goes forth as a free man if he left for himself any land whatsoever. The slave does not go forth as a free man. Arsimian said the slave is always free unless the master said all my possessions are given to my slave except to ten thousand part of them and Ardini B. Joseph said in the name of our Eliezer movables. In the case of a slave are regarded as a reservation but movables in the case of a Kethuba are not regarded as a reservation and Rabba asked Arnaman what is the reason to which the latter replied a slave is regarded as movables and in the case of movables movables are regarded as a reservation the Kethuba of a woman however is payable from real estate and in the case of real estate movables are not regarded as a reservation Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. He replied to him we explain. This as being due to the fact that the freedom certificate is not complete Rabba said in the name of Arnaman in five cases it is necessary that all one's possessions shall be given away in writing and they are the following the case of a dying man one slave one s wife one sons and a woman who keeps her husband away from her estate a dying man for we learned if a dying man gave all his property in writing to others and left for himself some piece of land his gift is valid if However, he did not leave for himself some piece of land. His gift is invalid. One slave, for we learned if one gave all his property to his slave in writing, the latter goes forth as a free man. If he left for himself some lands, the slave does not go forth as a free man. One's wife, for Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, if a dying man gave all his property to his wife in writing, he thereby only appointed her administratrix. One sons, for we learned if a person assigns all his property to his sons in writing, and he has assigned also to his wife a piece of land of any size whatsoever, she loses the claims of her kethuba. A woman who keeps her husband away from her estate, for a master said, a woman who desires to keep her husband away from her estate must give away all her estate in writing. In all these cases, movables are also regarded as a reservation, except in that of a kethuba, since in respect to it, the rabbis have enacted that a woman has a. Claim upon lands but have not provided her with the right of collecting it from movables. Amimar said movables that are entered in the Kethuba and are also available are regarded as a reservation if a person said my property shall be given to X slave S are included for we learned if one gave all his property to his slave in writing the letter goes forth as a free man land is described as property for we learned property which has a security may be acquired by means of money. Deed and possession a cloak is called property for we learned and that which has no security can only be acquired by means of pulling money is called property for we learned and that which has no security may be acquired in conjunction with property which has a security bought jointly with it by means of money deed and possession as in the case of our papa who had a money claim of 12,000 zoos at PQZ and he passed them over into the possession of our Samuel Biaha by virtue of it. Threshold of his house, and when the latter came back, he went out to meet him as far as to a deed is called property for Rabbi Isaac said there are two kinds of deeds. If a person says take possession of the field on behalf of X and write for him the deed, he may withdraw the deed, but not the field. If however he says take possession of the field on condition that you write for him the deed, he may withdraw both the deed and the field. But our high Avin said in the name of our Hunavir. Our three kinds of deeds two have just been described, and the third is one which the seller writes before the sale in accordance with the law. We have learned that Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra a deed may be written for the seller, though the buyer is not with him in this case. As soon as the buyer takes possession of the ground, he acquires also the deed irrespective of the place in which it is kept, and this accords with what we have learned that movable property may be acquired with. Landed property by means of money deed and possession cattle are called property for we learned if a person consecrated his property which contained cattle suitable as sacrifices for the altar males are to be sold for burnt offerings and females are to be sold for peace offerings birds are called property for we learned if a person consecrated his property which contained things suitable for sacrifices for the altar such as wines oils and birds etc phylacteries are called property for we learned if a person consecrated his property his phylacteries also are taken away from him the question was raised what is the law in the case of a scroll of the law is it not regarded as property since it is unsaleable because it is prohibited to sell it or perhaps since it may be sold in order to study Torah or to take a wife it is regarded as property this is undecided Nimani Zitra the mother of Amram of two sisters are Toby and Ardini and Arjoseph the mother of Arzitra B. Tobia. Gave her property in writing to Arzitra B. Tobia because she intended to marry Arzi but she duly married but was subsequently divorced. She thereupon appeared before Arbi Bibi He said she made a gift of her property because she desired to marry and behold she married Arhuna the son of Arjashua said unto him because you are yourselves frail beings you speak frail words even according to him who said that a gift given by a woman who wished to keep it away from her future husband is acquired by the recipient. This law is only applicable to a case where the woman did not declare her reason here however she has specifically declared that she made the gift because she wished to marry and surely though she married she was now divorced the mother of Rami Bihama gave her property in writing to Rami Bihama in the evening but in the morning she gave them in writing to Arak Bihama Rami Bihama came before Arshis who confirmed him in the possession of it. Property Arak Bihama, however, went to Arnaman, who similarly confirmed him in the possession of the property. Arshis hate thereupon appeared before Arnaman and said unto him, What is the reason that the master has confirmed Arak Bihama in possession? Is it because she retracted? Surely she died. He replied unto him, Thus said Samuel, wherever a person may retract, if he recovered, he may also withdraw his gift. May it be suggested that Samuel said this in the case only where the withdrawal was for himself. Did he, however, say this in the case where the withdrawal was in favor of another person? He replied unto him, Samuel distinctly stated whether for himself or for another, the mother of Aram the pious had a case of notes of indebtedness while she was dying. She said, Let it be given to my son Aram. His brothers appeared before Arnaman and said to him, Surely he did not pull the case of documents. He replied unto them, The instructions of a dying person are. Regarded legally as written and delivered the sister of Artobi B. Armathena gave her possessions in writing to Artobi B. Armathena in the morning and the evening Ahad boy son of Armathena came and wept before her saying now people will say that one is a scholar and the other is no scholar so she gave them in writing to him he subsequently appeared before Arnaman who said unto him thus said Samuel wherever a person may retract if he recovers he may also withdraw his gift it. Sister of Ardini B. Joseph had a piece of an orchard whenever she fell ill she transferred the ownership of it to him Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. But as soon as she recovered she withdrew on one occasion she fell ill and sent word to him come and take possession he replied I have no desire thereupon she again sent word to him come and take possession in whatever manner you desire then he went left for her some portion of the intended gift and symbolic acquisition from her was. Also arranged as she again recovered she retracted and came before Arnaman he sent for him he however did not come saying why should I come surely some portion of the estate was left to her and symbolic acquisition from her also took place thereupon he sent to him the following message if you do not come I will chastise you with a thorn that causes no blood to flow he asked the witnesses how the incident had occurred and they told him that when she sent for her brother she exclaimed thus alas that I am dying he said unto them if so the disposal of her estate was due to her expectation of death and he that gives instructions owing to his expectation of death may retract it was stated in the case where a dying man presented a part of his estate Rabbah said in the name of Arnaman it is like the gift of a man in good health and requires symbolic acquisition the rabbis reported the following in the presence of Rabbah in the name of Marzitra of Arnaman who reported in the name of Arnaman it is like the gift of a man in good health and it is like the gift of a man who is dying it is like the gift of a man in good health in that if he recovered he cannot retract and it is like the gift of a man who is dying in that no symbolic acquisition is required Rabbah said unto them did I not tell you that you shall not hang empty jars on Arnaman thus said Arnaman it is like the gift of a man in good health and requires symbolic acquisition Rabbah raised an objection against Arnaman if he left for himself any land whatsoever his gift is valid does not this refer to the case where no symbolic acquisition from him took place nowhere symbolic acquisition did take place if so explain the second clause if however he did not leave for himself any land whatsoever his gift is invalid now if
Divorce is not an object for symbolic acquisition, so this also was not attended by a symbolic acquisition. There also it is a case of one giving instructions clearly on account of his expectation of death. Are who not the son of Arjashu replied elsewhere? An instruction given owing to the expectation of death requires symbolic acquisition, but the Mishnah you have mentioned referred to the case of one who distributed all his estate. For in such a case, it was given the same legal force as the gift of a dying man, and the law is that where a dying man presented a part of his estate, symbolic acquisition is required. Although he subsequently died, if however his instructions concerning the gift were due to his expectation of death, no symbolic acquisition is required. This, however, only when he died, if he recovered, he may retract, even though symbolic acquisition from him took place. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, it was stated as to the gift of a dying man in the deed. Of which was recorded symbolic acquisition. The school of Rab in the name of Rab reported that the testator has thereby made him ride on two harnessed horses. But Samuel said, I do not know what decision to give on the matter. The school of Rab reported in the name of Rab that he made him ride on two harnessed horses, for it is like the gift of a man in good health, and it is also like the gift of a dying man. It is like the gift of a man in good health, and that if he recovered, he cannot retract, and it is like the gift of a dying man, and that if he said that his loan shall be given to X, his loan is to be given to X. Samuel, however, had said, I do not know what decision to give on the matter, since it is possible that he decided not to transfer possession to him except through the deed, and no possession by means of a deed may be acquired after the testator's death. A contradiction was pointed out between one statement of Rab and another statement of his end between. One statement of Samuel and another statement of his for being sent in the name of our be it known to you that our Eliezer had sent to the diaspora in the name of our master that where a dying man said right and deliver remainder to X and he died they must neither write the deed nor deliver the remainder because it is possible that the testator had decided not to transfer possession to him except through the deed and no possession by means of a deed may be acquired after the testator's death and Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel that the law is that one may both write and deliver does not this present a contradiction between one statement of Rab and another statement of his and between one statement of Samuel and another statement of his there is no contradiction between the two statements of Rab one deals with the case where symbolic acquisition took place the other where no symbolic acquisition took place there is also no contradiction between the two statements of Samuel because in the latter case the reference is to one who specifically strengthened his claims Arnaman B. Isaac sat behind Rabba while Rabba was sitting before Arnaman when he addressed to him the following inquiry did Samuel say since it is possible that he decided not to transfer possession to him except through the deed and no possession by means of a deed may be acquired after the testator's death surely Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel if a dying man gave all his property in writing to strangers although symbolic acquisition took place he may retract if he recovered Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi because it is known that the symbolic acquisition took place only on account of his expectation of death he answered him by wave of his hand and remained silent when he rose Arnaman B. Isaac asked Rabba what did he indicate to you Rabba replied to him that Rab Judah's report refers to the case where the testator strengthened it. Donis claims in what manner is it indicated that one wished to strengthen the Donis claims are his door replied by including in the deed the formula and we acquired from him in addition to this presentation of the gift it is obvious that where a dying man gave all his estate in writing to one man and subsequently to another the law is the very same as that which our enunciated when he came this one will annul another will if however he wrote a deed of the gift and handed it to one and subsequently wrote a deed of the gift and handed it to another Rab said the first acquires its ownership while Samuel said the second acquires its ownership Rab said the first acquires its ownership for it is like the gift of a person in good health while Samuel said the second acquires its ownership for it is like the gift of a dying man but surely their difference of opinion on the principle has already once been expressed in the case of the deed of a Gift of a dying man in which symbolic acquisition was entered both are required for if their dispute had been stated in connection with the first case it might have been assumed that in that case only Rab adheres to his opinion because symbolic acquisition took place but in this case where no symbolic acquisition took place it might have been suggested that he agrees with Samuel and if their dispute had been stated in connection with the second case it might have been assumed that in that case only Samuel adheres to his opinion but in that case it might have been suggested that he agrees with Rab hence both were required at Surah they taught as above at Pamadai they taught as follows our Jeremiah B. Abba said the following inquiry was sent from the academy to Samuel will our master instruct us as to what is the law in the case where a dying man gave all his estate to strangers in writing and symbolic acquisition also took place but was not entered in the deed he replied to them after symbolic acquisition no withdrawal is of any avail Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra they understood him to mean that this decision applied only to the case of withdrawal in favor of a stranger but not for himself or his da however said unto them when Arhuna came from Kafri he explained it to mean whether for himself or for others there was a certain man from whom symbolic acquisition was taken who came before Arhuna the latter said what can I do? For you in such a case where you did not transfer possession as other people do there was a certain deed of a gift in which there was entered in life and in death Rab said behold it is to be treated like the usual gift of a dying man and Samuel said behold it is to be treated like the gift of a man in good health Rab said behold it is like the gift of a dying man since it contains the entry in death the testator meant thereby the don't need to acquire possession after death while the insertion in life was just for good luck and Samuel said behold it is like the gift of a man in good health since it contained the entry in life the testator thereby meant to transfer possession while he was alive while his entry of and in death is only like one saying from now and forevermore the scholars of Nihardia stated the law is in accordance with the decision of Rab Rabba said if however the deed contains the entry from life the Doni acquires immediate possession. Amimar said the law is not according to the view of Rabba said Arashi to Amimar is not this obvious seeing that the scholars of Nihardia distinctly said that the law was in accordance with the decision of Rab it might have been assumed that where the entry was from life Rab agrees hence it was necessary to teach us otherwise there was a certain person who once came with an inquiry to Nihardia before Arnaman but he sent him to Shantamaya before our Jeremiah B. Abba declaring this. Is Samuel's province how could we act in accordance with the decision of Rab? There was a certain woman who once came before Rabba to ask for his ruling as Rabba gave his decision in accordance with his traditional teaching she worried him he consequently said to our Papa the son of Arhan and his scribe go write for her a statement but add to it he may hire at their expense or deceive them she called out may your ship sink are you trying to fool me Rabba's clothes were soaked in water and yet he did not escape the drowning mission if he has not entered in it that he was lying sick and he not pleads I was lying sick and they plead you were in good health he must produce evidence that he was a dying man these are the words of our Mayor the sages however say he who claims from the other must produce the proof tomorrow once a deed of a gift contained the entry as he was lying sick in his bed but not and as a result of his illness he departed from the world Talmud, Mas Baba. Bathrabi Rabba said behold he is dead and his grave indeed proves this Abbe however said to him how now if in the case of a ship that sank where most of the passengers are doomed to perish we apply to the victims the restrictions of living men and the restrictions of dead men how much more ought we to do so in the case of sick men of whom most do recover are who not the son of our Joshua said in accordance with whose view may that reported statement of Rabba be justified in accordance with the view of our Nathan for it was taught who takes away from whom he takes away of their possession without proof but they cannot take away of his possession except by the production of proof these are the words of our Jacob our Nathan however said if he was in good health he must produce proof that at the time the gift was made he was lying sick if he was lying sick they must produce proof that at the time the gift was made he was in good health our Eliezer said as regards Levitical uncleanness also they differ in their views on the same principles as in this dispute for we learned a wall valley in the summer is subject to the laws of a private domain in respect of the Sabbath and to those of a public domain in respect of Levitical uncleanness in the rainy season it is regarded as a private domain in both respects Rabba said this has reference only to the case where a winter has not passed over it but where a winter has passed over it it is regarded as a private domain in all respects the sages however say he who claims from the other has to produce the
Witnesses are all powerful and they themselves impair the validity of the document, but here where all the force of the document does not depend on him, it might have been assumed that he is not believed, and if their dispute had been stated in connection with this alone, it might have been assumed that in this case only did our mayor say that the donor is not believed, but in that case it might have been assumed that he agrees with the rabbis, hence both were required rabbi. Likewise stated that the proof is by witnesses have they said unto him what is the reason if it be said because in all deeds it is entered as he was able to walk about in the street and in this deed no such entry is made therefore it is to be concluded that when the gift was made he was a dying man it may be retorted on the contrary since in all deeds it is entered as he was lying sick in his bed and in this deed no such entry is made therefore it is to be concluded that when he made the gift he was in good health as one inference is just as reasonable as the other replied rather the money is to remain in the possession of its original owner and the following are in the same dispute for our Yohanan said proof must be produced by witnesses and our Simeon Belakish said proof consists in the attestation of the deed our Yohanan pointed out the following objection against our Simeon Belakish it once happened at Bani Barak that a person sold his fathers estate and died the members of the family thereupon protested that he was a minor at the time of his death they came to our Akiva and asked whether the body might be examined he replied to them you are not permitted to disannul him and furthermore the signs of maturity usually undergo a change after death Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. Now according to my interpretation of our mission that evidence is produced by the testimony of witnesses one can well understand why when he asked the buyers to bring witnesses and they could not obtain them they came to ask him whether the body might not be examined but according to your interpretation that evidence consists in the attestation of the deed why should they wish to examine the body let them procure the attestation of their deeds and thus gain possession of the property do you think replied our Lakish that the property was in the possession of the members of the family and that the buyers came to protest this was not the case the property was in the possession of the buyers and the members of the family came and protested logical reasoning also supports this view since when he said to them you are not permitted to disannul him they remained silent if it is granted that the members of the family protested one can well understand why they remained silent if however it be assumed that the buyers protested why it may be asked did they remain silent they should have replied to him we paid him money let him be disannulled if only because of this there would be no argument for our Akiva may have said to them thus in the first place a post-mortem must not be held because you are not permitted to disannul him and furthermore in case you might say he took our money let him be disannulled the signs of maturity usually undergo a change after death our Simeon Belakish inquired of our Yohanan with reference to what has been taught in the mission of Barkhapur that if a Person was enjoying the use of the field on the strength of the current belief that it was his, and someone lodged a protest against him, claiming it is mine. And the first produced his deed, stating, "You sold it to me, or you gave it to me as a gift." If the latter said, "I never saw this deed," the deed is to be attested by those who signed it. If, however, he said it was a deed of trust or a deed given on trust for something which I sold you, but for which you did not pay me the price, then if witnesses are available, one must be guided by witnesses. But if they are not available, one is to be guided by the deed. Are we to assume, ask Reshlakish, that this is in accordance with the opinion of our mayor, who stated that where one admits that he wrote the deed, attestation is not required, but not in accordance with the view of the rabbis? Here, Yohanan replied to him, "No, because I maintain that all agree that where one admitted that he wrote a deed, no attestation." Is required, but surely Rush Lakish rejoined they are actually in dispute on this question as it was taught they are not believed so far as to invalidate it. These are the words of our mayor, but the sages say they are believed. He replied to him, Should he because witnesses are all powerful and may impair the validity of the deed have the same power as if all depended on him? But Rush Lakish asked him again in your own name, it was reported that the members of the family have justly protested. He replied to him, This was said by Eliezer. I have never said such a thing. Arzira said if our Yohanan could contradict his disciple, our Eliezer would he contradict his master Arjane for Arjane said in the name of Rabbi, though one admits that he wrote a deed attestation is nevertheless required, and our Yohanan said to him, Is not this master the law enunciated in our mission where it is stated, and the sages say he who claims from the other has to produce the proof and proof. Can be produced only through the attestation of the deed acceptable, however, are the words of our master Joseph. For our master Joseph, in the name of Rab Judah, in the name of Samuel, said, This is the view of the sages, but our mayor said, Though one admits the writing of a deed attestation is nevertheless required, and as to the expression, all agree the words of the rabbis in relation to those of our mayor may be described as the words of all, but surely we learn the reverse, and the sages say, He who claims from the other has to produce the proof, reverse the order, but surely it was taught they are not believed so far as to invalidate it. These are the words of our mayor, and the sages say they are believed, reverse the order, but surely our Yohanan said, Proof must be produced by witnesses, reverse the order. Is it then to be assumed that the objection also is to be reversed? No Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, thus said, Our Yohanan to our Simeon Belakish, according to my interpretation. That proof is produced through the attestation of the deed. One can well understand how it was possible for the buyers to seize the property according to you. However, since you maintain that proof is to be produced through the evidence of witnesses, how was it possible for the buyers to seize the property? He replied to him in the case of a protest on the part of members of the family. I agree with you that it is no legal protest for what do they plead that he was a minor, but it is an established fact that witnesses do not sign a deed unless they know that he was of age. It was stated at what age may a minor sell his deceased father's estate. Rabbi said in the name of Arnaman when he is 18 years of age and Arunabi Hanan is said in the name of Arnaman when 20 years of age. Arzera raised an objection and once happened at Bani Barak that a person sold his father's estate and died. The members of his family thereupon protested asserting that he was a minor. At the time of his death they came to our Akiva and asked whether the body might be examined he replied to them you are not permitted to disannul him and furthermore the signs of maturity usually undergo a change after death now according to him who said 18 years of age Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. One can well understand the reason why they came and asked whether the corpse might be examined if however it is said at 20 what useful purpose could the examination serve surely we learned if at the age of 20 he did not produce two hairs they shall bring evidence that he is 20 years old and he becomes a sorry he may neither perform the lizard nor the Levirate marriage has it not been stated in connection with this mission our Samuel son of our Isaac said in the name of Rab that only applies to the case where other symptoms of a sorry also appeared on his body Rabba said this may also be arrived at by deduction for it was taught and he becomes a sorry from which this may well be deduced and in the case where no symptoms of a sorry developed how long is one regarded a minor our high taught until he has passed middle age whenever such a case came before our high he used to tell them if the youth was emaciated let him first be fattened and if he was stout he used to tell them let him first be made to lose weight for these symptoms appear sometimes as a result of emaciation and sometimes they develop as a result of stoutness the question was raised is the intervening period regarded as that of under or over age Rabbi said in the name of Arnaman the intervening period is regarded as that of under age Rabbi son of Arshila said in the name of Arnaman the intervening period is regarded as that of over age that view of Rabbi however was not stated explicitly but was arrived at inferentially for there was a certain youth who during his intervening period went and sold the estate of his deceased father he came before Rabbah who decided that the action was illegal the student who saw what had happened thought that Rabbah's reason was because during the intervening period one is regarded as being underage but this is not so in this particular case Rabbah observed excessive foolishness for the youth was also liberating his slaves without any apparent cause it'll be Manishah sent the following inquiry to Rabbah will our master instruct us as to what is the ruling in the case of a girl who is 14 years and one day old and understands how to carry on business he sent word to him in reply if she understands how to carry on a business her purchase is legal purchase and her sale is legal sale why did he not inquire of him about the case of a boy the incident happened to be such why did he not address his inquiry with reference to a girl who is 12 years and one day old that case happened to be of such a nature a certain Youth who was under 20 years of age sold the estate he inherited from his father in accordance with the decision sent to
Said Arashi to Umumar how now if in the case of a sale where he receives money it has been said that it is not valid because it is possible that he might sell too cheaply how much more so in the case of a gift where he receives nothing he replied to him Talmud, Mas Baba Bathre and according to your reasoning if he sold something worth five for six would his sale indeed be legally valid but this is the reason the rabbis were well aware that a child is susceptible to the temptations of money and if it would have been laid down that a sale of his is legally valid people might sometimes rattle money before him and he would be tempted to sell all the possessions of his dead father in the case of a gift however it is known that had he not had some benefit from him he would not have presented him with a gift the rabbis therefore said that his gift shall be a legal gift in order that people might render him service Arnam and said in the name of Samuel a youth must be examined to ascertain whether he has the signs of maturity in respect of betrothal divorce Eliza declarations of refusal but in regard to the sale of the estate of his father he cannot do so until he becomes 20 years of age but since the youth was examined in respect of his betrothal what need is there for an examination in respect of his divorce this law is required only in the case of a youth who married his dead brother's widow for we learned if a boy of the age of nine years and a day had connection with his sister-in-law he has acquired her as wife and may not divorce her until he had attained legal age in respect of Eliza to exclude the ruling of our Jose who said in the biblical section of Eliza it is written man but in the case of a woman there is no difference between a major and a minor hence it was necessary to teach us that woman is compared to man contrary to the view of our Jose and in respect of Declarations of refusal this had to be mentioned in order to exclude the ruling of Arjuna who said a girl can exercise the right of refusal until the black predominates hence it was necessary to teach us that the law is not in accordance with the view of Arjuna and in respect of the sale of the estate of his father until he becomes 20 years of age had to be taught in order to exclude the view of him who said the youth need only be 18 years of age the law is that during the intervening period one is regarded as being underage the law is in accordance with Kittle the law is in accordance with Marzitra the law is according to Amimar and the law is in accordance with what Arnaman said in the name of Samuel in all cases Mishnah if a person distributed his possessions verbally or Eliezer said whether he was in good health or dangerously ill all real estate is acquired by means of money deed and possession while movable objects are only acquired by means of pulling Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi they said unto him the mother of the sons of Rokal once fell ill and she said let my brooch which is worth twelve mina be given to my daughter and when she died her instructions were carried out he replied to them as to the sons of Rokal may their mother bury them Gemara it was taught our Eliezer said to the sages once there lived the man of Moron in Jerusalem and he possessed much movable property which he desired to give away as gift. As he was told however that there was no means of carrying out his wish unless he transferred possession to the dunce by virtue of land transferred to them at the same time he consequently purchased a rocky piece of land near Jerusalem and gave the following instructions its northern side shall be given to X and together with it a hundred sheep and a hundred casks and its southern side shall be given to Y and together with it a hundred sheep and a hundred casks and when he died. The sages carried out his instructions. They replied to him, "Is there any proof from there?" The Maronite was in good health. He replied to them, "As to the sons of Rokal, may their mother bury them." Why did he curse them? Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, "They allowed thistles to grow in their vineyard, and our Eliezer is thereby consistent with his view. For we learned if a person allows thistles to grow in a vineyard, either by our Eliezer says causes the fruit to be forbidden, and the sages say one does not cause the fruit of a vineyard to be forbidden unless he grows a plant the like of which people usually allow to grow." Said Arhanna, "What is our Eliezer's reason? Because in Arabia they allow thistles to grow in their fields as fodder for their camels. Our Levi said symbolic acquisition may be acquired from a dying man even on the Sabbath, but this is not due to a consideration of the view of our Eliezer, but to the possibility that his peace of mind might be disturbed." Mishnah our Eliezer said on the Sabbath his verbal instructions are legally valid because he is unable to write but not on a weekday our Joshua said if they said this in respect of the Sabbath how much more so in the case of a weekday similarly one may acquire ownership on behalf of a minor but not on behalf of a person who is of age these are the words of our Eliezer our Joshua said if they allowed possession to be acquired on behalf of a minor how much more so on behalf of a person who is of age Gemara whose version is represented in our Mishnah it is that of our Judah for it was taught our Meir stated our Eliezer said on a weekday his verbal instructions are legally valid because he is able to write but not on the Sabbath our Joshua Talmud Mas Baba Bathra said they said this in respect of a weekday and how much more so in the case of the Sabbath similarly one may acquire ownership on behalf of a person who is of age but not on behalf of a minor these are the Words of our Eliezer our Joshua said if they allowed possession to be acquired on behalf of one who is of age how much more so on behalf of a minor our Judah stated our Eliezer said on the Sabbath his verbal instructions are legally valid because he is unable to write but not on a weekday our Joshua said if they said this in respect of the Sabbath how much more so in the case of a weekday similarly one may acquire ownership on behalf of a minor but not on behalf of a person who is of age these are the words of our Eliezer our Joshua said if they allowed possession to be acquired on behalf of a minor how much more so on behalf of a person who is of age Mishnah in the case where a house collapsed upon a man and his father or upon a man and those whose heir he is and that person had against him the claim of a woman's ketubah or that of a creditor and in the first case the heirs of the father plead that the son died first and the father afterwards while the Creditors plead that the father died first and the son afterwards Beth Shammai hold that the amount in dispute is to be divided and Beth Hillel hold that the estate is to remain in its former status Gemara we learned elsewhere he who lends money to another on a bond is entitled to collect his debt from the borrower's lands even though they were subsequently mortgaged if however the loan was made in the presence of witnesses it may be collected from free property only Samuel inquired what is the law in the case where the borrower entered in the bond that I may acquire and he acquired according to our mayor who holds of you that a person may transfer possession of something that has not yet come into existence there can be no question for the lender has undoubtedly acquired possession the question arises according to the view of the rabbis who maintain that a person may not transfer possession of something that has not yet come into existence are Joseph Said, come in here, and the sages say this creditor who sold him the land was prudent because thereby he was in a position to take from him a pledge. Rabbi said to him, You mean from him, from him, surely even the cloak that is upon his shoulders may be seized. Our question, however, is what is the law in the case where the borrower entered in the bond that I may acquire, and he subsequently bought and sold, or where he entered that I may acquire, and he subsequently bought or transmitted his purchase as an inheritance? Our Hannah replied, Come in here, in the case where a house collapsed upon a man and his father, or upon a man and those whose heir he is, and that person had against him the claim of a woman's ketubah or that of a creditor, and in the first case the heirs of the father plead that the son died first, and the father afterwards, while the creditors plead that the father died first, etc. Now, if it were to be assumed that where a borrower entered, in the bond that I may acquire and he subsequently bought and sold or where he entered that I may acquire and he subsequently bought or transferred his purchase as an inheritance the land does not become mortgaged to the creditor what claim could the creditors advance even if it were granted that the father had died first and that the son had consequently inherited his estate this is merely another form of the case where a bond contains the entry that I may acquire our nomin. said to them our colleague Zara has explained this as follows it is the moral duty of the orphans to repay the debt of their father our ashi demurred this surely is a verbal loan and both Rab and Samuel stated that a verbal loan cannot be collected either from the ears or from the buyer's Talmud Mas Baba Bathrabi but the fact is that this mission represents the view of our mayor who holds that a person may transfer possession of something that is not yet in existence or Jacob of Nihar Pekhod said in the name of Robin to come and here antedated bonds of indebtedness are invalid and postdated ones are valid now if it could be assumed that where the bond contained the entry that I may acquire and he subsequently bought and sold or where it contained the entry that I may acquire and he subsequently bought and transmitted the purchase as an inheritance the land is not mortgaged to the creditor why are postdated bonds valid this is surely similar to the case of
Question that follows does not arise since the land was not in any way mortgaged. If however a reason could be found for the statement that such land is mortgaged to the creditor, the question arises as to what is the ruling in the case where the debtor borrowed from one person and then borrowed from another and then purchased some real estate which he subsequently sold. Is this land mortgaged to the first lender or is it mortgaged to the second? Arnavan replied, We also have raised the same question and a reply was sent from Palestine that the first acquired the right of seizing that land. Arhuna said they divide the land among themselves and Rabbi Abba also learned that the land is to be divided between them. Rabbi said in the first version, Arashi told us that the first creditor acquired the right over the land. The second version of Arashi, however, told us that the land was to be divided and the law is that the land is to be divided. An objection was raised how is one to understand the statement that for improvement of lands one may not seize any sold property if a person has sold a field to another who improved it and a creditor of the seller came and seized it when the buyer collects from the seller he collects the value of the principal even from sold property but that of improvement from free property only now if that were so he should only be able to claim half the cost of his improvement. The expression he collects which was used also implies half the value of his improvement Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Mishnah if the house collapsed upon a man and his wife and the heirs of the husband plead that the wife died first and that the husband died afterwards while the heirs of the wife plead that the husband died first and that the wife died afterwards Beth I hold that the estate is to be divided and Beth Hillel hold that possessions are to remain with those. Who are in their established right of ownership the Ketubah in the possession of the heirs of the husband and the property that comes in and goes out with her in the possession of the heirs of the father Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Bigamar in whose established right of ownership are Yohanan said in the right of the ownership of the heirs of the husband are Eliezer said in the right of ownership of the heirs of the wife and are Simeon Bilakish in the name of Barkhapur said the estate in dispute is to be divided and so did Barkhapur teach since these appear as heirs and those appear as heirs the estate is to be divided between the Mishnah if the house collapsed upon a man and his mother both agree that the estate in dispute is to be divided our said I agree in this case that the estate is to remain with those who are in its established right of ownership Ben said to him is it not enough that we are suffering from the existing divisions of opinion that you must Come to create differences for us where unanimity was declared Gemara in whose established right of ownership are said in the established right of the ownership of the heirs of the mother Arzara said in the established right of the ownership of the heirs of the son when Arzara went up to Palestine he adopted the principle of Arlai Arzara said from this one may deduce that the climate of the land of Israel makes one wise and what is the reason Abbe replied because the inheritance has become the established possession of that tribe Benazay said to him I said not enough that we are suffering from existing divisions of opinions etc. Arsimli said this implies that Benazay was disciple and colleague of Arakiba seeing that he said to him that you come the following statement was sent from Palestine if a son borrowed on the security of the estate of his father during the lifetime of his father and he died his son may take away from the buyers and this it is that Presents a difficulty in civil law if he borrowed it may be asked what is he to take away and furthermore what has he to do with buyers but if that statement was made thus Talmud, Mas Baba Batra, it must have been made if a son sold the estate of his father during the lifetime of the father and he died his son may take it away from the buyers and this it is that presents a difficulty in civil law for they could say to him your father has sold and you are taking away what? Objection is this could he not reply I succeed to the rights of the father of my father you may know that such a plea is justified for it is written instead of thy father shall be thy sons whom thou shalt make princes in all the land if however a message was sent to which objection is to be raised it may be the following a firstborn son who sold the share of his birthright during the lifetime of his father and he died during the lifetime of his father his son may take it away from the buyers and this it is that presents a difficulty in civil law for his father sold it and he takes it away and if it be suggested that in this case also he might plead I come as successor to the rights of my father's father it may be retorted if he comes as successor to the rights of his father's father what claim has he upon the portion of the birthright but what difficulty is this could he not reply I succeed to the rights of my father's father but take also the place of my father if however a message was sent to which objection is to be raised it might be the following if a person was in a position to tender evidence for one in respect of a transaction that was recorded in a deed before he turned robber and then he turned robber he is not permitted to attest his handwriting but others may attest it now if he himself is not trusted shall others be trusted this then it is which presents a difficulty in civil law what difficulty is this it? It's possible that the Palestine message refers to a case where his handwriting was endorsed at a court of law if however a message was sent to which objection is to be raised it might be the following if a person was in a position to tender evidence for one in respect of a transaction that was recorded in a deed before it had fallen as an inheritance to him he is not eligible to identify his handwriting but others may identify his handwriting what difficulty however is this is it not possible that here also the reference is to a case where his handwriting was endorsed at a court of law if however a message was sent to which objection is to be raised it might be the following if a person was in a position to tender evidence for one before he became his son-in-law and he subsequently became his son-in-law he is not permitted to attest his handwriting but others may attest it now if he is not trusted shall others be trusted and if it be suggested that here also the reference is to a case where his handwriting was endorsed at a court of law surely it may be retorted our Joseph B. Menumi said in the name of Arnaman even though his handwriting was not endorsed at a court of law what difficulty however is this it is possible that it is a decree of the king that he shall not be trusted as a witness while others shall be trusted and the reason is not because he might lie for should not this explanation be accepted could it be imagined that Moses and Aaron are not permitted to act as witnesses for their fathers in law because they are untrustworthy the only possible explanation then is that it is a decree of the king that they shall not act as witnesses for them so here also the explanation may be that it is a decree of the king that he shall not attest his handwriting in favor of his father in law hence the message sent from Palestine was in fact just the one that was mentioned at first and as to your Objection from the verse instead of thy fathers shall be thy sons it may be pointed out that this was written in connection with a blessing but can it be said that this verse was written only in connection with a blessing Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and that with respect to a matter of law it is not applicable surely it was taught in the case where a house collapsed upon a man and his father or upon a man and those whose heir he is and that man had against him the claim of a woman's ketubah or that of a creditor and in the first case the heirs of the father plead that the son died first and the father afterwards while the creditor s plead that the father died first and the son afterwards now sons denote the heirs of the father do they not and brothers those whose heir he is if then it could be assumed that one cannot plead I come by virtue of the rights of the father of my father because the verse instead of thy fathers shall be thy sons was written in connection with the blessing what avails it for the years that the son died first and the father died afterwards the creditor surely could say to them I collect my debt from the inheritance of their father no by the ears of the father his brothers are meant and by those whose heir he is the brothers of his father are meant Arshis hate was asked may a son in the grave be heir to his mother to transmit her estate to his paternal brothers Arshis hate said to them you have learned that if a father was taken captive and died and his son died in the home country or if a son was carried into captivity where he died and his father died in the home country the estate is to be divided between the ears of the father and the ears of the son how is this to be understood if it be suggested that it is to be understood as was taught who then are the ears of the father and who are the ears of the son must it not then be concluded that it is this that was meant if a father was taken into captivity where he died and the son of his daughter died in the home country or if the son of one's daughter was taken into captivity where he died and the father of his mother died in the home country and it is not known which of them died first the estate is to be divided between the ears of the father and the ears of the son now if it were so granted even that the son died first he should in his grave inherit the estate of the father of his mother and transmit it to his paternal brothers must it not consequently be inferred that a son in the grave does not inherit the estate of his mother to transmit it to his paternal brothers Arahabi Menumi said to Abbe we also were taught to the same effect if the house collapsed upon on a man and his mother both agree that the estate in dispute is to be divided now if it were so granted even that the son had
Decided in favor of the buyer said Rabba to Arnaman is this the law surely he who claims from the other has to produce the proof a contradiction was pointed out between two statements of Rabba and between two statements of Arnaman for once a person said to another what claim have you upon this house the other replied to him I bought it from you and enjoyed undisturbed use of during the three years required to establish a legal right of possession the first said to him I occupied however the inner rooms when the matter was brought before Arnaman he said to the buyer go and bring proof of your undisturbed enjoyment of the use of said Rabba to Arnaman is this the law surely he who claims from the other has to produce the proof does not this present a contradiction between the two statements of Rabba and between the two statements of Arnaman there is no contradiction between Rabba's statements because here the seller is in possession of his property and there the buyer is in the possession of his property there is also no contradiction between the statements of Arnaman because since here he spoke to him of the estate of Barsasan and that plot bore the name of Barsasan it is incumbent upon him to prove that it does not belong to Barsasan here however granted that he has no less a claim than one who holds a deed do we not even in such a case say to the holder attest your deed and you will retain possession of the estate Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra chapter X mission of plain deed must bear the signatures of the witnesses on its inside a folded one must bear the signatures of the witnesses on the reverse a plain one that bears the signatures of the witnesses on the reverse and a folded one that bears the signatures of its witnesses on the inside are both invalid Arhan and Abigamaliel said a folded deed that bears the signatures of the witnesses on its inside is valid because it can be turned into a plain one, our Simeon B. Gamaliel said, All depends on the usage of the country. A plain deed requires two witnesses, and a folded one, three. A plain deed that bears the signature of one witness only, and a folded one that bears the signatures of two witnesses only are both invalid. Tomorrow, whence these words are handed, said, For scripture says, Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe the deeds and seal them and procure the evidence of witnesses. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe the deeds. Talmud, Mas Baba Bath Rabbi refers to the plain deed and seal them, refers to the folded one and procure the evidence implies two witnesses. Witnesses implies three. How is this possible? Two for a folded deed, three for a plain one. Might not this be reversed since it has more folds? It must also have more witnesses. Raphram said, It may be derived from the following. So I took the deed of the purchase, both that which was sealed containing the terms and Conditions and that which was open, so I took the deed of the purchase refers to the plain deed that which was sealed refers to the folded one, and that which was open refers to the plain portion in the folded deed. The terms and conditions refers to the laws which distinguish the plain deed from the folded one. Visa one requires two witnesses, and the other three witnesses the witnesses of the one side on the obverse, while the witnesses of the other side on the reverse side. Might not this be reversed since it has more folds? It must also have more witnesses. Rami B. Ezekiel said it may be derived from the following text at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established if their evidence may be established by two. Why should three be specified to tell you that two are required for a plain deed? Three for a folded one might not this be reversed since it has more folds? It must also have more witnesses. Is it for? This purpose that the verses mentioned were intended surely each one is required for a separate purpose as it was taught by the statement men shall buy fields for money and subscribe the deeds and seal them good advice was tendered so I took the deed of the purchase is just a record of what had happened at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses has been specified in order to compare three witnesses to two concerning which are Akiva and the rabbis are in dispute the fact however is that the law of a folded deed is only rabbinical and the scriptural verses quoted are Amir's Makkah what is the reason why the rabbis instituted a folded deed they were in a place inhabited by priests who were very hot tempered and they divorced their wives consequently the rabbis made this provision so that in the meantime they might cool down this satisfactorily explains bills of divorce what explanation however may be given in the case of other documents in order that there may be no distinction between bills of divorce and other deeds where in the case of a folded deed do the witnesses sign are who not said between one fold and the other and are Jeremiah B. Abba said on the back of the writing and corresponding to all the written part on the external side of the deed Rami B. Abba said to Arhista according to Arhuna who said that the witnesses signed between one fold and the other assuming that he meant between one fold and the other on the external side the following objection may be raised surely a folded deed was once brought before Rabbi who remarked there is no date on this deed thereupon our Simeon son of Rabbi said to Rabbi it might be hidden between the folds on ripping the seams open he saw it now if it were so he should have remarked there is neither date nor are there witnesses on this deed he replied to him do you think that according to Arhuna the witnesses signed between the Folds on the inside, no, they sign between the folds on the outside, but is there no reason to apprehend that he might forge the lower section of the folded deed and enter whatever he wished after the witnesses had signed firm and established it is entered on it? Is there, however, no reason to apprehend that he might enter whatever he wished and then write a second time firm and establish the formula firm and established is entered only once, not twice? Is there no apprehension that he might erase the original firm and established and add whatever he wished and then write firm and established? Surely, are Yohanan said a suspended word that has been confirmed is admissible. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, and erasure, however, is inadmissible, although it had been confirmed the law, however, that an erasure invalid only applies to the case where it occurs in the position of the formula firm and established and occupies the same space as firm and established according to our. Jeremiah B. Abba, however, who stated on the back of the writing and corresponding to all the written part on the external side of the deed, is there no cost to apprehend that he might write on the inside whatever he wished and induce additional witnesses to sign on the outside and might say, I did it in order to increase the number of witnesses. He replied to him, Do you think that witnesses sign in the same order as the lines of the deed? They sign vertically from bottom to top, but is there no reason to apprehend that some unfavorable condition might occur in the last line of the deed and he would cut off that last line and though with it he would also cut off the name of the witness Reuben? The deed would yet remain valid through the remaining part of the signature son of Jacob witness. As we learned, the signature son of X witness is valid. The witness writes Reuben son of across one line and Jacob witness above it. Is there no reason, however, to Apprehend that though he might cut off Reuben son of the deed would yet remain valid through the remaining portion of the signatures Jacob witness as we learned the signature X witness is valid the word witness is not written and if you wish it may be said that a witness in fact does write after his signature witness but this is a case where it is known that the signature Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi is not that of Jacob is it not possible that he signed on behalf of his father. No one gives up his own name and uses as his signature the name of his father might he not have used it as a mere mark for surely Rab drew a fish Arhan and drew a palm branch Arhis Dai Samak Arhashai and I and Rabbi son of Arhuna Mass no one would be so impertinent as to make of the name of his father a mere symbol Marzitra said what is the need for all this any folded deed the signature of whose witnesses do not terminate with the same line on the deed is an invalid document R. Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of Aryohan and all erasures require confirmation and the last line must contain a repetition of the subject matter of the deed. What is the reason Talmud? Mas Baba Bathra Aram Rome said because the last line cannot be taken as a determining factor said Arnaman to Aram Rome once do you derive this the other replied to him because it was taught if the signatures of the witnesses were removed two lines from the text the deed is invalid if only one line it is valid why are two lines different from one line because one might commit forgery and add some unauthorized matter in the case of one line also might not one commit forgery and add some spurious matter must we not then conclude that the last line cannot be taken as a determining factor this proves it Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra B. the question was raised what is the ruling in the case of a line and a half come and here if the signatures of the witnesses were removed two lines. From the text the deed is invalid from which it may be inferred that if they were removed a line and a half only the deed is valid explain however the first clause if only one line it is valid from which it follows that only if the interval was one line is the deed valid but if it was a line and a half the deed is invalid from this then no deduction can be made what about an answer to the question come and hear what has been taught if the signatures of the witnesses were removed two lines from the text the deed is invalid if less than this it is valid if four or five witnesses
R. Isaac B. Eliezer said as much for instance as is required for the writing of black light above one another this shows that he is of the opinion that the limit is two written lines and four intervening spaces are high BMI in the name of Allah said as much for instance as is required for the writing of a lame in the upper and a final cough in the lower line from this it clearly follows that he is of the opinion that the limit is two written lines and three intervening spaces are about said as much for instance as is necessary for the writing of Barak B. Levi in one line for he holds the opinion that the limit is one written line and two intervening spaces rap said what has been taught is only applicable to the space between the signatures of the witnesses and the text but between the signatures of the witnesses and the legal attestation even if the blank space is wider the deed is valid why is the limit between the signatures of it? Witnesses and the text different from the other because the witnesses having signed the holder of the deed might commit forgery by entering on it whatever he desires in the case of the blank space between the signatures of the witnesses and the attestation to could not forgery be committed by entering whatever one desired and attaching the signature of witnesses in the case where the blank space is dotted with ink marks if so one could also dot with ink marks any blank space between the signatures of the witnesses and the text of the deed it might be assumed that the witnesses had confirmed the dotted portion in the case of dotted ink marks between the signatures of the witnesses and the attestation would it not also be assumed that the court had confirmed the dotted portion a court does not confirm an ink dotted space is there no reason to apprehend that the upper portion of the deed might be entirely cut off the ink dots erased any terms desired entered and the signatures of witnesses also might be attached and yet the deed would be regarded as valid since Rap stated that a deed the text and the signatures of the witnesses of which appear on an erasure is legally valid Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi according to our Kahana who reported it in the name of Samuel this is quite right according to our Tabumi however who reported it in the name of Rab what is there to be said he is of the opinion that in any such case a deed is not confirmed by the attestation of the court that may appear on it but by the witnesses on it or Yohanan however said what has been taught is only applicable to the space between the signatures of the witnesses and the text but between the signatures of the witnesses and the legal attestation even if the blank space is limited to one line the deed is invalid why is the limit between the witnesses and the attestation different from the other because the upper portion of the deed might be cut off and the text of a new deed and its witnesses might be written on the one line and he is of the opinion that a deed the text and the witnesses of which appear on one line is valid if so in the case of a space between the witnesses and the text also might not the upper portion of the deed be cut off and the witnesses having signed anything one desires might be entered he holds the opinion that a deed the text of which appears on one line and its witnesses on another is invalid but is there no reason to apprehend that the text and the witnesses might be written in one line and the holder of the deed might plead I did this in order to increase the number of witnesses he holds the opinion that in any such case a deed is not confirmed by the witnesses that appear below but by the witnesses who appear above reverting to the above text rap stated that a deed the text and the signatures of the witnesses of which appear on an erasure is Valid Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrave, however it is objected that since the writing on the document had been erased once it might be erased again it may be replied that anything which has been erased once is not like that which has been erased twice but is there no cause to apprehend that ink might first be poured on the place of the witnesses and this would be erased so that when the text is subsequently erased the lower and the upper sections would represent a repeated erasure of a replied rab is of the opinion that witnesses must not sign on an erasure unless the erasure was made in their presence an objection was raised a deed the text of which is written on clean paper and its witnesses on an erasure is valid is there no cause to apprehend that the text might be erased and any terms one desires substituted and thus there would result a deed the text and witnesses of which appear on an erasure they write as follows we witnesses signed on an Erasure and the text is written on paper where however do they write this if below surely one can cut it off if above one can erase it they write it between the signatures if so explain the second clause a deed the text of which appears on an erasure and its witnesses on clean paper is invalid why it may be asked should it be invalid let them in this case also write thus we witnesses signed on paper and the text is written on an erasure would you now also reply that as the writing was once erased one might again erase it surely you said that what was erased once is not like that which was erased twice this has been said in the case only where the witnesses are signed on an erasure where however the witnesses are not signed on an erasure but on clean paper the difference cannot be detected but let any scroll be brought on which some writing could be erased and compared the erasure on one scroll is not always like the erasure on another Scroll let then the signatures of the witnesses be accepted by the court and be erased and compared. Our Hashai replied an erasure of one day's standing is not like an erasure of two days standing. Let it stand for some time. Our Jeremiah replied precaution had to be taken to provide against an erring court. Our Hanabi Gamaliel said a folded deed etc. Rabbi raised an objection against the statement of our Hanabi Gamaliel Talmud. Mas Baba Bathra be surely the date of the one deed is not like that of the other four. In the case of a plain deed the first completed year of a king's reign is counted as his first and the second completed year as his second. While in the case of a folded one the first year of a king's reign is counted as his second the second as his third. And sometimes it may happen that a person might borrow money from another on a folded deed and in the meantime he might obtain funds and repay him. But when requesting the return of his deed Creditor might reply to him I lost it and would write out for him instead a receipt and when the time of its payment arrived he might convert it into a plain deed and say to him you borrowed from me now he holds of you that a receipt is not written was rabbi however familiar with the dating of a folded deed surely once a certain folded deed was brought before rabbi who remarked this is post dated and zonin said to him such is the practice of this nation if a king reigned a full year they count it as his second year if two years they count them as his third year after he heard it from zonin he knew it in a certain plain deed there occurred the following date in the year of the archon x said arhana let inquiry be made when that archon assumed office might he not on that date have been in office for some years our hashai replied such is the practice of this nation in the first year they call him archon in the second they call him again is it not possible that he was deposed and reappointed. Our Jeremiah replied, In such a case, he is designated our Our rabbis taught in the case where a person said, I am to be a Nazarite. Simica said, If he added Hina, he must observe one term. If he added Dagon, he must observe two terms. Trigon, three terms. Tetragon, four terms. Pentagon, five terms. Our rabbis taught a circular two cornered, three cornered, and five cornered house is not subject to uncleanness from house. Plates of four cornered house is subject to uncleanness from such plates. Whence is this inferred for our rabbis taught above? It is said instead of wall, wall signifying two below. Also instead of wall, it is said walls, which similarly signifies two, thus making a total of four walls. A folded deed was once brought before rabbi who remarked, There is no date on this deed. Thereupon our Simeon son of rabbi said to rabbi, It might be hidden between its folds, unripping the seams. Open he saw it rabbi turned round and looked at him with displeasure I did not write it said the other Arjuda Hayyata wrote it keep away from tail bearing rabbi called to him once he was sitting in his presence when he finished a section of the book of Psalms how correct is this writing said rabbi I did not write it replied the other Judah Hayyata wrote it keep away from tail bearing rabbi called to him in the first case one can well understand rabbi's exhortation since there was slander what tail bearing however was there owing to the teaching of Ardimi for Ardimi brother of our Safra taught a man should never speak in praise of his friend because by praise of him he brings about his blame Aram Rome said in the name of Rab there are three transgressions which no man escapes for a single day sinful thought calculation on the results of prayer and slander slander how could one imagine such a thing Talmud Mas Baba Bathra, but the fine shades of slander were meant Rab Judah said in the name of Rab most people are guilty of robbery a minority of lewdness and all of slander of slander how could one imagine such a thing but the fine shades of slander were meant Rab and Simeon B. Gamaliel said all depends on the usage of the country and does not the first tana hold the principle of the usage of the country are as she replied where it is the custom to use plain deeds and one said to the scribe prepare for me a plain deed and the latter prepared for him a folded one the objection is valid where it is the custom to use folded deeds and one said to the scribe prepare for me a folded deed and the latter prepared for him a plain one legal objection may be raised their
One that bears the signatures of two witnesses is invalid since it might have been imagined that because elsewhere such evidence is valid it is valid here also it was necessary to teach us that it is invalid in the case however of a plain deed that bears the signature of one witness is not this obvious Abbe replied this was required for the following that even where in addition to the signature of one witness there is also the oral evidence of another the deed is invalid. Amimar once declared a deed valid on the signature of one witness and the oral evidence of another said Arashi to Amimar and what about the view of Abbe the other replied to him I did not hear of it that is to say I do not share his view but if so the difficulty Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi in our mission remains it teaches us this that two witnesses on a folded deed are like one witness on a plain one as in the latter the defect is biblical so. Also in the former the defect is biblical this can be proved for the members of the college sent the following inquiry to our Jeremiah in the case of witnesses one of whom had signed the deed and the other confirmed the contents orally are they combined according to the first tenet of our Joshua B. Korha the question does not arise because according to him independent evidence of two cannot be combined even in the case where the two witnesses signed the deed or the two gave oral. Evidence the question however arises according to our Joshua B. Korha is the independent evidence combined only in the case where the two witnesses signed the deed or where the two gave oral evidence but in the case where one witness signed and one testified orally their evidence is not combined or is there perhaps no difference he sent to them the following reply I am not worthy of having this inquiry addressed to me but your disciple is inclined to the opinion that the Witnesses may be regarded as combined. He said unto him, We learned it thus for the members of the college sent the following inquiry to our Jeremiah in the case of two witnesses who gave evidence, one at one court and the other at another court. May one court come to the other and thus cause the evidence to be combined according to the first tenet of our Nathan. The question does not arise since according to him such evidence cannot be combined even where it was given before one court. The question, however, arises according to our Nathan is the evidence combined only where it was given at one court, but if at two courts it is not combined or is there perhaps no difference? And he sent to them his reply, I am not worthy of having this inquiry addressed to me, but your disciple is inclined to the opinion that the witnesses may be regarded as combined. Marbi said this was the inquiry addressed to him in the case where two gave evidence at one court and then. They gave evidence at another court may one member of either court come to the other court and combine according to the view of our Nathan the question does not arise for since witnesses may be combined is there any need to say that judges may be combined the question however arises according to the first tenet of our Nathan is it witnesses only that are not combined but judges are or is there perhaps no difference he sent to them in reply I am not worthy of having this inquiry addressed to me but your disciple is inclined to the view that they may be combined Robin has said such was the inquiry sent to him where three judges sat down to confirm a deed and one of them died is it necessary to write we were in a session of three and one is now no more or not he sent to them in reply I am not worthy of having this inquiry addressed to me but your disciple is inclined to the view that it is necessary to write we were in a session of three and one is now no more and on account of this our Jeremiah was readmitted to the college mission when in a bond of indebtedness IT is written a hundred ZUZ which are twenty sella the creditor receives only twenty sella if the entry was a hundred ZUZ which are thirty sella he receives only a mena if the entry reads silver ZUZ in which are and the amount is blotted out IT represents no less than two if the entry reads silver sellers which are and the amount is blotted out IT represents no less than two if the which are and the amount is blotted out IT is no less than two if above a mena is written and below two hundred or if two hundred are written above and a mena below one is always to be guided by the lower entry if so why should the upper portion at all be written in case a letter in the lower section be rubbed off it may be inferred from the upper portion Gemara our rabbis taught silver signifies no less than a silver dinar silver dinari or Denarii silver signifies no less than two silver denarii silver for denarii signifies silver for no less than two gold denarii the master said silver signifies no less than a silver dinar might it not signify a bar of silver our Eliezer replied this is a case where coin was mentioned might it not signify small change our papa replied in the case of a place where small silver coins are not current our rabbis taught gold signifies no less than a golden dinar gold denarii or denarii gold signifies no less than two gold denarii gold for denarii signifies gold of the value of no less than two silver denarii the master said gold signifies no less than a gold dinar might it not mean a bar of gold our Eliezer replied in the case where coin was mentioned Talmud Mas Baba Bathro might it not signify small change small change is not made of gold gold for denarii signifies gold of the value of no less than two silver denarii might he not have meant broken gold where of the value of two gold denarii they replied the holder of the bond must always be at a disadvantage if so the same principles should be followed in the former cases also Arashi replied in the first cases denarii was written in the last dinrin was written and once may it be deduced that there is a difference between denarii and dinrin for we learned a woman who had five doubtful confinements or five doubtful issues brings one offering and may subsequently eat of sacrificial meat she is not obliged however to bring the rest if she had five certain confinements or five issues she brings one sacrifice and may subsequently eat of sacrificial meat but is also obliged to bring the rest it once happened that the price of a pair of birds in Jerusalem had risen to gold denarii thereupon our Simeon B. Gamaliel exclaimed by this temple I shall not go to rest this night before these can be obtained for silver denarii he entered the Beth Din and Issued the following instruction A woman who had five certain child confinements or five certain issues brings one sacrifice and may subsequently eat of sacrificial meat and there is no obligation upon her to bring the rest Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi on that day the price of a pair of birds fell to a quarter of a dinar if above is written etc. Our rabbis taught the lower section may be corrected from the upper one where one letter is missing but not in the case of two letters. For example Hanan from Hananis or Anan from Anani what is the reason why two letters must not be replaced because a name of four letters might occur and these would represent half of the name if so in the case of one letter also might not a name of two letters occur and this would represent half of the name but this is the reason for two letters a name of three letters might occur and these would represent the greater part of the name our papa said it is obvious to me that if Sifal appears in the upper section and full in the lower section the latter is always to be taken as a guide our papa however inquired what is the ruling if full appears above and seafull below may this be attributed to a fly or not this remains undecided in a certain deed there was written 600 and azuz our sharabia sent this inquiry to abay is the entry to be interpreted as 600 iskira and azuz or perhaps as 600 perutoth and azuz he replied to him dismiss the question of perutoth which could not have been written in the deed since they are counted up talmud mas baba bathre and converted into zuz and what then could the entry mean either 600 iskira and azuz or 600 zuz and azuz but the holder of the bond must always be at a disadvantage abay said one who is required to present his signature at a court of law shall not present it at the foot of the scroll because a stranger might find it and write above the signature that he has a claim of money upon him and we learned that a person who produced against another bond in the latter's handwriting showing that he owes him a debt may collect it from his free property a collector of bridge tolls once came before Abbe and said to him will the master give me a signature so that when the rabbis come and present to me an authorization I will allow them to pass without payment of the toll he was writing it down for him at the top of a scroll as the other was pulling it he said to him the rabbis have long ago anticipated you Abbe said numbers from three to ten should not be written at the end of a line because forgery might be committed by adding letters to them and if this occurred the sentence should be repeated two or three times since it would then be impossible that the numbers should not once occur in the middle of a line in a certain deed it was entered a third of an orchard the buyer Subsequently erased the top and the base of the Beth and converted the second word into an orchard when he appeared before Abbe the latter said to him why has the Bob so much space round about it having been placed under arrest he confessed in a certain deed there was entered the portion of Reuben and Simeon brothers they had a brother whose name was brothers and the buyer added to it Abbe and converted the word into and brothers when he came before Abbe the latter said to him why is there so little space round the Bob he was placed under arrest and he confessed a certain deed bore the signatures of Rabbah and Arahabi Adda he came
Be written for the seller in the absence of the buyer it must not be written however for the buyer unless the seller is present the fee is to be paid by the buyer deeds of betrothal and marriage are not to be written except with the consent of both parties and the fee is paid by the bridegroom a contract of tenancy on shares or on a fixed rental is not written except with the approval of both parties and the fee is paid by the tenant deeds of arbitration and all other judicial documents are not written except with the approval of both parties and both pay the fee Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said two deeds may be written for the two parties one for each tomorrow what is meant by provided they are known Rab Judah said in the name of Rab provided the name of the man is known in the case of a letter of divorce and the name of the woman in the case of a receipt are Safra and Arahavi Huna and Arhuna behind and sat together and Abay also was sitting with them and while they were in session they raised the following question why is the name of the man required to be known in the case of a letter of divorce and not the name of the woman and the name of the woman and not that of the man in the case of a receipt surely there is reason to fear that one might write a letter of divorce and give it to the wife of another person and sometimes a woman might procure the writing of a receipt and give it to a strange man Abay said to them thus said Rab the name of the man in the case of a letter of divorce and the same law applies to the name of the woman the name of the woman in the case of a receipt and the same law applies to the name of the man but is there no reason to apprehend that there might be a case of two persons of the name of Joseph B. Simeon living in the same town and that one of them might write a letter of divorce and deliver it to the other's wife Arahabi who now said to them thus said Rab two persons of the name of Joseph son of Simeon who live in one town must not divorce their wives except in the presence of each other is there no reason however to apprehend that a person might go to another town and make his name there known as Joseph B. Simeon and then would write a letter of divorce and carry it to the wife of that person Arhuna behind and said to them thus said Rab provided one's name was known in a town for thirty days he need not be suspected what is the law where one's name is not known. Abbe said where they call him and he answers Arzibit said a deceiver is vigilant in his deceit a certain receipt was produced on which the signature of our Jeremiah B. Abba appeared the woman however came before him and said to him it was not I, I also said to them our Jeremiah replied that it was not she but they told me she has grown old and her voice has become rough said Abbe although the rabbi said Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra once a statement has been made. It cannot be withdrawn it is not the nature of a scholar to take particular note of a woman's face a certain receipt on which the signature of our Jeremiah B. Abba appeared was produced but the woman said to him it was not I, I am sure he insisted it was you said Abbe although a scholar is not in the habit of taking note of a woman's appearance when however he does take notice he is relied upon Abbe said a scholar who desires to betroth the woman should take with him a layman so that Another woman might not be substituted for her who would be taken away from him and the husband pays the fee etc. What is the reason because scripture says and he shall write and give and why is this not done at the present time the rabbis have imposed it upon the woman to order that he might not cause her undue delay a bond may be written for a borrower though the lender is not present etc. Is not this obvious this would not have been required except in the case of a loan. For merchandise on shares a deed of sale may be written for the seller in the absence of the buyer etc. Is not this obvious this would not have been required except in the case where one sells his field on account of its inferiority deeds of betrothal and marriage are not written etc. Is this not obvious this would not have been required except for the fact that even a scholar has to pay the fee though it is a satisfaction to his father-in-law to bring him into his family. Contract of tenancy on shares or on a fixed rental is not written etc. Is not this obvious it would not have been required except for the case where the land is to lie fellow deeds of arbitration are not written except with the approval of both parties etc. What is meant by shadery bearer and here it was explained as records of the pleas are Jeremiah B. Abba explained one of the litigants chooses one and the other chooses another Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said two deeds may be written for the two parties one for each may it be suggested that they are in dispute on the principle of exercising force against a sodomite character for one master is of the opinion that force is exercised and the other master is of the opinion that force is not exercised no both agree that force is exercised but the reason of Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel here is this because one can say to the other I do not like your rights to be at the side of my rights for you appear to me as a lurking lion mission in the case where a person paid a part of his debt and the bond was deposited with a third party to whom the borrower said if I will not pay you the balance between now and a certain date give him his bond and the date arrived and he did not pay our Jose said he shall give IT or Judah said he shall not give IT tomorrow wherein lies the difference between them our Jose holds that his Magda conveys possession and our Judah holds that his Magda does not convey possession our nomin in the name of Rabbi Abba in the name of Rab said the Halachah is according to our Jose when such cases came before our MI he said since our Yohanan has taught us again and again that the Halachah is according to our Jose what can I do the Halachah however is not according to our Jose mission if a man's bond of indebtedness was effaced he must secure witnesses and appear before a court of law where he is supplied with the following attestation the bond of X son of Y was Faded on such and such a day Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B and A and B were signed on it as its witnesses Gemara our rabbis taught what is the form of its attestation we X Y and Z being in a session of three A son of B produced before us a faded bond on such and such a date and C and D were signed as its witnesses and if the attestation contains the following we have dealt with the evidence of the witnesses and their evidence was found to agree the creditor collects his debt and is not required to produce any additional proof but if not he is required to produce proof of bond intentionally torn is invalid if torn accidentally it is valid in case it was effaced or obliterated if the tracing of the letters is distinguishable it is valid how is one to understand intentionally torn and how torn accidentally Rab Judah said intentionally torn means a tear made by a court of law torn accidentally a tear which was not made by a court of law how is a tear made by a court of Law to be understood Rab Judah said if it was made at the place of the witnesses the place of the date and the place of the amount Abbe said if it runs lengthwise and crosswise certain Arabs who came to Pamit either were seizing by force the lands of the inhabitants the owners came to Abbe and said to him will the master examine our deeds and write for us duplicate so that in case one is forcibly taken away we shall still hold one in our possession he said to them what can I do for you and our Safra said two deeds may not be written in respect of the same field since a person might thereby seize and seize again as they were troubling him he said to his scribe go and write for them the text of the deeds on an erasure and let the witnesses sign on clean paper and thus produce duplicate deeds which are invalid said Arahabi menu to Abbe might it not happen that the original tracing would be distinguishable and concerning such a case surely it was Taught a deed that was effaced or obliterated if its tracing is distinguishable is valid he replied to him did I say a proper deed shall be written what I said was mere letters of the alphabet or rabbis taught should a creditor come and say I lost my bond of indebtedness the bond may not be rewritten for him although witnesses stated we wrote signed and delivered such a deed to him this however applies only to the case of bonds of indebtedness but in the case of deeds of purchase and sale a deed with the omission of the clause pledging property may be rewritten Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said deeds of purchase and sale also must not be rewritten for thus said Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel where a person made a gift to his friend and the latter returned the deed to him his gift also is thereby returned but the sages say his gift is valid the master had said with the exception of its land security what is the reason our safra? Replied because two deeds may not be written in respect of the same field in case a creditor might go and seize the field of this person and the latter would go and produce one deed and seize thereby the lands of subsequent buyers he would then say to the creditor wait until I am firmly established in the possession of this field and then come and seize it from me he would then produce the other deed and thereby rob other buyers also since however the creditor's bond was torn whereby would he again seize any land and if it be said that this might refer to a case where it was not torn surely it may be pointed out our nom and stated any turpa which does not contain the declaration we have torn up the creditor's bond of indebtedness is not illegal turpa and any adracta which does contain the entry we have torn up the turpa is not illegal adracta and any shema in which the statement we have torn up the adracta is not entered is not illegal
The claim is money. They assume that the debtor might have satisfied the claim with money in this case. However, where the claim is for land, they well know that one who claims land would not be satisfied with money. The master had said with the omission of the clause pledging property, how is such a deed to be written? Our and said it is written as follows. This deed is not for the purpose of collecting thereby either from sold or from free property, but for that of establishing the land in. The possession of the buyer Raphram said this proves that the omission of the clause pledging property is regarded as the scribe's error since the reason given was because such an entry was actually included but it follows had it not been included he could have claimed his compensation from the seller's lands Rashi said the omission of the clause pledging property is not regarded as the scribe's error and the meaning of with the omission of the clause pledging property is that no such clause is entered in the deed a certain woman once gave to a man money wherewith to buy for her a plot of land he went and bought for her the land without providing for the security of its tenure she came before Arnaman who said to the agent the woman has the right to declare I sent you to improve my position not to make it worse go then buy it yourself from him without security and then sell it to the woman with due security of tenure Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said where a person made a gift to his friend and the latter returned the deed to him his gift also is thereby returned but the sages said his gift is valid what is Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel's reason R.C. said because it is just as if the donor had said to the donee this field is given to you for so long a period as the deed remains in your possession Rabbi Demur if so the same law should apply also to the case where it was stolen or lost but said Rabbi they differ on the question whether letters may be acquired by delivery R. Simeon B. Gamaliel holds the opinion that letters are acquired by delivery while the rabbis hold the opinion that letters may not be acquired by delivery or rabbis taught where a person appears in court with a deed and with evidence of undisturbed possession judgment is given on the basis of the deed these are the words of Rabbi R. Simeon B. Gamaliel said judgment is given on the basis of his undisturbed Possession on what principle do they differ when Ardimi came he said they differ on the question whether letters may be acquired by delivery Talmud, Mos Baba Bathre R. Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that letters are not acquired by delivery and Rabbi holds that letters are acquired by delivery said Abbe to him if so this would present a disagreement with the master the other replied to him then let there be disagreement I mean to say to you the said Abbe to him that the Beritha cannot be well explained except on the lines which the master had laid down and since that is so there would emerge a contradiction between one statement of R. Simeon B. Gamaliel and the other statement of his but said Abbe here it is a case where one of them was found to be irrelevant or otherwise disqualified and they differ on the same principle that underlies the dispute of Armeir and R. Eliezer Rabbi holds the same view as R. Eliezer who maintains that the witnesses to the Delivery effect the legal separation while Arsimian B. Gamaliel is of the same opinion as Armeir who maintains that the witnesses who signed the letter of divorce are the main factor in the legal separation but surely Arabah had said our Eliezer agrees that a deed is invalid if the irregularity is internal but said Rabbin all agree that the deed is invalid if it contains the entry we have dealt with the evidence of the witnesses and their evidence was found to be irregular in accordance with the law laid down by Arabah they only differ in the case of a deed which bears no signatures of witnesses at all in which case Rabbi holds the same view as our Eliezer who maintains that the witnesses to the delivery effect the legal separation while Arsimian B. Gamaliel holds the same view as Armeir who maintains that the witnesses who signed the deed affect the final separation if you prefer however I might say that they differ on the question whether in the case where a person admitted that he wrote a deed independent legal attestation is required for Rabbi holds that where a person admitted that he wrote a deed no independent attestation is required while Arsimian B. Gamaliel holds that independent attestation is required did we not however hear that they hold contrary views for it was taught where two men cling to a deed the creditor pleading it is mine I dropped it and you found it and the borrower pleading it is indeed yours but I have paid you the validity of the deed is established by those who signed it so Rabbi Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel said let them divide it and when this was discussed the following question was raised does not Rabbi accept what we have learned where two men hold a cloth one pleading I found it and the other also pleading I found it the one must take an oath that he possesses in it no less than a half and the other must take an oath that he possesses in it no less than a half and they divide it. And Rabbi in the name of Arnaman replied in the case of an attested deed no one disputes the law that they must divide they differ only in the case of a deed which has not been attested since Rabbi holds the opinion that where one admitted that he wrote a deed independent attestation is required and consequently if the creditor is able to secure its attestation he collects a half and if not the deed is regarded as a mere pot's heard while Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel holds it. Opinion that where one admits that he wrote a deed no independent attestation is required and they divide reverse if you prefer however it may be said that there is really no need to reverse the reported opinions but the dispute here is on the question of proving all one's please such as the case of our Isaac B. Joseph who claimed a sum of money from our Abba when he came before our Isaac Napaha our Abba pleaded I repay to you in the presence of X and Y let X and Y come said. Our Isaac to him and let them give their evidence if they will not come set our Abba to him am I not to be believed surely we have it as an established law that alone made in the presence of witnesses need not be repaid in the presence of witnesses in this case our Isaac replied to him I am of the same opinion as that in the reported statement of the master for our Abba in the name of our Abba Abba in the name of Rab said where one said to another I paid you your debt in the presence of X and Y it is necessary that X and Y should come and give evidence but surely said our Abba to him or Gittel said in the name of Rab the Halachah is in accordance with the statement of our Simeon B. Gamaliel and even Rabbi Talmud Mos Baba Bathra B. disagreed only in respect of proving one statement I also replied our Isaac to him require the evidence of your witnesses in order to prove your plea if a person repaid part of his debt our Judah said he shall exchange his bond for Another R. Jose said he shall write a quittance. Our Judah said thus the debtor would have to guard his quittance from my said R. Jose to him such a course I as better for the creditor and his rights must not be impaired. Gemara R. said in the name of Rab the Halachah is neither in accordance with our Judah nor in accordance with our Jose but only a court of law has the authority to tear up the deed and to write for the creditor another deed entering the original date said R. Naman to R. Huna and others say that R. Jeremiah B. Abba said to R. Huna had Rab heard that Barry the were and it was taught witnesses may tear up the deed and write for the creditor another deed entering the original date he would have withdrawn he said unto him he heard it and he did not withdraw Talmud. Mos Baba Bathray in the case of a court of law one can well understand because it has the power and authority to confiscate money but as regards witnesses who had once performed their mission how could they perform their mission again but can they not surely Rab Judah said in the name of Rab witnesses may write even tell successive deeds in respect of one field our Joseph replied this is permitted only in the case of a deed of gift and Rab replied even in the case of a deed of sale which does not contain the clause pledging property what was that very it was taught if a creditor was claiming from a debtor a thousand zoos and he repaid five hundred zoos of these witnesses may tear up the bond and write for him another deed bearing the original date so our Judah our Jose said this deed must remain where it is and acquittance is to be written and for two reasons has it been said that a receipt was to be written firstly in order that he be compelled thereby to repay the debt and secondly in order that the debt may be collected from property sold since the original date but our Judah also said bearing the original date this is what our Jose Said to our Judah, if you mean bearing the first date, I disagree with you for one reason. If you mean bearing the second date, I disagree with you for two reasons. Our rabbis taught a deed, the date of which is a Sabbath or the tenth of Tishri is regarded as a post-dated deed and is valid. So our Judah, our Jose declares it to be invalid. Said our Judah to him, was not such a deed actually brought before you at Sephoris and you declared it to be valid. Our Jose replied to him, when El declared it to be valid, I declared it in that case only. But surely our Judah also speaks of such a deed. Our Petath replied, all agree that if the date of the deed was calculated and it was found to coincide exactly with the Sabbath day or the tenth of Tishri, it is a post-dated deed and is valid. Talmud, Mos Baba Bathra be there in disagreement only in the case of an ordinary post-dated deed, in which case our Judah follows his
We learned antedated bonds of indebtedness are invalid and postdated ones are valid. Set our hand under this law applies only to bonds of indebtedness, but in the case of deeds of purchase and sale, even those which are postdated are invalid. What is the reason a person might sometimes sell a plot of land to another in Nissan and write the deed for him in Tishri, and in the meantime he might obtain some money and repurchase it from him, but when Tishri arrived, he would produce it and say, I have subsequently bought it from you again. If so, in the case of bonds of indebtedness, also one might sometimes borrow money in Nissan and write the bond for the creditor in Tishri, and in the meantime he would obtain some money and repay him when however the debtor requested the return of his bond, he would reply to him, I lost it, and would instead write out for him acquittance when later the date of payment arrived, he would produce it and plead, You have borrowed from me just now, he holds. The opinion that no receipt is to be written said Aryamar to Arkahana and others say that our Jeremiah of Difti said to Arkahana but what of the present time when postdated deeds are written acquaintances also are written he replied to him this is permissible since the time when our Abba said to his scribes when you write a postdated deed write as follows the deed was not written on the date indicated but was postdated said Arashi to Arkahana and what of the present time when this is not done this is not necessary since our Safra instructed his scribes when you write out acquaintances enter the date of the deed if you know it if not leave the quittance undated so that whenever the deed is produced the receipt will render it invalid said Rabbanah to Arashi and others say that Arashi said to Arkahana Talmud Mas Baba Bathra but this is not done at the present time he replied to him the rabbis have made the necessary provision whosoever acts accordingly reaps it. Benefit he who does not act accordingly has himself to blame for any loss suffered. Rabbi son of Arshila said to those who were writing deeds of transfer, When you write deeds of transfer, enter the date of transfer if you know it, and if not, enter the date on which the deed is prepared so that it might not have the appearance of a falsehood. Rab said to his scribes, and Arhuna similarly said to his scribes, When you are actually writing any deed, actually, although the information was given to you. At Hainai, when you are at Hainai, write at Hainai, although the information was given to you, actually, Rabbi said, If a man who is in possession of a bond of a hundred zoos said convert it into two bonds each of fifty zoos, his request must not be granted. What is the reason the rabbis instituted a law which is acceptable to the creditor and is also acceptable to the borrower? It is acceptable to the creditor in that the debtor is thereby compelled to repay him the entire loan, and it is also Acceptable to the borrower in that the legal force of the bond is thereby impaired. Rabba further stated if a man holding two bonds each of fifty zoos requests that they be converted into one bond of a hundred zoos, his request must not be granted because the rabbis have ordained a law which is agreeable to the creditor and is also agreeable to the borrower. It is agreeable to the creditor in that the force of his bond is not thereby impaired and it is also agreeable to the borrower. In that he is not thereby under pressure to repay the debt. Arashi said if a man holds a bond for a hundred zoos and requests that it be converted into one of fifty zoos, his request must not be granted. What is the reason we assume the debtor had already repaid him that loan and that when he asked him for the return of his bond he was told that he had lost it and so he wrote out for him acquaintance but that later he would produce that new bond and claim this is for another. Loan Mishnah in the case of two brothers, the one poor and the other rich, whom their father had left a bathhouse or an olive press, if he built these to be let out on hire, the rent belongs to the common estate. If however he built them for his own use, the rich brother may say to the poor brother, Buy for yourself slaves that they may bathe in the bathhouse, or buy for yourself olives, and come and prepare them in the olive press. If there were two men in the same town, and the name of the one was Joseph, son of Simeon, and the name of the other was Joseph, son of Simeon, neither may produce a bond of indebtedness against the other, nor may another person produce a bond of indebtedness against them. If a man found among his deeds acquaintance showing that the bond of Joseph, son of Simeon, was discharged, the bonds of both are considered to be discharged. How should they proceed? They should indicate the third generation, and if their names are alike to the Third generation, they add some personal description, and if their personal descriptions are alike, they write priest Gemara in a certain bond that was presented at the court of Arhuna. There was the following entry: Nine son of Wad borrowed from you, Amina Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra B. Arhuna decided that from you might even signify from the eggs a large and even from King Shubur said Arhista to Rabbi go and consider this matter. For in the evening Arhuna will question you on the subject. He went out carefully, considered the matter, and found the following very thorough. And it was taught in the case of a letter of divorce which bears the signatures of witnesses, but no date. Abbas all said if there was written in it I divorce you this day, it is valid. This clearly proves that that day is taken to mean that day on which it was produced. So here also from you must mean from that person who produced the bond said Abbas to him, is it not possible that Abbas all holds the same? View as our Eliezer who maintains that the witnesses to the delivery affect the legal separation but here surely there is reason to apprehend that it was lost he replied unto him that a deed was lost is not to be apprehended and whence is it deduced that the losing of a deed is not to be apprehended for we learned if there were two men in the same town and the name of the one was Joseph son of Simeon and the name of the other was Joseph son of Simeon neither may produce a bond of indebtedness against the other nor may another person produce a bond of indebtedness against them either of them however it follows may produce a bond of indebtedness against others but why why not apprehend the loss of a deed from this then it may be deduced that we do not apprehend the loss and we do not apprehend the loss of a deed by one particular individual but we do apprehend loss of deeds generally by many Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra, since it was taught however as they cannot produce a bond of indebtedness against one another, so they cannot produce a bond against others. The question arises wherein lies the principle of their disagreement. They differ on the question whether letters may be acquired by means of delivery or tana holds that letters are acquired by means of delivery and the external tana holds that letters are not acquired by means of delivery. And if you prefer, I would say that all agree that letters may be acquired by delivery, but they differ here on the question whether it is necessary to produce proof or tana holds that proof need not be produced while the external tana holds that proof must be produced for it was stated letters are acquired by delivery. Abbe said he must however produce proof and Rabbi said he need not produce proof said Abbe once do I derive this for it was taught the brother who presents the bond of indebtedness must produce proof. Obviously this applies also to the case of Others Rabbah however said brothers are different because they pilfer from one another. Others say Rabbah said once do I derive this for it was taught the brother who presents the bond of indebtedness must produce proof from which it is obvious that this applies to brothers only since they pilfer from one another but not to others. And Abbe explains that it was necessary to specify brothers because it might have been assumed that as they pilfer from one another they are all particularly alert and should not therefore require to produce proof. Hence it was necessary to teach us that it is not so as regards however the following wherein it was taught as they may present a bond of indebtedness against others so may they present bonds against each other. The question arises wherein lies the principle of their disagreement. They differ on the question whether a bond may be written for a borrower though the creditor be not with him or tana holds that a Bond may be written for a borrower, although the creditor be not with him. Consequently, it may sometimes happen that one would go to a scribe and witnesses and tell them, Write for me a bond because I intend borrowing money from my friend Joseph, son of Simeon. And after they had written and signed it for him, he would take hold of it and demand from him, Give me the hundred zoos which you borrowed from me. The external tanta holds that no bond may be written for a borrower unless the creditor be with him. If a man found among his deeds a record to the effect that the bond of Joseph, son of Simeon, was discharged, the bonds of both are considered to be discharged, etc. The reason is thus because a record was found, but had there been found, none a bond could be presented against one of them. Surely we have learned, nor may another person produce a bond of indebtedness against them. Our Jeremiah replied in the case where the bonds record the names of the third generation then. Let us see in whose name the discharge was made out. Our Hashai replied, where the third generation is indicated in the bond, but not in the discharge. Abbe said, This is the meaning of our mission. If a borrower found among his deeds acquaintance showing that the bond of Joseph, son of Simeon, against him was discharged, the bonds of both are considered to be discharged. How should they proceed? They should indicate the third generation, etc. A tanda taught if both were priests, they enter. The names of previous generations, Mishnah. If a father said
a conspiracy against the property of the guarantor and then the husband would take his wife back again tomorrow what is the reason both Rabbah and our Joseph explained because the guarantor can say you have entrusted me with a man and a man have I handed over to you or not and is not this the law of the Persians on the contrary they invariably go after the guarantor this however is the objection is not this ruling like that of a Persian court of law the judges of which do not give any reason for their decisions but said Arnam and the meaning of he must not exact payment from the guarantor is that he may not demand payment from the guarantor first thus it was also taught elsewhere if a man lends money to another on a guarantor security payment shall not be demanded from the guarantor in the first instance if however the creditor said on condition that I may exact payment from whom I will the guarantor may be called upon first said Arunat. Whence may it be deduced that a guarantor becomes responsible for a debt he has guaranteed for it is written I will be surety for him of my hand shall thou require him or his daughter this surely was an unconditional assumption of obligation for it is written deliver him into my hand and I will bring him back to thee but said our Isaac it may be deduced from the following take his garment that is surety for a stranger and hold him in pledge that is surety for an alien woman. Furthermore, it is said, My son, if thou art become surety for thy neighbor, if thou hast struck thy hands for a stranger, if thou art snared by the words of thy mouth, thou art caught by the words of thy mouth, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself, seeing that thou art come into the hand of thy neighbor, go humble thyself, and urge thy neighbor, if he has a claim of money upon you, open out for him the palm of your hand, and if not get at him through many friends, Amimar said the question. Whether a guarantor is responsible for the payment of the debt he guaranteed is a matter of dispute between Arjuda and Arjose, according to Arjose, who said his Makta conveys title, a guarantor is responsible, according to Arjuda, however, who said his Makta gives no title, the guarantor is not responsible, said Arashi to Amimar, surely it is the regular practice of the courts to rule that his Makta gives no title, and yet that a guarantor is held responsible, but said Arashi, having regard to the Pleasure of being trusted by the creditor, he determines to undertake the responsibility if, however, he said on the condition that may exact payment from whom will, etc. Rabbi Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan, this applies only in the case where the debtor has no property, but where the debtor has property, no payment may be exacted from the guarantor, since, however, it is stated in the final clause, Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel said, if the borrower has property, payment from the guarantor may in neither case be exacted, one might infer that in the opinion of the first tanna, there is no difference whether he had or had not any property, there is a lacuna in our mission, and the proper reading is as follows, if a man lends money to another on a guarantor's security, he must not exact payment from the guarantor, if, however, he said on the condition that I may exact payment from whom I will, payment may be exacted from the guarantor, this law applies only to the case where the debtor has. No property but where the debtor has property payment from the guarantor may not be exacted and in the case of a Kabbalan even though the debtor has property payment may be exacted from the Kabbalan Talmud, Mas Baba Bathra Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel said if the borrower has property payment may be exacted neither from the one nor from the other Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Aryohan and wherever Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel taught in our mission the Halachah is in agreement with his ruling. Except in the cases of guarantors Aden and the latter proof Arhuna said should one say lend him a sum of money and I shall be guarantor lend him and I shall repay you lend him and I shall be liable for the loan or lend him and I shall give it back to you all these are expressions of guarantee if however one said give him a sum of money and I shall be Kabbalan give him and I shall repay you give him and I shall be liable for the loan or give him and I shall. Give it back to you all these are expressions of Kabbalan if the question was raised what is the law if one said lend him and I shall be Kabbalan or give him and I shall be guarantor our Isaac replied the expression of guarantee has the force of a guarantee the expression of Kabbalan if I has the force of acceptance our said all of these are expressions of Kabbalan if except that of lend him a sum of money and I shall be guarantor Rabbi said all of these are expressions of guarantee except that of give him and I shall give it back to you Marbi Amimar said to our Ashi father said thus if one said give him a sum of money and I shall give it back to you the creditor has no claim whatsoever against the borrower the law however is not so for a debtor cannot escape from the creditor unless the guarantor had taken the money with his own hand from the creditor and delivered it to the borrower a certain judge once allowed a creditor to take Possession of the property of the debtor before that debtor had been sued, the matter having been brought to his notice, Arhanin the son of Aryeb removed him, said Rabbah, who would have been so wise as to do such a thing if not Arhanin the son of Aryeb, he holds the opinion that a man's possessions are his surety, and we have learned if a man lends money to another on a guarantor's security, he must not exact payment from the guarantor, and this has been established to mean that the guarantor may not be called upon first a certain guarantor of orphans once paid the creditor before the orphans were sued, said Arpapa, the repayment of a verbal loan to a creditor is a commandment, and orphans are not subject to the performance of commandments, but Arhuna son of Arjashua said it may be assumed that he deposited with him some bundles of valuables, Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi, what is the practical difference between them? The difference between them is the case where the Debtor admitted liability or where he was placed under the ban and died while still under the ban. A message was sent from Palestine where one was placed under a ban and died under the ban. The law is in accordance with the view of Arhuna, the son of Arjashua. An objection was raised. A guarantor who produced a bond of indebtedness cannot exact payment if, however, it contains the entry I received from you. He may exact payment now according to Arhuna, the son of Arjashua. One can well understand this law to be applicable in the case where the debtor had admitted liability according to our papa. However, there is a difficulty there. It is different since he took the trouble to write for him. I received for this very object a certain guarantor to a Gentile once paid the Gentile before he sued the orphan. Said Armordicay to Arashi, thus said Abimi of Patronia in the name of Rabba, even according to him who said that the possibility that bundles of valuables were deposited with. The creditor was to be taken into consideration. This is only applicable to an Israelite, but in the case of a Gentile, since he invariably goes for payment to the guarantor, the possibility that bundles of valuables were deposited with the creditor need not be taken into consideration. The other said unto him, on the contrary, even according to him who said that the possibility that bundles of valuables were deposited with the creditor need not be taken into consideration. This is only applicable to an Israelite, but in the case of Gentiles, since their judges invariably go to the guarantor, it may be taken for granted that had not the debtor deposited with him some bundles of valuables at the outset, he would not have accepted any responsibility whatsoever. And so said Arsimian B. Gamaliel, where a man is guarantor for a woman in respect of her ketubah, etc. Moses B. Isri was guarantor for the ketubah of his daughter in law. Now his son Arhuna was a scholar, but in poor circumstances said Abbe is there no one who would go and advise Arhuna to divorce his wife so that she might go and collect her kathubah from his father and then remarry her but said Rabba to him have we not learned that the husband must bow to derive no further benefit from her does everyone who divorces his wife said Abbe to him do it at a court of law finally however it was discovered that he was a priest this is just what people say exclaimed Abbe poverty follows it. Poor could Abbe have said such a thing surely Abbe had said who is a cunning rogue he who counsels to sell an estate in accordance with Arsimian B. Gamaliel the case of one son is different and the case of a scholar is also different but surely he was only a guarantor and a guarantor for a kathubah it has been definitely established is not responsible for payment he was a kabbalan this reply would be quite correct according to him who said that though the husband had no property. A Kabbalan for a Kathubah is responsible for payment what however can be replied according to him who said that he is responsible for payment only where the husband has property but is not responsible for payment where the husband has not if you wish I might say Arhuna did have property but it was struck with blast and if you prefer I might say a father in the case of his son always undertakes responsibility for it was stated a guarantor for a Kathubah is in the opinion of all not responsible for payment a Kabbalan for a creditor is in the opinion of all responsible for payment in the case however of a Kabbalan for a Kathubah or a guarantor for a creditor there is a dispute one master holds that he is responsible only where the debtor has property but if he has none he is not responsible and the other master holds that he is responsible whether the debt
where it was not authenticated consequently if he said give he thereby confirmed the bond if however he did not say give he did not confirm the bond rabbi stated if a dying man said i owe mana to x and the orphan stated we have paid it they are believed if however he said give a mana to x and the orphan stated we have paid it they are not believed topsy turvy does not the reverse stand to reason if he said give a mana since their father had given a definite order it might be justly assumed that they discharged the debt if however he said i owe mana to x since their father did not give a definite order it ought to be assumed that they did not discharge it if however such a statement was made it was made in the following terms if a dying man said i owe mana to x and the orphans declared our father subsequently told us that he paid they are believed what is the reason he might have subsequently recalled it to his mind if however he said give a mana to X and his orphans declared our father subsequently told us that he paid they are not believed for had it been the case that he paid it he would not have used the word give Rabba inquired what is the lower a dying man admitted a debt is it necessary for him to say also be you my witnesses or is it not necessary to say be you my witnesses is it assumed that a man might jest in the hour of his death or that a man does not jest in the hour of his death is it necessary for him to say right or is it not necessary to say right after having raised these questions he answered them himself no one jest in the hour of his death and the words of a dying man are regarded legally as written and delivered mission if a man lent money to another on the security of a bond of indebtedness he may collect the debt from mortgage property if however the loan was made before witnesses he may recover his debt from free property only Talmud, Mas Baba Bath, Rabbi, Person produced against another his note of hand showing that the latter owes him a sum of money he may recover it frost his free property if the guarantee and signature of a guarantor appear below the signatures to bonds of indebtedness the creditor may recover his debt from the guarantor's free property such a case once came before our Ishmael who decided that the debt may be recovered from the guarantor's free property Ben Nanyas however said to him the debt may be replied neither from sold property nor from free property while the other asked him behold he replied to him this is just as if a creditor were in the act of throttling a debtor in the street and his friend found him and said leave him alone and will pay you he would certainly be exempt from liability since the loan was not made through trust in him but what matter of guarantor however is liable to refund a debt if the guarantor said lend him a sum of money and I will repay it to you. You he is liable since the loan was made through trust in him or Ishmael further stated he who would be wise should engage in the study of civil laws for there is no branch in the Torah more comprehensive than they and they are like a welling fountain and he that would engage in the study of civil laws let him wait upon Simeon ben Nanyas Gamar said according to the word of the Torah either a loan secured by a bond or a verbal loan may be recovered from mortgage property what is it? Reason the hypothecary obligation involved is biblical why then has it been said that a verbal loan may be collected from free property only on account of possible loss to the buyers if so the same law should apply also to a loan that is secured by a bond in this case they have brought the loss upon themselves Rabbi however said according to the word of the Torah either a loan secured by a bond or a verbal loan may be recovered from free property only what is the reason? The hypothecary obligation involved is not biblical why then has it been said that a loan secured by a bond may be recovered from sold property in order that doors may not be locked in the face of borrowers if so the same law should apply also to a verbal loan in that case the loan is not sufficiently known did Rabbah however give such a ruling surely Rabbah said if land was collected he receives a double portion but if money was collected he does not and our said if money was collected he has a double portion and if it be suggested that the statement of Rabbah should be transposed to Allah and that of Allah to Rabbah surely it may be pointed out Allah said according to the word of the Torah a creditor is to receive of the worst Rabbah only stated the reason of the Palestinians but he himself does not share their view both Rabbah and Samuel stated a verbal loan may be recovered neither from the heirs nor from the buyer what is the reason the hypothecary Obligation involved is not biblical. Both Arjuhanan and Arsimian be like stated a verbal loan may be recovered either from the ears or from the buyers. What is the reason the hypothecary obligation involved is biblical? An objection was raised if a man was digging a pit in a public domain and an ox falls upon him and kills him. The owner of the ox is exempt. Moreover, if the ox dies, compensation for its value must be paid to its owner by the ears of the owner of the pit. Arlay replied. In the name of Rab, this law is applicable to the case only where he appeared before a court of law, but surely it was stated that it killed him. Or Adabi Ahab replied, This is a case where he was fatally injured, but Arnaman surely said that a tanner recited the statement as follows it killed and buried him. That is a case where judges sat at the mouth of the pit and convicted him. Talmud, Mas Baba Bathray, our Papa said the law is that a verbal loan may be recovered from the ears, but may not be recovered from the buyers it may be recovered from the ears in order that doors might not be locked in the face of borrowers but may not be recovered from the buyers because it is not sufficiently known if a person produced against another his note of hand showing that the latter owed him a sum of money he may recover it from free property etc rabbi nathan inquired of aryohan and what is the law in the case where his handwriting was legally endorsed at a court of law the other replied to him although one's handwriting had been legally endorsed at a court of law the debt may be recovered from free property only rami Bihama raised an objection there are three kinds of letters of divorce which are invalid but if the woman did remarry her child is deemed legitimate and they are the following a letter of divorce written in the husband's handwriting which bears no signatures of witnesses one bearing the signatures of witnesses but no date and one bearing a date and the signature of one witness only these are the three kinds of letters of divorce which are invalid did the woman however remarry the child is deemed legitimate or Eliezer said a letter of divorce although it bears no signatures of witnesses but was given to the woman in the presence of witnesses is valid and such a document entitles one to collect from mortgage property there it is different because he pledged himself at the very time of writing if the guarantee and signature of a guarantor appear below the signatures to bonds of indebtedness etc rab said if the guarantee appears before the signatures on the bond the debt may be recovered from mortgage property if after the signatures on the bond it may be recovered from free property only at times rab said even if the guarantee appears before the signatures on the bond the debt may be recovered from free property only this surely presents a contradiction between one Ruling of Rab and the other ruling of his there is no contradiction the one refers to the case where it was entered X is guarantor the other speaks of a case where it was entered and X is guarantor are Yohanan however said either with the one or with the other the debt may be recovered from the guarantor's free property only even though it was entered and X is guarantor Rob raised an objection a bill of divorce containing greetings under which the witnesses have signed is invalid. Because we apprehend that they might have signed the greetings only and Rab said I had the following explanation of this law from our Yohanan the entry give greetings renders the bill invalid but with the entry and give greetings it is valid here also it is a case where the entry was X is guarantor if so the statement is exactly the same as that of Rab read and so said our Yohanan such a case once came before our Ishmael etc said Rab be Barhana in the name of our Yohanan. Although our Ishmael praised Ben Nanyas the Halachah is in accordance with his own view a question was raised what is our Ishmael's view in the case of throttling come and hear that which our Jacob said in the name of our Yohanan our Ishmael differed in the case of throttling also is the Halachah in accordance with his view or is the Halachah in this case not in accordance with his view come and hear when Rabin came he stated in the name of our Yohanan our Ishmael differed in the case of throttling also and the Halachah is in accordance with his view in the case of throttling also Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel a guarantor even in the case of throttling who was made to enter into a legal obligation assumes responsibility for the payment of the debt from this it is to be inferred that a guarantor generally does not require a kanyan and this is in disagreement with the statement of Arnaman for Arnaman said Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi Talmud, Mas Baba Bathrabi. Only in the case of a guarantor appointed by a court of law is no kanyan required. In all other cases, however, kanyan is required, and the law is if one guarantees a loan at the time the money is delivered, no kanyan is required. If after the money is delivered, kanyan is required. And in the case of a guarantor appointed by a court of law, no kanyan is required for having regard to the pleasure he has in the confidence reposed in him, he wholeheartedly determines to shoulder the full responsibility.